The Isaurians retired to their mountains, their fortresses were successively besieged and ruined, their communication with the sea was intercepted, the bravest of their leaders died in arms, the surviving chiefs, before their execution, were dragged in chains through the Hippodrome, a colony of their youth was transplanted into Thrace, and the remnant of the people submitted to the Roman government. Yet some generations elapsed before their minds were reduced to the level of slavery. The populous villages of Mount Taurus were filled with horsemen and archers, they resisted the imposition of tributes, but they recruited the armies of Justinian, and his civil magistrates, the proconsul of Cappadocia, the count of Isauria, and the praetors of Laconia and Pisidia, were invested with military power to restrain the licentious practice of rapes and assassinations. If we extend our view from the tropic to the mouth of the Danais, we may observe, on one hand, the precautions of Justinian to curb the savages of Ashthiopia, 76, and, on the other, the long walls which he constructed in Crimea for the protection of his friendly Goths, a colony of 3,000 shepherds and warriors. From that peninsula to Trebizond, the eastern curve of the Euxine was secured by forts, by alliance, or by religion, and the possession of Lazica, the coal chose of ancient, the Mingrelia of modern, geography, soon became the object of an important war. Trebizond, in after times the seat of a romantic empire, was indebted to the liberality of Justinian for a church, an aqueduct, and a castle, whose ditches are hewn in the solid rock. From that maritime city, a frontier line of 500 miles may be drawn to the fortress of Circesium, the last Roman station on the Euphrates. Above Trebizond immediately, and five days' journey to the south, the country rises into dark forests and craggy mountains, as savage though not so lofty as the Alps and the Pyrenees. In this rigorous climate, 78, where the snows seldom melt, the fruits are tardy and tasteless even honey is poisonous, the most industrious tillage would be confined to some pleasant valleys, and the pastoral tribes obtained a scanty sustenance from the flesh and milk of their cattle. The Chilibians 79 derived their name and temper from the iron quality of the soil, and, since the days of Cyrus, they might produce, under the various appellations of Chaldeans and Zanians, an uninterrupted prescription of war and rapine. Under the reign of Justinian, they acknowledged the god and the emperor of the Romans, and seven fortresses were built in the most accessible passes, to exclude the ambition of the Persian monarch. The principal source of the Euphrates descends from the Chilibian mountains, and seems to flow towards the west and the Euxine, bending to the southwest. The river passes under the walls of Satulla and Melitene, which were restored by Justinian as the bulwarks of the Lesser Armenia and gradually approaches the Mediterranean Sea, till at length, repelled by Mount Taurus, the Euphrates inclines his long and flexible course to the southeast and the Gulf of Persia. Among the Roman cities beyond the Euphrates, we distinguish two recent foundations, which were named from Theodosius and the relics of the martyrs, and two capitals, Amida and Didasa, which are celebrated in the history of every age. Their strength was proportioned by Justinian to the danger of their situation. A ditch and palisade might be sufficient to resist the artless force of the cavalry of Scythia, but more elaborate works were required to sustain a regular siege against the arms and treasures of the great king. His skillful engineers understood the methods of conducting deep mines, and of raising platforms to the level of the rampart, he shook the strongest battlements with his military engines, and sometimes advanced to the assault with a line of movable turrets on the backs of elephants. In the great cities of the east, the disadvantage of space, perhaps of position, was compensated by the zeal of the people, who seconded the garrison in the defense of their country and religion, and the fabulous promise of the Son of God, that Tidusa should never be taken, filled the citizens with valiant confidence, and chilled the besiegers with doubt and dismay. The subordinate towns of Armenia and Mesopotamia were diligently strengthened, and the posts which appeared to have any command of ground or water were occupied by numerous forts, substantially built of stone, or more hastily erected with the obvious materials of earth and brick. 
the eye of Justinian investigated every spot, and his cruel precautions might attract the war into some lonely vale, whose peaceful natives, connected by trade and marriage, were ignorant of national discord and the quarrels of princes. Westward of the Euphrates, a sandy desert extends above 600 miles to the Red Sea. Nature had interposed a vacant solitude between the ambition of two rival empires, the Arabians, till Muhammad arose, were formidable only as robbers, and, in the proud security of peace, the fortifications of Syria were neglected on the most vulnerable side. But the national enmity, at least the effects of that enmity, had been suspended by a truce, which continued above fourscore years. An ambassador from the Emperor Zeno accompanied the rash and unfortunate Peroses, in his expedition against the Neptalites or White Huns, whose conquests had been stretched from the Caspian to the heart of India, whose throne was enriched with emeralds, 81 and whose cavalry was supported by a line of 2,000 elephants. The Persians were twice circumvented, in a situation which made valor useless and flight impossible, and the double victory of the Huns was achieved by military stratagem. They dismissed their royal captive after he had submitted to adore the majesty of a barbarian, and the humiliation was poorly evaded by the casuistical subtlety of the Magi, who instructed Peroses to direct his attention to the rising sun. The indignant successor of Cyrus forgot his danger and his gratitude, he renewed the attack with headstrong fury, and lost both his army and his life. The death of Peroses abandoned Persia to her foreign and domestic enemies, and twelve years of confusion elapsed before his son Kobades or Kobad could embrace any designs of ambition or revenge. The unkind parsimony of Anastasius was the motive or pretense of a Roman war. The Huns and Arabs marched under the Persian standard, and the fortifications of Armenia and Mesopotamia were at that time in a ruinous or imperfect condition. The emperor returned his thanks to the governor and people of Martyropolis for the prompt surrender of a city which could not be successfully defended, and the conflagration of Theodosiopolis might justify the conduct of their prudent neighbors. Amida sustained a long and destructive siege. At the end of three months the loss of 50,000 of the soldiers of Kabades was not balanced by any prospect of success, and it was in vain that the Magi deduced a flattering prediction from the indecency of the women on the ramparts, who had revealed their most secret charms to the eyes of the assailants. At length, in a silent night, they ascended the most accessible tower, which was guarded only by some monks, oppressed, after the duties of a festival, with sleep and wine. Scaling ladders were applied at the dawn of day, the presence of Kabades, his stern command, and his drawn sword, compelled the Persians to vanquish, and, before it was sheathed, fourscore thousand of the inhabitants had expiated the blood of their companions. After the siege of Amida, the war continued three years, and the unhappy frontier tasted the full measure of its calamities. The gold of Anastasius was offered too late, the number of his troops was defeated by the number of their generals, the country was stripped of its inhabitants, and both the living and the dead were abandoned to the wild beasts of the desert. The resistance of Edessa, and the deficiency of spoil, inclined the mind of Kabades to peace, he sold his conquests for an exorbitant price, and the same line, though marked with slaughter and devastation, still separated the two empires. To avert the repetition of the same evils, Anastasius resolved to form a new colony, so strong that it should defy the power of the Persian, so far advanced towards Assyria that its stationary troops might defend the province by the menace or operation of offensive war. For this purpose, the town of Dara, fourteen miles from Nisibis, and four days' journey from the Tigris, was peopled and adorned, the hasty works of Anastasius were improved by the perseverance of Justinian, and, without insisting on places less important, the fortifications of Dara may represent the military architecture of the age. The city was surrounded with two walls, and the interval between them, of fifty paces, afforded a retreat to the cattle of the besieged. The inner wall was a monument of strength and beauty, it measured sixty feet from the ground and the height of the towers was one hundred feet, the loopholes, 
from whence an enemy might be annoyed with missile weapons, were small, but numerous, the soldiers were planted along the rampart, under the shelter of double galleries, and a third platform, spacious and secure, was raised on the summit of the towers. The exterior wall appears to have been less lofty, but more solid, and each tower was protected by a quadrangular bulwark. A hard rocky soil resisted the tools of the miners, and on the southeast, where the ground was more tractable, their approach was retarded by a new work, which advanced in the shape of an half moon. The double and treble ditches were filled with a stream of water, and in the management of the river the most skillful labor was employed to supply the inhabitants, to distress the besiegers, and to prevent the mischiefs of a natural or artificial inundation. Dara continued more than sixty years to fulfill the wishes of its founders, and to provoke the jealousy of the Persians, who incessantly complained that this impregnable fortress had been constructed in manifest violation of the treaty of peace between the two empires. Between the Euxine and the Caspian, the countries of Colchos, Iberia, and Albania are intersected in every direction by the branches of Mount Caucasus and the two principal gates or passes from north to south have been frequently confounded in the geography both of the ancients and moderns. The name of Caspian or Albanian gates is properly applied to Durband, which occupies a short declivity between the mountains and the sea, the city, if we give credit to local tradition, had been founded by the Greeks, and this dangerous entrance was fortified by the kings of Persia with a mole, double walls, and doors of iron. The Iberian gates 83 are formed by a narrow passage of six miles in Mount Caucasus, which opens from the northern side of Iberia or Georgia into the plain that reaches to the Tanais and the Volga. A fortress, designed by Alexander, perhaps, or one of his successors, to command that important pass, had descended by right of conquest or inheritance to a prince of the Huns, who offered it for a moderate price to the emperor, but, while Anastasius paused, while he timorously computed the cost and the distance, a more vigilant rival interposed, and Cabades forcibly occupied the Straits of Caucasus. The Albanian and Iberian gates excluded the horsemen of Scythia from the shortest and most practicable roads, and the whole front of the mountains was covered by the rampart of Gog and Magog, the long wall which has excited the curiosity of an Arabian caliph 84 and a Russian conqueror. According to a recent description, huge stones 7 feet thick, 21 feet in length or height, are artificially joined without iron or cement, to compose a wall which runs above 300 miles from the shores of Durban, over the hills and through the valleys of Dagestan and Georgia. Without a vision, such a work might be undertaken by the policy of Cabades, without a miracle, it might be accomplished by his son, so formidable to the Romans under the name of Chosroes, so dear to the Orientals under the appellation of Nashur I. The Persian monarch held in his hand the keys both of peace and war, but he stipulated, in every treaty, that Justinian should contribute to the expense of a common barrier, which equally protected the two empires from the inroads of the Scythians seven. Justinian suppressed the schools of Athens and the consulship of Rome, which had given so many sages and heroes to mankind. Both these institutions had long since degenerated from their primitive glory, yet some reproach may be justly inflicted on the avarice and jealousy of a prince by whose hands such venerable ruins were destroyed. Athens, after her Persian triumphs, adopted the philosophy of Ionia and the rhetoric of Sicily, and these studies became the patrimony of a city whose inhabitants, about thirty thousand males, condensed, within the period of a single life, the genius of ages and millions. Our sense of the dignity of human nature is exalted by the simple recollection that Isocrates was the companion of Plato and Xenophon, that he assisted, perhaps with the historian Thucydides, at the first representations of the Oedipus of Sophocles and the Iphigenia of Euripides, and that his pupils Ischines and Demosthenes contended for the crown of patriotism in the presence of Aristotle, the master of Theophrastus, who taught at Athens with the founders of the Stoic and Epicurean sects. The ingenuous youth of Attica enjoyed the benefits of their domestic education, 
which was communicated without envy to the rival cities. 2000 Disciples heard the lessons of Theophrastus, the schools of rhetoric must have been still more populous than those of philosophy, and a rapid succession of students diffused the fame of their teachers as far as the utmost limits of the Grecian language and name. Those limits were enlarged by the victories of Alexander, the arts of Athens survived her freedom and dominion, and the Greek colonies which the Macedonians planted in Egypt, and scattered over Asia, undertook long and frequent pilgrimages to worship the Muses in their favorite temple on the banks of the Ilissus. The Latin conquerors respectfully listened to the instructions of their subjects and captives, the names of Cicero and Horace were enrolled in the schools of Athens, and, after the perfect settlement of the Roman Empire, the natives of Italy, of Africa, and of Britain, conversed in the groves of the academy with their fellow students of the East. The studies of philosophy and eloquence are congenial to a popular state, which encourages the freedom of inquiry and submits only to the force of persuasion. In the republics of Greece and Rome, the art of speaking was the powerful engine of patriotism or ambition, and the schools of rhetoric poured forth the colony of statesmen and legislators. When the liberty of public debate was suppressed, the orator, in the honorable profession of an advocate, might plead the cause of innocence and justice, he might abuse his talents in the more profitable trade of panegyric, and the same precepts continued to dictate the fanciful declamations of the sophist and the chaster beauties of historical composition. The systems which professed to unfold the nature of God, of man, and of the universe, entertained the curiosity of the philosophic student, and, according to the temper of his mind, he might doubt with the skeptics or decide with the Stoics, sublimely speculate with Plato or severely argue with Aristotle. The pride of the adverse sects had fixed an unattainable term of moral happiness and perfection, but the race was glorious and salutary, the disciples of Zeno, and even those of Epicurus, were taught both to act and to suffer and the death of Petronius was not less effectual than that of Seneca to humble a tyrant by the discovery of his impotence. The light of science could not indeed be confined within the walls of Athens. Her incomparable writers addressed themselves to the human race, the living masters emigrated to Italy and Asia, Beritus, in later times, was devoted to the study of the law, astronomy and physic were cultivated in the Museum of Alexandria, but the Attic schools of rhetoric and philosophy maintained their superior reputation from the Peloponnesian War to the reign of Justinian. Athens, though situate in a barren soil, possessed a pure air, a free navigation, and the monuments of ancient art. That sacred retirement was seldom disturbed by the business of trade or government, and the last of the Athenians were distinguished by their lively wit, the purity of their taste and language, their social manners and some traces, at least in discourse, of their magnanimity of their fathers. In the suburbs of the city, the Academy of the Platonists, the Lyceum of the Peripatetics, the Portico of the Stoics, and the Garden of the Epicureans, were planted with trees and decorated with statues, and the philosophers, instead of being immured in a cloister, delivered their instructions in spacious and pleasant walks which at different hours were consecrated to the exercises of the mind and body. The genius of the founders still lived in those venerable seats. The ambition of succeeding to the masters of human reason excited a generous emulation, and the merit of the candidates was determined, on each vacancy, by the free voices of an enlightened people. The Athenian professors were paid by their disciples, according to their mutual wants and abilities. The price appears to have varied from a mina to a talent, and Isocrates himself, who derides the avarice of the sophists, required in his school of rhetoric about thirty pounds from each of his hundred pupils. The wages of industry are just and honorable, yet the same Isocrates shed tears at the first receipt of a stipend, the Stoic might blush when he was hired to preach the contempt of money and I should be sorry to discover that Aristotle or Plato so far degenerated from the example of Socrates, as to exchange knowledge for gold. But some property of lands and houses was settled by the permission of the laws, and the legacies of deceased friends, on the philosophic chairs of Athens. 
Epicurus bequeathed to his disciples the gardens which he had purchased for 80 mine or 250 pounds, with a fund sufficient for their frugal subsistence and monthly festivals semicolon 86 and the patrimony of Plato afforded an annual rent, which, in eight centuries, was gradually increased from three to one thousand pieces of gold. The schools of Athens were protected by the wisest and most virtuous of the Roman princes. The library which Hadrian founded was placed in a portico adorned with pictures, statues, and a roof of alabaster, and supported by one hundred columns of Phrygian marble. The public salaries were assigned by the generous spirit of the Antonines, and each professor, of politics, of rhetoric, of the Platonic, the Peripatetic, the Stoic, and the Epicurean philosophy, received an annual stipend of ten thousand dram, or more than three hundred pounds sterling. After the death of Marcus, these liberal donations, and the privileges attached to the thrones of science, were abolished and revived, diminished and enlarged, but some vestige of royal bounty may be found under the successors of Constantine, and their arbitrary choice of an unworthy candidate might tempt the philosophers of Athens to regret the days of independence and poverty. It is remarkable that the impartial favour of the Antonines was bestowed on the four adverse sects of philosophy, which they considered as equally useful, or at least as equally innocent. Socrates had formerly been the glory and the reproach of his country, and the first lessons of Epicurus so strangely scandalised the pious ears of the Athenians that by his exile, and that of his antagonists, they silenced all vain disputes concerning the nature of the gods. But in the ensuing year they recalled the hasty decree, restored the liberty of the schools, and were convinced, by the experience of ages, that the moral character of philosophers is not affected by the diversity of their theological speculations. The Gothic arms were less fatal to the schools of Athens than the establishment of a new religion, whose ministers superseded the exercise of reason, resolved every question by an article of faith and condemned the infidel or skeptic to eternal flames. In many a volume of laborious controversy, they exposed the weakness of the understanding and the corruption of the heart, insulted human nature in the sages of antiquity, and prescribed the spirit of philosophical inquiry, so repugnant to the doctrine, or at least to the temper, of an humble believer. The surviving sect of Platonists, whom Plato would have blushed to acknowledge, extravagantly mingled a sublime theory with the practice of superstition and magic, and, as they remained alone in the midst of a Christian world, they indulged a secret rancor against the government of the church and state, whose severity was still suspended over their heads. About a century after the reign of Julian, 88 Proclus was permitted to teach in the philosophic chair of the academy, and such was his industry that he frequently, in the same day, pronounced five lessons and composed seven hundred lines. His sagacious mind explored the deepest questions of morals and metaphysics, and he ventured to urge eighteen arguments against the Christian doctrine of the creation of the world. But in the intervals of study he personally conversed with Pan, Esculapius, and Minerva, in whose mysteries he was secretly initiated, and whose prostrate statues he adored in the devout persuasion that the philosopher, who is a citizen of the universe, should be the priest of its various deities. An eclipse of the sun announced his approaching end, and his life, with that of his scholar Isidore, compiled by two of their most learned disciples, exhibits a deplorable picture of the second childhood of human reason. Yet the golden chain, as it was fondly styled, of the Platonic succession, continued forty-four years from the death of Priclus to the edict of Justinian, which imposed a perpetual silence on the schools of Athens, and excited the grief and indignation of the few remaining votaries of Grecian science and superstition. Seven friends and philosophers, Diogenes and Hermias, Ulius and Prisson, Damasius, Isidore, and Simplicius, who dissented from the religion of their sovereign, embraced the resolution of seeking, in a foreign land, the freedom which was denied in their native country. They had heard, and they credulously believed, that the Republic of Plato was realized in the despotic government of Persia, and that a patriotic king reigned over the happiest and most virtuous of nations. 
They were soon astonished by the natural discovery that Persia resembled the other countries of the globe, that Chosroes, who affected the name of a philosopher, was vain, cruel, and ambitious, that bigotry, and a spirit of intolerance, prevailed among the Magi, that the nobles were haughty, the courtiers servile, and the magistrates unjust, that the guilty sometimes escaped, and that the innocent were often oppressed. The disappointment of the philosophers provoked them to overlook the real virtues of the Persians, and they were scandalized, more deeply perhaps than became their profession, with the plurality of wives and concubines, the incestuous marriages, and the custom of exposing dead bodies to the dogs and vultures, instead of hiding them in the earth or consuming them with fire. Their repentance was expressed by a precipitate return, and they loudly declared that they had rather die on the borders of the empire than enjoy the wealth and favor of the barbarian. From this journey, however, they derived a benefit which reflects the purest luster on the character of Chosroes. He required that the seven sages who had visited the court of Persia should be exempted from the penal laws which Justinian enacted against his pagan subjects, and this privilege, expressly stipulated in a treaty of peace, was guarded by the vigilance of a powerful mediator. Simplicius and his companions ended their lives in peace and obscurity, and, as they left no disciples, they terminate the long list of Grecian philosophers, who may be justly praised notwithstanding their defects, as the wisest and most virtuous of their contemporaries. The writings of Simplicius are now extant. His physical and metaphysical commentaries on Aristotle have passed away with the fashion of the times, but his moral interpretation of Epictetus is preserved in the Library of Nations, as a classic book, most excellently adapted to direct the will, to purify the heart, and to confirm the understanding by a just confidence in the nature both of God and man. About the same time that Pythagoras first invented the appellation of philosopher, liberty and the consulship were founded at Rome by the elder Brutus. The revolutions of the consular office, which may be viewed in the successive lights of a substance, a shadow, and a name, have been occasionally mentioned in the present history. The first magistrates of the Republic had been chosen by the people, to exercise in the senate and in the camp, the powers of peace and war, which were afterwards translated to the emperors. But the tradition of ancient dignity was long revered by the Romans and barbarians. A Gothic historian applauds the consulship of Theodoric as the height of all temporal glory and greatness, the king of Italy himself congratulates those annual favorites of fortune who, without the cares, enjoyed the splendor of the throne and at the end of a thousand years two consuls were created by the sovereigns of Rome and Constantinople, for the sole purpose of giving a date to the year and a festival to the people. But the expenses of this festival, in which the wealthy and the vain aspired to surpass their predecessors, insensibly arose to the enormous sum of fourscore thousand pounds, the wisest senators declined an useless honor, which involved the certain ruin of their families, and to this reluctance I should impute the frequent chasms in the last age of the consular fasti. The predecessors of Justinian had assisted from the public treasures the dignity of the less opulent candidates, the avarice of that prince preferred the cheaper and more convenient method of advice and regulation. Seven processions or spectacles were the number to which his edict confined the horse and chariot races, the athletic sports, the music and pantomimes of the theatre and the hunting of wild beasts, and small pieces of silver were discreetly substituted to the gold medals, which had always excited tumult and drunkenness, when they were scattered with a profuse hand among the populace. Notwithstanding these precautions and his own example, the succession of consuls finally ceased in the thirteenth year of Justinian, whose despotic temper might be gratified by the silent extinction of a title which admonished the Romans of their ancient freedom. Yet the annual consulship still lived in the minds of the people, they fondly expected its speedy restoration, they applauded the gracious condescension of successive princes, by whom it was assumed in the first year of their reign, and three centuries elapsed, after the death of Justinian, before that obsolete dignity, which had been suppressed by custom, could be abolished by law. 
the imperfect mode of distinguishing each year by the name of a magistrate was usefully supplied by the date of a permanent era, the creation of the world, according to the Septuagint version, was adopted by the Greeks semicolon 91 and the Latins, since the age of Charlemagne, have computed their time from the birth of Christ. Conquests of Justinian in the West Middle. Character and first campaigns of Belisarius Middle. He invades and subdues the Vandal Kingdom of Africa Middle. His triumph Middle. The Gothic War Middle. He recovers Sicily, Naples, and Rome Middle. Siege of Rome by the Goths Middle. Their retreat and losses Middle. Surrender of Ravenna Middle. Glory of Belisarius Middle. His domestic shame and misfortunes Middle. His wife Antoninon Justinian ascended the throne, about fifty years after the fall of the Western Empire, the Kingdom of the Goths and Vandals had obtained a solid and, as it might seem, legal establishment both in Europe and Africa. The titles which Roman victory had inscribed were erased with equal justice by the sword of the barbarians, and their successful rapine derived a more venerable sanction from time, from treaties, and from the oaths of fidelity already repeated by a second or third generation of obedient subjects. Experience and Christianity had refuted the superstitious hope that Rome was founded by the gods to reign forever over the nations of the earth. But the proud claim of perpetual and indefeasible dominion, which her soldiers could no longer maintain, was firmly asserted by her statesmen and lawyers, whose opinions have been sometimes revived and propagated in the modern schools of jurisprudence. After Rome herself had been stripped of the imperial purple, the princes of Constantinople assumed the sole and sacred scepter of the monarchy, demanded, as their rightful inheritance, the provinces which had been subdued by the consuls or possessed by the Caesars, and feebly aspired to deliver their faithful subjects of the West from the usurpation of heretics and barbarians. The execution of this splendid design was in some degree reserved for Justinian. During the five first years of his reign, he reluctantly waged a costly and unprofitable war against the Persians, till his pride submitted to his ambition, and he purchased, at the price of 440,000 pounds sterling, the benefit of a precarious truce, which, in the language of both nations, was dignified with the appellation of the endless peace. The safety of the East enabled the emperor to employ his forces against the Vandals, and the internal state of Africa afforded an honorable motive, and promised a powerful support, to the Roman arms. According to the testament of the founder, the African kingdom had linearly descended to Hildric the eldest of the Vandal princes. A mild disposition inclined the son of a tyrant, the grandson of a conqueror, to prefer the counsels of clemency and peace and his accession was marked by the salutary edict which restored two hundred bishops to their churches and allowed the free profession of the Athanasian creed. But the Catholics accepted with cold and transient gratitude a favour so inadequate to their pretensions, and the virtues of Hildric offended the prejudices of his countrymen. The Arian clergy presumed to insinuate that he had renounced the faith and the soldiers more loudly complained that he had degenerated from the courage, of his ancestors. His ambassadors were suspected of a secret and disgraceful negotiation in the Byzantine court, and his general, the Achilles, III as he was named, of the Vandals, lost a battle against the naked and disorderly Moors. The public discontent was exasperated by Jelima, whose age, descent, and military fame gave him an apparent title to the succession, he assumed, with the consent of the nation, the reins of government, and his unfortunate sovereign sunk without a struggle from the throne to a dungeon, where he was strictly guarded with a faithful counsellor and his unpopular nephew, the Achilles of the Vandals. But the indulgence which Hildrek had shown to his Catholic subjects had powerfully recommended him to the favour of Justinian, who, for the benefit of his own sect, could acknowledge the use and justice of religious toleration, their alliance, while the nephew of Justin remained in a private station, was cemented by the mutual exchange of gifts and letters, and the Emperor Justinian asserted the cause of royalty and friendship. In two successive embassies, he admonished the usurper to repent of his treason, or to abstain, at least, from any further violence, which might provoke the displeasure of God and of the Romans, 
to reverence the laws of kindred and succession, and to suffer an infirm old man peaceably to end his days either on the throne of Carthage or in the palace of Constantinople. The passions or even the prudence of Julima compelled him to reject these requests, which were urged in the haughty tone of menace and command, and he justified his ambition in a language rarely spoken in the Byzantine court, by alleging the right of a free people to remove or punish their chief magistrate, who had failed in the execution of the kingly office. After this fruitless expostulation, the captive monarch was more rigorously treated, his nephew was deprived of his eyes, and the cruel vandal, confident in his strength and distance, derided the vain threats and slow preparations of the Emperor of the East. Justinian resolved to deliver or revenge his friend, Julima to maintain his usurpation, and the war was preceded, according to the practice of civilized nations, by the most solemn protestations that each party was sincerely desirous of peace. The report of an African war was grateful only to the vain and idle populace of Constantinople, whose poverty exempted them from tribute, and whose cowardice was seldom exposed to military service. But the wiser citizens, who judged of the future by the past, revolved in their memory the immense loss both of men and money, which the empire had sustained in the expedition of Basiliscus. The troops, which, after five laborious campaigns, had been recalled from the Persian frontier, dreaded the sea, the climate, and the arms of an unknown enemy. The ministers of the finances computed, as far as they might compute, the demands of an African war, the taxes which must be found and levied to supply those insatiate demands, and the danger lest their own lives, or at least their lucrative employments, should be made responsible for the deficiency of the supply. Inspired by such selfish motives, for we may not suspect him of any zeal for the public good, John of Cappadocia ventured to oppose in full counsel the inclinations of his master. He confessed that a victory of such importance could not be too dearly purchased, but he represented in a grave discourse the certain difficulties and the uncertain event. You undertake, said the prefect, to besiege Carthage by land, the distance is not less than 140 days journey, on the sea, a whole year four must elapse before you can receive any intelligence from your fleet. If Africa should be reduced, it cannot be preserved without the additional conquest of Sicily and Italy. Success will impose the obligation of new labours, a single misfortune will attract the barbarians into the heart of your exhausted empire. Justinian felt the weight of this salutary advice. He was confounded by the unwonted freedom of an obsequious servant, and the design of the war would perhaps have been relinquished, if his courage had not been revived by a voice which silenced the doubts of profane reason. I have seen a vision, cried an artful or fanatic bishop of the East. It is the will of heaven, O Emperor, that you should not abandon your holy enterprise for the deliverance of the African Church. The God of battles will march before your standard and disperse your enemies, who are the enemies of his son. The emperor might be tempted, and his counsellors were constrained, to give credit to this seasonable revelation, but they derived more rational hope from the revolt which the adherents of Hildric or Athanasius had already excited on the borders of the Vandal monarchy. Pudentius, an African subject, had privately signified his loyal intentions, and a small military aid restored the province of Tripoli to the obedience of the Romans. The government of Sardinia had been entrusted to Godas, a valiant barbarian, he suspended the payment of tribute, disclaimed his allegiance to the usurper, and gave audience to the emissaries of Justinian, who found him master of that fruitful island, at the head of his guards, and proudly invested with the ensigns of royalty. The forces of the Vandals were diminished by discord and suspicion, the Roman armies were animated by the spirit of Belisarius, one of those heroic names which are familiar to every age and to every nation. The Africanus of New Rome was born, and perhaps educated, among the Thrace and peasants, comma five without any of those advantages which had formed the virtues of the elder and the younger Scipio, a noble origin, liberal studies, and the emulation of a free state. The silence of a loquacious secretary may be admitted to prove that the youth of Belisarius could not afford any subject of praise. He served, most assuredly with valour and reputation, 
among the private guards of Justinian, and, when his patron became emperor, the domestic was promoted to military command. After a bold inroad into Persia Armenia, in which his glory was shared by a colleague and his progress was checked by an enemy, Belisarius repaired to the important station of Dara, where he first accepted the service of Procopius, the faithful companion, and diligent historian, of his exploits. The Mirans of Persia advanced, with 40,000 of her best troops, to raise the fortifications of Dara, and signify the day and the hour on which the citizens should prepare a bath for his refreshment after the toils of victory. He encountered an adversary equal to himself, by the new title of General of the East, his superior in the science of war, but much inferior in the number and quality of his troops, which amounted only to twenty-five thousand Romans and strangers, relaxed in their discipline, and humbled by recent disasters. As the level plain of Dara refused all shelter to stratagem and ambush, Belisarius protected his front with a deep trench, which was prolonged at first in perpendicular and afterwards in parallel lines, to cover the wings of cavalry advantageously posted to command the flanks and rear of the enemy. When the Roman centre was shaken, their well-timed and rapid charge decided the conflict, the standard of Persia fell, the immortals fled, the infantry threw away their bucklers, and eight thousand of the vanquished were left on the field of battle. In the next campaign, Syria was invaded on the side of the desert, and Belisarius, with twenty thousand men, hastened from Dara to the relief of the province. During the whole summer, the designs of the enemy were baffled by his skillful dispositions, he pressed their retreat, occupied each night their camp of the preceding day, and would have secured a bloodless victory if he could have resisted the impatience of his own troops. Their valiant promise was faintly supported in the hour of battle, the right wing was exposed by the treacherous or cowardly desertion of the Christian Arabs. The Huns, a veteran band of eight hundred warriors, were oppressed by superior numbers, the flight of the Isaurians was intercepted, but the Roman infantry stood firm on the left, for Belisarius himself, dismounting from his horse, showed them that intrepid despair was their only safety. They turned their backs to the Euphrates, and their faces to the enemy, innumerable arrows glanced without effect from the compact and shelving order of their bucklers, an impenetrable line of pikes was opposed to the repeated assaults of the Persian cavalry, and, after a resistance of many hours, the remaining troops were skillfully embarked under the shadow of the night. The Persian command retired with disorder and disgrace to answer a strict account of the lives of so many soldiers which he had consumed in a barren victory. But the fame of Belisarius was not sullied by a defeat, in which he alone had saved his army from the consequences of their own rashness, the approach of peace relieved him from the guard of the eastern frontier, and his conduct in the sedition of Constantinople amply discharged his obligations to the emperor. When the African war became the topic of popular discourse and secret deliberation, each of the Roman generals was apprehensive, rather than ambitious, of the dangerous honour, but, as soon as Justinian had declared his preference of superior merit, their envy was rekindled by the unanimous applause which was given to the choice of Belisarius. The temper of the Byzantine court may encourage a suspicion that the hero was darkly assisted by the intrigues of his wife the fair and subtle Antonina, who alternately enjoyed the confidence, and incurred the hatred, of the Empress Theodora. The birth of Antonina was ignoble, she descended from a family of charioteers, and her chastity has been stained with the foulest reproach. Yet she reigned with long and absolute power over the mind of her illustrious husband, and, if Antonina disdained the merit of conjugal fidelity, she expressed a manly friendship to Belisarius whom she accompanied with undaunted resolution in all the hardships and dangers of a military life. The preparations for the African war were not unworthy of the last contest between Rome and Carthage. The pride and flower of the army consisted of the guards of Belisarius, who, according to the pernicious indulgence of the times, devoted themselves by a particular oath of fidelity to the service of their patrons. Their strength and stature, for which they had been curiously selected, the goodness of their horses and armour, and the assiduous practice of all the exercises of war, 
enabled them to act whatever their courage might prompt, and their courage was exalted by the social honor of their rank and the personal ambition of favor and fortune. Four hundred of the bravest of the Haruli marched under the banner of the faithful and active foras, their untractable valor was more highly prized than the tame submission of the Greeks and Syrians and of such importance was it deemed to procure a reinforcement of six hundred Masargeet, or Huns, that they were allured by fraud and deceit to engage in a naval expedition. Five thousand horse and ten thousand foot were embarked at Constantinople for the conquest of Africa, but the infantry, for the most part levied in Thrace and Isauria, yielded to the more prevailing use and reputation of the cavalry and the Scythian bow was the weapon on which the armies of Rome were now reduced to place their principal dependence. From a laudable desire to assert the dignity of his theme, Procopius defends the soldiers of his own time against the morose critics who confined that respectable name to the heavy-armed warriors of antiquity and maliciously observed that the word archer is introduced by Homer 7 as a term of contempt. Such contempt might, perhaps, be due to the naked youths who appeared on foot in the fields of Troy, and, lurking behind a tombstone, or the shield of a friend, drew the bowstring to their breast, comma it and dismissed a feeble and lifeless arrow. But our archers, pursues the historian, are mounted on horses, which they manage with admirable skill, their head and shoulders are protected by a cask or buckler, they wear greaves of iron on their legs and their bodies are guarded by a coat of mail. On their right side hangs a quiver, a sword on their left, and their hand is accustomed to wield a lance or javelin in closer combat. Their bows are strong and weighty, they shoot in every possible direction, advancing, retreating, to the front, to the rear, or to either flank, and, as they are taught to draw the bowstring not to the breast, but to the right ear, firm, indeed must be the armor that can resist the rapid violence of their shaft. Five hundred transports, navigated by twenty thousand mariners of Egypt, Cilicia, and Ionia, were collected in the harbor of Constantinople. The smallest of these vessels may be computed at thirty, the largest at five hundred tons, and the fair average will supply an allowance, liberal but not profuse of about 100,000 tons common iron for the reception of 35,000 soldiers and sailors, of 5,000 horses, of arms, engines, and military stores, and of a sufficient stock of water and provisions for a voyage, perhaps, of three months. The proud galleys, which in former ages swept the Mediterranean with so many hundred oars, had long since disappeared and the fleet of Justinian was escorted only by ninety-two light brigantines, covered from the missile weapons of the enemy, and rowed by two thousand of the brave and robust youth of Constantinople. Twenty-two generals are named, most of whom were afterwards distinguished in the wars of Africa and Italy, but the supreme command, both by land and sea, was delegated to Belisarius alone with a boundless power of acting according to his discretion as if the emperor himself were present. The separation of the naval and military professions is at once the effect and the cause of the modern improvements in the science of navigation and maritime war. In the seventh year of the reign of Justinian, and about the time of the summer solstice, the whole fleet of six hundred ships was ranged in martial pomp before the gardens of the palace. The patriarch pronounced his benediction the emperor signified his last commands, the general's trumpet gave the signal of departure, and every heart, according to its fears or wishes, explored with anxious curiosity the omens of misfortune and success. The first halt was made at Perinthus or Heracli, where Belisarius waited five days to receive some Thracian horses, a military gift of his sovereign. From thence the fleet pursued their course through the midst of the Propontis, but, as they struggled to pass the Straits of the Hellespont, an unfavorable wind detained them four days at Ubidas, where the general exhibited a memorable lesson of firmness and severity. Two of the Huns, who in a drunken quarrel had slain one of their fellow soldiers, were instantly shown to the army suspended on a lofty gibbet. The national indignity was resented by their countrymen, who disclaimed the servile laws of the empire, and asserted the free privilege of Scythia, 
where a small fine was allowed to expiate the hasty sallies of intemperance and anger. Their complaints were specious, their clamors were loud, and the Romans were not averse to the example of disorder and impunity. But the rising sedition was appeased by the authority and eloquence of the general, and he represented to the assembled troops the obligation of justice, the importance of discipline, the rewards of piety and virtue, and the unpardonable guilt of murder, which, in his apprehension, was aggravated rather than excused by the vice of intoxication. In the navigation from the Hellespont to Peloponnesus, which the Greeks, after the siege of Troy, had performed in four days, 11 the fleet of Belisarius was guided in their course by his master galley, conspicuous in the day by the redness of the sails, and in the night by the torches blazing from the masthead. It was the duty of the pilots, as they steered between the islands, and turned the capes of Mali and Dinarum, to preserve the just order and regular intervals of such a multitude of ships, as the wind was fair and moderate, their labours were not unsuccessful, and the troops were safely disembarked at Methone on the Messenian coast, to repose themselves for a while after the fatigues of the sea. In this place they experienced how avarice, invested with authority, may sport with the lives of thousands which are bravely exposed for the public service. According to military practice, the bread or biscuit of the Romans was twice prepared in the oven, and a diminution of one-fourth was cheerfully allowed for the loss of weight. To gain this miserable profit, and to save the expense of wood, the prefect John of Cappadocia had given orders that the flour should be slightly baked by the same fire which warmed the baths of Constantinople, and, when the sacks were opened, a soft and mouldy paste was distributed to the army. Such unwholesome food, assisted by the heat of the climate and season, soon produced an epidemical disease, which swept away five hundred soldiers. Their health was restored by the diligence of Belisarius, who provided fresh bread at Methone, and boldly expressed his just and humane indignation. The emperor heard his complaint. The general was praised, but the minister was not punished. From the port of Methone, the pilots steered along the western coast of Peloponnesus, as far as the Isle of Zacynthus or Sant, before they undertook the voyage, in their eyes a most arduous voyage, of one hundred leagues over the Ionian Sea. As the fleet was surprised by a calm, sixteen days were consumed in the slow navigation and even the general would have suffered the intolerable hardship of thirst, if the ingenuity of Antonina had not preserved the water in glass bottles, which she buried deep in the sand in a part of the ship impervious to the rays of the sun. At length the harbour of Corcana, 12 on the southern side of Sicily, afforded a secure and hospitable shelter. The Gothic officers who governed the island in the name of the daughter and grandson of Theodoric obeyed their imprudent orders to receive the troops of Justinian like friends and allies, provisions were liberally supplied, the cavalry was remounted, and Procopius soon returned from Syracuse with correct information of the state and designs of the Vandals. His intelligence determined Belisarius to hasten his operations, and his wise impatience was seconded by the winds. The fleet lost sight of Sicily, passed before the Isle of Malta, discovered the capes of Africa, ran along the coast with a strong gale from the northeast, and finally cast anchor at the promontory of Caput Vada, about five days journey to the south of Carthage. If Julima had been informed of the approach of the enemy, he must have delayed the conquest of Sardinia, for the immediate defence of his person and kingdom. A detachment of five thousand soldiers, and one hundred and twenty galleys, would have joined the remaining forces of the Vandals, and the descendant of Gensric might have surprised and oppressed a fleet of deep laden transports incapable of action, and of light brigantines that seemed only qualified for flight. Belisarius had secretly trembled when he overheard his soldiers, in the passage, emboldening each other to confess their apprehensions, if they were once on shore, they hoped to maintain the honour of their arms, but, if they should be attacked at sea, they did not blush to acknowledge that they wanted courage to contend at the same time with the winds, the waves, and the barbarians. 
the knowledge of their sentiments decided Belisarius to seize the first opportunity of landing them on the coast of Africa, and he prudently rejected, in a council of war, the proposal of sailing with the fleet and army into the port of Carthage. Three months after their departure from Constantinople, the men and horses, the arms and military stores, were safely disembarked, and five soldiers were left as a guard on board each of the ships, which were disposed in the form of a semicircle. The remainder of the troops occupied a camp on the seashore, which they fortified, according to ancient discipline, with a ditch and rampart, and the discovery of a source of fresh water, while it allayed the thirst, excited the superstitious confidence, of the Romans. The next morning, some of the neighboring gardens were pillaged, and Belisarius, after chastising the offenders, embraced the slight occasion, but the decisive moment, of inculcating the maxims of justice, moderation, and genuine policy. When I first accepted the commission of subduing Africa, I depended much less, said the general, on the numbers, or even the bravery, of my troops, than upon the friendly disposition of the natives and their immortal hatred to the Vandals. You alone can deprive me of this hope, if you continue to extort by rapine, what might be purchased for a little money, such acts of violence will reconcile these implacable enemies, and unite them in a just and holy league against the invaders of their country. These exhortations were enforced by a rigid discipline, of which the soldiers themselves soon felt and praised the salutary effects. The inhabitants, instead of deserting their houses, or hiding their corn, supplied the Romans with a fair and liberal market, the civil officers of the province continued to exercise their functions in the name of Justinian, and the clergy, from motives of conscience and interest, assiduously labored to promote the cause of a Catholic emperor. The small town of Select, 15 one day's journey from the camp, had the honor of being foremost to open her gates and to resume her ancient allegiance. The larger cities of Leptis and Adrumtum imitated the example of loyalty as soon as Belisarius appeared, and he advanced without opposition as far as Grass, a palace of the Vandal kings at the distance of fifty miles from Carthage. The weary Romans indulged themselves in the refreshment of shady groves, cool fountains, and delicious fruits, and the preference which Procopius allows to these gardens over any that he had seen either in the east or west, may be ascribed either to the taste or the fatigue of the historian. In three generations prosperity and a warm climate had dissolved the hardy virtue of the Vandals, who insensibly became the most luxurious of mankind. In their villas and gardens, which might deserve the Persian name of Paradise, 16 they enjoyed a cool and elegant repose, and, after the daily use of the bath, the barbarians were seated at a table profusely spread with the delicacies of the land and sea. Their silken robes loosely flowing after the fashion of the meds, were embroidered with gold, love and hunting were the labors of their life, and their vacant hours were amused by pantomimes, chariot races, and the music and dances of the theater. In a march of ten or twelve days, the vigilance of Belisarius was constantly awakened active against his unseen enemies, by whom, in every place and at every hour, he might be suddenly attacked. An officer of confidence and merit, John the Armenian, led the vanguards of three hundred horse, six hundred Massagete covered at a certain distance the left flank, and the whole fleet steering along the coast, seldom lost sight of the army, which moved each day about twelve miles, and lodged in the evening in strong camps or in friendly towns. The near approach of the Romans to Carthage filled the mind of Jelima with anxiety and terror. He prudently wished to protract the war till his brother, with his veteran troops, should return from the conquest of Sardinia, and he now lamented the rash policy of his ancestors, who, by destroying the fortifications of Africa, had left him only the dangerous resource of risking a battle in the neighborhood of his capital. The Vandal conquerors, from their original number of fifty thousand, were multiplied, without including their women and children, to 160,000 fighting men, and such forces, animated with valor and union, might have crushed, at their first landing, the feeble and exhausted bands of the Roman general. 
but the friends of the captive king were more inclined to accept the invitations, than to resist the progress, of Belisarius, and many a proud barbarian disguised his aversion to war under the more specious name of his hatred to the usurper. Yet the authority and promises of Jelima collected a formidable army, and his plans were concerted with some degree of military skill. An order was dispatched to his brother Amatas, to collect all the forces of Carthage and to encounter the van of the Roman army at the distance of ten miles from the city. His nephew Gibbermund, with two thousand horse, was destined to attack their left, when the monarch himself, who silently followed, should charge their rear in a situation which excluded them from the aid or even the view of their fleet. But the rashness of Amatas was fatal to himself and his country. He anticipated the hour of attack, outstripped his tardy followers, and was pierced with a mortal wound, after he had slain, with his own hand, twelve of his boldest antagonists. His vandals fled to Carthage. The highway, almost ten miles, was strewed with dead bodies, and it seemed incredible that such multitudes could be slaughtered by the swords of three hundred Romans. The nephew of Jelima was defeated after a slight combat by the six hundred Massagit, they did not equal the third part of his numbers, but each Scythian was fired by the example of his chief, who gloriously exercised the privilege of his family by riding foremost and alone to shoot the first arrow against the enemy. In the meanwhile, Jelima himself, ignorant of the event, and misguided by the windings of the hills, inadvertently passed the Roman army and reached the scene of action where Amatas had fallen. He wept the fate of his brother and of Carthage, charged with irresistible fury the advancing squadrons, and might have pursued, and perhaps decided the victory, if he had not wasted those inestimable moments in the discharge of a vain, though bias, duty to the dead. While his spirit was broken by this mournful office, he heard the trumpet of Belisarius, who, leaving Antonina and his infantry in the camp, pressed forwards with his guards and the remainder of the cavalry to rally his flying troops and to restore the fortune of the day. Much room could not be found in this disorderly battle for the talents of a general, but the king fled before the hero, and the vandals, accustomed only to a Moorish enemy, were incapable of withstanding the arms and discipline of the Romans. Jelima retired with hasty steps towards the desert of Numidia but he had soon the consolation of learning that his private orders for the execution of Hildric and his captive friends had been faithfully obeyed. The tyrant's revenge was useful only to his enemies. The death of a lawful prince excited the compassion of his people, his life might have perplexed the victorious Romans, and the lieutenant of Justinian, by a crime of which he was innocent, was relieved from the painful alternative of forfeiting his honor or relinquishing his conquests. As soon as the tumult had subsided, the several parts of the army informed each other of the accidents of the day, and Belisarius pitched his camp on the field of victory, to which the tenth milestone from Carthage had applied the Latin appellation of Decimus. From a wise suspicion of the stratagems and resources of the Vandals, he marched the next day in order of battle halted in the evening before the gates of Carthage, and allowed a night of repose, that he might not in darkness and disorder expose the city to the licentiousness of the soldiers or the soldiers themselves to the secret ambush of the city. But, as the fears of Belisarius were the result of calm and intrepid reason, he was soon satisfied that he might confide, without danger, in the peaceful and friendly aspect of the capital. Carthage blazed with innumerable torches, the signals of the public joy, the chain was removed that guarded the entrance of the port, the gates were thrown open, and the people, with acclamations of gratitude, hailed and invited their Roman deliverers. The defeat of the Vandals and the freedom of Africa were announced to the city on the eve of St. Cyprian, when the churches were already adorned and illuminated for the festival of the martyr whom three centuries of superstition had almost raised to a local deity. The Arians, conscious that their reign had expired, resigned the temple to the Catholics, who rescued their saint from profane hands, performed the holy rite, and loudly proclaimed the greed of Athanasius and Justinian. One awful hour reversed the fortunes of the contending parties. The suppliant Vandals, 
who had so lately indulged the vices of conquerors, sought an humble refuge in the sanctuary of the church, while the merchants of the east were delivered from the deepest dungeon of the palace by their affrighted keeper, who implored the protection of his captors, and showed them, through an aperture in the wall, the sails of the Roman fleet. After their separation from the army, the naval commanders had proceeded with slow caution along the coast, till they reached the Hermian promontory and obtained the first intelligence of the victory of Belisarius. Faithful to his instructions, they would have cast anchor about twenty miles from Carthage, if the more skilful seamen had not represented the perils of the shore and the signs of an impending tempest. Still ignorant of the revolution, they declined. However, the rash attempt of forcing the chain of the port, and the adjacent harbour and suburb of Mandracium were insulted only by the rapine of a private officer who disobeyed and deserted his leaders. But the imperial fleet, advancing with a fair wind, steered through the narrow entrance of the Goleta, and occupied in the deep and capacious lake of Tunis a secure station about five miles from the capital. No sooner was Belisarius informed of their arrival than he dispatched orders that the greatest part of the mariners should be immediately landed to join the triumph, and to swell the apparent numbers, of the Romans. Before he allowed them to enter the gates of Carthage, he exhorted them, in a discourse worthy of himself and the occasion, not to disgrace the glory of their arms, and to remember that the Vandals had been the tyrants, but that there were the deliverers, of the Africans, who must now be respected as the voluntary and affectionate subjects of their common sovereign. The Romans marched through the streets in close ranks, prepared for battle if an enemy had appeared, the strict order maintained by the general imprinted on their minds the duty of obedience, and, in an age in which custom and impunity almost sanctified the abuse of conquest, the genius of one man repressed the passions of a victorious army. The voice of menace and complaint was silent, the trade of Carthage was not interrupted, while Africa changed her master and her government, the shops continued open and busy, and the soldiers, after sufficient guards had been posted, modestly departed to the houses which were allotted for their reception. Belisarius fixed his residence in the palace, seated himself on the throne of Genseric, accepted and distributed the barbaric spoil granted their lives to the suppliant vandals, and laboured to repair the damage which the suburb of Mandracium had sustained in the preceding night. At supper he entertained his principal officers with the form and magnificence of a royal banquet. The victor was respectfully served by the captive officers of the household, and in the moments of festivity, when the impartial spectators applauded the fortune and merit of Belisarius. His envious flatterers secretly shed their venom on every word and gesture which might alarm the suspicions of a jealous monarch. One day was given to these pompous scenes, which may not be despised as useless, if they attracted the popular veneration, but the active mind of Belisarius, which in the pride of victory could suppose a defeat, had already resolved that the Roman Empire in Africa should not depend on the chance of arms or the favour of the people. The fortifications of Carthage had alone been exempted from the general prescription, but in the reign of ninety-five years they were suffered to decay by the thoughtless and indolent vandals. A wiser conqueror is toward with incredible dispatch the walls and ditches of the city. His liberality encouraged the workmen, the soldiers, the mariners, and the citizens, vied with each other in the salutary labour, and Jelima, who had feared to trust his person in an open town beheld with astonishment and despair the rising strength of an impregnable fortress. That unfortunate monarch, after the loss of his capital, applied himself to collect the remains of an army scattered, rather than destroyed, by the preceding battle, and the hopes of pillage attracted some Moorish bands to the standard of Jelima. He encamped in the fields of Bulla, four days' journey from Carthage, insulted the capital, which he deprived of the use of an aqueduct, proposed an high reward for the head of every Roman, affected to spare the persons and property of his African subjects, and secretly negotiated with the Aryan sectaries and the confederate Huns. Under these circumstances, the conquest of Sardinia served only to aggravate his distress, he reflected, with the deepest anguish, 
that he had wasted in that useless enterprise five thousand of his bravest troops, and he read, with grief and shame, the victorious letter of his brother Zano, who expressed a sanguine confidence that the king, after the example of their ancestors, had already chastised the rashness of the Roman invader. Alas! My brother, replied Jelima, heaven has declared against our unhappy nation. While you have subdued Sardinia, we have lost Africa. No sooner did Belisarius appear with a handful of soldiers than courage and prosperity deserted the cause of the Vandals. Your nephew Gibbamund, your brother Amatus, have been betrayed to death by the cowardice of their followers. Our horses, our ships, Carthage itself, and all Africa, are in the power of the enemy. Yet the Vandals still prefer an ignominious repose at the expense of their wives and children, their wealth and liberty. Nothing now remains except the field of Bulla and the hope of your valour. Abandon Sardinia, fly to our relief, restore our empire, or perish by our side. On the receipt of this epistle, Zano imparted his grief to the principal vandals, but the intelligence was prudently concealed from the natives of the island. The troops embarked in 120 galleys at the port of Cagliari, cast anchor the third day on the confines of Mauritania and hastily pursued their march to join the royal standard in the camp of Bulla. Mournful was the interview, the two brothers embraced, they wept in silence, no questions were asked of the Sardinian victory, no inquiries were made of the African misfortunes, they saw before their eyes the whole extent of their calamities, and the absence of their wives and child n afforded a melancholy proof that either death or captivity had been their lot. The language spirit of the Vandals was at length awakened and united by the entreaties of their king, the example of Zeno, and the instant danger which threatened their monarchy and religion. The military strength of the nation advanced to battle, and such was the rapid increase that, before their army reached Tricameron, about twenty miles from Carthage, they might boast, perhaps with some exaggeration, that they surpassed, in a tenfold proportion the diminutive powers of the Romans. But these powers were under the command of Belisarius, and, as he was conscious of their superior merit, he permitted the barbarians to surprise him at an unseasonable hour. The Romans were instantly under arms, a rivulet covered their front, the cavalry formed the first line, which Belisarius supported in the centre, at the head of five hundred guards, the infantry, at some distance, was posted in the second line, and the vigilance of the general watched the separate station and ambiguous faith of the Massagit, who secretly reserved their aid for the conquerors. The historian has inserted, and the reader may easily supply, the speeches nineteen of the commanders, who, by arguments the most apposite to their situation, inculcated the importance of victory and the contempt of life. Zano with the troops which had followed him to the conquest of Sardinia, was placed in the centre, and the throne of Genseric might have stood, if the multitude of Vandals had imitated their intrepid resolution. Casting away their lances and missile weapons, they drew their swords, and expected the charge, the Roman cavalry thrice passed the rivulet, they were thrice repulsed, and the conflict was firmly maintained, till Zano fell and the standard of Belisarius was displayed. Gelima retreated to his camp, the Huns joined the pursuit, and the victors despoiled the bodies of the slain. Yet no more than fifty Romans and eight hundred Vandals were found on the field of battle, so inconsiderable was the carnage of a day which extinguished a nation and transferred the empire of Africa. In the evening Belisarius led his infantry to the attack of the camp, and the pusillanimous flight of Jelima exposed the vanity of his recent declarations that, to the vanquished, death was a relief, life a burthen, and infamy the only object of terror. His departure was secret, but, as soon as the Vandals discovered that their king had deserted them, they hastily dispersed, anxious only for their personal safety, and careless of every object that is dear or valuable to mankind. The Romans entered the camp without resistance, and the wildest scenes of disorder were veiled in the darkness and confusion of the night. Every barbarian who met their swords was inhumanly massacred, their widows and daughters, as rich as or beautiful concubines, 
were embraced by the licentious soldiers, and avarice itself was almost satiated with the treasures of gold and silver, the accumulated fruits of conquest or economy in a long period of prosperity and peace. In this frantic search, the troops even of Belisarius forgot their caution and respect. Intoxicated with lust and rapine, they explored, in small parties, or alone, the adjacent fields, the woods, the rocks, and the caverns, that might possibly conceal any desirable prize, laden with booty, they deserted their ranks, and wandered, without a guide, on the high road to Carthage, and, if the flying enemies had dared to return, very few of the conquerors would have escaped. Deeply sensible of the disgrace and danger, Belisarius passed an apprehensive night on the field of victory, at the dawn of day he planted his standard on a hill, recalled his guards and veterans, and gradually restored the modesty and obedience of the camp. It was equally the concern of the Roman general to subdue the hostile, and to save the prostrate, barbarian, and the suppliant vandals, who could be found only in churches, were protected by his authority, disarmed, and separately confined, that they might neither disturb the public peace nor become the victims of popular revenge. After dispatching a light detachment to tread the footsteps of Jelima, he advanced with his whole army, about ten days' march, as far as Hippo Regius, which no longer possessed the relics of Street Augustine. The season, and the certain intelligence that the Vandal had fled to the inaccessible country of the Moors, determined Belisarius to relinquish the vain pursuit and to fix his winter quarters at Carthage. From thence he dispatched his principal lieutenant, to inform the emperor that, in the space of three months, he had achieved the conquest of Africa. Belisarius spoke the language of truth. The surviving Vandals yielded, without resistance, their arms and their freedom, the neighborhood of Carthage submitted to his presence, and the more distant provinces were successively subdued by the report of his victory. Tripoli was confirmed in her voluntary allegiance, Sardinia and Corsica surrendered to an officer, who carried, instead of a sword, the head of the valiant Zano, and the isles of Majorca, Minorca, and Yuka, consented to remain an humble appendage of the African kingdom. Caesarea, a royal city, which in Luke's geography may be confounded with the modern Algiers, was situate thirty days' march to the westward of Carthage, by land the road was infested by the Moors, but the sea was open and the Romans were now masters of the sea. An active and discreet tribune sailed as far as the Straits, where he occupied Septimor Suta, 21 which rises opposite to Gibraltar on the African coast, that remote place was afterwards adorned and fortified by Justinian, and he seems to have indulged the vain ambition of extending his empire to the columns of Hercules. He received the messengers of victory at the time when he was preparing to publish the pandects of the Roman law, and the devout or jealous emperor celebrated the divine goodness, and confessed in silence the merit of his successful general. Impatient to abolish the temporal and spiritual tyranny of the Vandals, he proceeded, without delay, to the full establishment of the Catholic Church. Her jurisdiction, wealth, and immunities perhaps the most essential part of episcopal religion, were restored and amplified with a liberal hand, the Arian worship was suppressed, the Donatist meetings were prescribed, and the Synod of Carthage, by the voice of 217 bishops, 22 applauded the just measure of pious retaliation. On such an occasion, it may not be presumed that many orthodox prelates were absent, but the comparative smallness of their number, which in ancient councils had been twice or even thrice multiplied, most clearly indicates the decay both of the church and state. While Justinian approved himself the defender of the faith, he entertained an ambitious hope that his victorious lieutenant would speedily enlarge the narrow limits of his dominion to the space which they occupied before the invasion of the Moors and Vandals, and Belisarius was instructed to establish five dukes or commanders in the convenient stations of Tripoli, Leptis, Serta, Caesarea, and Sardinia, and to compute the military force of Palatines or borderers that might be sufficient for the defense of Africa. 
the kingdom of the Vandals was not unworthy of the presence of a Praetorian prefect, and four consulars, three presidents, were appointed to administer the seven provinces under his civil jurisdiction. The number of their subordinate officers, clerks, messengers, or assistants, was minutely expressed, 396 for the prefect himself, 50 for each of his vicegerents, and the rigid definition of their fees and salaries was more effectual to confirm the right than to prevent the abuse. These magistrates might be oppressive, but they were not idle, and the subtle questions of justice and revenue were infinitely propagated under the new government, which professed to revive the freedom and equity of the Roman Republic. The conqueror was solicitous to extract a prompt and plentiful supply from his African subjects, and he allowed them to claim, even in the third degree, and from the collateral line, the houses and lands of which their families had been unjustly despoiled by the Vandals. After the departure of Belisarius, who acted by an higher and special commission, no ordinary provision was made for a master general of the forces but the office of Praetorian Prefect was entrusted to a soldier, the civil and military powers were united, according to the practice of Justinian, in the chief governor, and the representative of the emperor in Africa, as well as in Italy, was soon distinguished by the appellation of Exarch. Yet the conquest of Africa was imperfect, till her former sovereign was delivered either alive or dead into the hands of the Romans. Doubtful of the event, Julima had given secret orders that a part of his treasure should be transported to Spain, where he hoped to find a secure refuge at the court of the king of the Visigoths. But these intentions were disappointed by accident, treachery, and the indefatigable pursuit of his enemies, who intercepted his flight from the seashore, and chased the unfortunate monarch, with some faithful followers to the inaccessible mountain of Papia, 23 in the inland country of Numidia. He was immediately besieged by Foras, an officer whose truth and sobriety were the more applauded, as such qualities could seldom be found among the Heruli, the most corrupt of the barbarian tribes. To his vigilance Belisarius had entrusted this important charge, and, after a bold attempt to scale the mountain, in which he lost an hundred and ten soldiers, for as expected, during a winter siege, the operation of distress and famine on the mind of the Vandal king. From the softest habits of pleasure, from the unbounded command of industry and wealth, he was reduced to share the poverty of the Moors, 24 supportable only to themselves by their ignorance of a happier condition. In their rude hovels of mud and hurdles, which confined the smoke and excluded the light, they promiscuously slept on the ground perhaps on a sheepskin, with their wives, their children, and their cattle. Sordid and scanty were their garments, the use of bread and wine was unknown, and their oate and or barley cakes, imperfectly baked in the ashes, were devoured almost in a crude state by the hungry savages. The health of Jelima must have sunk under these strange and unwonted hardships, from whatsoever cause they had been endured but his actual misery was embittered by the recollection of past greatness, the daily insolence of his protectors, and the just apprehension that the light and venal moors might be tempted to betray the rights of hospitality. The knowledge of his situation dictated the humane and friendly epistle of Furs. Like yourself, said the chief of the Heruli, I am an illiterate barbarian, but I speak the language of plain sense and an honest heart. Why will you persist in hopeless obstinacy? Why will you ruin yourself, your family, and nation? The love of freedom and abhorrence of slavery? Alas! My dearest Jelima, are you not already the worst of slaves, the slave of the vile nation of the Moors? Would it not be preferable to sustain at Constantinople a life of poverty and servitude, rather than to reign the undoubted monarch of the mountain of Papua? Do you think it a disgrace to be the subject of Justinian? Belisarius is his subject, and we ourselves, whose birth is not inferior to your own, are not ashamed of our obedience to the Roman Emperor. That generous prince will grant you a rich inheritance of lands, a place in the Senate, and the dignity of patrician, such are his gracious intentions, and you may depend with full assurance on the word of Belisarius. So long as heaven has condemned us to suffer, patience is a virtue. But, if we reject the proffered deliverance, 
it degenerates into blind and stupid despair. I am not insensible, replied the king of the Vandals, how kind and rational is your advice. But I cannot persuade myself to become the slave of an unjust enemy, who has deserved my implacable hatred. Him I had never injured either by word or deed, yet he has sent against me, I know not from whence, a certain Berlizarius, who has cast me headlong from the throne into this abyss of misery. Justinian is a man, he is a prince, does he not dread for himself a similar reverse of fortune? I can write no more, my grief oppresses me. Send me, I beseech you, my dear Ferrers, send me a liar, comma twenty-five a sponge, and a loaf of bread. From the Vandal messenger, Ferrers was informed of the motives of this singular request. It was long since the King of Africa had tasted bread, a defluxion had fallen on his eyes, the effect of fatigue or incessant weeping, and he wished to solace the melancholy hours by singing to the lyre the sad story of his own misfortunes. The humanity of Ferrers was moved, he sent the three extraordinary gifts, but even his humanity prompted him to redouble the vigilance of his guard, that he might sooner compel his prisoner to embrace a resolution advantageous to the Romans, but salutary to himself. The obstinacy of Jalima at length yielded to reason and necessity, the solemn assurances of safety and honourable treatment were ratified in the Emperor's name, by the ambassador of Berlizarius, and the King of the Vandals descended from the mountain. The first public interview was in one of the suburbs of Carthage, and, when the royal captive accosted his conqueror, he burst into a fit of laughter. The crowd might naturally believe that extreme grief had deprived Jalima of his senses, but in this mournful state unseasonable mirth insinuated to more intelligent observers that the vain and transitory scenes of human greatness are unworthy of a serious thought. Their contempt was soon justified by a new example of a vulgar truth, that flattery adheres to power, and envy to superior merit. The chiefs of the Roman army presumed to think themselves the rivals of an hero. Their private dispatches maliciously affirmed that the conqueror of Africa, strong in his reputation and the public love, conspired to seat himself on the throne of the Vandals. Justinian listened with too patient an ear, and his silence was the result of jealousy rather than of confidence. An honourable alternative, of remaining in the province or of returning to the capital, was indeed submitted to the discretion of Belisarius, but he wisely concluded, from intercepted letters and the knowledge of his sovereign's temper, that he must either resign his head, erect his standard, or confound his enemies by his presence and submission. Innocence and courage decided his choice. His guards, captives, and treasures were diligently embarked, and so prosperous was the navigation that his arrival at Constantinople preceded any certain account of his departure from the port of Carthage. Such unsuspecting loyalty removed the apprehensions of Justinian, envy was silenced and inflamed by the public gratitude, and the third Africanus obtained the honours of a triumph, a ceremony which the city of Constantine had never seen, and which ancient Rome, since the reign of Tiberius, had reserved for the auspicious arms of the Caesars. From the palace of Berlizarius, the procession was conducted through the principal streets to the Hippodrome, and this memorable day seemed to avenge the injuries of Genseric, and to expiate the shame of the Romans. The wealth of nations was displayed, the trophies of martial law in effeminate luxury, rich armour, golden thrones, and the chariots of state which had been used by the Vandal Queen the massy furniture of the royal banquet, the splendour of precious stones, the elegant forms of statues and vases, the more substantial treasure of gold, and the holy vessels of the Jewish temple, which, after their long peregrination, were respectfully deposited in the Christian church of Jerusalem. A long train of the noblest vandals reluctantly exposed their lofty stature and manly countenance. Jelima slowly advanced. He was clad in a purple robe, and still maintained the majesty of a king. Not a tear escaped from his eyes, not a sigh was heard, but his pride or piety derived some secret consolation from the words of Solomon, 28, which he repeatedly pronounced, Vanity! Vanity! All is vanity! Instead of ascending a triumphal car drawn by four horses or elephants, 
the modest conqueror marched on foot at the head of his brave companions, his prudence might decline an honor too conspicuous for a subject, and his magnanimity might justly disdain what had been so often sullied by the vilest of tyrants. The glorious procession entered the gate of the Hippodrome, was saluted by the acclamations of the Senate and people, and halted before the throne where Justinian and Theodora were seated to receive the homage of the captive monarch and the victorious hero. They both performed the customary adoration, and, falling prostrate on the ground, respectfully touched the footstool of a prince who had not unsheathed his sword, and of a prostitute who had danced in the theatre. Some gentle violence was used to bend the stubborn spirit of the grandson of Genseric, and, however trained to servitude, the genius of Belisarius must have secretly rebelled. He was immediately declared consul for the ensuing year, and the day of his inauguration resembled the pomp of a second triumph. His curule chair was borne aloft on the shoulders of captive vandals, and the spoils of war, gold cups, and rich girdles, were profusely scattered among the populace. But the purest reward of Belisarius was in the faithful execution of a treaty for which his honour had been pledged to the king of the Vandals. The religious scruples of Jelima, who adhered to the Arian heresy, were incompatible with the dignity of senator or patrician, but he received from the emperor an ample estate in the province of Galatia, where the abdicated monarch retired with his family and friends, to a life of peace of affluence, and perhaps of content. The daughters of Hildric were entertained with the respectful tenderness due to their age and misfortune, and Justinian and Theodora accepted the honour of educating and enriching the female descendants of the great Theodosius. The bravest of the Vandal youth were distributed into five squadrons of cavalry, which adopted the name of their benefactor, and supported in the Persian wars the glory of their ancestors. But these rare exceptions, the reward of birth or valour, are insufficient to explain the fate of a nation, whose numbers, before a short and bloodless war, amounted to more than six hundred thousand persons. After the exile of their king and nobles, the servile crowd might purchase their safety by abjuring their character, religion, and language, and their degenerate posterity would be insensibly mingled with the common herd of African subjects. Yet even in the present age, and in the heart of the Moorish tribes, a curious traveller has discovered the white complexion and long flaxen hair of a northern race semicolon 30 and it was formerly believed that the boldest of the Vandals fled beyond the power, or even the knowledge, of the Romans, to enjoy their solitary freedom on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Africa had been their empire, it became their prison, nor could they entertain in hope, or even a wish, of returning to the banks of the Elbe where their brethren, of a spirit less adventurous, still wandered in their native forests. It was impossible for cowards to surmount the barriers of unknown seas and hostile barbarians, it was impossible for brave men to expose their nakedness and defeat before the eyes of their countrymen, to describe the kingdoms which they had lost, and to claim a share of the humble inheritance which, in a happier hour, they had almost unanimously renounced. In the country between the Elbe and the Oder, several populous villages of Luxatia are inhabited by the Vandals, they still preserve their language, their customs, and the purity of their blood, support with some impatience the Saxon or Prussian yoke, and serve with secret and voluntary allegiance the descendant of their ancient kings, who in his garb and present fortune is confounded with the meanest of his vassals. The name and situation of this unhappy people might indicate their descent from one common stock with the conquerors of Africa. But the use of a Sclavonian dialect more clearly represents them as the last remnant of the new colonies, who succeeded to the genuine Vandals, already scattered or destroyed in the age of Procopius. If Belisarius had been tempted to hesitate in his allegiance, he might have urged, even against the emperor himself the indispensable duty of saving Africa from an enemy more barbarous than the Vandals. The origin of the Moors is involved in darkness, they were ignorant of the use of letters. Their limits cannot be precisely defined, a boundless continent was opened to the Libyan shepherds, the change of seasons and pastures regulated their motions, and their rude huts and slender furniture were transported with the same ease as their arms. 
their families, and their cattle, which consisted of sheep, oxen, and camels. During the vigor of the Roman power, they observed a respectable distance from Carthage and the seashore, under the feeble reign of the Vandals they invaded the cities of Numidia, occupied the sea coast from Dangia to Caesarea, and pitched their camps, with impunity, in the fertile province of Byzacium. The formidable strength and artful conduct of Belisarius secured the neutrality of the Moorish princes, whose vanity aspired to receive, in the emperor's name, the ensigns of their regal dignity. They were astonished by the rapid event, and trembled in the presence of their conqueror. But his approaching departure soon relieved the apprehensions of a savage and superstitious people, the number of their wives allowed them to disregard the safety of their infant hostages, and, when the Roman general hoisted sail in the port of Carthage, he heard the cries, and almost beheld the flames, of the desolated province. Yet he persisted in his resolution, and, leaving only a part of his guards to reinforce the feeble garrisons, he entrusted the command of Africa to the eunuch Solomon, 37 who proved himself not unworthy to be the successor of Belisarius. In the first invasion, some detachments, with two officers of merit, were surprised and intercepted, but Solomon speedily assembled his troops, marched from Carthage into the heart of the country, and in two great battles destroyed sixty thousand of the barbarians. The Moors depended on their multitude, their swiftness, and their inaccessible mountains, and the aspect and smell of their camels are said to have produced some confusion in the Roman cavalry. But, as soon as they were commanded to dismount, they derided this contemptible obstacle, as soon as the columns ascended the hills, the naked and disorderly crowd was dazzled by glittering arms and regular evolutions, and the menace of their female prophets was repeatedly fulfilled, that the Moors should be discomfited by a beardless antagonist. The victorious eunuch advanced thirteen days' journey from Carthage, to besiege Mount Orasius, 39 the citadel, and at the same time the garden, of Numidia. That range of hills, a branch of the great Atlas, contains within a circumference of 120 miles, a rare variety of soil and climate, the intermediate valleys and elevated plains abound with rich pastures, perpetual streams, and fruits of a delicious taste and uncommon magnitude. This fair solitude is decorated with the ruins of Lambassa, a Roman city, once the seat of a legion and the residence of 40,000 inhabitants. The Ionic temple of Aesculapius is encompassed with Moorish huts, and the cattle now graze in the midst of an amphitheatre, under the shade of Corinthian columns. A sharp perpendicular rock rises above the level of the mountain, where the African princes deposited their wives and treasures, and a proverb is familiar to the Arabs, that the man may eat fire, who dares to attack the craggy cliffs and inhospitable natives of Mount Orasius. This hardy enterprise was twice attempted by the eunuch Solomon, from the first he retreated with some disgrace, and in the second, his patience and provisions were almost exhausted, and he must again have retired, if he had not yielded to the impetuous courage of his troops, who audaciously scaled, to the astonishment of the Moors, the mountain the hostile camp, and the summit of the Geminian rock. A citadel was erected to secure this important conquest, and to remind the barbarians of their defeat, and, as Solomon pursued his march to the west, the long-lost province of Mauritanian Sitifi was again annexed to the Roman Empire. The Moorish war continued several years after the departure of Belisarius but the laurels which he resigned to a faithful lieutenant may be justly ascribed to his own triumph. The experience of past faults, which may sometimes correct the mature age of an individual, is seldom profitable to the successive generations of mankind. The nations of antiquity, careless of each other's safety, were separately vanquished and enslaved by the Romans. This awful lesson might have instructed the barbarians of the West to oppose with timely counsels and confederate arms, the unbounded ambition of Justinian. Yet the same error was repeated, the same consequences were felt, and the Goths, both of Italy and Spain, insensible of their approaching danger, beheld with indifference, and even with joy, 
the rapid downfall of the Vandals. After the failure of the royal line, Theudes, a valiant and powerful chief, ascended the throne of Spain, which he had formerly administered in the name of Theodoric and his infant grandison. Under his command the Visigoths besieged the fortress of Ceuta on the African coast, but, while they spent the Sabbath day in peace and devotion, the pious security of their camp was invaded by a sally from the town, and the king himself, with some difficulty and danger, escaped from the hands of a sacrilegious enemy. It was not long before his pride and resentment were gratified by a suppliant embassy from the unfortunate Chulima, who implored, in his distress, the aid of the Spanish monarch. But, instead of sacrificing these unworthy passions to the dictates of generosity and prudence, Theudes amused the ambassadors, till he was secretly informed of the loss of Carthage, and then dismissed them with obscure and contemptuous advice, to seek in their native country a true knowledge of the state of the Vandals. The long continuance of the Italian war delayed the punishment of the Visigoths, and the eyes of Theudes were closed before they tasted the fruits of his mistaken policy. After his death, the sceptre of Spain was disputed by a civil war. The weaker candidate solicited the protection of Justinian, and ambitiously subscribed a treaty of alliance, which deeply wounded the independence and happiness of his country. Several cities, both on the ocean and the Mediterranean, were ceded to the Roman troops, who afterwards refused to evacuate those pledges, as it should seem, either of safety or payment, and, as they were fortified by perpetual supplies from Africa, they maintained their impregnable stations, for the mischievous purpose of inflaming the civil and religious factions of the barbarians. Seventy years elapsed before this painful thorn could be extirpated from the bosom of the monarchy, and, as long as the emperors retained any share of these remote and useless possessions, their vanity might number Spain in the list of their provinces, and the successors of Alaric in the rank of their vassals. The error of the Goths who reigned in Italy was less excusable than that of their Spanish brethren, and their punishment was still more immediate and terrible. From a motive of private revenge, they enabled their most dangerous enemy to destroy their most valuable ally. A sister of the great Theodoric had been given in marriage to Thrasim and the African king, on this occasion, the fortress of Lilabasham 41 in Sicily was resigned to the Vandals, and the princess Amala Frida was attended by a martial train of 1,000 nobles, and 5,000 Gothic soldiers, who signalized their valor in the Moorish wars. Their merit was overrated by themselves, and perhaps neglected by the Vandals, they viewed the country with envy, and the conquerors with disdain, but their real or fictitious conspiracy was prevented by a massacre, the Goths were oppressed, and the captivity of Amala Frida was soon followed by her secret and suspicious death. The eloquent pen of Cassiodorus was employed to reproach the Vandal court with the cruel violation of every social and public duty, but the vengeance which he threatened in the name of his sovereign might be derided with impunity, as long as Africa was protected by the sea, and the Goths were destitute of a navy. In the blind impotence of grief and indignation, they joyfully saluted the approach of the Romans, entertained the fleet of Belisarius in the ports of Sicily, and were speedily delighted or alarmed by the surprising intelligence that their revenge was executed beyond the measure of their hopes. Or perhaps of their wishes. To their friendship the emperor was indebted for the kingdom of Africa, and the Goths might reasonably think that they were entitled to resume the possession of a barren rock, so recently separated as a nuptial gift from the island of Sicily. They were soon undeceived by the haughty mandate of Belisarius, which excited their tardy and unavailing repentance. The city and promontory of Lilibium, said the Roman general, belonged to the Vandals, and I claim them by the right of conquest. Your submission may deserve the favor of the emperor. Your obstinacy will provoke his displeasure, and must kindle a war that can terminate only in your utter ruin. If you compel us to take up arms, we shall contend, not to regain the possession of a single city, but to deprive you of all the provinces which you unjustly withhold from their lawful sovereign. A nation of two hundred thousand soldiers might have smiled at the vain menace of Justinian and his lieutenant, 
but a spirit of discord and disaffection prevailed in Italy, and the Goths supported, with reluctance, the indignity of a female reign. The birth of Marlesantha, the regent and queen of Italy, united the two most illustrious families of the barbarians. Her mother, the sister of Clovis, was descended from the long haired kings of the Merovingian race, semicolon 42, and the regal succession of the Imli was illustrated in the 11th generation by her father, the great Theodoric, whose merit might have ennobled a plebeian origin. The sex of his daughter excluded her from the Gothic throne, but his vigilant tenderness for his family and his people discovered the last heir of the royal line, whose ancestors had taken refuge in Spain and the fortunate Eutaric was suddenly exalted to the rank of a consul and a prince. He enjoyed only a short time the charms of Marlesantha, and the hopes of the succession, and his widow, after the death of her husband and father, was left the guardian of her son Athalaric, and the kingdom of Italy. At the age of about twenty-eight years, the endowments of her mind and person had attained their perfect maturity. Her beauty, which, in the apprehension of Theodora herself, might have disputed the conquest of an emperor, was animated by manly sense, activity, and resolution. Education and experience had cultivated her talents, her philosophic studies were exempt from vanity, and, though she expressed herself with equal elegance and ease in the Greek, the Latin, and the Gothic tongue, the daughter of Theodoric maintained in her councils a discreet and impenetrable silence. By a faithful imitation of the virtues, she revived the prosperity, of his reign, while she strove, with pious care, to expiate the faults, and to obliterate the darker memory, of his declining age. The children of Boethius and Symmachus were restored to their paternal inheritance, her extreme lenity never consented to inflict any corporal or pecuniary penalties on her Roman subjects, and she generously despised the clamours of the Goths who at the end of forty years still considered the people of Italy as their slaves or their enemies. Her salutary measures were directed by the wisdom, and celebrated by the eloquence, of Cassiodorus, she solicited and deserved the friendship of the emperor, and the kingdoms of Europe respected, both in peace and war, the majesty of the Gothic throne. But the future happiness of the queen and of Italy depended on the education of her son, who was destined by his birth, to support the different and almost incompatible characters of the chief of a barbarian camp and the first magistrate of a civilized nation. From the age of ten years, 43 Athalaric was diligently instructed in the arts and sciences, either useful or ornamental for a Roman prince, and three venerable Goths were chosen to instill the principles of honor and virtue into the mind of their young king. But the pupil who is insensible of the benefits, must abhor the restraints, of education, and the solicitude of the queen, which affection rendered anxious and severe, offended the untractable nature of her son and his subjects. On a solemn festival, when the Goths were assembled in the palace of Ravenna, the royal youth escaped from his mother's apartment, and, with tears of pride and anger, complained of a blow which his stubborn disobedience had provoked her to inflict. The barbarians resented the indignity which had been offered to their king, accused the regent of conspiring against his life and crown, and imperiously demanded that the grandson of Theodoric should be rescued from the dastardly discipline of women and pedants, and educated, like a valiant goth, in the society of his equals and the glorious ignorance of his ancestors. To this rude clamor, importunately urged as the voice of the nation, Amalasantha was compelled to yield her reason and the dearest wishes of her heart. The king of Italy was abandoned to wine, to women, and to rustic sports, and the indiscreet contempt of the ungrateful youth betrayed the mischievous designs of his favorites and her enemies. Encompassed with domestic foes, she entered into a secret negotiation with the emperor Justinian, obtained the assurance of a friendly reception and had actually deposited at Dyrrachium in Epirus a treasure of forty thousand pounds of gold. Happy would it have been for her fame and safety, if she had calmly retired from barbarous faction to the peace and splendor of Constantinople. But the mind of Marlesantha was inflamed by ambition and revenge, and, while her ships lay at anchor in the port, 
she waited for the success of a crime which her passions excused or applauded as an act of justice. Three of the most dangerous malcontents had been separately removed, under the pretense of trust and command, to the frontiers of Italy, they were assassinated by her private emissaries, and the blood of these noble Goths rendered the Queen Mother absolute in the court of Ravenna, and justly odious to a free people. But, if she had lamented the disorders of her son, she soon wept his irreparable loss, and the death of Athalaric, who at the age of sixteen was consumed by premature intemperance, left her destitute of any firm support or legal authority. Instead of submitting to the laws of her country, which held as a fundamental maxim that the succession could never pass from the lance to the distaff, the daughter of Theodoric conceived the impracticable design of sharing with one of her cousins the regal title, and of reserving in her own hands the substance of supreme power. He received the proposal with profound respect and affected gratitude, and the eloquent Cassiodorus announced to the Senate and the Emperor, that Amalasanthu and Theodatus had ascended the throne of Italy. His birth, for his mother was the sister of Theodoric, might be considered as an imperfect title, and the choice of Amalasanthu was more strongly directed by her contempt of his avarice and pusillanimity, which had deprived him of the love of the Italians and the esteem of the barbarians. But Theodatus was exasperated by the contempt which he deserved her justice had repressed and reproached the oppression which he exercised against his Tuscan neighbours, and the principal Goths, united by common guilt and resentment, conspired to instigate his slow and timid disposition. The letters of congratulation were scarcely dispatched before the Queen of Italy was imprisoned in a small island of the Lake of Bolsena, 44 where, after a short confinement, she was strangled in the bath, by the order, on with the connivance of the new king, who instructed his turbulent subjects to shed the blood of their sovereigns. Justinian beheld with joy the dissensions of the Goths, and the mediation of an ally concealed and promoted the ambitious views of the conqueror. His ambassadors, in their public audience, demanded the fortress of Lilibium, ten barbarian fugitives, and a just compensation for the pillage of a small town on the Illyrian borders, but they secretly negotiated with Theodatus to betray the province of Tuscany, and tempted Amalasantha to extricate herself from danger and perplexity by a free surrender of the kingdom of Italy. A false and servile epistle was subscribed by the reluctant hand of the captive queen, but the confession of the Roman senators, who were sent to Constantinople, revealed the truth of her deplorable situation, and Justinian, by the voice of a new ambassador, most powerfully interceded for her life and liberty. Yet the secret instructions of the same minister were adapted to serve the cruel jealousy of Theodora, who dreaded the presence and superior charms of a rival, he prompted with artful and ambiguous hints the execution of a crime so useful to the Romans semicolon 45 received the intelligence of her death with grief and indignation, and denounced, in his master's name, a mortal war against the perfidious assassin. In Italy, as well as in Africa, the guilt of an usurper appeared to justify the arms of Justinian, but the forces which he prepared were insufficient for the subversion of a mighty kingdom, if their feeble numbers had not been multiplied by the name, the spirit, and the conduct of an hero. A chosen troop of guards, who served on horseback and were armed with lances and bucklers, attended the person of Belisarius. His cavalry was composed of two hundred Huns, three hundred Moors, and four thousand Confederates, and the infantry consisted only of three thousand Isaurians. Steering the same course as in his former expedition, the Roman consul cast anchor before Catana in Sicily, to survey the strength of the island, and to decide whether he should attempt the conquest or peaceably pursue his voyage for the African coast he found a fruitful land and a friendly people. Notwithstanding the decay of agriculture, Sicily still supplied the granaries of Rome, the farmers were graciously exempted from the oppression of military quarters, and the Goths, who trusted the defence of the island to the inhabitants, had some reason to complain that their confidence was ungratefully betrayed. Instead of soliciting and expecting the aid of the king of Italy, they yielded to the first summons a cheerful obedience and this province, the first fruits of the Punic Wars, 
was again, after a long separation, united to the Roman Empire. The Gothic garrison of Palermo, which alone attempted to resist, was reduced, after a short siege, by a singular stratagem. Belisarius introduced his ships into the deepest recess of the harbour, their boats were laboriously hoisted with ropes and pulleys to the topmast head, and he filled them with archers, who from that superior station commanded the ramparts of the city. After this easy though successful campaign, the conqueror entered Syracuse in triumph, at the head of his victorious bands, distributing gold medals to the people on the day which so gloriously terminated the year of the consulship. He passed the winter season in the palace of ancient kings, amidst the ruins of a Grecian colony, which once extended to a circumference of two and twenty miles semicolon forty-six but in the spring, about the festival of Easter, the prosecution of his designs was interrupted by a dangerous revolt of the African forces. Carthage was saved by the presence of Belisarius who suddenly landed with a thousand guards. Two thousand soldiers of doubtful faith returned to the standard of their old commander, and he marched, without hesitation, above fifty miles, to seek an enemy whom he affected to pity and despise. Eight thousand rebels trembled at his approach, they were rooted at the first onset by the dexterity of their master, and this ignoble victory would have restored the peace of Africa, if the conqueror had not been hastily recalled to Sicily, to appease a sedition which was kindled during his absence in his own camp. Disorder and disobedience were the common malady of the times, the genius to command and the virtue to obey resided only in the mind of Belsarius. Although Theodatus descended from a race of heroes, he was ignorant of the art, and averse to the dangers, of war. Although he had studied the writings of Plato and Tully, philosophy was incapable of purifying his mind from the basest passions, avarice and fear. He had purchased a scepter by ingratitude and murder, at the first menace of an enemy he degraded his own majesty, and that of a nation which already disdained their unworthy sovereign. Astonished by the recent example of Jelima, he saw himself dragged in chains through the streets of Constantinople, the terrors which Belisarius inspired, were heightened by the eloquence of Peter, the Byzantine ambassador, and that bold and subtle advocate persuaded him to sign a treaty, too ignominious to become the foundation of a lasting peace. It was stipulated that in the acclamations of the Roman people the name of the emperor should be always proclaimed before that of the Gothic king, and that, as often as the statue of Theodatus was erected in brass or marble, the divine image of Justinian should be placed on its right hand. Instead of conferring, the king of Italy was reduced to solicit, the honours of the senate, and the consent of the emperor was made indispensable before he could execute, against a priest or senator, the sentence either of death or confiscation. The feeble monarch resigned the possession of Sicily, offered, as the annual mark of his dependence, a crown of gold, of the weight of three hundred pounds, and promised to supply, at the requisition of his sovereign, three thousand Gothic auxiliaries for the service of the empire. Satisfied with these extraordinary concessions, the successful agent of Justinian hastened his journey to Constantinople, but no sooner had he reached the Alban Villa 48 than he was recalled by the anxiety of Theodatus and the dialogue which passed between the king and the ambassador deserves to be represented in its original simplicity. Are you of opinion that the emperor will ratify this treaty? Perhaps. If he refuses, what consequence will ensue? War. Will such a war be just or reasonable? Most assuredly, every one should act according to his character. What is your meaning? You are a philosopher Justinian is emperor of the Romans. It would ill become the disciple of Plato to shed the blood of thousands in his private quarrel, the successor of Augustus should vindicate his rights, and recover by arms the ancient provinces of his empire. This reasoning might not convince, but it was sufficient to alarm and subdue, the weakness of Theodatus, and he soon descended to his last offer, that for the poor equivalent of a pension of forty-eight thousand pounds sterling he would resign the kingdom of the Goths and Italians, and spend the remainder of his days in the innocent pleasures of philosophy and agriculture. Both treaties were entrusted to the hands of the ambassador, 
on the frail security of an oath not to produce the second till the first had been positively rejected? The event may be easily foreseen, Justinian required and accepted the abdication of the Gothic king. His indefatigable agent returned from Constantinople to Ravenna, with ample instructions, and a fair epistle, which praised the wisdom and generosity of the royal philosopher, granted his pension, with the assurance of such honours as a subject and a Catholic might enjoy, and wisely referred the final execution of the treaty to the presence and authority of Belisarius. But, in the interval of suspense, two Roman generals, who had entered the province of Dalmatia, were defeated and slain by the Gothic troops. From blind and abject despair, Theodatus capriciously rose to groundless and fatal presumptions, 49 and dared to receive with menace and contempt the ambassador of Justinian, who claimed his promise, solicited the allegiance of his subjects, and boldly asserted the inviolable privilege of his own character. The march of Belisarius dispelled this visionary pride, and, as the first campaign 50 was employed in the reduction of Sicily, the invasion of Italy is applied by Procopius to the second year of the Gothic War. After Belisarius had left sufficient garrisons in Palermo and Syracuse, he embarked his troops at Messina, and landed them, without resistance, on the opposite shores of Regium. A Gothic prince, who had married the daughter of Theodatus, was stationed with an army to guard the entrance of Italy, but he imitated, without scruple, the example of a sovereign faithless to his public and private duties. The perfidious Seberma deserted with his followers to the Roman camp, and was dismissed to enjoy the servile honours of the Byzantine court. From Regium to Naples, the fleet and army of Belisarius, almost always in view of each other, advanced near 300 miles along the sea coast. The people of Brium, Lucania, and Campania, who abhorred the name and religion of the Goths, embraced the specious excuse that their ruined walls were incapable of defence, the soldiers paid a just equivalent for a plentiful market, and curiosity alone interrupted the peaceful occupations of the husbandman or artificer. Naples, which has swelled to a great and populous capital, long cherished the language and manners of a Grecian colony, and the choice of Virgil had ennobled this elegant retreat which attracted the lovers of repose and study, from the noise, the smoke, and the laborious opulence of Rome. As soon as the place was invested by sea and land, Belisarius gave audience to the deputies of the people, who exhorted him to disregard a conquest unworthy of his arms, to seek the Gothic king in a field of battle, and, after his victory, to claim, as the sovereign of Rome, the allegiance of the dependent cities. When I treat with my enemies, replied the Roman chief, with an haughty smile, I am more accustomed to give than to receive counsel, but I hold in one hand inevitable ruin, and in the other, peace and freedom, such as Sicily now enjoys. The impatience of delay urged him to grant the most liberal terms. His honour secured their performance, but Naples was divided into two factions, and the Greek democracy was inflamed by their orators, who, with much spirit and some truth, represented to the multitude that the Goths would punish their defection and that Belisarius himself must esteem their loyalty and valour. Their deliberations, however, were not perfectly free, the city was commanded by eight hundred barbarians, whose wives and children were detained at Ravenna as the pledge of their fidelity, and even the Jews, who were rich and numerous, resisted, with desperate enthusiasm, the intolerant laws of Justinian. In a much later period, the circumference of Naples 52 measured only 2,363 paces colon 53 the fortifications were defended by precipices or the sea, when the aqueducts were intercepted, a supply of water might be drawn from wells and fountains, and the stock of provisions was sufficient to consume the patience of the besiegers. At the end of twenty days, that of Belisarius was almost exhausted, and he had reconciled himself to the disgrace of abandoning the siege, that he might march, before the winter season, against Rome and the Gothic king. But his anxiety was relieved by the bold curiosity of an Isaurian, who explored the dry channel of an aqueduct, 
and secretly reported that a passage might be perforated to introduce a file of armed soldiers into the heart of the city. When the work had been silently executed, the humane general risked the discovery of his secret, by a last and fruitless admonition of the impending danger. In the darkness of the night, four hundred Romans entered the aqueduct, raised themselves by a rope, which they fastened to an olive tree, into the house or garden of a solitary matron, sounded their trumpets, surprised the sentinels, and gave admittance to their companions, who on all sides scaled the walls and burst open the gates of the city. Every crime which is punished by social justice, was practiced as the rights of war, the Huns were distinguished by cruelty and sacrilege, and Lysarius alone appeared in the streets and churches of Naples to moderate the calamities which he predicted. The gold and silver, he repeatedly exclaimed, are the just rewards of your valor. But spare the inhabitants, they are Christians, they are suppliants, they are now your fellow subjects. Restore the children to their parents, the wives to their husbands, and show them, by your generosity, of what friends they have obstinately deprived themselves. The city was saved by the virtue and authority of its conqueror, 54 and, when the Neapolitans returned to their houses, they found some consolation in the secret enjoyment of their hidden treasures. The barbarian garrison enlisted in the service of the emperor, Apulia and Calabria, delivered from the odious presence of the Goths, acknowledged his dominion, and the tusks of the Caledonian boar, which was still shown at Benventum, are curiously described by the historian of Belisarius. The faithful soldiers and citizens of Naples had expected their deliverance from a prince, who remained the inactive and almost indifferent spectator of their ruin. Theodatus secured his person within the walls of Rome, while his cavalry advanced forty miles on the Appian Way, and encamped in the Pomptine Marshes, which, by a canal of nineteen miles in length, had been recently drained and converted into excellent pastures. But the principal forces of the Goths were dispersed in Dalmatia, Venetia, and Gaul, and the feeble mind of their king was confounded by the unsuccessful event of a divination, which seemed to presage the downfall of his empire. The most abject slaves have arraigned the guilt or weakness of an unfortunate master. The character of Theodatus was rigorously scrutinized by a free and idle camp of barbarians, conscious of their privilege and power, he was declared unworthy of his race, his nation, and his throne, and their general Vitages, whose valor had been signalized in the Illyrian War, was raised with the unanimous applause on the bucklers of his companions. On the first rumor, the abdicated monarch fled from the justice of his country, but he was pursued by private revenge. A Goth whom he had injured in his love overtook Theodatus on the Flaminian Way, and, regardless of his unmanly cries, slaughtered him as he lay prostrate on the ground, like a victim, says their historian, at the foot of the altar. The choice of the people is the best and purest title to reign over them, yet such is the prejudice of every age, that Vitages impatiently wished to return to Ravenna, where he might seize, with the reluctant hand of the daughter of Amalasantha, some faint shadow of hereditary right. A national council was immediately held, and the new monarch reconciled the impatient spirit of the barbarians to a measure of disgrace which the misconduct of his predecessor rendered wise and indispensable. The Goths consented to retreat in the presence of a victorious enemy, to delay till the next spring the operations of offensive war, to summon their scattered forces, to relinquish their distant possessions, and to trust even Rome itself to the faith of its inhabitants. Euterus, an aged warrior, was left in the capital with four thousand soldiers, a feeble garrison, which might have seconded the zeal, though it was incapable of opposing the wishes, of the Romans. But a momentary enthusiasm of religion and patriotism was kindled in their minds. They furiously exclaimed that the apostolic throne should no longer be profaned by the triumph or toleration of Arianism, that the tombs of the Caesars should no longer be trampled by the savages of the north, and, without reflecting that Italy must sink into a province of Constantinople, they fondly hailed the restoration of a Roman emperor as a new era of freedom and prosperity. The deputies of the Pope and clergy 
of the Senate and people, invited the Lieutenant of Justinian to accept their voluntary allegiance, and to enter the city, whose gates would be thrown open for his reception. As soon as Belisarius had fortified his new conquests, Naples and Cume, he advanced about twenty miles to the banks of the Volturnus, contemplated the decayed grandeur of Capua, and halted at the separation of the Latin and Appian ways. The work of the censor, after the incessant use of nine centuries, still preserved its primeval beauty, and not a flaw could be discovered in the large polished stones, of which that solid though narrow road was so firmly compacted. Belisarius, however, preferred the Latin way, which, at a distance from the sea and the marshes, skirted in a space of one hundred and twenty miles along the foot of the mountains. His enemies had disappeared, when he made his entrance through the Asnarian gate, the garrison departed without molestation along the Flaminian way, and the city, after sixty years' servitude, was delivered from the yoke of the barbarians. Euterus alone, from a motive of pride or discontent, refused to accompany the fugitives, and the Gothic chief, himself a trophy of the victory, was sent with the keys of Rome to the throne of the Emperor Justinian. The first days, which coincided with the old Saturnalia, were devoted to mutual congratulation and the public joy, and the Catholics prepared to celebrate, without a rival, the approaching festival of the Nativity of Christ. In the familiar conversation of an hero, the Romans acquired some notion of the virtues which history ascribed to their ancestors, they were edified by the apparent respect of Belisarius for the successor of Saint Peter, and his rigid discipline secured in the midst of war the blessings of tranquility and justice. They applauded the rapid success of his arms, which overran the adjacent country, as far as Narni, Perusia, and Spolto, but they trembled, the Senate, the clergy, and the unwarlike people, as soon as they understood that he had resolved, and would speedily be reduced, to sustain a siege against the powers of the Gothic monarchy. The designs of Vitages were executed, during the winter season, with diligence and effect. From their rustic habitations, from their distant garrisons, the Goths assembled at Ravenna for the defence of their country, and such were their numbers that, after an army had been detached for the relief of Dalmatia, 150,000 fighting men marched under the royal standard. According to the degrees of rank or merit, the Gothic king distributed arms and horses, rich gifts, and liberal promises, he moved along the Flaminian way, declined the useless sieges of Perusia and Spolto, respected the impregnable rock of Narni, and arrived within two miles of Rome at the foot of the Milvian bridge. The narrow passage was fortified with a tower and Belisarius had computed the value of the twenty days which must be lost in the construction of another bridge. But the consternation of the soldiers of the tower, who either fled or deserted, disappointed his hopes, and betrayed his person into the most imminent danger. At the head of one thousand horse, the Roman general sallied from the Flaminian gate to mark the ground of an advantageous position, and to survey the camp of the barbarians, but, while he still believed them on the other side of the Tiber, he was suddenly encompassed and assaulted by their innumerable squadrons. The fate of Italy depended on his life, and the deserters pointed to the conspicuous horse, a bay, 59 with a white face, which he rode on that memorable day. Aim at the bay horse, was the universal cry. Every bow was bent, every javelin was directed against that fatal object and the command was repeated and obeyed by thousands who were ignorant of its real motive. The bolder barbarians advanced to the more honourable combat of swords and spears, and the praise of an enemy has graced the fall of Visendus, the standard-bearer comma sixty who maintained his foremost station, till he was pierced with thirteen wounds, perhaps by the hand of Belisarius himself. The Roman general was strong, active, and dexterous. On every side he discharged his weighty and mortal strokes. His faithful guards imitated his valour and defended his person, and the Goths, after the loss of a thousand men, fled before the arms of an hero. They were rashly pursued to their camp, and the Romans, oppressed by multitudes, made a gradual, and at length a precipitate, retreat to the gates of the city.
the gates were shut against the fugitives, and the public terror was increased by the report that Belisarius was slain. His countenance was indeed disfigured by sweat, dust, and blood, his voice was hoarse, his strength was almost exhausted, but his unconquerable spirit still remained, he imparted that spirit to his desponding companions, and their last desperate charge was felt by the flying barbarians, as if a new army, vigorous and entire, had been poured from the city. The Flaminian gate was thrown open to a real triumph, but it was not before Belisarius had visited every post, and provided for the public safety, that he could be persuaded by his wife and friends to taste the needful refreshments of food and sleep. In the more improved state of the art of war, a general is seldom required, or even permitted, to display the personal prowess of a soldier, and the example of Belisarius may be added to the rare examples of Henry IV, of Pius, and of Alexander. After this first and unsuccessful trial of their enemies, the whole army of the Goths passed the Tiber, and formed the siege of the city, which continued above a year, till their final departure. Whatever fancy may conceive, the severe compass of the geographer defines the circumference of Rome within a line of twelve miles and three hundred and forty-five paces, and that circumference, except in the Vatican, has invariably been the same from the triumph of Orleans to the peaceful but obscure reign of the modern popes. But in the day of her greatness, the space within her walls was crowded with habitations and inhabitants, and the populous suburbs, that stretched along the public roads, were darted like so many rays from one common centre. Adversity swept away these extraneous ornaments, and left naked and desolate, a considerable part even of the seven hills. Yet Rome in its present state could send into the field above thirty thousand males of a military age semicolon sixty-two and, notwithstanding the want of discipline and exercise, the far greater part, inured to the hardships of poverty, might be capable of bearing arms for the defence of their country and religion. The prudence of Belisarius did not neglect this important resource. His soldiers were relieved by the zeal and diligence of the people, who watched while they slept, and laboured while they reposed, he accepted the voluntary service of the bravest and most indigent of the Roman youth, and the companies of townsmen sometimes represented, in a vacant post, the presence of the troops which had been drawn away to more essential duties. But his just confidence was placed in the veterans who had fought under his banner in the Persian and African wars, and, although that gallant band was reduced to five thousand men, he undertook, with such contemptible numbers, to defend a circle of twelve miles, against an army of one hundred and fifty thousand barbarians. In the walls of Rome, which Belisarius constructed or restored, the materials of ancient architecture may be discerned semicolon sixty-three and the whole fortification was completed except in a chasm still extant between the Pincian and Flaminian gates, which the prejudices of the Goths and Romans left under the effectual guard of Saint Peter the Apostle. The battlements or bastions were shaped in sharp angles, a ditch, broad and deep, protected the foot of the rampart, and the archers on the rampart were assisted by military engines, the burlister, a powerful crossbow, which darted short but massy arrows, the onagri, or wild asses, which, on the principle of a sling, threw stones and bullets of an enormous size. A chain was drawn across the Tiber, the arches of the aqueducts were made impervious, and the mole or sepulchre of Hadrian 66 was converted, for the first time, to the uses of a citadel. That venerable structure, which contained the ashes of the Antonines, was a circular turret, rising from a quadrangular basis, it was covered with the white marble of Burroughs and decorated by the statues of gods and heroes, and the lover of the arts must read with a sigh that the works of Praxicles or Lysippus were torn from their lofty pedestals, and hurled into the ditch on the heads of the besiegers. To each of his lieutenants Belisarius assigned the defence of a gate with the wise and peremptory instruction that, whatever might be the alarm, they should steadily adhere to their respective posts and trust their general for the safety of Rome. The formidable host of the Goths was insufficient to embrace the ample measure of the city, of the fourteen gates, 
seven only were invested from the Princeton to the Flaminian Way, and Vitages divided his troops into six camps, each of which was fortified with a ditch and rampart. On the Tuscan side of the river, a seventh encampment was formed in the field or circus of the Vatican, for the important purpose of commanding the Milvian Bridge and the course of the Tiber, but they approached with devotion the adjacent church of St. Peter, and the threshold of the holy apostles was respected during the siege by a Christian enemy. In the ages of victory, as often as the Senate decreed some distant conquest, the consul denounced hostilities, by unbarring in solemn pomp the gates of the Temple of Janus. Domestic war now rendered the admonition superfluous, and the ceremony was superseded by the establishment of a new religion. But the brazen Temple of Janus was left standing in the forum, of a size sufficient only to contain the statue of the god, five cubits in height, of a human form, but with two faces, directed to the east and west. The double gates were likewise of brass, and a fruitless effort to turn them on their rusty hinges revealed the scandalous secret that some Romans were still attached to the superstition of their ancestors. Eighteen days were employed by the besiegers to provide all the instruments of attack which antiquity had invented. Fascines were prepared to fill the ditches, scaling ladders to ascend the walls. The largest trees of the forest supplied the timbers of four battering rams, their heads were armed with iron, they were suspended by ropes, and each of them was worked by the labor of fifty men. The lofty wooden turrets moved on wheels or rollers, and formed a spacious platform of the level of the rampart. On the morning of the nineteenth day, a general attack was made from the Princeton Gate to the Vatican, seven Gothic columns, with their military engines, advanced to the assault and the Romans who lined the ramparts listened with doubt and anxiety to the cheerful assurances of their commander. As soon as the enemy approached the ditch, Belisarius himself drew the first arrow, and such was his strength and dexterity that he transfixed the foremost of the barbarian leaders. A shout of applause and victory was re-echoed along the wall. He drew a second arrow, and the stroke was followed with the same success and the same acclamation. The Roman general then gave the word that the archers should aim at the teams of oxen, they were instantly covered with mortal wounds, the towers which they drew remained useless and immovable, and a single moment disconcerted the laborious projects of the king of the Goths. After this disappointment, Vitages still continued, or feigned to continue, the assault of the Salarian gate, that he might divert the attention of his adversary while his principal forces more strenuously attacked the Princeton Gate and the Sepulchre of Hadrian, at the distance of three miles from each other. Near the former, the double walls of the Vivarium 69 were low or broken, the fortifications of the latter were feebly guarded, the vigour of the Goths was excited by the hope of victory and spoil, and, if a single post had given way, the Romans, and Rome itself, were irrecoverably lost. This perilous stay was the most glorious in the life of Belisarius. Amidst tumult and dismay, the whole plan of the attack and defence was distinctly present to his mind, he observed the changes of each instant, weighed every possible advantage, transported his person to the scenes of danger, and communicated his spirit in calm and decisive orders. The contest was fiercely maintained from the morning to the evening, the Goths were repulsed on all sides, and each Roman might boast that he had vanquished thirty barbarians, if the strange disproportion of numbers were not counterbalanced by the merit of one man. Thirty thousand Goths, according to the confession of their own chiefs, perished in this bloody action, and the multitude of the wounded was equal to that of the slain. When they advanced to the assault, their close disorder suffered not a javelin to fall without effect and, as they retired, the populace of the city joined the pursuit, and slaughtered, with impunity, the backs of their flying enemies. Belisarius instantly sallied from the gates, and, while the soldiers chaunted his name and victory, the hostile engines of war were reduced to ashes. Such was the loss and consternation of the Goths that, from this day, the siege of Rome degenerated into a tedious and indolent blockade and they were incessantly harassed by the Roman general, 
who in frequent skirmishes destroyed above 5,000 of their bravest troops. Their cavalry was unpractised in the use of the bow, their archers served on foot, and this divided force was incapable of contending with their adversaries, whose lances and arrows, at a distance or at hand, were alike formidable. The consummate skill of Belisarius embraced the favourable opportunities, and, as he chose the ground and the moment, as he pressed the charge or sounded the retreat, 70 the squadrons which he detached were seldom unsuccessful. These partial advantages diffused an impatient ardour among the soldiers and people, who began to feel the hardships of a siege, and to disregard the dangers of a general engagement. Each plebeian conceived himself to be an hero, and the infantry, who, since the decay of discipline, were rejected from the line of battle, aspired to the ancient honours of the Roman legion. Belisarius praised the spirit of his troops, condemned their presumption, yielded to their clamours, and prepared the remedies of a defeat, the possibility of which he alone had courage to suspect. In the quarter of the Vatican, the Romans prevailed, and, if the irreparable moments had not been wasted in the pillage of the camp, they might have occupied the Milvian bridge, and charged in the rear of the Gothic host. On the other side of the Tiber, Belisarius advanced from the Pincian and Salarian gates. But his army, 4,000 soldiers perhaps, was lost in a spacious plain, they were encompassed and oppressed by fresh multitudes, who continually relieved the broken ranks of the barbarians. The valiant leaders of the infantry were unskilled to conquer, they died, the retreat, an hasty retreat, was covered by the prudence of the general, and the victors started back with a fright from the formidable aspect of an armed rampart. The reputation of Belisarius was unsullied by a defeat, and the vain confidence of the Goths was not less serviceable to his designs than the repentance and modesty of the Roman troops. From the moment that Belisarius had determined to sustain a siege, his assiduous care provided Rome against the danger of famine, more dreadful than the Gothic arms. An extraordinary supply of corn was imported from Sicily, the harvests of Campania and Tuscany were forcibly swept for the use of the city, and the rights of private property were infringed by the strong plea of the public safety. It might easily be foreseen that the enemy would intercept the aqueducts, and the cessation of the water mills was the first inconvenience, which was speedily removed by mooring large vessels, and fixing millstones in the current of the river. The stream was soon embarrassed by the trunks of trees, and polluted with dead bodies, yet so effectual were the precautions of the Roman general that the waters of the Tiber still continued to give motion to the mills and drink to the inhabitants, the more distant quarters were supplied from domestic wells, and a besieged city might support, without impatience, the privation of her public baths. A large portion of Rome from the Princeton Gate to the Church of St. Paul, was never invested by the Goths, their excursions were restrained by the activity of the Moorish troops, the navigation of the Tiber, and the Latin, Appian, and Ostian ways, were left free and unmolested for the introduction of corn and cattle, or the retreat of the inhabitants, who sought a refuge in Campania or Sicily. Anxious to relieve himself from an useless and devouring multitude, Belisarius issued his peremptory orders for the instant departure of the women, the children, and slaves, required his soldiers to dismiss their male and female attendants, and regulated their allowance, that one moiety should be given in provisions and the other in money. His foresight was justified by the increase of the public distress, as soon as the Goths had occupied two important posts in the neighbourhood of Rome. By the loss of the port, or, as it is now called, the city of Porto, he was deprived of the country on the right of the Tiber, and the best communication with the sea, and he reflected with grief and anger, that three hundred men, could he have spared such a feeble band, might have defended its impregnable works. Seven miles from the capital, between the Appian and the Latin ways, two principal aqueducts crossing, and again crossing each other, enclosed within their solid and lofty arches a fortified space, 71 where Vitages established a camp of 7,000 Goths to intercept the convoys of Sicilian Campania. 
the granaries of Rome were insensibly exhausted, the adjacent country had been wasted with fire and sword, such scanty supplies as might yet be obtained by hasty excursions were the reward of valour and the purchase of wealth, the forage of the horses and the bread of the soldiers never failed, but in the last months of the siege the people were exposed to the miseries of scarcity, unwholesome food, 72 and contagious disorders. Belisarius saw and pitied their sufferings, but he had foreseen, and he watched, the decay of their loyalty and the progress of their discontent. Adversity had awakened the Romans from the dreams of grandeur and freedom, and taught them the humiliating lesson that it was of small moment to their real happiness whether the name of their master was derived from the Gothic or the Latin language. The lieutenant of Justinian listened to their just complaints, but he rejected with disdain the idea of flight or capitulation, repressed their clamorous impatience for battle, amused them with the prospect of sure and speedy relief, and secured himself and the city from the effects of their despair or treachery. Twice in each month he changed the station of the officers to whom the custody of the gates was committed, the various precautions of patrols, watchwords, lights, and music were repeatedly employed to discover whatever passed on the ramparts, outguards were posted beyond the ditch, and the trusty vigilance of dogs supplied the more doubtful fidelity of mankind. Our letter was intercepted, which assured the king of the Goths that the Asnarian gate, adjoining to the Lateran church, should be secretly open to his troops. On the proof or suspicion of treason, several senators were banished, and the Pope Silverius was summoned to attend the representative of his sovereign, at his headquarters in the Pincian Palace. The ecclesiastics who followed their bishop were detained in the first or second apartment, 74 and he alone was admitted to the presence of Belisarius. The conqueror of Rome and Carthage was modestly seated at the feet of Antonina, who reclined on a stately couch. The general was silent, but the voice of reproach and menace issued from the mouth of his imperious wife. Accused by credible witnesses, and the evidence of his own subscription, the successor of Saint Peter was despoiled of his pontifical ornaments, clad in the mean habit of monk, and embarked without delay for a distant exile in the east. At the emperor's command, the clergy of Rome proceeded to the choice of a new bishop, and, after a solemn invocation of the Holy Ghost, elected the deacon Vigilius, who had purchased the papal throne by a bribe of two hundred pounds of gold. The profit, and consequently the guilt, of this simony was imputed to Belisarius, but the hero obeyed the orders of his wife, Antonina served the passions of the empress, and Theodora lavished her treasures, in the vain hope of obtaining a pontiff hostile or indifferent to the council of Chalcedon. The epistle of Belisarius to the emperor announced his victory, his danger, and his resolution. According to your commands, we have entered the dominions of the Goths, and reduced to your obedience Sicily, Campania, and the city of Rome, but the loss of these conquests will be more disgraceful than their acquisition was glorious. Hitherto we have successfully fought against the multitude of the barbarians, but their multitudes may finally prevail. Victory is the gift of providence, but the reputation of kings and generals depends on the success or the failure of their designs. Permit me to speak with freedom, if you wish that we should live, send us subsistence, if you desire that we should conquer, send us arms, horses and men. The Romans have received us as friends and deliverers, but, in our present distress, they will be either betrayed by their confidence or we shall be oppressed by their treachery and hatred. For myself, my life is consecrated to your service, it is yours to reflect, whether my death in this situation will contribute to the glory and prosperity of your reign. Perhaps that reign would have been equally prosperous, if the peaceful master of the East had abstained from the conquest of Africa and Italy, but, as Justinian was ambitious of fame, he made some efforts, they were feeble and languid, to support and rescue his victorious general. A reinforcement of 1600 Sclavonians and Huns was led by Martin and Valerian, and, as they had reposed during the winter season in the harbours of Greece, the strength of the men and horses was not impaired by the fatigues of a sea voyage, and they distinguished their valour in the first sally against the besiegers. 
About the time of the summer solstice, Eutalius landed at Terracina with large sums of money for the payment of the troops. He cautiously proceeded along the Appian Way, and this convoy entered Rome through the gate Cape in a comma 76 while Berlizarius, on the other side, diverted the attention of the Goths by a vigorous and successful skirmish. These seasonable aids, the use and reputation of which were dexterously managed by the Roman general, revived the courage, or at least the hopes, of the soldiers and people. The historian Procopius was dispatched with an important commission, to collect the troops and provisions which Campania could furnish or Constantinople had sent, and the secretary of Belisarius was soon followed by Antonina herself, who boldly traversed the posts of the enemy, and returned with the oriental succors to the relief of her husband and the besieged city. A fleet of three thousand Isaurians cast anchor in the Bay of Naples. And afterwards at Ostia. Above two thousand horse, of whom a part were Thracians, landed at Tarentum, and, after the junction of five hundred soldiers of Campania, and a train of wagons laden with wine and flour, they directed their march on the Appian Way, from Capua to the neighborhood of Rome. The forces that arrived by land and sea were united at the mouth of the Tiber. Antonina convened a council of war, it was resolved to surmount, with sails and doors, the adverse stream of the river, and the Goths were apprehensive of disturbing, by any rash hostilities, the negotiation to which Berlizarius had craftily listened. They credulously believed that they saw no more than the vanguard of a fleet and army, which already covered the Ionian Sea and the plains of Campania, and the illusion was supported by the haughty language of the Roman general, when he gave audience to the ambassadors of Vitages. After a specious discourse to vindicate the justice of his cause, they declared that, for the sake of peace, they were disposed to announce the possession of Sicily. The emperor is not less generous, replied his lieutenant, with a disdainful smile in return for a gift which you no longer possess, he presents you with an ancient province of the empire, he resigns to the Goths the sovereignty of the British island. Belisarius rejected with equal firmness and contempt the offer of a tribute, but he allowed the Gothic ambassadors to seek their fate from the mouth of Justinian himself, and consented, with seeming reluctance, to a truce of three months, from the winter solstice to the equinox of spring. Prudence might not safely trust either the oaths or hostages of the barbarians, but the conscious superiority of the Roman chief was expressed in the distribution of his troops. As soon as fear or hunger compelled the Goths to evacuate Alba, Porto, and St. their place was instantly supplied, the garrisons of Narni, Spolto, and Perusia, were reinforced and the seven camps of the besiegers were gradually encompassed with the calamities of a siege. The prayers and pilgrimage of Dacius, Bishop of Milan, were not without effect, and he obtained one thousand Thracians and Isaurians, to assist the revolt of Liguria against her Arian tyrant. At the same time, John the Sanguinary, 77 the nephew of Vitalian, was detached with two thousand chosen horse, first to Alba on the Fusine Lake, and afterwards to the frontiers of Picenum on the Hadriatic Sea. In that province, said Berlizarius, the Goths have deposited their families and treasures, without a guard or the suspicion of danger. Doubtless they will violate the truce, let them feel your presence, before they hear of your motions. Spare the Italians, suffer not any fortified places to remain hostile in your rear and faithfully reserve the spoil for an equal and common partition. It would not be reasonable, he added with a laugh, that, whilst we are toiling to the destruction of the drones, our more fortunate brethren should rifle and enjoy the honey. The whole nation of the Ostrogoths had been assembled for the attack, and was almost entirely consumed in the siege of Rome. If any credit be due to an intelligent spectator, one third at least of their enormous host was destroyed, in frequent and bloody combats under the walls of the city. The bad fame and pernicious qualities of the summer air might already be imputed to the decay of agriculture and population, and the evils of famine and pestilence were aggravated by their own licentiousness and the unfriendly disposition of the country. 
while Vitages struggled with his fortune, while he hesitated between shame and ruin, his retreat was hastened by domestic alarms. The king of the Goths was informed by trembling messengers, that John the Sanguinary spread the devastations of war from the Apennine into the Hadriatic, that the rich spoils and innumerable captives of Picenum were lodged in the fortifications of Rimini, and that this formidable chief had defeated his uncle, insulted his capital, and seduced, by secret correspondence, the fidelity of his wife, the imperious daughter of Marlacintha. Yet, before he retired, Vitages made a last effort either to storm or to surprise the city. A secret passage was discovered in one of the aqueducts, two citizens of the Vatican were tempted by bribes to intoxicate the guards of the Orlean Gate, an attack was meditated on the walls beyond the Tiber in a place which was not fortified with towers, and the barbarians advanced, with torches and scaling ladders, to the assault of the Pincian Gate. But every attempt was defeated by the intrepid vigilance of Belisarius and his band of veterans, who, in the most perilous moments, did not regret the absence of their companions, and the Goths, alike destitute of help and subsistence, clamorously urged their departure, before the truce should expire, and the Roman cavalry should again be united. One year and nine days after the commencement of the siege, an army, so lately strong and triumphant, burnt their tents, and tumultuously repassed the Milvian Bridge. They repassed not with impunity, their thronging multitudes, oppressed in a narrow passage, were driven headlong into the Tiber, by their own fears and the pursuit of the enemy, and the Roman general, sallying from the Pincian Gate, inflicted a severe and disgraceful wound on their retreat. The slow length of a sickly and desponding host was heavily dragged along the Flaminian Way from whence the barbarians were sometimes compelled to deviate, lest they should encounter the hostile garrisons that guarded the high road to Rimini and Ravenna. Yet so powerful was this flying army that Vitages spared ten thousand men for the defence of the cities which he was most solicitous to preserve, and detached his nephew Euraeus, with an adequate force, for the chastisement of rebellious Milan. At the head of his principal army, he besieged Rimini only thirty-three miles distant from the Gothic capital. A feeble rampart and a shallow ditch were maintained by the skill and valour of John the Sanguinary, who shared the danger and fatigue of the meanest soldier, and emulated, on a theatre less illustrious, the military virtues of his great commander. The towers and battering engines of the barbarians were rendered useless, their attacks were repulsed, and the tedious blockade which reduced the garrison to the last extremity of hunger, afforded time for the union and march of the Roman forces. A fleet, which had surprised Ancona, sailed along the coast of the Hadriatic, to the relief of the besieged city. The eunuch Narses landed in Picenum with two thousand Heruli and five thousand of the bravest troops of the east. The rock of the Apennine was forced. 10,000 veterans moved round the foot of the mountains under the command of Belisarius himself, and a new army, whose encampment blazed with innumerable lights, appeared to advance along the Flaminian Way. Overwhelmed with astonishment and despair, the Goths abandoned the siege of Rimini, their tents, their standards, and their leaders, and Vitages, who gave or followed the example of flight never halted till he found a shelter within the walls and morasses of Ravenna. To these walls, and to some fortresses destitute of any mutual support, the Gothic monarchy was now reduced. The provinces of Italy had embraced the party of the emperor, and his army, gradually recruited to the number of twenty thousand men, must have achieved an easy and rapid conquest, if their invincible powers had not been weakened by the discord of the Roman chiefs. Before the end of the siege, an act of blood, ambiguous and indiscreet, sullied the fair fame of Belisarius. Presidius, a loyal Italian, as he fled from Ravenna to Rome, was rudely stopped by Constantine, the military governor of Spolto, and despoiled, even in a church, of two daggers richly inlaid with gold and precious stones. As soon as the public danger had subsided, Presidius complained of the loss and injury. His complaint was heard, but the order of restitution was disobeyed by the pride and avarice of the offender. Exasperated by the delay, 
Presidius boldly arrested the generals, horse as he passed through the forum, and with the spirit of a citizen demanded the common benefit of the Roman laws. The honor of Belisarius was engaged, he summoned a council, claimed the obedience of his subordinate officer, and was provoked, by an insolent reply, to call hastily for the presence of his guards. Constantine, viewing their entrance as the signal of death, drew his sword, and rushed on the general, who nimbly eluded the stroke, and was protected by his friends, while a desperate assassin was disarmed, dragged into a neighboring chamber, and executed, or rather murdered, by the guards, at the arbitrary command of Belisarius. In this hasty act of violence, the guilt of Constantine was no longer remembered, the despair and death of that valiant officer were secretly imputed to the revenge of Antonina, and each of his colleagues, conscious of the same rapine, was apprehensive of the same fate. The fear of a common enemy suspended the effects of their envy and discontent, but, in the confidence of approaching victory, they instigated a powerful rival to oppose the conqueror of Rome and Africa. From the domestic service of the palace and the administration of the private revenue, Narses the eunuch was suddenly exalted to the head of an army, and the spirit of an hero, who afterwards equalled the merit and glory of Belisarius, served only to perplex the operations of the Gothic War. To his prudent counsels, the relief of Rimini was ascribed by the leaders of the discontented faction, who exhorted Narses to assume an independent and separate command. The epistle of Justinian had indeed enjoined his obedience to the general, but the dangerous exception, as far as may be advantageous to the public service, reserved some freedom of judgment to the discreet favorite, who had so lately departed from the sacred and familiar conversation of his sovereign. In the exercise of this doubtful right, the eunuch perpetually dissented from the opinions of Belisarius, and, after yielding with reluctance to the siege of Urbino, he deserted his colleague in the night, and marched away to the conquest of the Emilian province. The fierce and formidable bands of the Heruli were attached to the person of Narses semicolon 79 10,000 Romans and Confederates were persuaded to march under his banners every malcontent embraced the fair opportunity of revenging his private or imaginary wrongs, and the remaining troops of Belisarius were divided and dispersed from the garrisons of Sicily to the shores of the Hadriatic. His skill and perseverance overcame every obstacle, Urbino was taken, the sieges of Fisul, Orvieto, and Oximum, were undertaken and vigorously prosecuted and the eunuch Narses was at length recalled to the domestic cares of the palace. All dissensions were healed, and all opposition was subdued, by the temperate authority of the Roman general, to whom his enemies could not refuse their esteem, and Belisarius inculcated the salutary lesson that the forces of the state should compose one body and be animated by one soul. But in the interval of discord the Goths were permitted to breathe, an important season was lost, Milan was destroyed, and the northern provinces of Italy were afflicted by an inundation of the Franks. When Justinian first meditated the conquest of Italy, he sent ambassadors to the kings of the Franks, and adjured them, by the common ties of alliance and religion, to join in the holy enterprise against the Arians. The Goths, as their wants were more urgent, employed a more effectual mode of persuasion, and vainly strove, by the gift of lands and money, to purchase the friendship, or at least the neutrality, of a light and perfidious nation. But the arms of Belisarius and the revolt of the Italians had no sooner shaken the Gothic monarchy than Theodobert of Austrasia, the most powerful and warlike of the Merovingian kings, was persuaded to succor their distress by an indirect and seasonable aid. Without expecting the consent of their sovereign, ten thousand Burgundians, his recent subjects, descended from the Alps, and joined the troops which Vitages had sent to chastise the revolt of Milan. After an obstinate siege, the capital of Liguria was reduced by famine, but no capitulation could be obtained, except for the safe retreat of the Roman garrison. Dacius, the orthodox bishop, who had seduced his countrymen to rebellion eighty and ruin, escaped to the luxury and honors of the Byzantine court semicolon eighty-one but the clergy perhaps the Arian clergy, 
were slaughtered at the foot of their own altars by the defenders of the Catholic faith. 300,000 males were reported to be slain semicolon 82 the female sex, and the more precious spoil, was resigned to the Burgundians, and the houses, or at least the walls, of Milan were leveled with the ground. The Goths, in their last moments, were revenged by the destruction of a city, second only to Rome in size and opulence, in the splendor of its buildings, or the number of its inhabitants and Belisarius sympathized alone in the fate of his deserted and devoted friends. Encouraged by this successful inroad, Theodobut himself, in the ensuing spring, invaded the plains of Italy with an army of 100,000 barbarians. The king and some chosen followers were mounted on horseback and armed with lances, the infantry, without bows or spears, were satisfied with a shield, a sword, and a double-edged battle-axe which, in their hands, became a deadly and unerring weapon. Italy trembled at the march of the Franks, and both the Gothic prince and the Roman general, alike ignorant of their designs, solicited, with hope and terror, the friendship of these dangerous allies. Till he had secured the passage of the Po on the bridge of Pavia, the grandson of Clovis dissembled his intentions, which he at length declared by assaulting, almost at the same instant, the hostile camps of the Romans and Goths. Instead of uniting their arms, they fled with equal precipitation, and the fertile though desolate provinces of Liguria and Emilia were abandoned to a licentious host of barbarians, whose rage was not mitigated by any thoughts of settlement or conquest. Among the cities which they ruined, Genoa, not yet constructed of marble, is particularly enumerated, and the deaths of thousands according to the regular practice of war, appear to have excited less horror than some idolatrous sacrifices of women and children, which were performed with impunity in the camp of the most Christian king. If it were not a melancholy truth that the first and most cruel sufferings must be the lot of the innocent and helpless, history might exult in the misery of the conquerors, who, in the midst of riches, were left destitute of bread or wine, reduced to drink the waters of the Po, and to feed on the flesh of distempered cattle. The dysentery swept away one third of their army, and the clamors of his subjects, who were impatient to pass the Alps, disposed Theodobut to listen with respect to the mild exhortations of Belisarius. The memory of this inglorious and destructive warfare was perpetuated on the medals of Gaul, and Justinian, without unsheathing his sword, assumed the title of conqueror of the Franks. The Merovinian prince was offended by the vanity of the emperor, he affected to pity the fallen fortunes of the Goths, and his insidious offer of a federal union was fortified by the promise or menace of descending from the Alps at the head of five hundred thousand men. His plans of conquest were boundless and perhaps chimerical. The king of Austrasia threatened to chastise Justinian, and to march to the gates of Constantinople semicolon 84 he was overthrown and slain 85 by a wild bull comma 86 as he hunted in the Belgic or German forests. As soon as Belisarius was delivered from his foreign and domestic enemies, he seriously applied his forces to the final reduction of Italy. In the siege of Osimo, the general was nearly transpierced with an arrow if the mortal stroke had not been intercepted by one of his guards, who lost, in that pious office, the use of his hand. The Goths of Osimo, four thousand warriors, with those of Fesiel and the Caution Alps, were among the last who maintained their independence, and their gallant resistance, which almost tired the patience, deserved the esteem, of the conqueror. His prudence refused to subscribe the safe conduct which they asked, to join their brethren of Ravenna, but they saved, by an honorable capitulation, one moiety at least of their wealth, with the free alternative of retiring peaceably to their estates, or enlisting to serve the emperor in his Persian wars. The multitudes which yet adhered to the standard of Vitages far surpassed the number of the Roman troops, but neither prayers, nor defiance, nor the extreme danger of his most faithful subjects could tempt the Gothic king beyond the fortifications of Ravenna. These fortifications were indeed impregnable to the assaults of art or violence, and, when Belisarius invested the capital, 
he was soon convinced that famine only could tame the stubborn spirit of the barbarians. The sea, the land, and the channels of the Po, were guarded by the vigilance of the Roman general, and his morality extended the rights of war to the practice of poisoning the waters, 87 and secretly firing the granaries, 88 of a besieged city. While he pressed the blockade of Ravenna, he was surprised by the arrival of two ambassadors from Constantinople, with a treaty of peace which Justinian had imprudently signed without deigning to consult the author of his victor. By this disgraceful and precarious agreement, Italy and the Gothic treasury were divided, and the provinces beyond the Po were left with the regal title to the successor of Theodoric. The ambassadors were eager to accomplish their salutary commission, the captive vitages accepted, with transport, the unexpected offer of a crown, honor was less prevalent among the Goths than the want and appetite of food, and the Roman chiefs, who murmured at the continuance of the war, professed implicit submission to the commands of the emperor. If Belisarius had possessed only the courage of a soldier, the laurel would have been snatched from his hand by timid and envious counsels, but, in this decisive moment, he resolved, with the magnanimity of a statesman, to sustain alone the danger and merit of generous disobedience. Each of his officers gave written opinion that the siege of Ravenna was impracticable and hopeless, the general then rejected the treaty of partition, and declared his own resolution of leading vitages and chains to the feet of Justinian. The Goths retired with doubt and dismay, this peremptory refusal deprived them of the only signature which they could trust, and filled their minds with a just apprehension that a sagacious enemy had discovered the full extent of their deplorable state. They compared the fame and fortune of Belisarius with the weakness of their ill-fated king, and the comparison suggested an extraordinary project, to which Vitages, with apparent resignation, was compelled to acquiesce. Partition would ruin the strength, exile would disgrace the honor, of the nation, but they offered their arms, their treasures, and the fortifications of Ravenna, if Belisarius would disclaim the authority of a master, accept the choice of the Goths, and assume, as he had deserved, the kingdom of Italy. If the false luster of a diadem could have tempted the loyalty of a faithful subject, his prudence must have foreseen the inconstancy of the barbarians, and his rational ambition would prefer the safe and honorable station of a Roman general. Even the patience and seeming satisfaction with which he entertained a proposal of treason might be susceptible of a malignant interpretation. But the lieutenant of Justinian was conscious of his own rectitude, he entered into a dark and crooked path, as it might lead to the voluntary submission of the Goths, and his dexterous policy persuaded them that he was disposed to comply with their wishes without engaging an oath or a promise for the performance of a treaty which he secretly abhorred. The day of the surrender of Ravenna was stipulated by the Gothic ambassadors, a fleet, laden with provisions, sailed as a welcome guest into the deepest recess of the harbour, the gates were opened to the fancied king of Italy, and Belisarius, without meeting an enemy, triumphantly marched through the streets of an impregnable city. The Romans were astonished by their success, the multitude of tall and robust barbarians were confounded by the image of their own patience, and the masculine females, spitting in the faces of their sons and husbands, most bitterly reproached them for betraying their dominion and freedom to these pygmies of the south, contemptible in their numbers, diminutive in their stature. Before the Goths could recover from the first surprise and claim the accomplishment of their doubtful hopes, the victor established his power in Ravenna, beyond the danger of repentance and revolt. Vitages, who perhaps had attempted to escape, was honorably guarded in his palace. 91 The flower of the Gothic youth was selected for the service of the emperor, the remainder of the people were dismissed to their peaceful habitations in the southern provinces, and a colony of Italians was invited to replenish the depopulated city. The submission of the capital was initiated in the towns and villages of Italy, which had not been subdued, or even visited, by the Romans, and the independent Goths who remained in arms at Pavia and Verona were ambitious only to become the subjects of Belisarius. But his inflexible loyalty rejected, except as the substitute of Justinian, their oaths of allegiance, 
and he was not offended by the reproach of their deputies, that he rather chose to be a slave than a king. After the second victory of Belisarius, envy again whispered, Justinian listened, and the hero was recalled. The remnant of the Gothic war was no longer worthy of his presence, a gracious sovereign was impatient to reward his services, and to consult his wisdom, and he alone was capable of defending the east against the innumerable armies of Persia. Belisarius understood the suspicion, accepted the excuse, embarked at Ravenna his spoils and trophies, and proved, by his ready obedience, that such an abrupt removal from the government of Italy was not less unjust than it might have been indiscreet. The emperor received, with honourable courtesy, both Vitages and his more noble consort, and, as the king of the Goths conformed to the Athanasian faith, he obtained, with a rich inheritance of lands in Asia, the rank of senator and patrician. Every spectator admired, without peril, the strength and stature of the young barbarians, they adored the majesty of the throne, and promised to shed their blood in the service of their benefactor. Justinian deposited in the Byzantine palace the treasures of the Gothic monarchy. A flattering senate was sometimes admitted to gaze on the magnificent spectacle, but it was enviously secluded from the public view, and the conqueror of Italy renounced, without a murmur, perhaps without a sigh, the well-earned honours of a second triumph. His glory was indeed exalted above all external pomp, and the faint and hollow praises of the court were supplied, even in a servile age, by the respect and admiration of his country. Whenever he appeared in the streets and public places of Constantinople, Belisarius attracted and satisfied the eyes of the people. His lofty stature and majestic countenance fulfilled their expectations of an hero, the meanest of his fellow citizens were emboldened by his gentle and gracious demeanour, and the martial train which attended his footsteps left his person more accessible than in a day of battle. 7,000 horsemen, matchless for beauty and valour, were maintained in the service, and at the private expense, of the general. Their prowess was always conspicuous in single combats, or in the foremost ranks, and both parties confessed that in the siege of Rome the guards of Belisarius had alone vanquished the barbarian host. Their numbers were continually augmented by the bravest and most faithful of the enemy, and his fortunate captives, the Vandals, the Moors, and the Goths, emulated the attachment of his domestic followers. By the union of liberality and justice, he acquired the love of the soldiers, without alienating the affections of the people. The sick and wounded were relieved with medicines and money, and, still more efficaciously, by the healing visits and smiles of their commander. The loss of a weapon or a horse was instantly repaired, and each deed of valour was rewarded by the rich and honourable gifts of a bracelet or a collar, which were rendered more precious by the judgment of Belisarius. He was endeared to the husbandmen by the peace and plenty which they enjoyed under the shadow of his standard. Instead of being injured, the country was enriched, by the march of the Roman armies, and such was the rigid discipline of their camp that not an apple was gathered from the tree, not a path could be traced in the fields of corn. Belisarius was chaste and sober. In the license of a military life, none could boast that they had seen him intoxicated with wine. The most beautiful captives of Gothic or Vandal race were offered to his embraces, but he turned aside from their charms, and the husband of Antonina was never suspected of violating the laws of conjugal fidelity. The spectator and historian of his exploits has observed that, amidst the perils of war, he was daring without rashness, prudent without fear, slow or rapid according to the exigencies of the moment, that in the deepest distress, he was animated by real or apparent hope, but that he was modest and humble in the most prosperous fortune. By these virtues he equalled, or excelled, the ancient masters of the military art. Victory, by sea and land, attended his arms. He subdued Africa, Italy, and the adjacent islands, led away captives the successors of Genseric and Theodoric, filled Constantinople with the spoils of their palaces and in the space of six years recovered half the provinces of the Western Empire. In his fame and merit, in wealth and power, he remained without a rival, 
the first of the Roman subjects, the voice of envy could only magnify his dangerous importance, and the emperor might applaud his own discerning spirit which had discovered and raised the genius of Belisarius. It was the custom of the Roman triumphs that a slave should be placed behind the chariot to remind the conqueror of the instability of fortune and the infirmities of human nature. Procopius, in his anecdotes, has assumed that servile and ungrateful office. The generous reader may cast away the libel, but the evidence of facts will adhere to his memory, and he will reluctantly confess that the fame, and even the virtue, of Belisarius were polluted by the lust and cruelty of his wife, and that the hero deserved an appellation which may not drop from the pen of the decent historian. The mother of Antonina was a theatrical prostitute, and both her father and grandfather exercised at Thessalonica and Constantinople the vile, though lucrative, profession of charioteers. In the various situations of their fortune, she became the companion, the enemy, the servant, and the favorite of the Empress Theodora, these loose and ambitious females had been connected by similar pleasures, they were separated by the jealousy of vice, and at length reconciled by the partnership of guilt. Before her marriage with Belisarius, Antonina had one husband and many lovers, Phocius, the son of her former nuptials, was of an age to distinguish himself at the siege of Naples, and it was not till the autumn of her age and beauty that she indulged a scandalous attachment to a Thracian youth. Theodosius had been educated in the Anomian heresy, the African voyage was consecrated by the baptism and auspicious name of the first soldier who embarked, and the proselyte was adopted into the family of his spiritual parents, Belisarius and Antonina. Before they touched the shores of Africa, this holy kindred degenerated into sensual love, and, as Antonina soon overleaped the bounds of modesty and caution, the Roman general was alone ignorant of his own dishonor. During their residence at Carthage, he surprised the two lovers in a subterraneous chamber, solitary, warm, and almost naked. Anger flashed from his eyes. With the help of this young man, said the unblushing Antonina, I was secreting our most precious effects from the knowledge of Justinian. The youth resumed his garments, and the pious husband consented to disbelieve the evidence of his own senses. From this pleasing and perhaps voluntary delusion Belisarius was awakened at Syracuse, by the officious information of Macedonia, and that female attendant, after requiring an oath for her security, produced two chamberlains, who, like herself, had often beheld the adulteries of Antonina. An hasty flight into Asia saved Theodosius from the justice of an injured husband, who had signified to one of his guards the order of his death, but the tears of Antonina, and her artful seductions, assured the credulous hero of her innocence, and he stooped, against his faith and judgment, to abandon those imprudent friends who had presumed to accuse or doubt the chastity of his wife. The revenge of a guilty woman is implacable and bloody. The unfortunate Macedonia, with the two witnesses, were secretly arrested by the minister of her cruelty, their tongues were cut out, their bodies were hacked into small pieces, and their remains were cast into the sea of Syracuse. A rash though judicious saying of Constantine, I would sooner have punished the adulteress than the boy, was deeply remembered by Antonina, and two years afterwards, when despair had armed that officer against his general, her sanguinary advice decided and hastened his execution. Even the indignation of Phocius was not forgiven by his mother, the exile of her son prepared the recall of her lover, and Theodosius condescended to accept the pressing and humble invitation of the conqueror of Italy. In the absolute direction of his household, and in the important commissions of peace and war, 94 the favourite youth most rapidly acquired a fortune of four hundred thousand pounds sterling, and, after their return to Constantinople, the passion of Antonina, at least, continued ardent and unabated. But fear, devotion, and lassitude perhaps, inspired Theodosius with more serious thoughts. He dreaded the busy scandal of the capital and the indiscreet fondness of the wife of Belisarius, escaped from her embraces, and, retiring to Ephesus, shaved his head and took refuge in the sanctuary of an monastic life. 
the despair of the new Ariadne could scarcely have been excused by the death of her husband. She wept, she tore her hair, she filled the palace with her cries, she had lost the dearest of friends, a tender, a faithful, a laborious friend. But her warm entreaties, fortified by the prayers of Belisarius, were insufficient to draw the holy monk from the solitude of Ephesus. It was not till the general moved forward for the Persian War, that Theodosius could be tempted to return to Constantinople, and the short interval before the departure of Antonina herself was boldly devoted to love and pleasure. A philosopher may pity and forgive the infirmities of female nature, from which he receives no real injury, but contemptible is the husband who feels, and yet endures, his own infamy in that of his wife. Antonina pursued her son with implacable hatred, and the gallant Phocius 95 was exposed to her secret persecutions in the camp beyond the Tigris. Enraged by his own wrongs and by the dishonor of his blood, he cast away in his turn the sentiments of nature, and revealed to Belisarius the turpitude of the woman who had violated all the duties of a mother and a wife. From the surprise and indignation of the Roman general, his former credulity appears to have been sincere, he embraced the knees of the son of Antonina, adjured him to remember his obligations rather than his birth, and confirmed at the altar their holy vows of revenge and mutual defence. The dominion of Antonina was impaired by absence, and, when she met her husband, on his return from the Persian confines, Belisarius, in his first and transient emotions, confined her person and threatened her life. Phocius was more resolved to punish, and less prompt to pardon, he flew to Ephesus, extorted from a trusty eunuch of his mother the full confession of her guilt, arrested Theodosius and his treasures in the church of Saint John the Apostle, and concealed his captives, whose execution was only delayed, in a secure and sequestered fortress of Cilicia. Such a daring outrage against public justice could not pass with impunity, and the cause of Antonina was espoused by the Empress, whose favour she had deserved by the recent services of the disgrace of a prefect and the exile and murder of a pope. At the end of the campaign, Belisarius was recalled, he complied, as usual, with the imperial mandate. His mind was not prepared for rebellion, his obedience, however adverse to the dictates of honour was consonant to the wishes of his heart, and, when he embraced his wife, at the command, and perhaps in the presence, of the empress, the tender husband was disposed to forgive or to be forgiven. The bounty of Theodora reserved for her companion a more precious favour. I have found, she said, my dearest patrician, a pearl of inestimable value, it has not yet been viewed by any mortal eye, but the sight and the possession of this jewel are destined for my friend. As soon as the curiosity and impatience of Antonina were kindled, the door of a bedchamber was thrown open, and she beheld her lover, whom the diligence of the eunuchs had discovered in his secret prison. Her silent wonder burst into passionate exclamations of gratitude and joy, and she named Theodora her queen, her benefactress, and her saviour. The monk of Ephesus was nourished in the palace with luxury and ambition, but, instead of assuming, as he was promised, the command of the Roman armies, Theodosius expired in the first fatigues of an amorous interview. The grief of Antonina could only be assuaged by the sufferings of her son. A youth of consular rank, and a sickly constitution, was punished, without a trial, like a malefactor and a slave, yet such was the constancy of his mind that Phocius sustained the tortures of the scourge and the rack without violating the faith which he had sworn to Belisarius. After this fruitless cruelty, the son of Antonina, while his mother feasted with the empress, was buried in her subterraneous prisons, which admitted not the distinction of night and day. He twice escaped to the most venerable sanctuaries of Constantinople, the churches of Street Sophia and of the Virgin, but his tyrants were insensible of religion as of pity, and the helpless youth, amidst the clamours of the clergy and people, was twice dragged from the altar to the dungeon. His third attempt was more successful. At the end of three years, the prophet Zachariah, or some mortal friend, indicated the means of an escape, he eluded the spies and guards of the empress, 
reached the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, embraced the profession of a monk, and the abbot Photius was employed, after the death of Justinian, to reconcile and regulate the churches of Egypt. The son of Antoninus suffered all that an enemy can inflict, her patient husband imposed on himself the more exquisite misery of violating his promise and deserting his friend. In the succeeding campaign, Belisarius was again sent against the Persians, he saved the East, but he offended Theodora, and perhaps the Emperor himself. The malady of Justinian had countenanced the rumor of his death, and the Roman general, on the supposition of that probable event, spoke the free language of a citizen and a soldier. His colleague Bzis, who concurred in the same sentiments, lost his rank, his liberty, and his health, by the persecution of the Empress, but the disgrace of Belisarius was alleviated by the dignity of his own character, and the influence of his wife, who might wish to humble, but could not desire to ruin, the partner of her fortunes. Even his removal was coloured by the assurance that the sinking state of Italy would be retrieved by the single presence of its conqueror. But no sooner had he returned, alone and defenceless, than an hostile commission was sent to the east, to seize his treasures and criminate his actions. The guards and veterans who followed his private banner were distributed among the chiefs of the army, and even the eunuchs presumed to cast lots for the partition of his martial domestics. When he passed with a small and sordid retinue through the streets of Constantinople, his forlorn appearance excited the amazement and compassion of the people. Justinian and Theodora received him with cold ingratitude, the servile crowd with insolence and contempt, and in the evening he retired with trembling steps to his deserted palace. An indisposition, feigned or real, had confined Antonina to her apartment and she walked disdainfully silent in the adjacent portico, while Belisarius threw himself on his bed, and expected, in an agony of grief and terror, the death which he had so often braved under the walls of Rome. Long after sunset a messenger was announced from the Empress, he opened, with anxious curiosity, the letter which contained the sentence of his fate. You cannot be ignorant how much you have deserved my displeasure. I am not insensible of the services of Antonina. To her merits and intercession I have granted your life, and permit you to retain a part of your treasures, which might be justly forfeited to the state. Let your gratitude, where it is due, be displayed, not in words, but in your future behavior. I know not how to believe or to relate the transports with which the hero is said to have received this ignominious pardon. He fell prostrate before his wife, he kissed the feet of his saviour, and he devoutly promised to live the grateful and submissive slave of Antonina. A fine of one hundred and twenty thousand pounds sterling was levied on the fortunes of Belisarius, and with the office of Count, or Master of the Royal Stables, he accepted the conduct of the Italian war. At his departure from Constantinople, his friends, and even the public, were persuaded that, as soon as he regained his freedom, he would renounce his dissimulation, and that his wife, Theodora, and perhaps the emperor himself, would be sacrificed to the just revenge of a virtuous rebel. Their hopes were deceived, and the unconquerable patience and loyalty of Belisarius appear either below or above the character of a man. The art of man is able to construct monuments far more permanent than the narrow span of his own existence, yet these monuments, like himself, are perishable and frail, and, in the boundless annals of time, his life and his labours must equally be measured as a fleeting moment. In the Temple of Peace a very curious library was open. At a small distance from thence was situated the Forum of Trajan. It was surrounded with a lofty portico in the form of a quadrangle, into which four triumphal arches opened a noble and spacious entrance. State of the barbaric world middle dot establishment of the Lombards on the Danube middle dot tribes and inroads of the Sclavonians middle dot origin, empire, and embassies of the Turks middle dot the flight of the Avars middle dot Chosroes I. Or Nushirvan king of Persia middle dot his reign and wars with the Romans middle dot the Colchian or Lazic war middle dot the Ethiopian saw a estimate of personal merit as relative to the common faculties of mankind the efforts of genius or virtue, 
either in active or speculative life, are measured not so much by their real elevation as by the height to which they ascend above the level of their age or country, and the same stature, which in a people of giants would pass unnoticed, must appear conspicuous in a race of pygmies. Leonidas and his three hundred companions devoted their lives at Thermopyle, but the education of the infant, the boy, and the man, had prepared, and almost ensured, this memorable sacrifice, and each Spartan would approve, rather than admire, an act of duty of which himself and eight thousand of his fellow citizens were equally capable. The great Pompey might inscribe on his trophies, that he had defeated in battle two millions of enemies and reduced fifteen hundred cities from the Lake of Meotis to the Red Sea semicolon too but the fortune of Rome flew before his eagles, the nations were oppressed by their own fears, and the invincible legions which he commanded had been formed by the habits of conquest and the discipline of ages. In this view, the character of Belisarius may be deservedly placed above the heroes of the ancient republics. His imperfections flowed from the contagion of the times, his virtues were his own, the free gift of nature or reflection, he raised himself without a master or a rival, and so inadequate were the arms committed to his hand that his sole advantage was derived from the pride and presumption of his adversaries. Under his command, the subjects of Justinian often deserved to be called Romans, but the unwarlike appellation of Greeks was imposed as a term of reproach by the haughty Goths, who affected to blush that they must dispute the kingdom of Italy with a nation of tragedians, pantomimes, and pirates. The climate of Asia has indeed been found less congenial than that of Europe to military spirit, those populous countries were enervated by luxury, despotism, and superstition, and the monks were more expensive and more numerous than the soldiers of the East. The regular force of the empire had once amounted to 645,000 men, it was reduced, in the time of Justinian, to 150,000, and this number, large as it may seem, was thinly scattered over the sea and land, in Spain and Italy, in Africa and Egypt, on the banks of the Danube, the coast of the Euxine, and the frontiers of Persia. The citizen was exhausted, yet the soldier was unpaid, his poverty was mischievously soothed by the privilege of rapine and indolence, and the tardy payments were detained and intercepted by the fraud of those agents who usurp, without courage or danger, the emoluments of war. Public and private distress recruited the armies of the state, but in the field, and still more in the presence of the enemy, their numbers were always defective. The want of national spirit was supplied by the precarious faith and disorderly service of barbarian mercenaries. Even military honor, which has often survived the loss of virtue and freedom, was almost totally extinct. The generals, who were multiplied beyond the example of former times, labored only to prevent the success, or to sully the reputation, of their colleagues, and they had been taught by experience that, if merit sometimes provoked the jealousy, error or even guilt would obtain the indulgence, of a gracious emperor. In such an age the triumphs of Belisarius, and afterwards of Narses, shine with incomparable luster, but they are encompassed with the darkest shades of disgrace and calamity. While the lieutenant of Justinian subdued the kingdoms of the Goths and Vandals, the emperor, comma for timid though ambitious, balanced the forces of the barbarians, fomented their divisions by flattery and falsehood, and invited by his patience and liberality the repetition of injuries. The keys of Carthage, Rome, and Ravenna were presented to their conqueror, while Antioch was destroyed by the Persians and Justinian trembled for the safety of Constantinople. Even the Gothic victories of Belisarius were prejudicial to the state, since they abolished the important barrier of the upper Danube which had been so faithfully guarded by Theodoric and his daughter. For the defence of Italy, the Goths evacuated Bannonia and Noricum, which they left in a peaceful and flourishing condition, the sovereignty was claimed by the Emperor of the Romans. The actual possession was abandoned to the boldness of the first invader. On the opposite banks of the Danube, the plains of Upper Hungary and the Transylvanian hills were possessed, since the death of Attila by the tribes of the Jepide, who respected the Gothic arms, and despised, 
not indeed the gold of the Romans, but the secret motive of their annual subsidies. The vacant fortifications of the river were instantly occupied by these barbarians, their standards were planted on the walls of Sirmium and Belgrade, and the ironical tone of their apology aggravated this insult on the majesty of the empire. So extensive, O Caesar, are your dominions, so numerous are your cities, that you are continually seeking for nations to whom, either in peace or war, you may relinquish these useless possessions. The Jepide are your brave and faithful allies, and, if they have anticipated your gifts, they have shown a just confidence in your bounty. Their presumption was excused by the mode of revenge which Justinian embraced. Instead of asserting the rights of a sovereign for the protection of his subjects, the emperor invited a strange people to invade and possess the Roman provinces between the Danube and the Alps and the ambition of the Jepide was checked by the rising power and fame of the Lombards. This corrupt appellation has been diffused in the 13th century by the merchants and bankers, the Italian posterity of these savage warriors, but the original name of Lanabards is expressive only of the peculiar length and fashion of their beards. I am not disposed either to question or to justify their Scandinavian origin semicolon 7 nor to pursue the migrations of the Lombards through unknown regions and marvelous adventures. About the time of Augustus and Trajan, a ray of historic light breaks on the darkness of their antiquities, and they are discovered, for the first time, between the Elbe and the Oder. Fierce beyond the example of the Germans. They delighted to propagate the tremendous belief that their heads were formed like the heads of dogs and that they drank the blood of their enemies whom they vanquished in battle. The smallness of their numbers was recruited by the adoption of their bravest slaves, and alone, amidst their powerful neighbors, they defended by arms their high-spirited independence. In the tempests of the north, which overwhelmed so many names and nations, this little bark of the Lombards still floated on the surface. They gradually descended towards the south and the Danube, and at the end of four hundred years they again appear with their ancient valour and renown. Their manners were not less ferocious. The assassination of a royal guest was executed in the presence, and by the command, of the king's daughter, who had been provoked by some words of insult and disappointed by his diminutive stature, and a tribute, the price of blood, was imposed on the Lombards by his brother the king of the Heruli. Adversity revived a sense of moderation and justice, and the insolence of conquest was chastised by the signal defeat and irreparable dispersion of the Heruli, who were seated in the southern provinces of Poland. The victories of the Lombards, recommended them to the friendship of the emperors, and, at the solicitation of Justinian, they passed the Danube, to reduce, according to their treaty, the cities of Noricum and the fortresses of Pannonia. But the spirit of rapine soon tempted them beyond these ample limits. They wandered along the coast of the Hadriatic as far as Dyrrhachium, and presumed, with familiar rudeness, to enter the towns and houses of their Roman allies and to seize the captives who had escaped from their audacious hands. These acts of hostility, the sallies, as it might be pretended, of some loose adventurers, were disowned by the nation and excused by the emperor, but the arms of the Lombards were more seriously engaged by a contest of thirty years, which was terminated only by the extirpation of the Jepide. The hostile nations often pleaded their cause before the throne of Constantinople, and the crafty Justinian, to whom the barbarians were almost equally odious, pronounced a partial and ambiguous sentence and dexterously protracted the war by slow and ineffectual succors. Their strength was formidable, since the Lombards, who sent into the field several myriads of soldiers, still claimed, as the weaker side, the protection of the Romans. Their spirit was intrepid, yet such is the uncertainty of courage that the two armies were suddenly struck with a panic, they fled from each other, and the rival kings remained with their guards in the midst of an empty plain. A short truce was obtained, but their mutual resentment again kindled, and the remembrance of their shame rendered the next encounter more desperate and bloody. Forty thousand of the barbarians perished in the decisive battle, which broke the power of the Jepide, transferred the fears and wishes of Justinian, 
and first displayed the character of Alboin, the youthful prince of the Lombards, and the future conqueror of Italy. The wild people who dwelt or wandered in the plains of Russia, Lithuania, and Poland, might be reduced, in the age of Justinian, under the two great families of the Bulgarians Nine and the Sclavonians. According to the Greek writers, the former, who touched the Euxine and the Lake Meotis, derived from the Huns their name or descent, and it is needless to renew the simple and well-known picture of Tartar manners. They were bold and dexterous archers, who drank the milk and feasted on the flesh of their fleet and indefatigable horses, whose flocks and herds followed, or rather guided, the motions of their roving camps, to whose inroads no country was remote or impervious, and who were practiced in flight, though incapable of fear. The nation was divided into two powerful and hostile tribes, who pursued each other with fraternal hatred. They eagerly disputed the friendship or rather the gifts of the emperor, and the distinction which nature had fixed between the faithful dog and the rapacious wolf was applied by an ambassador who received only verbal instructions from the mouth of his illiterate prince. The Bulgarians, of whatsoever species, were equally attracted by Roman wealth, they assumed a vague dominion over the Sclavonian name, and their rapid marches could only be stepped by the Baltic Sea or the extreme cold and poverty of the north. But the same race of Sclavonians appears to have maintained, in every age, the possession of the same countries. Their numerous tribes, however distant or adverse, used one common language, it was harsh and irregular, and were known by the resemblance of their form which deviated from the swarthy Tartar, and approached without attaining the lofty stature and fair complexion of the German. 4,600 villages 11 were scattered over the provinces of Russia and Poland, and their huts were hastily built of rough timber, in a country deficient both in stone and iron. Erected, or rather concealed, in the depth of forests, on the banks of rivers, or the edge of morasses, we may not perhaps, without flattery, compare them to the architecture of the beaver, which they resembled in a double issue, to the land and water, for the escape of the savage inhabitant, an animal less cleanly, less diligent, and less social, than that marvellous quadruped. The fertility of the soil, rather than the labour of the natives, supplied the rustic plenty of the Sclavonians. Their sheep and horned cattle were large and numerous, and the fields which they sowed with militant panic twelve afforded, in the place of bread, a coarse and less nutritive food. The incessant rapine of their neighbours compelled them to bury this treasure in the earth, but on the appearance of a stranger, it was freely imparted by a people whose unfavourable character is qualified by the epithets of chaste, patient, and hospitable. As their supreme god, they adored an invisible master of the thunder. The rivers and the nymphs obtained their subordinate honours, and the popular worship was expressed in vows and sacrifice. The Sclavonians disdained to obey a despot, a prince, or even a magistrate, but their experience was too narrow, their passions too headstrong, to compose a system of equal law or general defence. Some voluntary respect was yielded to age and valour, but each tribe or village existed as a separate republic, and all must be persuaded where none could be compelled. They fought on foot, almost naked, and, except an unwieldy shield, without any defensive armour, their weapons of offence were a bow, a quiver of small poisoned arrows, and a long rope, which they dexterously threw from a distance, and entangled their enemy in a running noose. In the field, the Sclavonian infantry was dangerous by their speed, agility, and hardiness, they swam, they dived, they remained under water, drawing their breath through a hollow cane, and a river or lake was often the scene of their unsuspected ambuscade. But these were the achievements of spies or stragglers. The military art was unknown to the Sclavonians, their name was obscure, and their conquests were inglorious. I have marked the faint and general outline of the Sclavonians and Bulgarians, without attempting to define their intermediate boundaries which were not accurately known or respected by the barbarians themselves. Their importance was measured by their vicinity to the empire, and the level country of Moldavia and Wallachia was occupied by the Antes, a Sclavonian tribe, 
which swelled the titles of Justinian with an epithet of conquest. Against the Antes he erected the fortifications of the Lower Danube, and laboured to secure the alliance of a people seated in the direct channel of northern inundation, an interval of two hundred miles between the mountains of Transylvania and the Euxine Sea. But the Antes wanted power and inclination to stem the fury of the torrent, and the light-armed Sclavonians, from an hundred tribes, pursued, with almost equal speed, the footsteps of the Bulgarian horse. The payment of one piece of gold for each soldier procured a safe and easy retreat through the country of the Jepide, who commanded the passage of the Upper Danube. The hopes or fears of the barbarians, their intestine union or discord, the accident of a frozen or shallow stream, the prospect of harvest or vintage, the prosperity or distress of the Romans, were the causes which produced the uniform repetition of annual visits, 15 tedious in the narrative and destructive in the event. The same year, and possibly the same month, in which Ravenna surrendered, was marked by an invasion of the Huns or Bulgarians, so dreadful that it almost effaced the memory of their past inroads. They spread from the suburbs of Constantinople to the Ionian Gulf, destroyed thirty two cities or castles erased Potidia, which Athens had built and Philip had besieged, and repassed the Danube, dragging at their horses' heels 120,000 of the subjects of Justinian. In a subsequent inroad they pierced the wall of the Thrace and Chisensus, extirpated the habitations and the inhabitants, boldly traversed the Hellespont, and returned to their companions, laden with the spoils of Asia. Another party, which seemed a multitude in the eyes of the Romans, penetrated, without opposition, from the Straits of Thermopyle to the Isthmus of Corinth, and the last ruin of Greece has appeared in object too minute for the attention of history. The works which the emperor raised for the protection, but at the expense, of his subjects, served only to disclose the weakness of some neglected part, and the walls, which by flattery had been deemed impregnable were either deserted by the garrison or scaled by the barbarians. Three thousand Sclavonians, who insolently divided themselves into two bands, discovered the weakness and misery of a triumphant reign. They passed the Danube and the Hebrus, vanquished the Roman generals who dared to oppose their progress, and plundered with impunity, the cities of Illyricum and Thrace, each of which had arms and numbers to overwhelm their contemptible assailants. Whatever praise the boldness of the Sclavonians may deserve, it is sullied by the wanton and deliberate cruelty which they are accused of exercising on their prisoners. Without distinction of rank, or age, or sex, the captives were impaled, or flayed alive, or suspended between four posts and beaten with clubs till they expired, or enclosed in some spacious building and left to perish in the flames with the spoil and cattle which might impede the march of these savage victors. Perhaps a more impartial narrative would reduce the number, and qualify the nature, of these horrid acts, and they might sometimes be excused by the cruel laws of retaliation. In the siege of Torpyrus, 17 whose obstinate defence had enraged the Sclavonians, they massacred 15,000 males, but they spared the women and children, the most valuable captives were always reserved for labour or ransom, the servitude was not rigorous, and the terms of their deliverance were speedy and moderate. But the subject or the historian of Justinian exhaled his just indignation in the language of complaint and reproach and Procopius has confidently affirmed that in a reign of thirty-two years each annual inroad of the barbarians consumed two hundred thousand of the inhabitants of the Roman Empire. The entire population of Turkish Europe, which nearly corresponds with the provinces of Justinian, would perhaps be incapable of supplying six millions of persons, the result of this incredible estimate. In the midst of these obscure calamities, Europe felt the shock of a revolution which first revealed to the world the name and nation of the Turks. Like Romulus, the founder of the martial people was suckled by a she-wolf, who afterwards made him the father of a numerous progeny, and the representation of that animal in the banners of the Turks preserved the memory, or rather suggested the idea, of a fable, which was invented, without any mutual intercourse, by the shepherds of Latium and those of Scythia. 
at the equal distance of 2,000 miles from the Caspian, the Icy, the Chinese, and the Bengal Seas, a ridge of mountains is conspicuous, the center and perhaps the summit of Asia, which, in the language of different nations, has been styled I Mors, and Kaf common 19 and Altai, and the Golden Mountains, and the Girdle of the Earth. The sides of the hills were productive of minerals, and the iron forges, 20 for the purpose of war, were exercised by the Turks, the most despised portion of the slaves of the great Khan of the Georgian. But their servitude could only last till a leader, bold and eloquent, should arise, to persuade his countrymen that the same arms which they forged for their masters might become, in their own hands, the instruments of freedom and victory. They sallied from the mountain semicolon 21 a scepter was the reward of his advice, and the annual ceremony, in which a piece of iron was heated in the fire and a smith's hammer was successively handled by the prince and his nobles, recorded for ages the humble profession and rational pride of the Turkish nation. Berzner, their first leader, signalized their valor in his own and successful combats against the neighboring tribes. But, when he presumed to ask in marriage the daughter of the great Khan, the insolent demand of a slave and a mechanic was contemptuously rejected. The disgrace was expiated by a more noble alliance with the Princess of China, and the decisive battle, which almost extirpated the nation of Georgian, established in Tartary the new and more powerful empire of the Turks. They reigned over the north but they confessed the vanity of conquest by their faithful attachment to the mountain of their fathers. The royal encampment seldom lost sight of Mount Altai, from whence the river Irtish descends to water the rich pastures of the Karmux, 22 which nourish the largest sheep and oxen in the world. The soil is fruitful, and the climate mild and temperate, the happy region was ignorant of earthquake and pestilence, the emperor's throne was turned towards the east, and a golden wolf, on the top of a spear, seemed to guard the entrance of his tent. One of the successors of Berzner was tempted by the luxury and superstition of China, but his design of building cities and temples was defeated by the simple wisdom of a barbarian counselor. The Turks, he said, are not equal in number to one hundredth part of the inhabitants of China. If we balance their power and elude their armies, it is because we wander without any fixed habitations, in the exercise of war and hunting. Are we strong? We advance and conquer, are we feeble? We retire and are concealed. Should the Turks confine themselves within the walls of cities, the loss of a battle would be the destruction of their empire. The Bonzes preach only patience, humility, and the renunciation of the world. Such. O king! Is not the religion of heroes? They entertained with less reluctance the doctrines of Zoroaster, but the greatest part of the nation acquiesced, without inquiry, in the opinions, or rather in the practice, of their ancestors. The honors of sacrifice were reserved for the supreme deity. They acknowledged, in rude hymns, their obligations to the air, the fire, the water, and the earth and their priests derived some profit from the art of divination. Their unwritten laws were rigorous and impartial, theft was punished by a tenfold restitution, adultery, treason, and murder, with death, and no chastisement could be inflicted too severe for the rare and inexpiable guilt of cowardice. As the subject nations marched under the standard of the Turks, their cavalry, both men and horses, were proudly computed by millions. One of their effective armies consisted of 400,000 soldiers, and in less than 50 years they were connected in peace and war with the Romans, the Persians, and the Chinese. In their northern limits, some vestige may be discovered of the form and situation of Kamchatka, of a people of hunters and fishermen, whose sledges were drawn by dogs, and whose habitations were buried in the earth. The Turks were ignorant of astronomy but the observation taken by some learned Chinese, with a gnome on of 8 feet, fixes the royal camp in the latitude of 49 degrees, and marks their extreme progress within 3, or at least 10, degrees of the polar circle. Among their southern conquests, the most splendid was that of the Niftalites or White Huns, a polite and warlike people, 
who possessed the commercial cities of Bochara and Samarkand, who had vanquished the Persian monarch, and carried their victorious arms along the banks, and perhaps to the mouth, of the Indus. On the side of the west, the Turkish cavalry advanced to the Lake Meades. They passed that lake on the ice. The Khan, who dwelt at the foot of Mount Altai, issued his commands for the siege of Bosphorus, 24 a city, the voluntary subject of Rome, and whose princes had formerly been the friends of Athens. To the east, the Turks invaded China, as often as the vigor of the government was relaxed, and I am taught to read in the history of the times, that they mowed down their patient enemies like hemp or grass, and that the mandarins applauded the wisdom of an emperor who repulsed these barbarians with golden lances. This extent of savage empire compelled the Turkish monarch to establish three subordinate princes of his own blood, who soon forgot their gratitude and allegiance. The conquerors were innovated by luxury, which is always fatal except to an industrious people, the policy of China solicited the vanquished nations to resume their independence, and the power of the Turks was limited to a period of two hundred years. The revival of their name and dominion in the southern countries of Asia are the events of a later age, and the dynasties which succeeded to their native realms may sleep in oblivion, since their history bears no relation to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. In the rapid career of conquest, the Turks attacked and subdued the nation of the Ogres, or Varginites, on the banks of the river Till, which derived the epithet of black from its dark water or gloomy forests. The Khan of the Ogres was slain with 300,000 of his subjects, and their bodies were scattered over the space of four days' journey. Their surviving countrymen acknowledged the strength and mercy of the Turks, and a small portion, about 20,000 warriors, preferred exile to servitude. They followed the well known road of the Volga, cherished the error of the nations who confounded them with the Avars, and spread the terror of that false though famous appellation, which had not however, saved its lawful proprietors from the yoke of the Turks. After a long and victorious march, the new Avars arrived at the foot of Mount Caucasus, in the country of the Alani 27 and Circassians, where they first heard of the splendor and weakness of the Roman Empire. They humbly requested their confederate, the prince of the Alani, to lead them to this source of riches, and their ambassador, with the permission of the governor of Lazica, was transported by the Euxine Sea to Constantinople. The whole city was poured forth to behold with curiosity and terror the aspect of a strange people, their long hair, which hung in terraces down their backs, was gracefully bound with ribbons, but the rest of their habit appeared to imitate the fashion of the Huns. When they were admitted to the audience of Justinian, Candish, the first of the ambassadors, addressed the Roman Emperor in these terms. You see before you, O mighty prince, the representatives of the strongest and most populous of nations, the invincible, the irresistible Avars. We are willing to devote ourselves to your service, we are able to vanquish and destroy all the enemies who now disturb your repose. But we expect, as the price of our alliance, as the reward of our valor, precious gifts, annual subsidies, and fruitful possessions. At the time of this embassy, Justinian had reigned above thirty, he had lived above seventy-five, years. His mind, as well as his body, was feeble and languid, and the conqueror of Africa and Italy, careless of the permanent interest of his people, aspired only to end his days in the bosom even of inglorious peace. In a studied oration he imparted to the Senate his resolution to dissemble the insult, and to purchase the friendship, of the Avars and the whole senate, like the mandarins of China, applauded the incomparable wisdom and foresight of their sovereign. The instruments of luxury were immediately prepared to captivate the barbarians, silken garments, soft and splendid beds, and chains and collars encrusted with gold. The ambassadors, content with such liberal reception, departed from Constantinople, and Valentin, one of the emperor's guards, was sent with a similar character to their camp at the foot of Mount Caucasus. As their destruction or their success must be alike advantageous to the empire, he persuaded them to invade the enemies of Rome, and they were easily tempted, by gifts and promises, to gratify their ruling inclinations. 
These fugitives who fled before the Turkish arms passed the Danais and Borysthans, and boldly advanced into the heart of Poland and Germany, violating the law of nations and abusing the rights of victory. Before ten years had elapsed, their camps were seated on the Danube and the Elbe, many Bulgarian and Slavonian names were obliterated from the earth, and the remainder of their tribes are found as tributaries and vassals under the standard of the Avars. The Shagan, the peculiar title of their king, still affected to cultivate the friendship of the emperor, and Justinian entertained some thoughts of fixing them in Pannonia to balance the prevailing power of the Lombards. But the virtue or treachery of an Avar betrayed the secret enmity and ambitious designs of their countrymen, and they loudly complained of the timid though jealous policy of detaining their ambassadors, and denying the arms which they had been allowed to purchase in the capital of the empire. Perhaps the apparent change in the dispositions of the emperors may be ascribed to the embassy which was received from the conquerors of the Avars. The immense distance which eluded their arms could not extinguish their resentment, the Turkish ambassadors pursued the footsteps of the vanquished to the Jake, the Volga, Mount Caucasus, the Euxine, and Constantinople, and at length appeared before the successor of Constantine, to request that he would not espouse the cause of rebels and fugitives. Even commerce had some share in this remarkable negotiation, and the Sogdoites, who were now the tributaries of the Turks, embraced the fair occasion of opening by the north of the Caspian, a new road for the importation of Chinese silk into the Roman Empire. The Persian, who preferred the navigation of Ceylon, had stopped the caravans of Bochara and Samarkand, their silk was contemptuously burned, some Turkish ambassadors died in Persia, with a suspicion of poison, and the great Khan permitted his faithful vassal Mainayach, the prince of the Sogdoites, to propose, at the Byzantine court a treaty of alliance against their common enemies. Their splendid apparel and rich presents, the fruit of oriental luxury, distinguished Mainayach and his colleagues from the rude savages of the north, their letters, in the Scythian character and language, announced a people who had attained the rudiments of science semicolon 29 they enumerated the conquests, they offered the friendship and military aid, of the Turks, and their sincerity was attested by direful imprecations if they were guilty of falsehood, against their own head and the head of Disabul their master. The Greek prince entertained with hospitable regard the ambassadors of a remote and powerful monarch, the sight of silkworms and looms disappointed the hopes of the Sogdoites, the emperor renounced, or seemed to renounce, the fugitive Avars, but he accepted the alliance of the Turks, and the ratification of the treaty was carried by a Roman minister to the foot of Mount Altai. Under the successors of Justinian, the friendship of the two nations was cultivated by frequent and cordial intercourse. The most favoured vassals were permitted to imitate the example of the great Khan, and 106 Turks, who, on various occasions, had visited Constantinople, departed at the same time for their native country. The duration and length of the journey from the Byzantine court to Mount Altai are not specified. It might have been difficult to mark a road through the nameless deserts, the mountains, rivers, and morasses of Tartary, but a curious account has been preserved of the reception of the Roman ambassadors at the royal camp. After they had been purified with fire and incense, according to a rite still practiced under the sons of Zinis, they were introduced to the presence of Disabul. In a valley of the Golden Mountain, they found the great Khan in his tent seated in a chair with wheels, to which in horse might be occasionally harnessed. As soon as they had delivered their presents, which were received by the proper officers, they exposed, in a florid oration, the wishes of the Roman Emperor, that victory might attend the arms of the Turks, that their reign might be long and prosperous, and that a strict alliance, without envy or deceit, might for ever be maintained between the two most powerful nations of the earth. The answer of Disabul corresponded with these friendly professions, and the ambassadors were seated by his side, at a banquet which lasted the greatest part of the day, the tent was surrounded with silk hangings, and a tartar liquor was served on the table, which possessed at least the intoxicating qualities of wine. 
The entertainment of the succeeding day was more sumptuous, the silk hangings of the second tent were embroidered in various figures, and the royal seat, the cups, and the vases were of gold. A third pavilion was supported by columns of gilt wood, a bed of pure and massy gold was raised on four peacocks of the same metal, and, before the entrance of the tent, dishes, basins, and statues of solid silver, and admirable art, were ostentatiously piled in wagons, the monuments of valor rather than of industry. When Disabur led his armies against the frontiers of Persia, his Roman allies followed many days the march of the Turkish camp, nor were they dismissed until they had enjoyed their precedency over the envoy of the great king, whose loud and intemperate clamors interrupted the silence of the royal banquet. The power and ambition of Chosroes cemented the union of the Turks and Romans, who touched his dominions on either side, but those distant nations, regardless of each other, consulted the dictates of interest, without recollecting the obligations of oaths and treaties. While the successor of Disabul celebrated his father's obsequies, he was saluted by the ambassadors of the Emperor Tiberius, who proposed an invasion of Persia, and sustained with firmness the angry, and perhaps the just, reproaches of that haughty barbarian. You see my ten fingers, said the great Khan, and he applied them to his mouth. You Romans speak with as many tongues, but they are tongues of deceit and perjury. To me you hold one language, to my subjects another, and the nations are successively deluded by your perfidious eloquence. You precipitate your allies into war and danger, you enjoy their labors, and you neglect your benefactors. Hasten your return, inform your master that a Turk is incapable of uttering or forgiving falsehood, and that he shall speedily meet the punishment which he deserves. While he solicits my friendship with flattering and hollow words, he is sunk to a confederate of my fugitive Argonites. If I condescend to march against those contemptible slaves, they will tremble at the sound of our whips, they will be trampled, like a nest of ants, under the feet of my innumerable cavalry. I am not ignorant of the road which they have followed to invade your empire, nor can I be deceived by the vain pretense that Mount Caucasus is the impregnable barrier of the Romans. I know the course of the Dniester, the Danube, and the Hebrus. The most warlike nations have yielded to the arms of the Turks, and, from the rising to the setting sun, the earth is my inheritance. Notwithstanding this menace, a sense of mutual advantage soon renewed the alliance of the Turks and Romans, but the pride of the great Khan survived his resentment, and, when he announced an important conquest to his friend the Emperor Maurice, he styled himself the master of the seven races, and the lord of the seven climates, of the world. Disputes have often arisen between the sovereigns of Asia, for the title of king of the world, while the contest has proved that it could not belong to either of the competitors. The kingdom of the Turks was bounded by the Exeus or Gihon, and Turan was separated by that great river from the rival monarchy of Iran, or Persia, which, in a smaller compass, contained perhaps a larger measure of power and population. The Persians, who alternately invaded and repulsed the Turks and the Romans, were still ruled by the House of Sassan, which ascended the throne three hundred years before the accession of Justinian. His contemporary, Kabades, or Kobad, had been successful in war against the Emperor Anastasius, but the reign of that prince was distracted by civil and religious troubles. A prisoner in the hands of his subjects, an exile among the enemies of Persia, he recovered his liberty by prostituting the honor of his wife, and regained his kingdom with the dangerous and mercenary aid of the barbarians who had slain his father. His nobles were suspicious that Kobad never forgave the authors of his expulsion, or even those of his restoration. The people was deluded and inflamed by the fanaticism of Mazdak, who asserted the community of women thirty and the equality of mankind while he appropriated the richest lands and most beautiful females to the use of his sectaries. The view of these disorders, which had been fermented by his laws and example, 31 embittered the declining age of the Persian monarch, and his fears were increased by the consciousness of his design to reverse the natural and customary order of succession, 
in favor of his third and most favored son, so famous under the names of Chosroz and Nushirvan. To render the youth more illustrious in the eyes of the nations, Kobad was desirous that he should be adopted by the Emperor Justin. The hope of peace inclined the Byzantine court to accept this singular proposal, and Chosroz might have acquired a specious claim to the inheritance of his Roman parent. But the future mischief was diverted by the advice of the Questor Proclus, a difficulty was started, whether the adoption should be performed as a civil or military rite semicolon 32 the treaty was abruptly dissolved, and the sense of this indignity sunk deep into the mind of Chosroes, who had already advanced to the Tigris on his road to Constantinople. His father did not long survive the disappointment of his wishes, the testament of their deceased sovereign was read in the assembly of the nobles, and a powerful faction, prepared for the event and regardless of the priority of age, exalted Chosroes to the throne of Persia. He filled that throne during a prosperous period of 48 years, semicolon 33 and the justice of Nushirvan is celebrated as the theme of immortal praise by the nations of the East. But the justice of kings is understood by themselves, and even by their subjects, with an ample indulgence for the gratification of passion and interest. The virtue of Chosroes was that of a conqueror, who, in the measures of peace and war, is excited by ambition and restrained by prudence, who confounds the greatness with the happiness of a nation, and calmly devotes the lives of thousands to the fame, or even the amusement, of a single man. In his domestic administration, the just Nushirvan would merit, in our feelings, the appellation of a tyrant. His two elder brothers had been deprived of their fair expectations of the diadem, their future life, between the supreme rank and the condition of subjects, was anxious to themselves and formidable to their master, fear as well as revenge might tempt them to rebel, the slightest evidence of a conspiracy satisfied the author of their wrongs, and the repose of Chosroes was secured by the death of these unhappy princes, with their families and adherents. One guiltless youth was saved and dismissed by the compassion of a veteran general, and this act of humanity, which was revealed by his son, overbalanced the merit of reducing twelve nations to the obedience of Persia. Their zeal and prudence of Mabodes had fixed the diadem on the head of Chosroes himself, but he delayed to attend the royal summons, till he had performed the duties of a military review, he was instantly commanded to repair to the iron tripod, which stood before the gate of the palace, 34 where it was death to relieve or approach the victim, and Mabodes languished several days before his sentence was pronounced, by the inflexible pride and calm ingratitude of the son of Kobad. But the people, more especially in the east, is disposed to forgive, and even to applaud, the cruelty which strikes at the loftiest heads, at the slaves of ambition, whose voluntary choice has exposed them to live in the smiles, and to perish by the frown, of a capricious monarch. In the execution of the laws which he had no temptation to violate, in the punishment of crimes which attacked his own dignity, as well as the happiness of individuals, Nushirvan, or Chosroes, deserved the appellation of just. His government was firm, rigorous, and impartial. It was the first labor of his reign to abolish the dangerous theory of common or equal possessions. The lands and women which the sectaries of Mazdak had usurped were restored to their lawful owners, and the temperate chastisement of the fanatics or impostors confirmed the domestic rights of society. Instead of listening with blind confidence to a favorite minister, he established four viziers over the four great provinces of his empire Assyria, Media, Persia, and Bactriana. In the choice of judges, prefects, and counselors, he strove to remove the mask which is always worn in the presence of kings. He wished to substitute the natural order of talents for the accidental distinctions of birth and fortune. He professed, in specious language, his intention to prefer those men who carried the poor in their bosoms, and to banish corruption from the seat of justice, as dogs were excluded from the temples of the Magi. The code of laws of the first Artaxerxes was revived and published as the rule of the magistrates, but the assurance of speedy punishment was the best security of their virtue. Their behavior was inspected by a thousand eyes, their words were overheard by a thousand ears, 
the secret or public agents of the throne, and the provinces, from the Indian to the Arabian confines, were enlightened by the frequent visits of a sovereign who affected to emulate his celestial brother in his rapid and salutary career. Education and agriculture he viewed as the two objects most deserving of his care. In every city of Persia, orphans and the children of the poor maintained and instructed at the public expense, the daughters were given in marriage to the richest citizens of their own rank, and the sons, according to their different talents, were employed in mechanic trades or promoted to more honorable service. The deserted villages were relieved by his bounty, to the peasants and farmers who were found incapable of cultivating their lands, he distributed cattle, seed, and the instruments of husbandry, and the rare and inestimable treasure of fresh water was parsimoniously managed and skillfully dispersed over the arid territory of Persia. The prosperity of that kingdom was the effect and the evidence of his virtues. His vices are those of oriental despotism, but in the long competition between Chosros and Justinian the advantage both of merit and fortune is almost always on the side of the barbarian. To the praise of justice Nushev united the reputation of knowledge, and the seven Greek philosophers, who visited his court, were invited and deceived by the strange assurance that a disciple of Plato was seated on the Persian throne. Did they expect that a prince, strenuously exercised in the toils of war and government, should agitate, with dexterity like their own. The abstruse and profound question which amused the leisure of the schools of Athens? Could they hope that the precepts of philosophy should direct the life, and control the passions, of a despot whose infancy had been taught to consider his absolute and fluctuating will as the only rule of moral obligation? Question mark 36 The studies of Chosros were ostentatious and superficial but his example awakened the curiosity of an ingenious people, and the light of science was diffused over the dominions of Persia. At Gondi Sapa, in the neighborhood of the royal city of Susa, an academy of physic was founded, which insensibly became a liberal school of poetry, philosophy, and rhetoric. The annals of the monarchy 38 were composed, and, while recent and authentic history might afford some useful lessons both to the prince and people, the darkness of the first ages was embellished by the giants, the dragons, and the fabulous heroes of oriental romance. Every learned or confident stranger was enriched by the bounty, and flattered by the conversation, of the monarch, he nobly rewarded a Greek physician forty by the deliverance of three thousand captives, and the sophists who contended for his favor, were exasperated by the wealth and insolence of Uranius, their more successful rival. Noshervan believed, or at least respected, the religion of the Magi, and some traces of persecution may be discovered in his reign. Yet he allowed himself freely to compare the tenets of the various sects, and the theological disputes in which he frequently presided diminished the authority of the priest and enlightened the minds of the people. At his command, the most celebrated writers of Greece and India were translated into the Persian language, a smooth and elegant idiom, recommended by Muhammad to the use of paradise though it is branded with the epithets of savage and unmusical by the ignorance and presumption of Agathias. Yet the Greek historian might reasonably wonder that it should be found possible to execute an entire version of Plato and Aristotle in a foreign dialect which had not been framed to express the spirit of freedom and the subtleties of philosophic disquisition. And, if the reason of the stage he write might be equally dark or equally intelligible in every tongue, the dramatic art and verbal argumentation of the disciple of Socrates appear to be indissolubly mingled with the grace and perfection of his Attic style. In the search of universal knowledge, Noshervan was informed that the moral and political fables of Pulpey, an ancient Brookman, were preserved with jealous reverence among the treasures of the kings of India. The physician Perozes was secretly dispatched to the banks of the Ganges, with instructions to procure, at any price, the communication of this valuable work. His dexterity obtained the transcript, his learned diligence accomplished the translation, and the fables of Pulpay 42 were read and admired in the assembly of Nushevan and his nobles. The Indian original and the Persian copy have long since disappeared, but this venerable monument has been saved by the curiosity of the Arabian caliphs, 
revived in the modern Persic, the Turkish, the Syriac, the Hebrew, and the Greek idioms, and transfused through successive versions into the modern languages of Europe. In their present form the peculiar character, the manners and religion of the Hindus, are completely obliterated, and the intrinsic merit of the fables of Pilpe is far inferior to the concise elegance of Federus and the native graces of La Fontaine. Fifteen moral and political sentences are illustrated in a series of apologues, but the composition is intricate. The narrative prolix, and the precept obvious and barren. Yet the Brookman may assume the merit of inventing a pleasing fiction, which adorns the nakedness of truth, and alleviates, perhaps, to a royal ear the harshness of instruction. With a similar design to admonish kings that they are strong only in the strength of their subjects, the same Indians invented the game of chess, likewise introduced into Persia under the reign of Nushevan. The son of Kobad found his kingdom involved in a war with the successor of Constantine, and the anxiety of his domestic situation inclined him to grant the suspension of arms, which Justinian was impatient to purchase. Chosroes saw the Roman ambassadors at his feet. He accepted eleven thousand pounds of gold, as the price of an endless or indefinite peace. Semicolon 43 Some mutual exchanges were regulated, the Persian assumed the guard of the gates of Caucasus, and the demolition of Dara was suspended, on condition that it should never be made the residence of the general of the east. This interval of repose had been solicited, and was diligently improved, by the ambition of the emperor. His African conquests were the first fruits of the Persian treaty, and the avarice of Chosroes was soothed by a large portion of the spoils of Carthage, which his ambassadors required in a tone of pleasantry and under the color of friendship. But the trophies of Belisarius disturbed the slumbers of the great king, and he heard with astonishment, envy, and fear, that Sicily, Italy, and Rome itself had been reduced in three rapid campaigns to the obedience of Justinian. Unpractised in the art of violating treaties, he secretly excited his bold and subtle vassal Armandar. That prince of the Saracens, who resided at Hera, 44 had not been included in the general peace, and still waged an obscure war against his rival Erythas, the chief of the tribe of Gassan, and confederate of the empire. The subject of their dispute was an extensive sheep walk in the desert to the south of Palmyra. An immemorial tribute for the license of pasture appeared to attest the rights of Armandar, while the Gassanite appealed to the Latin name of Strata, a paved road, as an unquestionable evidence of the sovereignty and labors of the Romans. The two monarchs supported the cause of their respective vassals, and the Persian Arab, without expecting the event of a slow and doubtful arbitration, enriched his flying camp with the spoil and captives of Syria. Instead of repelling the arms, Justinian attempted to seduce the fidelity, of Armandar, while he called from the extremities of the earth the nations of Ethiopia and Scythia to invade the dominions of his rival. But the aid of such allies was distant and precarious, and the discovery of this hostile correspondence justified the complaints of the Goths and Armenians, who implored, almost at the same time, the protection of Chosroes. The descendants of Arsaces, who were still numerous in Armenia, had been provoked to assert the last relics of national freedom and hereditary rank, and the ambassadors of Vitages had secretly traversed the empire to expose the instant, and almost inevitable, danger of the Kingdom of Italy. Their representations were uniform, weighty, and effectual. We stand before your throne, the advocates of your interest as well as of our own. The ambitious and faithless Justinian aspires to be the sole master of the world. Since the endless peace, which betrayed the common freedom of mankind, that prince, your ally in words, your enemy in actions, has alike insulted his friends and foes, and has filled the earth with blood and confusion. Has he not violated the privileges of Armenia, the independence of Colchos, and the wild liberty of the Tsanian mountains? Has he not usurped, with equal avidity, the city of Bosphorus on the frozen Meades and the vale of palm trees on the shores of the Red Sea? The Moors, the Vandals, the Goths, have been successively oppressed, and each nation has calmly remained the spectator of its neighbor's ruin. Embrace, 
O King! The favorable moment, the East is left without defense, while the armies of Justinian and his renowned general are detained in the distant regions of the West. If you hesitate and delay, Belisarius and his victorious troops will soon return from the Tiber to the Tigris, and Persia may enjoy the wretched consolation of being the last devoured. 46 By such arguments Chosroes was easily persuaded to imitate the example which he condemned, but the Persian, ambitious of military fame, disdained the inactive warfare of a rival, who issued his sanguinary commands from the secure station of the Byzantine palace. Whatever might be the provocations of Chosroes, he abused the confidence of treaties, and the just reproaches of dissimulation and falsehood could only be concealed by the luster of his victories. The Persian army, which had been assembled in the plains of Babylon, prudently declined the strong cities of Mesopotamia, and followed the western bank of the Euphrates, till the small, though populous, town of Dura presumed to arrest the progress of the great king. The gates of Dura, by treachery and surprise, were burst open, and, as soon as Chosroes had stained his cimeter with the blood of the inhabitants, he dismissed the ambassador of Justinian to inform his master in what place he had left the enemy of the Romans. The conqueror still affected the praise of humanity and justice, and, as he beheld a noble matron with her infant rudely dragged along the ground, he sighed, he wept, and implored the divine justice to punish the author of these calamities. Yet the herd of twelve thousand captives was ransomed for two hundred pounds of gold, the neighboring bishop of Sergopolis pledged his faith for the payment, and in the subsequent year the unfeeling avarice of Chosroes exacted the penalty of an obligation which it was generous to contract and impossible to discharge. He advanced into the heart of Syria, but a feeble enemy, who vanished at his approach, disappointed him of the honor of victory, and, as he could not hope to establish his dominion, the Persian king displayed in this inroad the mean and rapacious vices of a robber. Hierapolis, Beria or Aleppo, Apamea, and Chalcis were successively besieged, they redeemed their safety by a ransom of gold or silver, proportioned to their respective strength and opulence, and their new master enforced, without observing, the terms of capitulation. Educated in the religion of the Magi, he exercised, without remorse, the lucrative trade of sacrilege, and, after stripping of its gold and gems a piece of the true cross, he generously restored the naked relic to the devotion of the Christians of Apamea. No more than fourteen years had elapsed since Antioch was ruined by an earthquake, but the Queen of the East, the new Theopolis, had been raised from the ground by the liberality of Justinian, and the increasing greatness of the buildings and the people already erased the memory of this recent disaster. On one side, the city was defended by the mountain, on the other by the river Ounts, but the most accessible part was commanded by a superior eminence, the proper remedies were ejected, from the despicable fear of discovering its weakness to the enemy, and Germanus, the emperor's nephew refused to trust his person and dignity within the walls of a besieged city. The people of Antioch had inherited the vain and satirical genius of their ancestors, they were elated by a sudden reinforcement of six thousand soldiers, they disdained the offers of an easy capitulation, and their intemperate clamors insulted from the ramparts the majesty of the great king. Under his eye the Persian myriads mounted with scaling ladders to the assault, the Roman mercenaries fled through the opposite gate of Daphne, and the generous resistance of the youth of Antioch served only to aggravate the miseries of their country. As Chosroes, attended by the ambassadors of Justinian, was descending from the mountain, he affected, in a plaintive voice, to deplore the obstinacy and ruin of that unhappy people, but the slaughter still raged with unrelenting fury, and the city, at the command of a barbarian, was delivered to the flames. The cathedral of Antioch was indeed preserved by the avarice, not the piety, of the conqueror, a more honorable exemption was granted to the church of St. Julian and the quarter of the town where the ambassadors resided, some distant streets were saved by the shifting of the wind, and the walls still subsisted to protect, and soon to betray, their new inhabitants. Fanaticism had defaced the ornaments of Daphne, but Chosroes breathed a purer air amidst her groves and fountains, 
and some idolaters in his train might sacrifice with impunity to the nymphs of that elegant retreat. Eighteen miles below Antioch, the river Ontz falls into the Mediterranean. The haughty Persian visited the term of his conquest, and, after bailing alone in the sea, he offered a solemn sacrifice of thanksgiving to the sun, or rather to the creator of the sun, whom the Magi adored. If this act of superstition offended the prejudices of the Syrians, they were pleased by the courteous and even eager attention with which he assisted at the games of the circus, and, as Chosroes had heard that the blue faction was espoused by the emperor, his peremptory command secured the victory of the green charioteer. From the discipline of his camp the people derived more solid consolation, and they interceded in vain for the life of a soldier who had too faithfully copied the rapine of the just Nushervn. At length, fatigued, though unsatiated, with the spoil of Syria, he slowly moved to the Euphrates, formed a temporary bridge in the neighborhood of Barblissus, and defined the space of three days for the entire passage of his numerous host. After his return, he founded, at the distance of one day's journey from the palace of Ctesiphon, a new city, which perpetuated the joint names of Chosroes and of Antioch. The Syrian captives recognized the form and situation of their native abodes, baths and a stately circus were constructed for their use, and a colony of musicians and charioteers revived in Assyria the pleasures of a Greek capital. By the munificence of the royal founder, a liberal allowance was assigned to these fortunate exiles, and they enjoyed the singular privilege of bestowing freedom on the slaves whom they acknowledged as their kinsmen. Palestine and the holy wealth of Jerusalem were the next objects that attracted the ambition, or rather the avarice, of Chosroes. Constantinople and the palace of the Caesars no longer appeared impregnable or remote, and his aspiring fancy already covered Asia Minor with the troops, and the Black Sea with the navies, of Persia. These hopes might have been realized, if the conqueror of Italy had not been seasonably recalled to the defense of the East. While Chosroes pursued his ambitious designs on the coast of the Euxine, Balizarius, at the head of an army without pay or discipline, in camp beyond the Euphrates within six miles of Nisibis. He meditated, by a skillful operation, to draw the Persians from their impregnable citadel, and, improving his advantage in the field, either to intercept their retreat or perhaps to enter the gates with the flying barbarians. He advanced one day's journey on the territories of Persia, reduced the fortress of Sisoran, and sent the governor, with eight hundred chosen horsemen to serve the emperor in his Italian wars. He detached Erythas and his Arabs, supported by twelve hundred Romans, to pass the Tigris, and to ravage the harvests of Assyria, a fruitful province, long exempt from the calamities of war. But the plans of Belisarius were disconcerted by the untractable spirit of Erythas, who neither returned to the camp nor sent any intelligence of his motions. The Roman general was fixed in anxious expectation to the same spot, the time of action elapsed, the ardent son of Mesopotamia inflamed with fevers the blood of his European soldiers, and the stationary troops and officers of Syria affected to tremble for the safety of their defenseless cities. Yet this diversion had already succeeded in forcing Chosroes to return with loss and precipitation, and, if the skill of Belisarius had been seconded by discipline and valour, his success might have satisfied the sanguine wishes of the public, who required at his hands the conquest of Ctesiphon and the deliverance of the captives of Antioch. At the end of the campaign, he was recalled to Constantinople by an ungrateful court, but the dangers of the ensuing spring restored his confidence and command, and the hero, almost alone, was dispatched, with the speed of post horses, to repel, by his name and presence, the invasion of Syria. He found the Roman generals, among whom was a nephew of Justinian, imprisoned by their fears in the fortifications of Hierapolis. But instead of listening to their timid counsels, Belisarius commanded them to follow him to Europus, where he had resolved to collect his forces, and to execute whatever God should inspire him to achieve against the enemy. His firm attitude on the banks of the Euphrates restrained Chosroes from advancing towards Palestine 
and he received with art and dignity the ambassadors, or rather spies, of the Persian monarch. The plain between Hierapolis and the river was covered with the squadrons of cavalry, six thousand hunters, tall and robust, who pursued their game without the apprehension of an enemy. On the opposite bank the ambassadors descried a thousand Armenian horse, who appeared to guard the passage of the Euphrates. The tent of Belisarius was of the coarsest linen, the simple equipage of a warrior who disdained the luxury of the East. Around his tent, the nations who marched under his standard were arranged with skillful confusion. The Thracians and Delirians were posted in the front, the Heruli and Goths in the center. The prospect was closed by the Moors and Vandals, and their loose array seemed to multiply their numbers. Their dress was light and active, one soldier carried a whip, another a sword, a third a bow, a fourth perhaps a battle axe, and the whole picture exhibited the intrepidity of the troops and the vigilance of the general. Chosroes was deluded by the address, and awed by the genius, of the lieutenant of Justinian. Conscious of the merit, and ignorant of the force, of his antagonist, he dreaded a decisive battle in a distant country, from whence not a Persian might return to relate the melancholy tale. The great king hastened to repass the Euphrates, and Belisarius pressed his retreat, by affecting to oppose a measure so salutary to the empire and which could scarcely have been prevented by an army of an hundred thousand men. Envy might suggest to ignorance and pride that the public enemy had been suffered to escape but the African and Gothic triumphs are less glorious than this safe and bloodless victory, in which neither fortune nor the valour of the soldiers can subtract any part of the general's renown. The second removal of Belisarius from the Persian to the Italian war revealed the extent of his personal merit, which had corrected or supplied the want of discipline and courage. Fifteen generals, without concert or skill, led through the mountains of Armenia an army of thirty thousand Romans, inattentive to their signals, their ranks, and their ensigns. Four thousand Persians, entrenched in the camp of Dubais, vanquished, almost without a combat, this disorderly multitude, their useless arms were scattered along the road, and their horses sunk under the fatigue of their rapid flight. But the Arabs of the Roman party prevailed over their brethren, the Armenians returned to their allegiance, the cities of Dara and Edessa resisted a sudden assault and a regular siege, and the calamities of war were suspended by those of pestilence. A tacit or formal agreement between the two sovereigns protected the tranquility of the eastern frontier, and the arms of Chosroes were confined to the Colchian or Lazic war which has been too minutely described by the historians of the times. The extreme length of the Euxine Sea, 49 from Constantinople to the mouth of the Phasis, may be computed as a voyage of nine days and a measure of 700 miles. From the Iberian Caucasus, the most lofty and craggy mountains of Asia, the river descends with such oblique vehemence that in a short space it is traversed by 120 bridges. Nor does the stream become placid and navigable till it reaches the town of Sarapana, five days' journey from the Cyrus, which flows from the same hills, but in a contrary direction, to the Caspian Lake. The proximity of these rivers has suggested the practice, or at least the idea, of wafting the precious merchandise of India down the Exus, over the Caspian, up the Cyrus, and with the current of the Phasis into the Euxine and Mediterranean seas. As it successively collects the streams of the plain of Colchos, the Phasis moves with diminished speed, though accumulated weight. At the mouth it is sixty fathom deep and half a league broad, but a small woody island is interposed in the midst of the channel, the water, so soon as it has deposited an earthy or metallic sediment, floats on the surface of the waves and is no longer susceptible of corruption. In a course of one hundred miles, forty of which are navigable for large vessels, the Phasis divides the celebrated region of Colchos, 50 or Mingrelia, 51 which, on three sides, is fortified by the Iberian and Armenian mountains, and whose maritime coast extends about 200 miles, from the neighborhood of Trebizond to Dioscurias, and the confines of Circassa. Both the soil and climate are relaxed by excessive moisture. 28 rivers, 
besides the Phasis and his dependent streams, convey their waters to the sea, and the hollowness of the ground appears to indicate the subterraneous channels between the Euxine and the Caspian. In the fields where wheat or barley is sown, the earth is too soft to sustain the action of the plough, but the gum, a small grain not unlike the millet or coriander seed, supplies the ordinary food of the people, and the use of bread is confined to the prince and his nobles. Yet the vintage is more plentiful than the harvest, and the bulk of the stems, as well as the quality of the wine, display the unassisted powers of nature. The same powers continually tend to overshadow the face of the country with thick forests, the timber of the hills and the flax of the plains contribute to the abundance of naval stores. The wild and tame animals, the horse, the ox, and the hog, are remarkably prolific, and the name of the pheasant is expressive of his native habitation on the banks of the Phasis. The gold mines to the south of Trebizond, which are still worked with sufficient profit, were a subject of national dispute between Justinian and Chosroes, and it is not unreasonable to believe that a vein of precious metal may be equally diffused through the circle of the hills, although these secret treasures are neglected by the laziness, or concealed by the prudence, of the Mingrelians. The waters, impregnated with particles of gold, are carefully strained through sheepskins or fleeces, but this expedient, the groundwork perhaps of a marvellous fable, affords a faint image of the wealth extracted from a virgin earth by the power and industry of ancient kings. Their silver palaces and golden chambers surpass our belief, but the fame of their riches is said to have excited the enterprising avarice of the Argonauts. Tradition has affirmed, with some colour of reason, that Egypt planted on the Phasis a learned and polite colony, which manufactured linen, built navies, and invented geographical maps. The ingenuity of the moderns has peopled, with flourishing cities and nations, the isthmus between the Euxine and the Caspian, and a lively writer, observing the resemblance of climate, and, in his apprehension, of trade, has not hesitated to pronounce Colchos the Holland of antiquity. But the riches of Colchos shine only through the darkness of conjecture or tradition, and its genuine history presents an uniform scene of rudeness and poverty. If 130 languages were spoken in the market of Dioscurias, they were the imperfect idioms of so many savage tribes or families, sequestered from each other in the valleys of Mount Caucasus, and their separation which diminished the importance, must have multiplied the number, of their rustic capitals. In the present state of Mingrelia, a village is an assemblage of huts within a wooden fence, the fortresses are seated in the depth of forests, the princely town of Saita, or Cotatis, consists of two hundred houses, and a stone edifice appertains only to the magnificence of kings. Twelve ships from Constantinople and about sixty barks, laden with the fruits of industry, annually cast anchor on the coast, and the list of Colchian exports is much increased, since the natives had only slaves and hides to offer in exchange for the corn and salt which they purchased from the subjects of Justinian. Not a vestige can be found of the art, the knowledge, or the navigation of the ancient Colchians, few Greeks desired or dared to pursue the footsteps of the Argonauts and even the marks of an Egyptian colony are lost on a nearer approach. The rite of circumcision is practiced only by the Mahometans of the Euxine, and the curled hair and swarthy complexion of Africa no longer disfigure the most perfect of the human race. It is in the adjacent climates of Georgia, Mengrelia, and Circassa, that nature has placed, at least to our eyes, the model of beauty in the shape of the limbs, the color of the skin the symmetry of the features, and the expression of the countenance. According to the destination of the two sexes, the men seem formed for action, the women for love, and the perpetual supply of females from Mount Caucasus has purified the blood, and improved the breed, of the southern nations of Asia. The proper district of Mingrelia, a portion only of the ancient coal shows, has long sustained an exportation of 12,000 slaves. The number of prisoners or criminals would be inadequate to the annual demand, but the common people are in a state of servitude to their lords. The exercise of fraud or rapine is unpunished in a lawless community, 
and the market is continually replenished by the abuse of civil and paternal authority. Such a trade, 54 which reduces the human species to the level of cattle, may tend to encourage marriage and population, since the multitude of children enriches their sordid and inhuman parent. But this source of impure wealth must inevitably poison the national manners, obliterate the sense of honor and virtue, and almost extinguish the instincts of nature. The Christians of Georgia and Mingrelia are the most dissolute of mankind, and their children, who, in a tender age, are sold into foreign slavery, have already learned to imitate the raping of the father and the prostitution of the mother. Yet amidst the rudest ignorance, the untaught natives discover a singular dexterity both of mind and hand, and, although the want of union and discipline exposes them to their more powerful neighbors, a bold and intrepid spirit has animated the Colchians of every age. In the host of Xerxes, they served on foot and their arms were a dagger or a javelin, a wooden cask, and a buckler of raw hides. But in their own country the use of cavalry has more generally prevailed, the meanest of the peasants disdain to walk, the martial nobles are possessed, perhaps, of two hundred horses, and above five thousand are numbered in the train of the Prince of Mingrelia. The Colchian government has been always a pure and hereditary kingdom and the authority of the sovereign is only restrained by the turbulence of his subjects. Whenever they were obedient, he could lead a numerous army into the field, but some faith is requisite to believe that the single tribe of the Suanians was composed of two hundred thousand soldiers, or that the population of Mingrelian now amounts to four millions of inhabitants. It was the boast of the Colchians, that their ancestors had checked the victories of Caesostris, and the defeat of the Egyptian is less incredible than his successful progress as far as the foot of Mount Caucasus. They sunk, without any memorable effort, under the arms of Cyrus, followed in distant wars the standard of the great king, and presented him every fifth year with one hundred boys and as many virgins, the fairest produce of the land. Yet he accepted this gift like the gold and ebony of India, the frankincense of the Arabs or the Negros and Ivory of Ethiopia, the Colchians were not subject to the dominion of a satrap, and they continued to enjoy the name as well as substance of national independence. After the fall of the Persian Empire, Mithridates, king of Pontus, added Colchos to the wide circle of his dominions on the Euxine, and, when the natives presumed to request that his son might reign over them, he bound the ambitious youth in chains of gold and delegated a servant in his place. In the pursuit of Mithridates, the Romans advanced to the banks of the Phasis, and their galleys ascended the river till they reached the camp of Pompey and his legions. But the Senate, and afterwards the emperors, disdained to reduce the distant and useless conquest into the form of a province. The family of a Greek rhetorician was permitted to reign in Colchos and the adjacent kingdoms from the time of Mark Antony to that of Nero, and, after the race of Palermo was extinct, the eastern Pontus, which preserved his name, extended no farther than the neighborhood of Trebizond. Beyond these limits the fortifications of Hissus, of Apsaris, of the Phasis, of Dioscurias or Sebastopolis, and of Pitus were guarded by sufficient detachments of horse and foot, and six princes of Colchos received their diadems from the lieutenants of Caesar. One of these lieutenants, the eloquent and philosophic Arian, surveyed, and has described, the Euxine coast, under the reign of Hadrian. The garrison which he reviewed at the mouth of the Phasis consisted of four hundred chosen legionaries, the brick walls and towers, the double ditch, and the military engines on the rampart, rendered this palace inaccessible to the barbarians, but the new suburbs, which had been built by the merchants and veterans, required, in the opinion of Rian, some external defense. As the strength of the empire was gradually impaired, the Romans stationed on the Phasis were either withdrawn or expelled, and the tribe of the Lazi, 58 whose posterity speak a foreign dialect and inhabit the sea coast of Trebizond, imposed their name and dominion on the ancient kingdom of Colchos. Their independence was soon invaded by a formidable neighbor, who had acquired, by arms and treaties, the sovereignty of Iberia. 
the dependent king of Lazica received his scepter at the hands of the Persian monarch, and the successors of Constantine acquiesced in this injurious claim, which was proudly urged as a right of immemorable prescription. In the beginning of the 6th century, their influence was restored by the introduction of Christianity, which the Mingrelians still profess with becoming zeal, without understanding the doctrines, or observing the precepts, of their religion. After the decease of his father, Zarthus was exalted to the regal dignity by the favor of the great king, but the pious youth abhorred the ceremonies of the Magi, and sought, in the palace of Constantinople, an orthodox baptism, a noble wife, and the alliance of the Emperor Justin. The king of Lazica was solemnly invested with the diadem, and his cloak and tunic of white silk, with a gold border, displayed, in rich embroidery, the figure of his new patron, who soothed the jealousy of the Persian court, and excused the revolt of Colchos, by the venerable names of hospitality and religion. The common interest of both empires imposed on the Colchians the duty of guarding the passes of Mount Caucasus, where a wall of sixty miles is now defended by the monthly service of the musketeers of Mingrelia. But this honorable connection was soon corrupted by the avarice and ambition of the Romans. Degraded from the rank of the allies, the Lazi were incessantly reminded, by words and actions, of their dependent state. At the distance of a day's journey beyond the Apsarus, they beheld the rising fortress of Petricom a sixty which commanded the maritime country to the south of the Phasis. Instead of being protected by the valour, Colchos was insulted by the licentiousness, of foreign mercenaries, the benefits of commerce were converted into base and vexatious monopoly, and Gabazes, the native prince, was reduced to a pageant of royalty by the superior influence of the officers of Justinian. Disappointed in their expectations of Christian virtue, the indignant Lazi reposed some confidence in the justice of an unbeliever. After a private assurance that their ambassador should not be delivered to the Romans, they publicly solicited the friendship and aid of Chosroes. The sagacious monarch instantly discerned the use and importance of Colchos, and meditated a plan of conquest, which was renewed at the end of a thousand years by Shabbos the wisest and most powerful of his successors. His ambition was fired by the hope of launching a Persian navy from the Phasis, of commanding the trade and navigation of the Euxine Sea, of desolating the coast of Pontus and Bithynia, of distressing, perhaps of attacking, Constantinople, and of persuading the barbarians of Europe to second his arms and counsels against the common enemy of mankind. Under the pretense of a Scythian war, he silently led his troops to the frontiers of Iberia, the Colchian guides were prepared to conduct them through the woods and along the precipices of Mount Caucasus, and a narrow path was laboriously formed into a safe and spacious highway, for the march of cavalry, and even of elephants. Gibbas has laid his person and diadem at the feet of the king of Persia, his Colchians imitated the submission of their prince, and, after the walls of Petra had been shaken, the Roman garrison prevented, by a capitulation, the impending fury of the last assault. But the Lazi soon discovered that their impatience had urged them to choose an evil more intolerable than the calamities which they strove to escape. The monopoly of salt and corn was effectually removed by the loss of those valuable commodities. The authority of a Roman legislator was succeeded by the pride of an oriental despot, who beheld, with equal disdain, the slaves whom he had exalted and the kings whom he had humbled before the footstool of his throne. The adoration of fire was introduced into cold shows by the zeal of the Magi, their intolerant spirit provoked the fervor of a Christian people, and the prejudice of nature or education was wounded by the impious practice of exposing the dead bodies of their parents, on the summit of a lofty tower, to the crows and vultures of the air. Conscious of the increasing hatred, which retarded the execution of his great designs, the just Nushevn had secretly given orders to assassinate the king of the Lazi, to transplant the people into some distant land, and to fix a faithful and warlike colony on the banks of the Phasis. The watchful jealousy of the Colchians foresaw and averted the approaching ruin. Their repentance was accepted at Constantinople by the prudence, 
rather than the clemency, of Justinian, and he commanded Dagestuus, with seven thousand Romans, and one thousand of the Zanni, to expel the Persians from the coast of the Euxine. The siege of Petra, which the Roman general, with the aid of the Lazi, immediately undertook, is one of the most remarkable actions of the age. The city was seated on a craggy rock, which hung over the sea, and communicated by a steep and narrow path with the land. Since the approach was difficult, the attack might be deemed impossible, the Persian conqueror had strengthened the fortifications of Justinian, and the places least inaccessible were covered by additional bulwarks. In this important fortress, the vigilance of Chosroes had deposited a magazine of offensive and defensive arms, sufficient for five times the number, not only of the garrison, but of the besiegers themselves. The stock of flour and salt provisions was adequate to the consumption of five years, the want of wine was supplied by vinegar, and grain from whence a strong liquor was extracted, and a triple aqueduct eluded the diligence, and even the suspicions, of the enemy. But the firmest defense of Petra was placed in the valor of fifteen hundred Persians, who resisted the assaults of the Romans, whilst, in a softer vein of earth, a mine was secretly perforated. The wall, supported by slender and temporary props, hung tottering in the air, but Agistus delayed the attack till he had secured a specific recompense, and the town was relieved before the return of his messenger from Constantinople. The Persian garrison was reduced to four hundred men, of whom no more than fifty were exempt from sickness or wounds yet such had been their inflexible perseverance, that they concealed their losses from the enemy, by enduring, without a murmur, the sight and putrefying stench of the dead bodies of their eleven hundred companions. After their deliverance, the breaches were hastily stopped with sandbags, the mine was replenished with earth, a new wall was erected on a frame of substantial timber, and a fresh garrison of three thousand men was stationed at Petra to sustain the labor of a second siege. The operations, both of the attack and defense, were conducted with skillful obstinacy, and each party derived useful lessons from the experience of their past faults. A battering ram was invented, of light construction and powerful effect, it was transported and worked by the hands of forty soldiers, and, as the stones were loosened by its repeated strokes, they were torn with long iron hooks from the wall. From those walls, a shower of darts was incessantly poured on the heads of the assailants, but they were most dangerously annoyed by a fiery composition of sulphur and bitumen, which in cold shows might with some propriety be named the oil of Medea. Of six thousand Romans who mounted the scaling ladders, their general, Bessas, was the first, a gallant veteran of seventy years of age, the courage of their leader, his fall, and extreme danger animated the irresistible effort of his troops, and their prevailing numbers oppressed the strength, without subduing the spirit, of the Persian garrison. The fate of these valiant men deserves to be more distinctly noticed. Seven hundred had perished in the siege, two thousand three hundred survived to defend the breach. One thousand and seventy were destroyed with fire and sword in the last assault, and, if seven hundred and thirty were made prisoners, only eighteen among them were found without the marks of honourable wounds. The remaining five hundred escaped into the citadel, which they maintained without any hopes of relief, rejecting the fairest terms of capitulation and service, till they were lost in the flames. They died in obedience to the commands of their prince, and such examples of loyalty and valour might excite their countrymen to deeds of equal despair and more prosperous event. The instant demolition of the works of Petra confessed the astonishment and apprehension of the conqueror. A Spartan would have praised and pitied the virtue of these heroic slaves, but the tedious warfare and alternate success of the Roman and Persian arms cannot detain the attention of posterity at the foot of Mount Caucasus. The advantages obtained by the troops of Justinian were more frequent and splendid, but the forces of the great king were continually supplied till they amounted to eight elephants and seventy thousand men, including twelve thousand Scythian allies, and above three thousand Dilemites, who descended by their free choice from the hills of Hyrcania, 
and were equally formidable in close or in distant combat. The siege of Archaeopolis, a name imposed or corrupted by the Greeks, was raised with some loss and precipitation, but the Persians occupied the passes of Iberia, Colchos was enslaved by their forts and garrisons, they devoured the scanty sustenance of the people, and the prince of the Lazi fled into the mountains. In the Roman camp, faith and discipline were unknown, and the independent leaders, who were invested with equal power, disputed with each other the preeminence of vice and corruption. The Persians followed, without a murmur, the commands of a single chief, who implicitly obeyed the instructions of their supreme lord. Their general was distinguished among the heroes of the East by his wisdom in council and his valor in the field. The advanced age of murmurers, and the lameness of both his feet, could not diminish the activity of his mind or even of his body, and, whilst he was carried in a litter in the front of battle, he inspired terror to the enemy, and a just confidence to the troops, who under his banners were always successful. After his death, the command devolved to Nacaragan, a proud satrap, who, in a conference with the imperial chiefs, had presumed to declare that he disposed of victory as absolutely as of the ring on his finger. Such presumption was the natural cause and forerunner of a shameful defeat. The Romans had been gradually repulsed to the edge of the seashore, and their last camp, on the ruins of the Grecian colony of Phasis, was defended on all sides by strong entrenchments, the river, the Euxine, and a fleet of galleys. Despair united their councils and invigorated their arms, they withstood the assault of the Persians, and the flight of Nacaragan proceeded or followed the slaughter of ten thousand of his bravest soldiers. He escaped from the Romans to fall into the hands of an unforgiving master, who severely chastised the error of his own choice. The unfortunate general was flayed alive, and his skin, stuffed into the human form, was exposed on the mountain a dreadful warning to those who might hereafter be entrusted with the fame and fortune of Persia. Yet the prudence of Chosroes insensibly relinquished the prosecution of the Colchian War, in the just persuasion that it is impossible to reduce or, at least, to hold a distant country against the wishes and efforts of its inhabitants. The fidelity of Gabazes sustained the most rigorous trials. He patiently endured the hardships of a savage life, and rejected, with disdain, the specious temptations of the Persian court. The king of the Lazi had been educated in the Christian religion. His mother was the daughter of a senator, during his youth, he had served ten years a silentiary of the Byzantine palace, 64 and the arrears of an unpaid salary were a motive of attachment as well as of complaint. But the long continuance of his sufferings extorted from him a naked representation of the truth and truth was an unpardonable libel on the lieutenants of Justinian, who, amidst the delays of the ruinous war, had spared his enemies and trampled on his allies. Their malicious information persuaded the emperor that his faithless vassal already meditated a second defection, an order was issued to send him prisoner to Constantinople, a treacherous clause was inserted, that he might be lawfully killed in case of resistance, and Gabbas is without arms or suspicion of danger, was stabbed in the security of a friendly interview. In the first moments of rage and despair the Colchians would have sacrificed their country and religion to the gratification of revenge. But the authority and eloquence of the wiser few obtained a salutary pause, the victory of the Fasis restored the terror of the Roman arms, and the emperor was solicitous to absolve his own name from the imputation of so foul a murder. A judge of senatorial rank was commissioned to inquire into the conduct and death of the king of the Lazi. He ascended a stately tribunal, encompassed by the ministers of justice and punishment, in the presence of both nations, this extraordinary cause was pleaded according to the forms of civil jurisprudence, and some satisfaction was granted to an injured people, by the sentence and execution of the meaner criminals. In peace. The king of Persia continually sought the pretenses of a rupture, but no sooner had he taken up arms than he expressed his desire of a safe and honorable treaty. During the fiercest hostilities, the two monarchs entertained a deceitful negotiation, and such was the superiority of Chosroes that, whilst he treated the Roman ministers with insolence and contempt, 
he obtained the most unprecedented honors for his own ambassadors at the imperial court. The successor of Cyrus assumed the majesty of the eastern sun, and graciously permitted his younger brother Justinian to reign over the west, with the pale and reflected splendor of the moon. This gigantic style was supported by the pomp and eloquence of Idigune, one of the royal chamberlains. His wife and daughters, with a train of eunuchs and camels, attended the march of the ambassador, two satraps with golden diadems were numbered among his followers, he was guarded by five hundred horse, the most valiant of the Persians, and the Roman governor of Dara wisely refused to admit more than twenty of this martial and hostile caravan. When Idigun had saluted the emperor and delivered his presents, he passed ten months at Constantinople without discussing any serious affairs. Instead of being confined to his palace and receiving food and water from the hands of his keepers, the Persian ambassador, without spies or guards, was allowed to visit the capital, and the freedom of conversation and trade enjoyed by his domestics offended the prejudices of an age which rigorously practiced the law of nations without confidence or courtesy. By an unexampled indulgence, his interpreter, a servant below the notice of a Roman magistrate, was seated, at the table of Justinian, by the side of his master, and one thousand pounds of gold might be assigned for the expense of his journey and entertainment. Yet the repeated labors of Vitigian could procure only a partial and imperfect truce, which was always purchased with the treasures, and renewed at the solicitation, of the Byzantine court. Many years of fruitless desolation elapsed before Justinian and Chosroes were compelled by mutual lassitude to consult the repose of their declining age. At a conference held on the frontier, each party, without expecting to gain credit, displayed the power, the justice, and the pacific intentions, of their respective sovereigns, but necessity and interest dictated the treaty of peace, which was concluded for a term of fifty years diligently composed in the Greek and Persian language, and attested by the seals of twelve interpreters. The liberty of commerce and religion was fixed and defined, the allies of the emperor and the great king were included in the same benefits and obligations, and the most scrupulous precautions were provided to prevent or determine the accidental disputes that might arise on the confines of two hostile nations. After twenty years of destructive though feeble war, the limits still remained without alteration, and Chosroes was persuaded to renounce his dangerous claim to the possession or sovereignty of Colchos and its dependent states. Rich in the accumulated treasures of the East, he extorted from the Romans an annual payment of thirty thousand pieces of gold, and the smallness of the sum revealed the disgrace of a tribute in its naked deformity. In a previous debate, the chariot of Caesostris and the wheel of fortune were replied by one of the ministers of Justinian, who observed that the reduction of Antioch and some Syrian cities had elevated beyond measure the vain and ambitious spirit of the barbarian. You are mistaken, replied the modest Persian, the king of kings, the lord of mankind, looks down with contempt on such petty acquisitions, and of the ten nations, vanquished by his invincible arms, he esteems the Romans as the least formidable. According to the Orientals the empire of Nushirvan extended from Fergana in Transoxiana to Yemen or Arabia Felix. He subdued the rebels of Hyrcania, reduced the provinces of Kabul and Zabalestan on the banks of the Indus, broke the power of the Utalites, terminated by an honorable treaty the Turkish war, and admitted the daughter of the great Khan into the number of his lawful wives. Victorious and respected among the princes of Asia, he gave audience, in his palace of Madain, Octisifton, to the ambassadors of the world. Their gifts or tributes, arms, rich garments, gems, slaves, or aromatics, were humbly presented at the foot of his throne, and he condescended to accept from the king of India ten quintals of the wood of aloes, a maid seven cubits in height, and a carpet softer than silk, the skin as it was reported, of an extraordinary serpent. Justinian had been reproached for his alliance with the Ethiopians, as if he attempted to introduce a people of savage negroes into the system of civilized society. But the friends of the Roman Empire, the Axumites, or Abyssinians, 
may be always distinguished from the original natives of Africa. The hand of nature has flattened the noses of the Negroes, covered their heads with shaggy wool, and tinged their skin with inherent and indelible blackness. But the olive complexion of the Abyssinians, their hair, shape, and features, distinctly mark them as a colony of Arabs, and this descent is confirmed by the resemblance of language and manners, the report of an ancient emigration, and the narrow interval between the shores of the Red Sea. Christianity had raised that nation above the level of African barbarism 68 their intercourse with Egypt, and the successors of Constantine, had communicated the rudiments of the arts and sciences, their vessels traded to the Isle of Ceylon, and seven kingdoms obeyed the Negus or Supreme Prince of Abyssinia. The independence of the Homerites, who reigned in the rich and happy Arabia, was first violated by an Ethiopian conqueror, he drew his hereditary claim from the Queen of Sheba, and his ambition was sanctified by religious zeal. The Jews, powerful and active in exile, had seduced the mind of Dunan, prince of the Homerites. They urged him to retaliate the persecution inflicted by the imperial laws on their unfortunate brethren, some Roman merchants were injuriously treated, and several Christians of Negra 69 were honored with the crown of martyrdom. The churches of Arabia implored the protection of the Abyssinian monarch. The Negus passed the Red Sea with a fleet and army, deprived the Jewish proselyte of his kingdom and life, and extinguished a race of princes, who had ruled above two thousand years the sequestered region of myrrh and frankincense. The conqueror immediately announced the victory of the gospel, requested an orthodox patriarch, and so warmly professed his friendship to the Roman Empire that Justinian was flattered by the hope of diverting the silk trade through the channel of Abyssinia, and of exciting the forces of Arabia against the Persian king. Nonosus, descended from a family of ambassadors, was named by the emperor to execute this important commission. He wisely declined the shorter, but more dangerous, road through the sandy deserts of Nubia, ascended the Nile, embarked on the Red Sea, and safely landed at the African port of Adulis. From Adulis to the royal city of Axum is no more than fifty leagues, in a direct line, but the winding passes of the mountains detained the ambassador fifteen days, and, as he traversed the forests, he saw, and vaguely computed, about five thousand wild elephants. The capital, according to his report, was large and populous and the village of Axum is still conspicuous by the regal coronations, by the ruins of a Christian temple, and by sixteen or seventeen obelisks inscribed with Grecian characters. But the Negus gave audience in the open field, seated on a lofty chariot, which was drawn by four elephants superbly caparisoned, and surrounded by his nobles and musicians. He was clad in a linen garment and cap, holding in his hand two javelins and a light shield and, although his nakedness was imperfectly covered, he displayed the barbaric pomp of gold chains, collars, and bracelets, richly adorned with pearls and precious stones. The ambassador of Justinian knelt, the Negus raised him from the ground, embraced Nonosus, kissed the seal, perused the letter, accepted the Roman alliance, and, brandishing his weapons, denounced implacable war against the worshippers of fire. But the proposal of the silk trade was eluded, and notwithstanding the assurances, and perhaps the wishes, of the Abyssinians, these hostile menaces evaporated without effect. The Homerites were unwilling to abandon their aromatic groves, to explore a sandy desert, and to encounter, after all their fatigues, a formidable nation from whom they had never received any personal injuries. Instead of enlarging his conquests, the king of Ethiopia was incapable of defending his possessions. Abreha, the slave of a Roman merchant of Adilis, assumed the scepter of the Homerites, the troops of Africa were seduced by the luxury of the climate, and Justinian solicited the friendship of the usurper, who honored, with a slight tribute, the supremacy of his prince. After a long series of prosperity, the power of Abreha was overthrown before the gates of Mecca, his children were despoiled by the Persian conqueror, and the Ethiopians were finally expelled from the continent of Asia.
This narrative of obscure and remote events is not foreign to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. If a Christian power had been maintained in Arabia, Muhammad must have been crushed in his cradle, and Abyssinia would have prevented a revolution which has changed the civil and religious state of the world. The Golden Palace of Nero excited a just indignation, but the vast extent of ground which had been usurped by his selfish luxury was more nobly filled under the succeeding reigns by the Colosseum, the Baths of Titus, the Claudian Portico, and the temples dedicated to the goddess of peace and to the genius of Rome. Rebellions of Africa middle dot restoration of the Gothic kingdom by total middle dot loss and recovery of Rome middle dot final conquest of Italy by Narses middle dot extinction of the Ostrogoths middle dot defeat of the Franks and Alemanni middle dot last victory, disgrace, and death of Belisarius middle dot death and character of Justinian middle dot comet, earthquakes. Plague the review of the nations from the Danube to the Nile has exposed on every side the weakness of the Romans, and our wonder is reasonably excited that they should presume to enlarge an empire whose ancient limits they were incapable of defending. But the wars, the conquests, and the triumphs of Justinian are the feeble and pernicious efforts of old age, which exhaust the remains of strength, and accelerate the decay of the powers of life. He exulted in the glorious act of restoring Africa and Italy to the Republic, but the calamities which followed the departure of Belisarius betrayed the impotence of the conqueror and accomplished the ruin of those unfortunate countries. From his new acquisitions, Justinian expected that his avarice as well as pride should be richly gratified. A rapacious minister of the finances closely pursued the footsteps of Belisarius, and, as the old registers of tribute had been burned by the Vandals, he indulged his fancy in a liberal calculation and arbitrary assessment of the wealth of Africa. The increase of taxes which were drawn away by a distant sovereign, and a general resumption of the patrimony or crown lands, soon dispelled the intoxication of the public joy, but the emperor was insensible to the modest complaints of the people, till he was awakened and alarmed by the clamours of military discontent. Many of the Roman soldiers had married the widows and daughters of the Vandals, as their own, by the double right of conquest and inheritance. They claimed the estates which Genseric had assigned to his victorious troops. They heard with disdain the cold and selfish representation of their officers, that the liberality of Justinian had raised them from a savage or servile condition, that they were already enriched by the spoils of Africa, the treasure, the slaves and the movables, of the vanquished barbarians, and that the ancient and lawful patrimony of the emperors would be applied only to the support of that government on which their own safety and reward must ultimately depend. The mutiny was secretly inflamed by a thousand soldiers, for the most part Haruli, who had imbibed the doctrines, and were instigated by the clergy, of the Aryan sect and the cause of perjury and rebellion was sanctified by the dispensing powers of fanaticism. The Aryans deplored the ruin of their church, triumphant above a century in Africa, and they were justly provoked by the laws of the conqueror, which interdicted the baptism of their children and the exercise of all religious worship. Of the Vandals chosen by Belisarius, the far greater part, in the honours of the Eastern service, forgot their country and religion but a generous band of four hundred obliged the mariners, when they were in sight of the Isle of Lesbos, to alter their course, they touched on Peloponnesus, ran ashore on a desert coast of Africa, and boldly erected on Mount Orasius the standard of independence and revolt. While the troops of the province disclaimed the command of their superiors, a conspiracy was formed at Carthage against the life of Solomon, who filled with honour the place of Belisarius and the Aryans had piously resolved to sacrifice the tyrant at the foot of the altar, during the awful mysteries of the festival of Easter. Fear or remorse restrained the daggers of the assassins, but the patience of Solomon emboldened their discontent, and at the end of ten days a furious sedition was kindled in the circus, which desolated Africa about ten years. The pillage of the city and the indiscriminate slaughter of its inhabitants were suspended only by darkness, sleep, and intoxication, the governor, with seven companions, among whom was the historian Procopius, escaped to Sicily, 
two-thirds of the army were involved in the guilt of treason, and 8,000 insurgents, assembling in the field of Bulla, elected Stuzza for their chief, a private soldier, who possessed in a superior degree the virtues of a rebel. Under the mask of freedom, his eloquence could lead, or at least impel, the passions of his equals. He raised himself to a level with Belisarius and the nephew of the emperor, by daring to encounter them in the field, and the victorious generals were compelled to acknowledge that Stuzza deserved a purer cause and a more legitimate command. Vanquished in battle he dexterously employed the arts of negotiation, a Roman army was seduced from their allegiance, and the chiefs who had trusted to his faithless promise were murdered by his order in a church of Numidia. When every resource either of force or perfidy was exhausted, Stuzza, with some desperate vandals, retired to the wilds of Mauritania, obtained the daughter of a barbarian prince, and eluded the pursuit of his enemies by the report of his death. The personal weight of Belisarius, the rank, the spirit, and the temper, of Germanus, the emperor's nephew, and the vigor and success of the second administration of the eunuch Solomon, restored the modesty of the camp, and maintained for a while the tranquility of Africa. But the vices of the Byzantine court were felt in that distant province, the troops complained that they were neither paid nor relieved, and, as soon as the public disorders were sufficiently mature, Stuzza was again alive, in arms, and at the gates of Carthage. He fell in a single combat, but he smiled in the agonies of death, when he was informed that his own javelin had reached the heart of his antagonist. The example of Stuzza, and the assurance that a fortunate soldier had been the first king, encouraged the ambition of Guntheris, and he promised, by a private treaty, to divide Africa with the Moors, if, with their dangerous aid, he should ascend the throne of Carthage. The feeble Ariobindas, unskilled in the affairs of peace and war, was raised, by his marriage with the niece of Justinian, to the office of Exarch. He was suddenly oppressed by a sedition of the guards, and his abject supplications, which provoked the contempt, could not move the pity, of the inexorable tyrant. After a reign of thirty days, Guntheris himself was stabbed at a banquet by the hand of Artaban, and it is singular enough that an Armenian prince, of the royal family of Arsaces, should re-establish at Carthage the authority of the Roman Empire. In the conspiracy which unsheathed the dagger of Brutus against the life of Caesar. Every circumstance is curious and important to the eyes of posterity, but the guilt or merit of these loyal or rebellious assassins could interest only the contemporaries of Procopius, who, by their hopes and fears, their friendship or resentment, were personally engaged in the revolutions of Africa. That country was rapidly sinking into the state of barbarism, from whence it had been raised by the Phoenician colonies and Roman laws, and every step of intestine discord was marked by some deplorable victory of savage man over civilized society. The Moors, three though ignorant of justice, were impatient of oppression, their vagrant life and boundless wildness disappointed the arms and eluded the chains, of a conqueror, and experience had shown that neither oaths nor obligations could secure the fidelity of their attachment. The victory of Mount Auras had awed them into momentary submission, but, if they respected the character of Solomon, they hated and despised the pride and luxury of his two nephews, Cyrus and Sergius, on whom their uncle had imprudently bestowed the provincial governments of Tripoli and Pentapolis. A Moorish tribe encamped under the walls of Leptis, to renew their alliance and receive from the governor the customary gifts. Four score of their deputies were introduced as friends into the city, but, on the dark suspicion of a conspiracy, they were massacred at the table of Sergius, and the clamor of arms and revenge was re echoed through the valleys of Mount Atlas, from both the Sits to the Atlantic Ocean. A personal injury, the unjust execution or murder of his brother, rendered Ontilus the enemy of the Romans. The defeat of the Vandals had formally signalized his valor, the rudiments of justice and prudence were still more conspicuous in Amor, and, while he laid a drum to in ashes, he calmly admonished the emperor that the peace of Africa might be secured by the recall of Solomon and his unworthy nephews. 
the exarch led forth his troops from Carthage, but, at the distance of six days' journey, in the neighborhood of Tebest, for he was astonished by the superior numbers and fierce aspect of the barbarians. He proposed a treaty, solicited a reconciliation, and offered to bind himself by the most solemn oaths. By what oaths can he bind himself? interrupted the indignant Moors. Will he swear by the Gospels, the divine books of the Christians? It was on those books that the faith of his nephew Sergius was pledged to eighty of our innocent and unfortunate brethren. Before we trust them a second time, let us try their efficacy in the chastisement of perjury and the vindication of their own honor. Their honor was vindicated in the field of Tebest, by the death of Solomon and the total loss of his army. The arrival of fresh troops and more skillful commanders, soon checked the insolence of the Moors, seventeen of their princes were slain in the same battle, and the doubtful and transient submission of their tribes was celebrated with lavish applause by the people of Constantinople. Successive inroads had reduced the province of Africa to one third of the measure of Italy, yet the Roman emperors continued to reign above a century over Carthage and the fruitful coast of the Mediterranean. But the victories and the losses of Justinian were alike pernicious to mankind, and such was the desolation of Africa that in many parts a stranger might wander whole days without meeting the face either of a friend or an enemy. The nation of the Vandals had disappeared, they once amounted to an hundred and sixty thousand warriors, without including the children, the women, or the slaves. Their numbers were infinitely surpassed by the number of the Moorish families extirpated in a relentless war and the same destruction was retaliated on the Romans and their allies, who perished by the climate, their mutual quarrels, and the rage of the barbarians. When Procopius first landed, he admired the populousness of the cities and country, strenuously exercised in the labors of commerce and agriculture. In less than twenty years, that busy scene was converted into a silent solitude, the wealthy citizens escaped to Sicily and Constantinople, and the secret historian has confidently affirmed that five millions of Africans were consumed by the wars and government of the Emperor Justinian. The jealousy of the Byzantine court had not permitted Belisarius to achieve the conquest of Italy, and his abrupt departure revived the courage of the Goths, six who respected his genius, his virtue, and even the laudable motive which had urged the servant of Justinian to deceive and reject them. They had lost their king an inconsiderable loss, their capital, their treasures, the provinces from Sicily to the Alps, and the military force of two hundred thousand barbarians, magnificently equipped with horses and arms. Yet all was not lost, as long as Pavia was defended by one thousand Goths, inspired by a sense of honor, the love of freedom, and the memory of their past greatness. The supreme command was unanimously offered to the brave Euraeus and it was in his eyes alone that the disgrace of his uncle Vitages could appear as a reason of exclusion. His voice inclined the election in favor of Hildebald, whose personal merit was recommended by the vain hope that his kinsman Theudes, the Spanish monarch, would support the common interest of the Gothic nation. The success of his arms in Liguria and Venetia seemed to justify their choice but he soon declared to the world that he was incapable of forgiving or commanding his benefactor. The consort of Hildebald was deeply wounded by the beauty, the riches, and the pride of the wife of Euraeus, and the death of that virtuous patriot excited the indignation of a free people. A bold assassin executed their sentence, by striking off the head of Hildebald in the midst of a banquet, the Rugians, a foreign tribe, assumed the privilege of election, and Tokla the nephew of the late king, was tempted, by revenge, to deliver himself and the garrison of Treviso into the hands of the Romans. But the gallant and accomplished youth was easily persuaded to prefer the Gothic throne before the service of Justinian, and, as soon as the palace of Pavia had been purified from the Rugian usurper, he reviewed the national force of five thousand soldiers and generously undertook the restoration of the kingdom of Italy. The successors of Belisarius, eleven generals of equal rank, neglected to crush the feeble and disunited Goths, till they were roused to action by the progress of Totla and the reproaches of Justinian. The gates of Verona were secretly opened to Artabazus, 
at the head of 100 Persians in the service of the empire. The Goths fled from the city. At the distance of 60 furlongs the Roman generals halted to regulate the division of the spoil. While they disputed, the enemy discovered the real number of the victors. The Persians were instantly overpowered, and it was by leaping from the wall that Artabazus preserved a life which he lost in a few days by the lance of a barbarian, who had defied him to single combat. 20,000 Romans encountered the forces of Totla, near Fenza, and on the hills of Mugolo of the Florentine territory. The ardor of freedmen who fought to regain their country was opposed to the languid temper of mercenary troops, who were even destitute of the merits of strong and well disciplined servitude. On the first attack, they abandoned their ensigns, threw down their arms, and dispersed on all sides with an active speed, which abated the loss whilst it aggravated the shame, of their defeat. The king of the Goths, who blushed for the baseness of his enemies, pursued with rapid steps the path of honour and victory. Totla passed the Po, traversed the Apennine, suspended the important conquest of Ravenna, Florence, and Rome, and marched through the heart of Italy to form the siege, or rather blockade, of Naples. The Roman chiefs, imprisoned in their respective cities and accusing each other of the common disgrace, did not presume to disturb his enterprise. But the emperor, alarmed by the distress and danger of his Italian conquests, dispatched to the relief of Naples a fleet of galleys and a body of Thracian and Armenian soldiers. They landed in Sicily, which yielded its copious stores of provisions, but the delays of the new commander, an unwarlike magistrate, protracted the sufferings of the besieged, and the succors, which he dropped with a timid and tardy hand, were successively intercepted by the armed vessels stationed by Totla in the Bay of Naples. The principal officer of the Romans was dragged with a rope round his neck to the foot of the wall, from whence, with a trembling voice, he exhorted the citizens to implore, like himself, the mercy of the conqueror. They requested a truce with a promise of surrendering the city if no effectual relief should appear at the end of thirty days. Instead of one month, the audacious barbarian granted them three, in the just confidence that famine would anticipate the term of their capitulation. After the reduction of Naples and Cume, the provinces of Lucania, Apulia, and Calabria submitted to the king of the Goths. Totla led his army to the gates of Rome, pitched his camp at Tibur, or Tivoli, within twenty miles of the capital, and calmly exhorted the senate and people to compare the tyranny of the Greeks with the blessings of the Gothic reign. The rapid success of Totla may be partly ascribed to the revolution which three years' experience had produced in the sentiments of the Italians. At the command, or at least in the name, of a Catholic emperor, the Pope, comma seven, their spiritual father, had been torn from the Roman Church and either starved or murdered on a desolate island. The virtues of Belisarius were replaced by the various or uniform vices of eleven chiefs, at Rome, Ravenna, Florence, Perugia, Spolto, and C, who abused their authority for the indulgence of lust or avarice. The improvement of the revenue was committed to Alexander, a subtle scribe, long practiced in the fraud and oppression of the Byzantine schools, and whose name of Saul Ixion, the scissors common nine was drawn from the dexterous artifice with which he reduced the size, without defacing the figure, of the gold coin. Instead of expecting the restoration of peace and industry, he imposed an heavy assessment on the fortunes of the Italians. Yet his present or future demands were less odious than a prosecution of arbitrary rigor against the persons and property of all those who, under the Gothic kings, had been concerned in the receipt and expenditure of the public money. The subjects of Justinian who escaped these partial vexations were oppressed by the irregular maintenance of the soldiers, whom Alexander defrauded and despised, and their hasty sallies in quest of wealth, or subsistence, provoked the inhabitants of the country to await or implore their deliverance from the virtues of a barbarian. Total ten was chaste and temperate, and none were deceived either friends or enemies, who depended on his faith or his clemency. To the husbandmen of Italy the Gothic king issued a welcome proclamation, enjoining them to pursue their important labours and to rest assured that, 
on the payment of the ordinary taxes, they should be defended by his valour and discipline from the injuries of war. The strong towns he successively attacked, and, as soon as they had yielded to his arms, he demolished the fortifications, to save the people from the calamities of a future siege, to deprive the Romans of the arts of defence, and to decide the tedious quarrel of the two nations by an equal and honourable conflict in the field of battle. The Roman captives and deserters were tempted to enlist in the service of a liberal and courteous adversary, the slaves were attracted by the firm and faithful promise that they should never be delivered to their masters, and, from the thousand warriors of Pavia, a new people, under the same appellation of Goths, was insensibly formed in the camp of Tutla. He sincerely accomplished the articles of capitulation, without seeking or accepting any sinister advantage from ambiguous expressions or unforeseen events, the garrison of Naples had stipulated, that they should be transported by sea, the obstinacy of the winds prevented their voyage, but they were generously supplied with horses, provisions, and a safe conduct to the gates of Rome. The wives of the senators, who had been surprised in the villas of Campania, were restored, without a ransom, to their husbands, the violation of female chastity was inexorably chastised with death, and, in the salutary regulation of the diet of the famished Neapolitans, the conqueror assumed the office of an humane and attentive physician. The virtues of total are equally laudable, whether they proceeded from true policy, religious principle, or the instinct of humanity, he often harangued his troops, and it was his constant theme that national vice and ruin are inseparably connected, that victory is the fruit of moral as well as military virtue and that the prince, and even the people, are responsible for the crimes which they neglect to punish. The return of Belisarius, to save the country which he had subdued, was pressed with equal vehemence by his friends and enemies, and the Gothic war was imposed as a trust or an exile on the veteran commander. An hero on the banks of the Euphrates, a slave in the palace of Constantinople, he accepted, with reluctance, the painful task of supporting his own reputation and retrieving the faults of his successors. The sea was open to the Romans, the ships and soldiers were assembled at Salona, near the palace of Diocletian, he refreshed and reviewed his troops at Pola in Istria, coasted round the head of the Hadriatic, entered the port of Ravenna, and dispatched orders rather than supplies to the subordinate cities. His first public oration was addressed to the Goths and Romans, in the name of the Emperor, who had suspended for a while the conquest of Persia and listened to the prayers of his Italian subjects. He gently touched on the causes and the authors of the recent disasters, striving to remove the fear of punishment for the past and the hope of impunity for the future, and labouring, with more zeal than success, to unite all the members of his government in a firm league of affection and obedience. Justinian, his gracious master, was inclined to pardon and reward, and it was their interest, as well as duty, to reclaim their deluded brethren, who had been seduced by the arts of the usurper. Not a man was tempted to desert the standard of the Gothic king. Belisarius soon discovered that he was sent to remain the idle and impotent spectator of the glory of a young barbarian, and his own epistle exhibits a genuine and lively picture of the distress of a noble mind. Most excellent prince, we are arrived in Italy, destitute of all the necessary implements of war, men, horses, arms, and money. In our late circuit through the villages of Thrace and Illyricum, we have collected, with extreme difficulty, about four thousand recruits, naked and unskilled in the use of weapons and the exercises of the camp. The soldiers already stationed in the province are discontented, fearful, and dismayed, at the sound of an enemy, they dismiss their horses, and cast their arms on the ground. No taxes can be raised, since Italy is in the hands of the barbarians, the failure of payment has deprived us of the right of command, or even of admonition. Be assured, dread sir, that the greater part of your troops have already deserted to the Goths. If the war could be achieved by the presence of Belisarius alone, your wishes are satisfied, Belisarius is in the midst of Italy. But, if you desire to conquer, far other preparations are requisite, 
without a military force, the title of general is an empty name. It would be expedient to restore to my service my own veterans and domestic guards. Before I can take the field, I must receive an adequate supply of light and heavy armed troops, and it is only with ready money that you can procure the indispensable aid of a powerful body of the cavalry of the Huns. 11 An officer in whom Belisarius confided was sent from Ravenna to hasten and conduct the succours, but the message was neglected, and the messenger was detained at Constantinople by an advantageous marriage. After his patience had been exhausted by delay and disappointment, the Roman general repassed the Hadriatic, and expected at Dyrrhachium the arrival of the troops, which were slowly assembled among the subjects and allies of the empire. His powers were still inadequate to the deliverance of Rome, which was closely besieged by the Gothic king. The Appian Way, a march of forty days, was covered by the barbarians, and, as the prudence of Belisarius declined a battle, he preferred the safe and speedy navigation of five days from the coast of Epirus to the mouth of the Tiber. After reducing, by force or treaty, the towns of inferior note in the Midland provinces of Italy, Totla proceeded not to assault, but to encompass and starve. The ancient capital. Rome was afflicted by the avarice, and guarded by the valour, of Bessas, a veteran chief of Gothic extraction, who filled, with a garrison of three thousand soldiers, the spacious circle of her venerable walls. From the distress of the people he extracted a profitable trade, and secretly rejoiced in the continuance of the siege. It was for his use that the granaries had been replenished. The charity of Pope Vigilius had purchased and embarked an ample supply of Sicilian corn, but the vessels which escaped the barbarians were seized by a rapacious governor, who imparted a scanty sustenance to the soldiers and sold the remainder to the wealthy Romans. The medimnus, or fifth part of the quarter of wheat, was exchanged for seven pieces of gold, fifty pieces were given for an ox a rare and accidental prize, the progress of famine enhanced this exorbitant value, and the mercenaries were tempted to deprive themselves of the allowance which was scarcely sufficient for the support of life. A tasteless and unwholesome mixture, in which the bran thrice exceeded the quantity of flour, appeased the hunger of the poor, they were gradually reduced to feed on dead horses, dogs, cats, and mice and eagerly to snatch the grass and even the nettles which grew among the ruins of the city. A crowd of spectres, pale and emaciated, their bodies oppressed with disease and their minds with despair, surrounded the palace of the governor, urged, with unavailing truth, that it was the duty of a master to maintain his slaves, and humbly requested that he would provide for their subsistence, permit their flight, or command their immediate execution. Bessas replied, with unfeeling tranquillity, that it was impossible to feed, unsafe to dismiss, and unlawful to kill, the subjects of the emperor. Yet the example of a private citizen might have shown his countrymen that a tyrant cannot withhold the privilege of death. Pierced by the cries of five children, who vainly called on their father for bread, he ordered them to follow his steps, advanced with calm and silent despair to one of the bridges of the Tiber, and, covering his face, threw himself headlong into the stream, in the presence of his family and the Roman people. To the rich and pusillanimous, Bessas twelve sold the permission of departure, but the greatest part of the fugitives expired on the public highways, or were intercepted by the flying parties of barbarians. In the meanwhile, the artful governor soothed the discontent, and revived the hopes, of the Romans by the vague reports of the fleets and armies which were hastening to their relief from the extremities of the east. They derived more rational comfort from the assurance that Belisarius had landed at the port, and, without numbering his forces, they firmly relied on the humanity, the courage, and the skill of their great deliverer. The foresight of Totler had raised obstacles worthy of such an antagonist. Ninety furlongs below the city, in the narrowest part of the river, he joined the two banks by strong and solid timbers in the form of a bridge, on which he erected two lofty towers, manned by the bravest of his Goths, and profusely stored with missile weapons and engines of offence. The approach of the bridge and towers was covered by a strong and massy chain of iron, and the chain, at either end, 
on the opposite sides of the Tiber, was defended by a numerous and chosen detachment of archers. But the enterprise of forcing these barriers and relieving the capital displays a shining example of the boldness and conduct of Belisarius. His cavalry advanced from the port along the public road, toward the motion, and distracted the attention, of the enemy. His infantry and provisions were distributed in two hundred large boats, and each boat was shielded by an high rampart of thick planks, pierced with many small holes for the discharge of missile weapons. In the front, two large vessels were linked together to sustain a floating castle, which commanded the towers of the bridge, and contained a magazine of fire, sulphur, and bitumen. The whole fleet, which the general led in person, was laboriously moved against the current of the river. The chain yielded to their weight, and the enemies who guarded the banks were either slain or scattered. As soon as they touched the principal barrier, the fire ship was instantly grappled to the bridge, one of the towers, with two hundred Goths, was consumed by the flames, the assailants shouted victory, and Rome was saved, if the wisdom of Belisarius had not been defeated by the misconduct of his officers. He had previously sent orders to Bessas to second his operations by a timely sally from the town, and he had fixed his lieutenant, Isaac, by a peremptory command to the station of the port. But avarice rendered Bessas immovable, while the youthful ardour of Isaac delivered him into the hands of a superior enemy. The exaggerated rumour of his defeat was hastily carried to the ears of Belisarius, he paused, betrayed in that single moment of his life some emotions of surprise and perplexity, and reluctantly sounded a retreat to save his wife Antonina, his treasures and the only harbour which he possessed on the Tuscan coast. The vexation of his mind produced an ardent and almost mortal fever, and Rome was left without protection to the mercy or indignation of Totler. The continuance of hostilities had embittered the national hatred, the Arian clergy was ignominiously driven from Rome, Pelagius, the archdeacon, returned without success from an embassy to the Gothic camp, and a Sicilian bishop, the envoy or nuncio of the Pope, was deprived of both of his hands, for daring to utter falsehoods in the service of the church and state. Famine had relaxed the strength and discipline of the garrison of Rome. They could derive no effectual service from a dying people, and the inhuman avarice of the merchant at length absorbed the vigilance of the governor. Four Isaurian sentinels, while their companions slept and their officers were absent, descended by a rope from the wall, and secretly proposed to the Gothic king to introduce his troops into the city. The offer was entertained with coldness and suspicion, they returned in safety, they twice repeated their visit, the place was twice examined, the conspiracy was known and disregarded, and no sooner had Total consented to the attempt, than they unbarred the Asinarian gate and gave admittance to the Goths till the dawn of day they halted in order of battle, apprehensive of treachery or ambush, but the troops of Bessas, with their leader, had already escaped, and, when the king was pressed to disturb their retreat, he prudently replied that no sight could be more grateful than that of a flying enemy. The patricians who were still possessed of horses, Decius, Basilius, and C accompanied the governor, their brethren, among whom Elibrius, Orestes, and Maximus are named by the historian, took refuge in the church of St. Peter, but the assertion that only five hundred persons remained in the capital inspires some doubt of the fidelity either of his narrative or of his text. As soon as daylight had displayed the entire victory of the Goths, their monarch devoutly visited the tomb of the Prince of the Apostles, but, while he prayed at the altar, Twenty-five soldiers and sixty citizens were put to the sword in the vestibule of the temple. The archdeacon Pelagius XIII stood before him with the gospels in his hand. O Lord, be merciful to your servant. Pelagius, said Totler with an insulting smile, your pride now condescends to become a suppliant. I am a suppliant, replied the prudent archdeacon. God has now made us your subjects, and, as your subjects, we are entitled to your clemency. At his humble prayer, the lives of the Romans were spared, 
and the chastity of the maids and matrons was preserved inviolate from the passions of the hungry soldiers. But they were rewarded by the freedom of pillage, after the most precious spoils had been reserved for the royal treasury. The houses of the senators were plentifully stored with gold and silver, and the avarice of Bessus had labored with so much guilt and shame for the benefit of the conqueror. In this revolution the sons and daughters of Roman consuls tasted the misery which they had spurned or relieved, wandered in tattered garments through the streets of the city, and begged their bread, perhaps without success, before the gates of their hereditary mansions. The riches of Rostishona, the daughter of Symmachus and widow of Boethius, had been generously devoted to alleviate the calamities of famine. But the barbarians were exasperated by the report that she had prompted the people to overthrow the statues of the great Theodoric, and the life of that venerable matron would have been sacrificed to his memory, if Totla had not respected her birth, her virtues, and even the pious motive of her revenge. The next day he pronounced two orations, to congratulate and admonish his victorious Goths, and to reproach the Senate, as the vilest of slaves, with their perjury, folly, and ingratitude, sternly declaring that their estates and honours were justly forfeited to the companions of his arms. Yet he consented to forgive their revolt, and the senators repaid his clemency by dispatching circular letters to their tenants and vassals in the provinces of Italy strictly to enjoin them to desert the standard of the Greeks, to cultivate their lands in peace, and to learn from their masters the duty of obedience to a Gothic sovereign. Against the city which had so long delayed the course of his victories he appeared inexorable, one third of the walls, in different parts, were demolished by his command, fire and engines prepared to consume or subvert the most stately works of antiquity and the world was astonished by the fatal decree, that Rome should be changed into a pasture for cattle. The firm and temperate remonstrance of Belisarius suspended the execution, he warned the barbarian not to sully his fame by the destruction of those monuments which were the glory of the dead and the delight of the living, and Totler was persuaded by the advice of an enemy to preserve Rome as the ornament of his kingdom or the fairest pledge of peace and reconciliation. When he had signified to the ambassadors of Belisarius his intention of sparing the city, he stationed an army at the distance of one hundred and twenty furlongs, to observe the motions of the Roman general. With the remainder of his forces, he marched into Lucania and Apulia, and occupied on the summit of Mount Garganus fourteen one of the camps of Hannibal. The senators were dragged in his train, and afterwards confined in the fortresses of Campania, the citizens, with their wives and children, were dispersed in exile, and during forty days Rome was abandoned to desolate and dreary solitude. The loss of Rome was speedily retrieved by an action to which, according to the event, the public opinion would apply the names of rashness or heroism. After the departure of Totla, the Roman general sallied from the port at the head of a thousand horse, cut in pieces the enemy who opposed his progress and visited with pity and reverence the vacant space of the Eternal City. Resolved to maintain a station so conspicuous in the eyes of mankind, he summoned the greatest part of his troops to the standard which he erected on the capital, the old inhabitants were recalled by the love of their country and the hopes of food, and the keys of Rome were sent a second time to the Emperor Justinian. The walls, as far as they had been demolished by the Goths, were repaired with rude and dissimilar materials, the ditch was restored, iron spikes sixteen were profusely scattered on the highways to annoy the feet of the horses, and, as new gates could not suddenly be procured, the entrance was guarded by a Spartan rampart of his bravest soldiers. At the expiration of twenty-five days, Totler returned by hasty marches from Apulia, to avenge the injury and disgrace. Belisarius expected his approach. The Goths were thrice repulsed in three general assaults, they lost the flower of their troops, the royal standard had almost fallen into the hands of the enemy, and the fame of Totla sunk, as it had risen, with the fortune of his arms. Whatever skill and courage could achieve had been performed by the Roman general, it remained only that Justinian should terminate, by a strong and seasonable effort, the war which he had ambitiously undertaken. The indolence, perhaps the impotence, 
of a prince who despised his enemies and envied his servants protracted the calamities of Italy. After a long silence, Belisarius was commanded to leave a sufficient garrison at Rome, and to transport himself into the province of Lucania, whose inhabitants, inflamed by Catholic zeal, had cast away the yoke of their Arian conquerors. In this ignoble warfare, the hero, invincible against the power of the barbarians, was basely vanquished by the delay, the disobedience, and the cowardice of his own officers. He reposed in his winter quarters of Crotona, in the full assurance that the two passes of the Lucanian hills were guarded by his cavalry. They were betrayed by treachery or weakness, and the rapid march of the Goths scarcely allowed time for the escape of Belisarius to the coast of Sicily. At length a fleet and army were assembled for the relief of Rosinum, or Rosno, 17 a fortress, 60 furlongs from the ruins of Sibiris where the nobles of Lucania had taken refuge. In the first attempt the Roman forces were dissipated by a storm. In the second they approached the shore, but they saw the hills covered with archers, the landing place defended by a line of spears, and the king of the Goths impatient for battle. The conqueror of Italy retired with a sigh, and continued to languish, inglorious and inactive, till Antonina, who had been sent to Constantinople to solicit succors, obtained, after the death of the empress, the permission of his return. The five last campaigns of Belisarius might abate the envy of his competitors, whose eyes had been dazzled and wounded by the blaze of his former glory. Instead of delivering Italy from the Goths, he had wandered like a fugitive along the coast, without daring to march into the country or to accept the bold and repeated challenge of Totla. Yet, in the judgment of the few who could discriminate counsels from events and compare the instruments with the execution, he appeared a more consummate master of the art of war, than in the season of his prosperity, when he presented two captive kings before the throne of Justinian. The valour of Belisarius was not chilled by age. His prudence was matured by experience, but the moral virtues of humanity and justice seemed to have yielded to the hard necessity of the times. The parsimony or poverty of the emperor compelled him to deviate from the rule of conduct which had deserved the love and confidence of the Italians. The war was maintained by the oppression of Ravenna, Sicily, and all the faithful subjects of the empire, and the rigorous prosecution of Herodian provoked that injured or guilty officer to deliver Spolto into the hands of the enemy. The avarice of Antonina, which had been sometimes diverted by love, now reigned without rival in her breast. Belisarius himself had always understood that riches, in a corrupt age, are their support and ornament of personal merit. And it cannot be presumed that he should stain his honour for the public service, without applying a part of the spoil to his private emolument. The hero had escaped the sword of the barbarians, but the dagger of conspiracy eighteen awaited his return. In the midst of wealth and honours, Artaban, who had chastised the African tyrant, complained of the ingratitude of courts. He aspired to Prejecta, the emperor's niece, who wished to reward her deliverer, but the impediment of his previous marriage was asserted by the piety of Theodora. The pride of royal descent was irritated by flattery, and the service in which he gloried had proved him capable of bold and sanguinary deeds. The death of Justinian was resolved, but the conspirators delayed the execution till they could surprise Belisarius, disarmed and naked, in the palace of Constantinople. Not a hope could be entertained of shaking his long-tried fidelity, and they justly dreaded the revenge, or rather justice, of the veteran general, who might speedily assemble an army in Thrace, to punish the assassins, and perhaps to enjoy the fruits of their crime. Delay afforded time for rash communications and honest confessions, Artaban and his accomplices were condemned by the Senate, but the extreme clemency of Justinian detained them in the gentle confinement of the palace, till he pardoned their flagitious attempt against his throne and life. If the emperor forgave his enemies, he must cordially embrace a friend whose victories were alone remembered, and who was endeared to his prince by the recent circumstance of their common danger. Belisarius reposed from his toils, in the high station of general of the east and count of the domestics, 
and the older consuls and patricians respectfully yielded the precedency of rank to the peerless merit of the first of the Romans. The first of the Romans still submitted to be the slave of his wife, but the servitude of habit and affection became less disgraceful when the death of Theodora had removed the baser influence of fear. Joannina their daughter, and the sole heiress of their fortunes, was betrothed to Anastasius the grandison, or rather the nephew, of the Empress Comma Twenty whose kind interposition forwarded the consummation of their youthful loves. But the power of Theodora expired, the parents of Joannina returned, and her honour, perhaps her happiness, were sacrificed to the revenge of an unfeeling mother, who dissolved the imperfect nuptials before they had been ratified by the ceremonies of the church. Before the departure of Belisarius, Perusia was besieged, and few cities were impregnable to the Gothic arms. Ravenna, Ancona, and Crotona still resisted the barbarians, and, when Totalo asked in marriage one of the daughters of France, he was stung by the just reproach that the king of Italy was unworthy of his title till it was acknowledged by the Roman people. Three thousand of the bravest soldiers had been left to defend the capital. On the suspicion of a monopoly, they massacred the governor, and announced to Justinian, by a deputation of the clergy, that, unless their offence was pardoned and their arrears were satisfied, they should instantly accept the tempting offers of Totla, but the officer who succeeded to the command, his name was Diogenes, deserved their esteem and confidence, and the Goths, instead of finding an easy conquest, encountered a vigorous resistance from the soldiers and people, who patiently endured the loss of the port and of all the maritime supplies. The siege of Rome would perhaps have been raised, if the liberality of Totla to the Isaurians had not encouraged some of their venal countrymen to copy the example of treason. In a dark night, while the Gothic trumpets sounded on another side, they silently opened the gate of St. Paul, the barbarians rushed into the city, and the flying garrison was intercepted before they could reach the harbour of St. Umsel. A soldier trained in the school of Belisarius, Paul of Cilicia, retired with four hundred men to the Mole of Hadrian. They repelled the Goths, but they felt the approach of famine and their aversion to the taste of horse flesh confirmed their resolution to risk the event of a desperate and decisive sally. But their spirit insensibly stooped to the offers of capitulation. They retrieved their arrears of pay, and preserved their arms and horses, by enlisting in the service of Totla, their chiefs, who pleaded a laudable attachment to their wives and children in the east, were dismissed with honour, and above four hundred enemies, who had taken refuge in the sanctuaries, were saved by the clemency of the victor. He no longer entertained a wish of destroying the edifices of Rome, 22 which he now respected as the seat of the Gothic kingdom, the senate and people were restored to their country, the means of subsistence were liberally provided, and Totla, in the robe of peace, exhibited the equestrian games of the circus. Whilst he amused the eyes of the multitude, Four hundred vessels were prepared for the embarkation of his troops. The cities of Regium and Tarentum were reduced. He passed into Sicily, the object of his implacable resentment, and the island was stripped of its gold and silver, of the fruits of the earth, and of an infinite number of horses, sheep, and oxen. Sardinia and Corsica obeyed the fortune of Italy, and the sea coast of Greece was visited by a fleet of three hundred galleys. The Goths were landed in Corsica and the ancient continent of Epirus, they advanced as far as Nicopolis, the trophy of Augustus, and Dodona, 24 once famous by the oracle of Jove. In every step of his victories, the wise barbarian repeated to Justinian his desire of peace, applauded the concord of their predecessors, and offered to employ the Gothic arms in the service of the empire. Justinian was deaf to the voice of peace but he neglected the prosecution of war, and the indolence of his temper disappointed, in some degree, the obstinacy of his passions. From this salutary slumber the emperor was awakened by the Pope Vigilius and the patrician Setcus, who appeared before his throne, and adjured him in the name of God and the people to resume the conquest and deliverance of Italy. In the choice of the generals, caprice, as well as judgment, was shown. A fleet and army sailed for the relief of Sicily, 
under the conduct of Liberius, but his want of youth and experience were afterwards discovered, and, before he touched the shores of the island, he was overtaken by his successor. In the place of Liberius the conspirator Artaban was raised from a prison to military honours, in the pious presumption that gratitude would animate his valour and fortify his allegiance. Belisarius reposed in the shade of his laurels, but the command of the principal army was reserved for Germanus, the emperor's nephew, whose rank and merit had been long depressed by the jealousy of the court. Theodora had injured him in the rights of a private citizen, the marriage of his children, and the testament of his brother, and, although his conduct was pure and blameless, Justinian was displeased that he should be thought worthy of the confidence of the malcontents. The life of Germanus was a lesson of implicit obedience, he nobly refused to prostitute his name and character in the factions of the circus, the gravity of his manners was tempered by innocent cheerfulness, and his riches were lent without interest to indigent or deserving friends. His valour had formerly triumphed over the Sclavonians of the Danube and the rebels of Africa, the first report of his promotion revived the hopes of the Italians, and he was privately assured that a crowd of Roman deserters would abandon, on his approach, the standard of Totla. His second marriage with Malacintha, the granddaughter of Theodoric, endeared Germanus to the Goths themselves, and they marched with reluctance against the father of a royal infant, the last offspring of the line of Mli. A splendid allowance was assigned by the emperor, the general contributed his private fortune, his two sons were popular and active, and he surpassed, in the promptitude and success of his levies, the expectation of mankind. He was permitted to select some squadrons of Thracian cavalry, the veterans, as well as the youth of Constantinople and Europe, engaged their voluntary service, and as far as the heart of Germany his fame and liberality attracted the aid of the barbarians. The Romans advanced to Sardica, an army of Sclavonians fled before their march, but within two days of their final departure, the designs of Germanus were terminated by his malady and death. Yet the impulse which he had given to the Italian war still continued to act with energy and effect. The maritime towns, Ancona, Crotona, Centumsal, resisted the assaults of Totla. Sicily was reduced by the zeal of Artaban, and the Gothic navy was defeated near the coast of the Hadriatic. The two fleets were almost equal, 47 to 50 galleys, the victory was decided by the knowledge and dexterity of the Greeks. But the ships were so closely grappled that only twelve of the Goths escaped from this unfortunate conflict. They affected to depreciate an element in which they were unskilled, but their own experience confirmed the truth of a maxim, that the master of the sea will always acquire the dominion of the land. After the loss of Germanus, the nations were provoked to smile by the strange intelligence that the command of the Roman armies was given to an eunuch. But the eunuch Narses 25 is ranked among the few who have rescued that unhappy name from the contempt and hatred of mankind. A feeble diminutive body concealed the soul of a statesman and a warrior. His youth had been employed in the management of the loom and distaff, in the cares of the household, and the service of female luxury, but, while his hands were busy, he secretly exercised the faculties of a vigorous and discerning mind. A stranger to the schools and the camp, he studied in the palace to dissemble, to flatter, and to persuade, and, as soon as he approached the person of the emperor, Justinian listened with surprise and pleasure to the manly counsels of his chamberlain and private treasurer. The talents of Narses were tried and improved in frequent embassies, he led an army into Italy, acquired a practical knowledge of the war and the country, and presumed to strive with the genius of Belisarius. Twelve years after his return, the eunuch was chosen to achieve the conquest which had been left imperfect by the first of the Roman generals. Instead of being dazzled by vanity or emulation, he seriously declared that, unless he were armed with an adequate force, he would never consent to risk his own glory and that of his sovereign. Justinian granted to the favourite what he might have denied to the hero, the Gothic war was rekindled from its ashes and the preparations were not unworthy of the ancient majesty of the empire. The key of the public treasure was put into his hand, to collect magazines, to levy soldiers, 
to purchase arms and horses, to discharge the arrears of pay, and to tempt the fidelity of the fugitives and deserters. The troops of Germanus were still in arms, they halted at Salona in the expectation of a new leader, and legions of subjects and allies were created by the well-known liberality of the eunuch Narses. The king of the Lombards 27 satisfied or surpassed the obligations of a treaty, by lending 2,200 of his bravest warriors, who were followed by 3,000 of their martial attendants. 3,000 Haruli fought on horseback under Philemoth, their native chief, and the noble Aratus, who adopted the manners and discipline of Rome, conducted a band of veterans of the same nation. Dagistheus was released from prison to command the Huns, and Cobad, the grandson and nephew of the great king, was conspicuous by the regal tiara at the head of his faithful Persians, who had devoted themselves to the fortunes of their prince. Absolute in the exercise of his authority, more absolute in the affection of his troops, Narses led a numerous and gallant army from Philippopolis to Salona, from whence he coasted the eastern side of the Hadriatic as far as the confines of Italy. His progress was checked. The east could not supply vessels capable of transporting such multitudes of men and horses. The Franks, who in the general confusion had usurped the greater part of the Venetian province, refused a free passage to the friends of the Lombards. The station of Verona was occupied by Teias, with the flower of the Gothic forces, and that skillful commander had overspread the adjacent country with the fall of woods and the inundation of waters. In this perplexity, an officer of experience proposed a measure, secure by the appearance of rashness, that the Roman army should cautiously advance along the seashore, while the fleet preceded their march, and successively cast a bridge of boats over the mouths of the rivers, the Tamavus, the Brenta, Adage, and the Po, that fall into the Hadriatic to the north of Ravenna. Nine days he reposed in the city, collected the fragments of the Italian army, and marched towards Rimini to meet the defiance of an insulting enemy. The prudence of Narses impelled him to speedy and decisive action. His powers were the last effort of the state, the cost of each day accumulated the enormous account, and the nations, untrained to discipline or fatigue, might be rashly provoked to turn their arms against each other, or against their benefactor. The same considerations might have tempered the ardor of Totler. But he was conscious, that the clergy and people of Italy aspired to a second revolution, he felt or suspected the rapid progress of treason, and he resolved to risk the Gothic kingdom on the chance of a day, in which the valiant would be animated by instant danger and the disaffected might be awed by mutual ignorance. In his march from Ravenna, the Roman general chastised the garrison of Rimini, traversed in a direct line the hills of Urbino, and re-entered the Flaminian Way, nine miles beyond the perforated rock, an obstacle of art and nature which might have stopped or retarded his progress. The Goths were assembled in the neighborhood of Rome, they advanced without delay to seek a superior enemy, and the two armies approached each other at the distance of one hundred furlongs, between Tagina 31 and the sepulchres of the Gauls. The haughty message of Narses was an offer, not of peace, but of pardon. The answer of the Gothic king declared his resolution to die or conquer. What day, said the messenger, will you fix for the combat? The eighth day, replied Totler, but early the next morning he attempted to surprise a foe, suspicious of deceit and prepared for battle. Ten thousand Haruli and Lombards, of approved valor and doubtful faith, were placed in the center. Each of the wings was composed of eight thousand Romans, the right was guarded by the cavalry of the Huns, the left was covered by fifteen hundred chosen horse, destined, according to the emergencies of action, to sustain the retreat of their friends or to encompass the flank of the enemy. From his proper station at the head of the right wing, the eunuch rode along the line, expressing by his voice and countenance the assurance of victory, exciting the soldiers of the emperor to punish the guilt and madness of a band of robbers and exposing to their view gold chains. Collars, and bracelets, the rewards of military virtue. From the event of a single combat they drew an omen of success, 
and they beheld with pleasure the courage of fifty archers, who maintained a small eminence against three successive attacks of the Gothic cavalry. At the distance only of two bow shots, the armies spent the morning in dreadful suspense, and the Romans tasted some necessary food, without unloosening the cuirass from their breasts, or the bridle from their horses. Narses awaited the charge, and it was delayed by total till he had received his last succors of two thousand Goths. While he consumed the hours in fruitless treaty, the king exhibited in a narrow space the strength and agility of a warrior. His armor was enchased with gold, his purple banner floated with the wind. He cast his lance into the air, caught it with the right hand, shifted it to the left, threw himself backwards, recovered his seat, and managed a fiery steed in all the paces and evolutions of the equestrian school. As soon as the suckers had arrived, he retired to his tent, assumed the dress and arms of a private soldier, and gave the signal of battle. The first line of cavalry advanced with more courage than discretion, and left behind them the infantry of the second line. They were soon engaged between the horns of a crescent, into which the adverse wings had been insensibly curved, and were saluted from either side by the volleys of four thousand archers. Their ardor, and even their distress, drove them forwards to a close and unequal conflict, in which they could only use their lances against an enemy equally skilled in all the instruments of war. A generous emulation inspired the Romans and their barbarian allies, and Narses, who calmly viewed and directed their efforts, doubted to whom he should adjudge the prize of superior bravery. The Gothic cavalry was astonished and disordered, pressed and broken, and the line of infantry, instead of presenting their spears or opening their intervals, were trampled under the feet of the flying horse. Six thousand of the Goths were slaughtered, without mercy, in the field of Tejina. Their prince, with five attendants, was overtaken by Asbad, of the race of the Jepide, spare the king of Italy, cried a loyal voice, and Asbad struck his lance through the body of Totla. The blow was instantly revenged by the faithful Goths they transported their dying monarch seven miles beyond the scene of his disgrace, and his last moments were not embittered by the presence of an enemy. Compassion afforded him the shelter of an obscure tomb, but the Romans were not satisfied of their victory, till they beheld the corpse of the Gothic king. His hat, enriched with gems, and his bloody robe, were presented to Justinian by the messengers of triumph. As soon as Narses had paid his devotions to the author of victory, and the blessed virgin, his peculiar patroness, 33, he praised, rewarded, and dismissed the Lombards. The villages had been reduced to ashes by these valiant savages. They ravished matrons and virgins on the altar, their retreat was diligently watched by a strong detachment of regular forces who prevented a repetition of the like disorders. The victorious eunuch pursued his march through Tuscany, accepted the submission of the Goths, heard the acclamations and often the complaints of the Italians, and encompassed the walls of Rome with the remainder of his formidable host. Round the wide circumference, Narses assigned to himself, and to each of his lieutenants, a real or a feigned attack while he silently marked the place of easy and unguarded entrance. Neither the fortifications of Hadrian's Mole, nor of the port, could long delay the progress of the conqueror, and Justinian once more received the keys of Rome, which, under his reign, had been five times taken and recovered. But the deliverance of Rome was the last calamity of the Roman people. The barbarian allies of Narses too frequently confounded the privileges of peace and war, the despair of the flying Goths found some consolation in sanguinary revenge, and three hundred youths of the noblest families, who had been sent as hostages beyond the Po, were inhumanly slain by the successor of Totla. The fate of the Senate suggests an awful lesson of the vicissitude of human affairs. Of the senators whom Totla had banished from their country, some were rescued by an officer of Belisarius and transported from Campania to Sicily, while others were too guilty to confide in the clemency of Justinian, or too poor to provide horses for their escape to the seashore. Their brethren languished five years in a state of indigence and exile, the victory of Narses revived their hopes, 
but their premature return to the metropolis was prevented by the furious Goths, and all the fortresses of Campania were stained with patrician blood. After a period of thirteen centuries, the institution of Romulus expired, and, if the nobles of Rome still assumed the title of senators, few subsequent traces can be discovered of a public council or constitutional order. Ascend six hundred years, and contemplate the kings of the earth soliciting an audience as the slaves or freedmen of the Roman Senate exclamation mark 35 the Gothic war was yet alive. The bravest of the nation retired beyond the Po, and Teias was unanimously chosen to succeed and revenge their departed hero. The new king immediately sent ambassadors to implore, or rather to purchase, the aid of the Franks and nobly lavished for the public safety the riches which had been deposited in the palace of Pavier. The residue of the royal treasure was guarded by his brother Elijah at Cum in Campania, but the strong castle which Totla had fortified was closely besieged by the arms of Narses. From the Alps to the foot of Mount Vesuvius, the Gothic king, by rapid and secret marches, advanced to the relief of his brother, eluded the vigilance of the Roman chiefs and pitched his camp on the banks of the Sanus or Draco, 36 which flows from New Syria into the Bay of Naples. The river separated the two armies, sixty days were consumed in distant and fruitless combats, and Teias maintained this important post, till he was deserted by his fleet and the hope of subsistence. With reluctant steps he ascended the Lectarian Mount, where the physicians of Rome, since the time of Galen, had sent their patients for the benefit of the air and the milk. But the Goths soon embraced a more generous resolution, to descend the hill to dismiss their horses, and to die in arms and in the possession of freedom. The king marched at their head, bearing in his right hand a lance, and an ample buckler in his left, with the one he struck dead the foremost of the assailants, with the other he received the weapons which every hand was ambitious to aim against his life. After a combat of many hours, his left arm was fatigued by the weight of twelve javelins which hung from his shield. Without moving from his ground or suspending his blows, the hero called aloud on his attendants for a fresh buckler, but in the moment while his side was uncovered it was pierced by a mortal dart. He fell, and his head, exalted on a spear, proclaimed to the nations that the Gothic kingdom was no more. But the example of his death served only to animate the companions who had sworn to perish with their leader. They fought till darkness descended on the earth. They reposed on their arms. The combat was renewed with the return of light, and maintained with unabated vigor till the evening of the second day. The repose of a second night, the want of water, and the loss of their bravest champions determined the surviving Goths to accept the fair capitulation which the prudence of Narses was inclined to propose. They embraced the alternative of residing in Italy as the subjects and soldiers of Justinian, or departing with a portion of their private wealth, in search of some independent country. Yet the oath of fidelity or exile was alike rejected by one thousand Goths, who broke away before the treaty was signed, and boldly effected their retreat to the walls of Pavia. The spirit as well as the situation of Elijah and prompted him to imitate rather than to bewail his brother, a strong and dexterous archer, he transpierced with a single arrow the armor and breast of his antagonist, and his military conduct defended Kamash 39 above a year against the forces of the Romans. Their industry had scooped the Sibyl's cave 40 into a prodigious mine, combustible materials were introduced to consume the temporary props. The wall and the gate of Cum sunk into the cavern, but the ruins formed a deep and inaccessible precipice. On the fragment of a rock Elijah stood alone and unshaken, till he calmly surveyed the hopeless condition of his country, and judged it more honorable to be the friend of Narses than the slave of the Franks. After the death of Teias, the Roman general separated his troops to reduce the cities of Italy, Lucca sustained a long and vigorous siege and such was the humanity or the prudence of Narses that the repeated perfidy of the inhabitants could not provoke him to exact the forfeit lives of their hostages. These hostages were dismissed in safety, and their grateful zeal at length subdued the obstinacy of their countrymen. Before Lucca had surrendered, 
Italy was overwhelmed by a new deluge of barbarians. A feeble youth, the grandson of Clovis, reigned over the Austrasians or Oriental Franks. The guardians of Theobald entertained with coldness and reluctance the magnificent promises of the Gothic ambassadors. But the spirit of a martial people outstripped the timid counsels of the court, two brothers, Lothair and Buxlin, 42 the dukes of the Alemanni, stood forth as the leaders of the Italian war, and 75,000 Germans descended in the autumn from the Rhetian Alps into the plain of Milan. The vanguard of the Roman army was stationed near the Po, under the conduct of Fulcheres, a bold Herulean, who rashly conceived that personal bravery was the sole duty and merit of a commander. As he marched without order or precaution along the Emilian Way, an ambuscade of Franks suddenly rose from the amphitheatre of Parma. His troops were surprised and routed, but their leader refused to fly, declaring to the last moment that death was less terrible than the angry countenance of Narses. The death of Fulcheres, and the retreat of the surviving chiefs, decided the fluctuating and rebellious temper of the Goths. They flew to the standard of their deliverers, and admitted them into the cities which still resisted the arms of the Roman general. The conqueror of Italy opened a free passage to the irresistible torrent of barbarians. They passed under the walls of Cessna, and answered by threats and reproaches the advice of Elijah that the Gothic treasures could no longer repay the labor of an invasion. Two thousand Franks were destroyed by the skill and valor of Narses himself, who sallied from Rimini at the head of three hundred horse to chastise the licentious rapine of their march. On the confines of Samnium the two brothers divided their forces. With the right wing, Buxlin assumed the spoil of Campania, Lucania, and Brium, with the left, Lothair accepted the plunder of Apulia and Calabria. They followed the coast of the Mediterranean and the Hadriatic, as far as Regium and Otranto, and the extreme lands of Italy were the term of their destructive progress. The Franks, who were Christians and Catholics, contented themselves with simple pillage and occasional murder. But the churches, which their piety had spared, were stripped by the sacrilegious hands of the Alemanni, who sacrificed horses' heads to their native deities of the woods and rivers. Semicolon 43 They melted or profaned the consecrated vessels, and the ruins of shrines and altars were stained with the blood of the faithful. Buxlin was actuated by ambition and Lothair by avarice. The former aspired to restore the Gothic kingdom, the latter, after a promise to his brother of speedy succors, returned by the same road to deposit his treasure beyond the Alps. The strength of their armies was already wasted by the change of climate and contagion of disease. The Germans reveled in the vintage of Italy, and their own intemperance avenged in some degree the miseries of a defenseless people. At the entrance of the spring, the imperial troops, who had guarded the cities, assembled to the number of 18,000 men, in the neighborhood of Rome. Their winter hours had not been consumed in idleness. By the command, and after the example, of Narses they repeated each day their military exercise on foot and on horseback, accustomed their ear to obey the sound of the trumpet, and practiced the steps and evolutions of the Pyrrhic dance. From the Straits of Sicily, Buxlin, with thirty thousand Franks and Alemanni, slowly moved towards Capua, occupied with a wooden tower the bridge of Caslinum, covered his right by the stream of the Volturnus, and secured the rest of his encampment by a rampart of sharp stakes and a circle of wagons, whose wheels were buried in the earth. He impatiently expected the return of Lothair, ignorant, alas! that his brother could never return and that the chief and his army had been swept away by a strange disease 44 on the banks of the Lake Benicus, between Trent and Verona. The banners of Narses soon approached the Volturnus, and the eyes of Italy were anxiously fixed on the event of this final contest. Perhaps the talents of the Roman general were most conspicuous in the calm operations which precede the tumult of a battle. His skillful movements intercepted the subsistence of the barbarian, deprived him of the advantage of the bridge and river, and, in the choice of the ground and moment of action, reduced him to comply with the inclination of his enemy. On the morning of the important day, when the ranks were already formed, a servant, for some trivial fault, 
was killed by his master, one of the leaders of the Harulai. The justice or passion of Narses was awakened, he summoned the offender to his presence, and, without listening to his excuses, gave the signal to the minister of death. If the cruel master had not infringed the laws of his nation, this arbitrary execution was not less unjust than it appears to have been imprudent. The Harulai felt the indignity, they halted, but the Roman general, without soothing their rage or expecting their resolution, called aloud, as the trumpets sounded, that, unless they hastened to occupy their place, they would lose the honor of the victory. His troops were disposed forty-five in a long front, the cavalry on the wings, in the center, the heavy armed foot, the archers and slingers in the rear. The Germans advanced in a sharp pointed column, of the form of a triangle or solid wedge. They pierced the feeble center of Narses, who received them with a smile into the fatal snare and directed his wings of cavalry insensibly to wheel on their flanks and encompass their rear. The host of the Franks and Dalimani consisted of infantry, a sword and buckler hung by their sides, and they used as their weapons of offense a weighty hatchet and a hooked javelin, which were only formidable in close combat or at a short distance. The flower of the Roman archers on horseback, and in complete armor, skirmished without peril round this immovable phalanx, supplied by active speed the deficiency of number, and aimed their arrows against a crowd of barbarians, who, instead of a cuirass and helmet, were covered by a loose garment of fur or linen. They paused, they trembled, their ranks were confounded, and in the decisive moment the Haruli, preferring glory to revenge, charged with rapid violence the head of the column. Their leader, Sindbal, and Elijern, the Gothic prince, deserved the prize of superior valor, and their example incited the victorious troops to achieve with swords and spears the destruction of the enemy. Buxlin and the greatest part of his army perished on the field of battle, in the waters of the Volturnus, or by the hands of the enraged peasants, but it may seem incredible that a victory, 46, which no more than five of the Alemanni survived, could be purchased with the loss of fourscore Romans. Seven thousand Goths, the relics of the war, defended the fortress of Camps until the ensuing spring, and every messenger of Narses announced the reduction of the Italian cities, whose names were corrupted by the ignorance or vanity of the Greeks. After the Battle of Caslinum, Narses entered the capital, the arms and treasures of the Goths, the Franks, and the Alemanni, were displayed. His soldiers, with garlands in their hands, chanted the praises of the conqueror, and Rome, for the last time, beheld the semblance of a triumph. After a reign of sixty years, the throne of the Gothic kings was filled by the Exarchs of Ravenna, the representatives in peace and war of the Emperor of the Romans. Their jurisdiction was soon reduced to the limits of a narrow province, but Narses himself, the first and most powerful of the Exarchs, administered above fifteen years the entire kingdom of Italy. Like Belisarius, he had deserved the honors of envy, calumny, and disgrace, but the favorite eunuch still enjoyed the confidence of Justinian, or the leader of a victorious army awed and repressed the ingratitude of a timid court. Yet it was not by weak and mischievous indulgence that Narses secured the attachment of his troops. Forgetful of the past and regardless of the future, they abused the present hour of prosperity and peace. The cities of Italy resounded with the noise of drinking and dancing, the spoils of victory were wasted in sensual pleasures, and nothing, says Agathias, remained, unless to exchange their shields and helmets for the soft loot and the capacious hogshead. In a manly oration not unworthy of a Roman censor, the eunuch reproved these disorderly vices, which sullied their fame and endangered their safety. The soldiers blushed and obeyed, discipline was confirmed, the fortifications were restored, a duke was stationed for the defense and military command of each of the principal cities semicolon 48 and the eye of Narses pervaded the ample prospect from Calabria to the Alps. The remains of the Gothic nation evacuated the country or mingled with the people, the Franks, instead of revenging the death of Buxlin, abandoned, without a struggle, their Italian conquests, and the rebellious Sindbal, chief of the Heruli, was subdued, 
taken, and hung on a lofty gallows by the inflexible justice of the exarch. The civil state of Italy, after the agitation of a long tempest, was fixed by a pragmatic sanction, which the emperor promulgated at the request of the pope. Justinian introduced his own jurisprudence into the schools and tribunals of the West, he ratified the acts of Theodoric and his immediate successors, but every deed was rescinded and abolished, which force had extorted, or fear had subscribed, under the usurpation of Tutler. A moderate theory was framed to reconcile the rights of property with the safety of prescription, the claims of the state with the poverty of the people and the pardon of offences with the interest of virtue and order of society. Under the exarchs of Ravenna, Rome was degraded to the second rank. Yet the senators were gratified by the permission of visiting their estates in Italy, and of approaching without obstacle the throne of Constantinople, the regulation of weights and measures was delegated to the Pope and Senate, and the salaries of lawyers and physicians, of orators and grammarians were destined to preserve or rekindle the light of science in the ancient capital. Justinian might dictate benevolent edicts, 49 and Narses might second his wishes by the restoration of cities and more especially of churches. But the power of kings is most effectual to destroy, and the twenty years of the Gothic War had consummated the distress and depopulation of Italy. As early as the fourth campaign, under the discipline of Belisarius himself, 50,000 laborers died of hunger 50 in the narrow region of Picenum, and a strict interpretation of the evidence of Procopius would swell the loss of Italy above the total sum of her present inhabitants. I desire to believe, but I dare not affirm, that Belisarius sincerely rejoiced in the triumph of Narses. Yet the consciousness of his own exploits might teach him to esteem without jealousy the merit of a rival and the repose of the aged warrior was crowned by a last victory which saved the emperor and the capital. The barbarians who annually visited the provinces of Europe were less discouraged by some accidental defeats than they were excited by the double hope of spoil and of subsidy. In the thirty-second winter of Justinian's reign, the Danube was deeply frozen, Zabagan led the cavalry of the Bulgarians, and his standard was followed by a promiscuous multitude of Sclavonians. The savage chief passed, without opposition, the river and the mountains, spread his troops over Macedonia and Thrace, and advanced with no more than seven thousand horse to the long walls which should have defended the territory of Constantinople. But the works of man are impotent against the assaults of nature, a recent earthquake had shaken the foundations of the wall, and the forces of the empire were employed on the distant frontiers of Italy, Africa, and Persia. The seven schools, 52 or companies, of the guards or domestic troops had been augmented to the number of 5,500 men, whose ordinary station was in the peaceful cities of Asia. But the places of the brave Armenians were insensibly supplied by lazy citizens, who purchased an exemption from the duties of civil life, without being exposed to the dangers of military service. Of such soldiers, few could be tempted to sally from the gates and none could be persuaded to remain in the field, unless they wanted strength and speed to escape from the Bulgarians. The report of the fugitives exaggerated the numbers and fierceness of an enemy who had polluted holy virgins and abandoned newborn infants to the dogs and vultures, a crowd of rustics, imploring food and protection, increased the consternation of the city and the tents of Zabagan were pitched at the distance of twenty miles, 53 on the banks of a small river, which encircles Melanthius, and afterwards falls into the Propontis. Justinian trembled, and those who had only seen the emperor in his old age were pleased to suppose that he had lost the alacrity and vigor of his youth. By his command the vessels of gold and silver were removed from the churches in the neighborhood, and even the suburbs, of Constantinople, the ramparts were lined with trembling spectators, the Golden Gate was crowded with useless generals and tribunes, and the Senate shared the fatigues and the apprehensions of the populace. But the eyes of the prince and people were directed to a feeble veteran, who was compelled by the public danger to resume the armor in which he had entered Carthage and defended Rome. The horses of the royal stables, of private citizens, and even of the circus, were hastily collected, 
the emulation of the old and young was roused by the name of Belisarius, and his first encampment was in the presence of a victorious enemy. His prudence, and the labor of the friendly peasants, secured, with a ditch and rampart, the repose of the night, innumerable fires and clouds of dust were artfully contrived to magnify the opinion of his strength, his soldiers suddenly passed from despondency to presumption, and, while ten thousand voices demanded the battle, Belisarius dissembled his knowledge that in the hour of trial he must depend on the firmness of three hundred veterans. The next morning the Bulgarian cavalry advanced to the charge. But they heard the shouts of multitudes, they beheld the arms and discipline of the front. They were assaulted on the flanks by two ambuscades which rose from the woods, their foremost warriors fell by the hand of the aged hero and his guards, and the swiftness of their evolutions was rendered useless by the close attack and rapid pursuit of the Romans. In this action, so speedy was their flight, the Bulgarians lost only 400 horse, but Constantinople was saved, and Zabagan, who felt the hand of a master, withdrew to a respectful distance. But his friends were numerous in the council of the emperor, and Belisarius obeyed with reluctance the commands of Envy and Justinian, which forbade him to achieve the deliverance of his country. On his return to the city, the people, still conscious of their danger, accompanied his triumph with acclamations of joy and gratitude, which were imputed as a crime to the victorious general. But, when he entered the palace, the courtiers were silent, and the emperor, after a cold and thankless embrace, dismissed him to mingle with the train of slaves. Yet so deep was the impression of his glory on the minds of men that Justinian, in the seventy-seventh year of his age, was encouraged to advance near forty miles from the capital, and to inspect in person the restoration of the long wall. The Bulgarians wasted the summer in the plains of Thrace, but they were inclined to peace by the failure of their rash attempts on Greece and the Chesensus. A menace of killing their prisoners quickened the payment of heavy ransoms, and the departure of Zabagan was hastened by the report that double proud vessels were built on the Danube to intercept his passage. The danger was soon forgotten, and a vain question, whether their sovereign had shown more wisdom or weakness, amused the idleness of the city. About two years after the last victory of Belisarius, the emperor returned from a Thracian journey of health, or business, or devotion. Justinian was afflicted by a pain in his head, and his private entry countenanced the rumor of his death. Before the third hour of the day, the baker's shops were plundered of their bread. The houses were shut, and every citizen, with hope or terror, prepared for the impending tumult. The senators themselves, fearful and suspicious, were convened at the ninth hour, and the prefect received their commands to visit every quarter of the city, and proclaim a general illumination for the recovery of the emperor's health. The ferment subsided, but every accident betrayed the impotence of the government and the factious temper of the people. The guards were disposed to mutiny as often as their quarters were changed or their pay was withheld, the frequent calamities of fires and earthquakes afforded the opportunities of disorder, the disputes of the blues and greens, of the orthodox and heretics, degenerated into bloody battles, and in the presence of the Persian ambassador Justinian blushed for himself and for his subjects. Capricious pardon and arbitrary punishment embittered the irksomeness and discontent of a long reign. A conspiracy was formed in the palace, and, unless we are deceived by the names of Marcellus and Sergius, the most virtuous and the most profligate of the courtiers were associated in the same designs. They had fixed the time of the execution, their rank gave them access to the royal banquet, and their black slaves fifty six were stationed in the vestibule and porticos to announce the death of the tyrant and to excite a sedition in the capital. But the indiscretion of an accomplice saved the poor remnant of the days of Justinian. The conspirators were detected and seized, with daggers hidden under their garments, Marcellus died by his own hand, and Sergius was dragged from the sanctuary. Pressed by a remorse or tempted by the hopes of safety, he accused two officers of the household of Belisarius and torture forced them to declare that they had acted according to the secret instructions of their patron. 
posterity will not hastily believe that an hero, who, in the vigor of life, had disdained the fairest offers of ambition and revenge, should stoop to the murder of his prince, whom he could not long expect to survive. His followers were impatient to fly, but flight must have been supported by rebellion, and he had lived enough for nature and for glory. Belisarius appeared before the council with less fear than indignation, after forty years' service, the emperor had prejudged his guilt, and injustice was sanctified by the presence and authority of the patriarch. The life of Belisarius was graciously spared, but his fortunes were sequestered, and from December to July he was guarded as a prisoner in his own palace. At length his innocence was acknowledged, his freedom and honours were restored, and death, which might be hastened by resentment and grief, removed him from the world about eight months after his deliverance. The name of Belisarius can never die, but, instead of the funeral, the monuments, the statues, so justly due to his memory, I only read that his treasures, the spoils of the Goths and Vandals, were immediately confiscated by the emperor. Some decent portion was reserved, however, for the use of his widow, and, as Antonina had much to repent, she devoted the last remains of her life and fortune to the foundation of a convent. Such is the simple and genuine narrative of the fall of Belisarius and the ingratitude of Justinian. That he was deprived of his eyes, and reduced by envy to beg his bread, give a penny to Belisarius the general, is a fiction of later times, 58 which has obtained credit, or rather favour, as a strange example of the vicissitudes of fortune. If the emperor could rejoice in the death of Belisarius, he enjoyed the base satisfaction only eight months. The last period of a reign of thirty-eight and a life of eighty-three years. It would be difficult to trace the character of a prince who is not the most conspicuous object of his own times, but the confessions of an enemy may be received as the safest evidence of his virtues. The resemblance of Justinian to the bust of Domitian is maliciously urged semicolon sixty with the acknowledgement, however, of a well-proportioned figure, a ruddy complexion, and a pleasing countenance. The emperor was easy of access, patient of hearing, courteous and affable in discourse, and a master of the angry passions, which rage with such destructive violence in the breast of a despot. Procopius praises his temper, to reproach him with calm and deliberate cruelty, but, in the conspiracies which attacked his authority and person, a more candid judge will approve the justice or admire the clemency of Justinian. He excelled in the private virtues of chastity and temperance, but the impartial love of beauty would have been less mischievous than his conjugal tenderness for Theodora, and his abstemious diet was regulated, not by the prudence of a philosopher, but the superstition of a monk. His repasts were short and frugal, on solemn fasts. He contented himself with water and vegetables, and such was his strength, as well as fervor, that he frequently passed two days and as many nights without tasting any food. The measure of his sleep was not less rigorous, after the repose of a single hour, the body was awakened by the soul, and, to the astonishment of his chamber ends, Justinian walked or studied till the morning light. Such restless application prolonged his time for the acquisition of knowledge 61 and the dispatch of business, and he might seriously deserve the reproach of confounding, by minute and preposterous diligence, the general order of his administration. The emperor professed himself a musician and architect, a poet and philosopher, a lawyer and theologian, and, if he failed in the enterprise of reconciling the Christian sects, the review of the Roman jurisprudence is a noble monument of his spirit and industry. In the government of the empire, he was less wise or less successful. The age was unfortunate, the people was oppressed and discontented, Theodora abused her power, a succession of bad ministers disgraced his judgment, and Justinian was neither beloved in his life nor regretted at his death. The love of fame was deeply implanted in his breast, but he condescended to the poor ambition of titles, honours, and contemporary praise, and, while he laboured to fix the admiration, he forfeited the esteem and affection, of the Romans.
the design of the African and Italian wars was boldly conceived and executed, and his penetration discovered the talents of Belisarius in the camp, of Narses in the palace. But the name of the emperor is eclipsed by the names of his victorious generals, and Belisarius still lives, to upbraid the envy and ingratitude of his sovereign. The partial favor of mankind applauds the genius of a conqueror, who leads and directs his subjects in the exercise of arms. The characters of Philip II and of Justinian are distinguished by the cold ambition which delights in war and declines the dangers of the field. Yet a colossal statue of bronze represented the emperor on horseback, preparing to march against the Persians in the habit and armor of Achilles. In the great square before the church of Street Sophia, this monument was raised on a brass column and a stone pedestal of seven steps, and the pillar of Theodosius, which weighed 7,400 pounds of silver, was removed from the same place by the avarice and vanity of Justinian. Future princes were more just or indulgent to his memory, the elder Andronicus, in the beginning of the 14th century, repaired and beautified his equestrian statue, since the fall of the empire, it has been melted into cannon by the victorious Turks. I shall conclude this chapter with the comets, the earthquakes, and the plague, which astonished or afflicted the age of Justinian. I. In the fifth year of his reign, and in the month of September, a comet 62 was seen during twenty days in the western quarter of the heavens, and which shot its rays into the north. Eight years afterwards, while the sun was in Capricorn, another comet appeared to follow in the Sagittary, the size was gradually increasing, the head was in the east, the tail in the west, and it remained visible above forty days. The nations, who gazed with astonishment, expected wars and calamities from the baleful influence, and these expectations were abundantly fulfilled. The astronomers dissembled their ignorance of the nature of these blazing stars, which they affected to represent as the floating meteors of the air, and few among them embraced the simple notion of Seneca and the Chaldeans, that they are only planets of a longer period and more eccentric motion. Time and science have justified the conjectures and predictions of the Roman sage, the telescope has opened new worlds to the eyes of astronomers semicolon 64 and, in the narrow space of history and fable, one and the same comet is already found to have revisited the earth in seven equal revolutions of 575 years. The first comma 65 which ascends beyond the Christian era 1767 years, is coeval with Ogyges the father of Grecian antiquity. And this appearance explains the tradition which Varro has preserved, that under his reign the planet Venus changed her color, size, figure, and course, a prodigy without example either in past or succeeding ages. The second visit, in the year 1193, is darkly implied in the fable of Electra the seventh of the Pleiads, who have been reduced to six since the time of the Trojan War. That nymph, the wife of Dardanus, was unable to support the ruin of her country, she abandoned the dances of her sister Orbs, fled from the Zodiac to the North Pole, and obtained, from her dishevelled locks, the name of the comet. The third period expires in the year 618, a date that exactly agrees with the tremendous comet of the Sibyl, and perhaps of Pliny, which arose in the West two generations before the reign of Cyrus. The fourth apparition, forty-four years before the birth of Christ, is of all others the most splendid and important. After the death of Caesar, a long-haired star was conspicuous to Rome and to the nations, during the games which were exhibited by young Octavian in honor of Venus and his uncle. The vulgar opinion, that it conveyed to heaven the divine soul of the dictator, was cherished and consecrated by the piety of a statesman, while his secret superstition referred the comet to the glory of his own times. The fifth visit has been already ascribed to the fifth year of Justinian, which coincides with the 531st of the Christian era. And it may deserve notice that in this, as in the preceding, instance the comet was followed, though at a longer interval, by a remarkable paleness of the sun. The sixth return, in the year 1106, is recorded by the chronicles of Europe and China, 
and in the first fervor of the Crusades, the Christians and the Mahometans might surmise, with equal reason, that it portended the destruction of the infidels. The seventh phenomenon of 1680 was presented to the eyes of an enlightened age. The philosophy of Bale dispelled a prejudice which Milton's muse had so recently adorned, that the comet from its horrid hair shakes pestilence and war. 69 Its road in the heavens was observed with exquisite skill by Flamsted and Cassini, and the mathematical science of Manui, Newton, and Halley, investigated the laws of its revolutions. At the eighth period, in the year 2255, their calculations may perhaps be verified by the astronomers of some future capital in the Siberian or American wilderness too. The near approach of a comet may injure or destroy the globe which we inhabit, but the changes on its surface have been hitherto produced by the action of volcanoes and earthquakes. The nature of the soil may indicate the countries most exposed to these formidable concussions, since they are caused by subterraneous fires, and such fires are kindled by the union and fermentation of iron and sulphur. But their times and effects appear to lie beyond the reach of human curiosity, and the philosopher will discreetly abstain from the prediction of earthquakes, till he has counted the drops of water that silently filtrate on the inflammable mineral, and measured the caverns which increase by resistance the explosion of the imprisoned air. Without assigning the cause, history will distinguish the periods in which these calamitous events have been rare or frequent, and will observe that this fever of the earth raged with uncommon violence during the reign of Justinian. Each year is marked by the repetition of earthquakes, of such duration that Constantinople has been shaken above forty days, of such extent that the shock has been communicated to the whole surface of the globe, or at least of the Roman Empire. An impulsive or vibratory motion was felt, enormous chasms were opened, huge and heavy bodies were discharged into the air, the sea alternately advanced and retreated beyond its ordinary bounds, and a mountain was torn from Libanus, 70 and cast into the waves, where it protected, as a mole, the new harbour of Bortri's 71 in Phoenicia. The stroke that agitates an anthill may crush the insect myriads in the dust, Yet truth must extort a confession that man has industriously labored for his own destruction. The institution of great cities, which include a nation within the limits of a wall, almost realizes the wish of Caligula that the Roman people had but one neck. 250,000 persons are said to have perished in the earthquake of Antioch, whose domestic multitudes were swelled by the conflux of strangers to the festival of the Ascension. The loss of Beritus 72 was of smaller account, but of much greater value. That city, on the coast of Phoenicia, was illustrated by the study of the civil law, which opened the surest road to wealth and dignity, the schools of Beritus were filled with the rising spirits of the age, and many a youth was lost in the earthquake, who might have lived to be the scourge or the guardian of his country. In these disasters, the architect becomes the enemy of mankind. The hut of a savage or the tent of an Arab may be thrown down without injury to the inhabitant, and the Peruvians had reason to deride the folly of their Spanish conquerors, who with so much cost and labor erected their own sepulchres. The rich marbles of a patrician are dashed on his own head, a whole people is buried under the ruins of public and private edifices, and the conflagration is kindled and propagated by the innumerable fires which are necessary for the subsistence and manufactures of a great city. Instead of the mutual sympathy which might comfort and assist the distressed, they dreadfully experience the vices and passions which are released from the fear of punishment, the tottering houses are pillaged by intrepid avarice, revenge embraces the moment, and selects the victim, and the earth often swallows the assassin, or the ravisher, in the consummation of their crimes. Superstition involves the present danger with invisible terrors, and, if the image of death may sometimes be subservient to the virtue or repentance of individuals, an affrighted people is more forcibly moved to expect the end of the world or to deprecate with servile homage the wrath of an avenging deity. Three. Ethiopia and Egypt have been stigmatized in every age as the original source and seminary of the plague. In a damp, hot, stagnating air, 
this African fever is generated from the putrefaction of animal substances, and especially from the swarms of locusts, not less destructive to mankind in their death than in their lives. The fatal disease which depopulated the earth in the time of Justinian and his successors first appeared in the neighborhood of Pelusium, between the Serbonian bog and the eastern channel of the Nile. From thence, tracing as it were a double path, it spread to the east, over Syria, Persia, and the Indies, and penetrated to the west, along the coast of Africa, and over the continent of Europe. In the spring of the second year, Constantinople, during three or four months, was visited by the pestilence, and Procopius, who observed its progress and symptoms with the eyes of a physician, 73 has emulated the skill and diligence of Thucydides in the description of the plague of Athens. The infection was sometimes announced by the visions of a distempered fancy, and the victim despaired as soon as he had heard the menace and felt the stroke of an invisible spectre. But the greater number, in their beds, in the streets, in their usual occupation, were surprised by a slight fever, so slight, indeed, that neither the pulse nor the color of the patient gave any signs of the approaching danger. The same, the next, or the succeeding day, it was declared by the swelling of the glands, particularly those of the groin, of the armpits, and under the ear, and, when these bows or tumors were opened, they were found to contain a coal, or black substance, of the size of a lentil. If they came to a just swelling and suppuration, the patient was saved by this kind and natural discharge of the morbid humor. But, if they continued hard and dry, a mortification quickly ensued, and the fifth day was commonly the term of his life. The fever was often accompanied with lethargy or delirium, the bodies of the sick were covered with black pustules or carbuncles, the symptoms of immediate death and, in the constitutions too feeble to produce an eruption, the vomiting of blood was followed by a mortification of the bowels. To pregnant women the plague was generally mortal, yet one infant was drawn alive from his dead mother, and three mothers survived the loss of their infected fetus. Youth was the most perilous season, and the female sex was less susceptible than the male, but every rank and profession was attacked with indiscriminate rage and many of those who escaped were deprived of the use of their speech, without being secure from return of the disorder. The physicians of Constantinople were zealous and skillful, but their art was baffled by the various symptoms and pertinacious vehemence of the disease, the same remedies were productive of contrary effects, and the event capriciously disappointed their prognostics of death or recovery. The order of funerals and the rite of sepulchres were confounded. Those who were left without friends or servants lay unburied in the streets or in their desolate houses, and a magistrate was authorized to collect the promiscuous heaps of dead bodies, to transport them by land or water, and to inter them in deep pits beyond the precincts of the city. Their own danger and the prospect of public distress awakened some remorse in the minds of the most vicious of mankind, the confidence of health again revived their passions and habits but philosophy must disdain the observation of Procopius that the lives of such men were guarded by the peculiar favor of fortune or providence. He forgot, or perhaps he secretly recollected, that the plague had touched the person of Justinian himself, but the abstemious diet of the emperor may suggest, as in the case of Socrates, a more rational and honorable cause for his recovery. During his sickness, the public consternation was expressed in the habits of the citizens, and their idleness and despondence occasioned a general scarcity in the capital of the East. Contagion is the inseparable symptom of the plague, which, by mutual respiration, is transfused from the infected persons to the lungs and stomach of those who approach them. While philosophers believe and tremble, it is singular that the existence of a real danger should have been denied by a people most prone to vain and imaginary terrors. Yet the fellow citizens of Procopius were satisfied, by some short and partial experience, that the infection could not be gained by the closest conversation semicolon 77 and this persuasion might support the assiduity of friends or physicians in the care of the sick, whom in human prudence would have condemned to solitude and despair. But the fatal security, like the predestination of the Turks, 
must have aided the progress of the contagion, and those salutary precautions to which Europe is indebted for her safety were unknown to the government of Justinian. No restraints were imposed on the free and frequent intercourse of the Roman provinces, from Persia to France, the nations were mingled and infected by wars and emigrations, and the pestilential odor which lurks for years in a bale of cotton was imported, by the abuse of trade, into the most distant regions. The mode of its propagation is explained by the remark of Procopius himself, that it always spread from the sea coast to the inland country, the most sequestered islands and mountains were successively visited, the places which had escaped the fury of its first passage were alone exposed to the contagion of the ensuing year. The winds might diffuse that subtle venom, but, unless the atmosphere be previously disposed for its reception, the plague would soon expire in the cold or temperate climates of the earth. Such was the universal corruption of the air that the pestilence which burst forth in the fifteenth year of Justinian was not checked or alleviated by any difference of the seasons. In time, its first malignity was abated and dispersed, the disease alternately languished and revived, but it was not till the end of a calamitous period of fifty-two years that mankind recovered their health or the air assumed its pure and salubrious quality. No facts have been preserved to sustain an account, or even a conjecture, of the numbers that perished in this extraordinary mortality. I only find that, during three months, five, and at length ten, thousand persons died each day at Constantinople, that many cities of the East were left vacant, and that in several districts of Italy the harvest and the vintage withered on the ground. The triple scourge of war, pestilence, and famine, afflicted the subjects of Justinian, and his reign is disgraced by a visible decrease of the human species, which has never been repaired in some of the fairest countries of the globe. Idea of the Roman jurisprudence middle. The laws of the kings middle. The twelve tables of the decemvirs middle. The laws of the people middle. The decrees of the senate middle. The edicts of the magistrates and emperors middle. Authority of the civilians middle. Code, band acts, novels, and institutes of Justinian middle. I. Rights of persons middle. Two. Rights of things 3. Private injury and action middle. 4. Crime and punishment vain titles of the victories of Justinian are crumbled into dust, but the name of the legislator is inscribed on a fair and everlasting monument. Under his reign, and by his care, the civil jurisprudence was digested in the immortal works of the Code, the Band Acts and the institutes semicolon 1 the public reason of the Romans has been silently or studiously transfused into the domestic institutions of Europe semicolon 2 and the laws of Justinian still command the respect or obedience of independent nations. Wise or fortunate is the prince who connects his own reputation with the honor and interest of a perpetual order of men. The defense of their founder is the first cause which in every age has exercised the zeal and industry of the civilians. They piously commemorate his virtues, dissemble or deny his failings, and fiercely chastise the guilt or folly of the rebels who presume to sully the majesty of the purple. The idolatry of love has provoked, as it usually happens, the rancor of opposition. The character of Justinian has been exposed to the blind vehemence of flattery and invective and the injustice of a sect, the anti-Tribonians, has refused all praise and merit to the prince, his ministers, and his laws. Attached to no party, interested only for the truth and candor of history, and directed by the most temperate and skillful guides comma for I enter with just diffidence on the subject of civil law, which has exhausted so many learned lives and clothed the walls of such spacious libraries. In a single, if possible in a short, chapter, I shall trace the Roman jurisprudence from Romulus to Justinian, 5 appreciate the labors of that emperor, and pause to contemplate the principles of a science so important to the peace and happiness of society. The laws of a nation form the most instructive portion of its history, and, although I have devoted myself to write the annals of a declining monarchy, I shall embrace the occasion to breathe the pure and invigorating air of the Republic. The primitive government of Rome was composed, 
with some political skill, of an elective king, a council of nobles, and a general assembly of the people. War and religion were administered by the supreme magistrate, and he alone proposed the laws, which were debated in the Senate and finally ratified or rejected by a majority of votes in the thirty curi or parishes of the city. Romulus, Numa, and Servius Tullius are celebrated as the most ancient legislators, and each of them claims his peculiar part in the threefold division of jurisprudence. The laws of marriage, the education of children, and the authority of parents, which may seem to draw their origin from nature itself, are ascribed to the untutored wisdom of Romulus. The law of nations and of religious worship, which Numa introduced, was derived from his nocturnal converse with the nymph of Egeria. The civil law is attributed to the experience of Servius, he balanced the rights and fortunes of the seven classes of citizens, and guarded, by fifty new regulations, the observance of contracts and the punishment of crimes. The state, which he had inclined towards a democracy, was changed by the last Tarquin into lawless despotism, and, when the kingly office was abolished, the patricians engrossed the benefits of freedom. The royal laws became odious or obsolete, the mysterious deposit was silently preserved by the priests and nobles, and, at the end of sixty years, the citizens of Rome still complained that they were ruled by the arbitrary sentence of the magistrates. Yet the positive institutions of the kings had blended themselves with the public and private manners of the city. Some fragments of that venerable jurisprudence seven were compiled by the diligence of antiquarians semicolon eight and above twenty texts still speak the rudeness of the Pelasgic idiom of the Latins. I shall not repeat the well-known story of the December's Comitent who sullied by their actions the honour of inscribing on brass, or wood, or ivory, the twelve tables of the Roman laws. They were dictated by the rigid and jealous spirit of an aristocracy which had yielded with reluctance to the just demands of the people. But the substance of the twelve tables was adapted to the state of the city, and the Romans had emerged from barbarism, since they were capable of studying and embracing the institutions of their more enlightened neighbours. A wise Ephesian was driven by envy from his native country, before he could reach the shores of Latium, he had observed the various forms of human nature and civil society. He imparted his knowledge to the legislators of Rome, and a statue was erected in the forum to the perpetual memory of Hermodorus. The names and the divisions of the copper money, the sole coin of the infant state, were of Dorian origin. Semicolon 13 The harvests of Campania and Sicily relieved their wants of a people whose agriculture was often interrupted by war and faction, and, since the trade was established, 14 the deputies who sailed from the Tiber might return from the same harbours with a more precious cargo of political wisdom. The colonies of Great Greece had transported and improved the arts of their mother country. Cuman Regium, Crotona and Tarentum, Agrigentum and Syracuse, were in the rank of the most flourishing cities. The disciples of Pythagoras applied philosophy to the use of government. The unwritten laws of Charondas accepted the aid of poetry and music semicolon 15 and Zeleucus framed the Republic of the Locrians, which stood without alteration above two hundred years. From a similar motive of national pride, both Livy and Dionysius are willing to believe that the deputies of Rome visited Athens under the wise and splendid administration of Pericles, and the laws of Solon were transfused into the Twelve Tables. If such an embassy had indeed been received from the barbarians of Hesperia, the Roman name would have been familiar to the Greeks before the reign of Alexander semicolon 17 and the faintest evidence would have been explored and celebrated by the curiosity of succeeding times. But the Athenian monuments are silent, nor will it seem credible that the patricians should undertake a long and perilous navigation to copy the purest model of a democracy. In the comparison of the tables of Solon with those of the Decemvers, some casual resemblance may be found, some rules which nature and reason have revealed to every society, some proofs of a common descent from Egypt or Phoenicia. But in all the great lines of public and private jurisprudence, 
the legislators of Rome and Athens appear to be strangers or adverse to each other. Whatever might be the origin or the merit of the twelve tables, they obtained among the Romans that blind and partial reverence which the lawyers of every country delight to bestow on their municipal institutions. The study is recommended by Cicero as equally pleasant and instructive. They amuse the mind by the remembrance of old words and the portrait of ancient manners, they inculcate the soundest principles of government and morals, and I am not afraid to affirm that the brief composition of the Decemvirs surpasses in genuine value the libraries of Grecian philosophy. How admirable, says Tully, with honest or affected prejudice, is the wisdom of our ancestors. We alone are the masters of civil prudence, and our superiority is the more conspicuous, if we deign to cast our eyes on the rude and almost ridiculous jurisprudence of Draken, of Solon, and of Lycurgus. The twelve tables were committed to the memory of the young and the meditation of the old, they were transcribed and illustrated with learned diligence, they had escaped the flames of the Gauls, they subsisted in the age of Justinian, and their subsequent loss has been imperfectly restored by the labours of modern critics. But, although these venerable monuments were considered as the rule of right and the fountain of justice, they were overwhelmed by the weight and variety of new laws, which, at the end of five centuries, became a grievance more intolerable than the vices of the city. Three thousand brass plates, the acts of the senate and people, were deposited in the capital and some of the acts, as the Julian law against extortion, surpassed the number of an hundred chapters. The Decemvirs had neglected to import the sanction of Zeleucus, which so long maintained the integrity of his republic. A law crean who proposed any new law stood forth in the assembly of the people with a cord round his neck, and, if the law was rejected, the innovator was instantly strangled. The Decemvirs had been named, and their tables were approved, by an assembly of the centuries, in which riches preponderated against numbers. To the first class of Romans, the proprietors of one hundred thousand pounds of copper comma nineteen ninety eight votes were assigned, and only ninety five were left for the six inferior classes, distributed according to their substance by the artful policy of Servius. But the tribunes soon established a more specious and popular maxim that every citizen has an equal right to enact the laws which he is bound to obey. Instead of the centuries, they convened the tribes, and the patricians, after an impotent struggle, submitted to the decrees of an assembly in which their votes were confounded with those of the meanest plebans. Yet, as long as the tribes successively passed over narrow bridges, and gave their voices aloud, the conduct of each citizen was exposed to the eyes and ears of his friends and countrymen. The insolvent debtor consulted the wishes of his creditor, the client would have blushed to oppose the views of his patron, the general was followed by his veterans, and the aspect of a grave magistrate was a living lesson to the multitude. A new method of secret ballot abolished the influence of fear and shame, of honor and interest and the abuse of freedom accelerated the progress of anarchy and despotism. The Romans had aspired to be equal, they were levelled by the equality of servitude, and the dictates of Augustus were patiently ratified by the formal consent of the tribes or centuries. Once, and once only, he experienced a sincere and strenuous opposition. His subjects had resigned all political liberty, they defended the freedom of domestic life a law which enforced the obligation, and strengthened the bonds, of marriage was clamorously rejected, and Propertius, in the arms of Delia, applauded the victory of licentious love, and the project of reform was suspended till a new and more tractable generation had arisen in the world. Such an example was not necessary to instruct a prudent usurper of the mischief of popular assemblies, and their abolition, which Augustus had silently prepared was accomplished without resistance, and almost without notice, on the accession of his successor. Sixtieth and plebeian legislators, whom numbers made formidable and poverty secure, were supplanted by six hundred senators, who held their honors, their fortunes, and their lives by the clemency of the emperor. The loss of executive power was alleviated by the gift of legislative authority, and Ulpian might assert, 
after the practice of two hundred years, that the decrees of the Senate obtain the force and validity of laws. In the times of freedom, the resolves of the people had often been dictated by the passion or error of the moment, the Cornelian, Pompeian, and Julian laws were adapted by a single hand to the prevailing disorders, but the Senate, under the reign of the Caesars, was composed of magistrates and lawyers, and in questions of private jurisprudence the integrity of their judgment was seldom perverted by fear or interest. The silence or ambiguity of the laws was supplied by the occasional edicts of those magistrates who were invested with the honours of the state. This ancient prerogative of the Roman kings was transferred, in the respective offices, to the consuls and dictators, the censors and praetors, and a similar right was assumed by the tribunes of the people, the aediles, and the proconsuls. At Rome and in the provinces, the duties of the subject and the intentions of the governor were proclaimed, and the civil jurisprudence was reformed by the annual edicts of the supreme judge, the praetor of the city. As soon as he ascended his tribunal, he announced by the voice of the crier, and afterwards inscribed on a white wall, the rules which he proposed to follow in the decision of doubtful cases, and the relief which his equity would afford from the precise rigour of ancient statutes. A principle of discretion more congenial to monarchy was introduced into the Republic. The art of respecting the name, and eluding the efficacy, of the laws was improved by successive praetors, subtleties and fictions were invented to defeat the plainest meaning of the decemvirs, and, where the end was salutary, the means were frequently absurd. The secret or probable wish of the dead was suffered to prevail over the order of succession and the forms of testaments, and the claimant, who was excluded from the character of heir, accepted with equal pleasure from an indulgent pre to the possession of the goods of his late kinsman or benefactor. In the redress of private wrongs, compensations and fines were substituted to the obsolete rigour of the twelve tables, time and space were annihilated by fanciful suppositions, and the plea of youth, or fraud, or violence, annulled the obligation, or excused the performance, of an inconvenient contract. A jurisdiction thus vague and arbitrary was exposed to the most dangerous abuse, the substance, as well as the form of justice were often sacrificed to the prejudices of virtue, the bias of laudable affection, and the grosser seductions of interest or resentment. But the errors or vices of each praetor expired with his annual office, such maxims alone as had been approved by reason and practice were copied by succeeding judges, the rule of proceeding was defined by the solution of new cases, and the temptations of injustice were removed by the Cornelian law which compelled the praetor of the year to adhere to the letter and spirit of his first proclamation. It was reserved for the curiosity and learning of Hadrian to accomplish the design which had been conceived by the genius of Caesar, and the praetorship of Salvius Julian, an eminent lawyer, was immortalized by the composition of the perpetual edict. This well-digested code was ratified by the emperor and the senate, the long divorce of law and equity was at length reconciled, and, instead of the twelve tables, the perpetual edict was fixed as the invariable standard of civil jurisprudence. From Augustus to Trajan, the modest chess cars were content to promulgate their edicts in the various characters of a Roman magistrate, and, in the decrees of the Senate, the epistles and orations of the prince were respectfully inserted. Hadrian appears to have been the first who assumed, without disguise, the plenitude of legislative power. And this innovation, so agreeable to his active mind, was countenanced by the patience of the times and his long absence from the seat of government. The same policy was embraced by succeeding monarchs, and, according to the harsh metaphor of Tertullian, the gloomy and intricate forest of ancient laws was cleared away by the acts of royal mandates and constitutions. During four centuries, from Hadrian to Justinian, the public and private jurisprudence was moulded by the will of the sovereign, and few institutions, either human or divine, were permitted to stand on their former basis. The origin of imperial legislation was concealed by the darkness of ages and the terrors of armed despotism, and a double fiction was propagated by the servility, or perhaps the ignorance, 
of the civilians who basked in the sunshine of the Roman and Byzantine courts. 1. To the prayer of the ancient Caesars, the people or the senate had sometimes granted a personal exemption from the obligation and penalty of particular statutes, and each indulgence was an act of jurisdiction exercised by the republic over the first of her citizens. His humble privilege was at length transformed into the prerogative of a tyrant, and the Latin expression of released from the laws, 24 was supposed to exalt the emperor above all human restraints, and to leave his conscience and reason as the sacred measure of his conduct. 2. A similar dependence was implied in the decrees of the senate, which, in every reign, defined the title and powers of an elective magistrate. But it was not before the ideas, and even the language, of the Romans had been corrupted, that a royal law, 25 and an irrevocable gift of the people, were created by the fancy of Ulpian, or more probably of Tribonian himself, and the origin of imperial power, though false in fact and slavish in its consequence, was supported on a principle of freedom and justice. The pleasure of the emperor has the vigor and effect of law since the Roman people by the royal law have transferred to their prince the full extent of their own power and sovereignty. The will of a single man, of a child perhaps, was allowed to prevail over the wisdom of ages and the inclinations of millions, and the degenerate Greeks were proud to declare that in his hands alone the arbitrary exercise of legislation could be safely deposited. What interest or passion, exclaims Theophilus in the court of Justinian, can reach the calm and sublime elevation of the monarch. He is already master of the lives and fortunes of his subjects, and those who have incurred his displeasure are already numbered with the dead. Disdaining the language of flattery, the historian may confess that, in questions of private jurisprudence, the absolute sovereign of a great empire can seldom be influenced by any personal considerations. Virtue, or even reason, will suggest to his impartial mind that he is the guardian of peace and equity, and that the interest of society is inseparably connected with his own. Under the weakest and most vicious reign, the seat of justice was filled by the wisdom and integrity of Papinian and Ulpian, and the purest materials of the Code and Pandects are inscribed with the names of Caracalla and his ministers. The tyrant of Rome was sometimes the benefactor of the provinces. A dagger terminated the crimes of Domitian, but the prudence of Nerva confirmed his acts, which, in the joy of their deliverance, had been rescinded by an indignant senate. Yet in the rescripts, 27 replies to the consultations of the magistrates, the wisest of princes might be deceived by a partial exposition of the case. And this abuse, which placed their hasty decisions on the same level with mature and deliberate acts of legislation, was ineffectually condemned by the sense and example of Trojan. The rescripts of the emperor, his grants and decrees, his edicts and pragmatic sanctions, were subscribed in purple ink, 28 and transmitted to the provinces as general or special laws, which the magistrates were bound to execute, and the people to obey. But, as their number continually multiplied, the rule of obedience became each day more doubtful and obscure till the will of the sovereign was fixed and ascertained in the Gregorian, the Hermogenian, and the Theodosian codes. The two first, of which some fragments have escaped, were framed by two private lawyers, to preserve the constitutions of the pagan emperors from Hadrian to Constantine. The third, which is still extant, was digested in sixteen books by the order of the younger Theodosius to consecrate the laws of the Christian princes from Constantine to his own reign. But the three codes obtained an equal authority in the tribunals, and any act which was not included in the sacred deposit might be disregarded by the judge as spurious or obsolete. Among savage nations, the want of letters is imperfectly supplied by the use of visible signs, which awaken attention, and perpetuate the remembrance of any public or private transaction. The jurisprudence of the first Romans exhibited the scenes of a pantomime, the words were adapted to the gestures, and the slightest error or neglect in the forms of proceeding was sufficient to annul the substance of the fairest claim.
The communion of the marriage life was denoted by the necessary elements of fire and water semicolon 30 and the divorced wife resigned the bunch of keys, by the delivery of which she had been invested with the government of the family. The manumission of a son, or a slave, was performed by turning him round with a gentle blow on the cheek, a work was prohibited by the casting of a stone, prescription was interrupted by the breaking of a branch, the clenched fist was the symbol of a pledge or deposit, the right hand was the gift of faith and confidence. The indenture of covenants was a broken straw, weights and scales were introduced into every payment, and the heir who accepted a testament was sometimes obliged to snap his fingers, to cast away his garments, and to leap and dance with real or affected transport. If a citizen pursued any stolen goods into a neighbor's house, he concealed his nakedness with a linen towel, and hid his face with a mask or basin, lest he should encounter the eyes of a virgin or a matron. In a civil action, the plaintiff touched the ear of the witness, seized his reluctant adversary by the neck, and implored, in solemn lamentation, the aid of his fellow citizens. The two competitors grasped each other's hand as if they stood prepared for combat before the tribunal of the praetor. He commanded them to produce the object of the dispute, they went, they returned with measured steps, and a clod of earth was cast at his feet to represent the field for which they contended. This occult science of the words and actions of law was the inheritance of the pontiffs and patricians. Like the Chaldean astrologers, they announced to their clients the day of business and repose, these important trifles were interwoven with the religion of Numa, and, after the publication of the Twelve Tables, the Roman people was still enslaved by the ignorance of judicial proceedings. The treachery of some plebeian officers at length revealed the profitable mystery, in a more enlightened age, the legal actions were derided and observed, and the same antiquity which sanctified the practice, obliterated the use and meaning, of this primitive language. A more liberal art was cultivated, however, by the sages of Rome who, in a stricter sense, may be considered as the authors of the civil law. The alteration of the idiom and manners of the Romans rendered the style of the twelve tables less familiar to each rising generation, and the doubtful passages were imperfectly explained by the study of legal antiquarians. To define the ambiguities, to circumscribe the latitude, to apply the principles, to extend the consequences, to reconcile the real or apparent contradictions, was a much nobler and more important task, and the province of legislation was silently invaded by the expounders of ancient statutes. Their subtle interpretations concurred with the equity of the praetor to reform the tyranny of the dark ages, however strange or intricate the means, it was the aim of artificial jurisprudence to restore the simple dictates of nature and reason, and the skill of private citizens was usefully employed to undermine the public institutions of their country. The revolution of almost 1000 years, from the Twelve Tables to the reign of Justinian, may be divided into three periods almost equal in duration, and distinguished from each other by the mode of instruction and the character of the civilians. Pride and ignorance contributed, during the first period, to confine within narrow limits the science of the Roman law. On the public days of market or assembly, the masters of the art were seen walking in the forum, ready to impart the needful advice to the meanest of their fellow citizens, from whose votes, on a future occasion, they might solicit a grateful return. As their years and honours increased, they seated themselves at home on a chair or throne, to expect with patient gravity the visits of their clients who at the dawn of day, from the town and country, began to thunder at their door. The duties of social life and the incidents of judicial proceeding were the ordinary subject of these consultations, and the verbal or written opinion of the juris consults was framed according to the rules of prudence and law. The youths of their own order and family were permitted to listen. Their children enjoyed the benefit of more private lessons and the Mutian race was long renowned for the hereditary knowledge of the civil law. The second period, the learned and splendid age of jurisprudence, may be extended from the birth of Cicero to the reign of Severus Alexander. A system was formed, 
schools were instituted, books were composed, and both the living and the dead became subservient to the instruction of the student. The tripartite of Illa as Petus, surnamed Catus, or the cunning, was preserved as the oldest work of jurisprudence. Cato the censor derived some additional fame from his legal studies, and those of his son, the kindred appellation of Mucins Savola was illustrated by three sages of the law, but the perfection of the science was ascribed to Servius Sulpicius their disciple, and the friend of Tully, and the long succession, which shone with equal luster under the Republic and under the Caesars, is finally closed by the respectable characters of Papinian, of Paul, and of Alpian. Their names, and the various titles of their productions, have been minutely preserved, and the example of Labio may suggest some idea of their diligence and fecundity. That eminent lawyer of the Augustan age, divided the year between the city and country, between business and composition, and four hundred books are enumerated as the fruit of his retirement. Of the collections of his rival Capito, the 259th book is expressly quoted and few teachers could deliver their opinions in less than a century of volumes. In the third period, between the reigns of Alexander and Justinian, the oracles of jurisprudence were almost mute. The measure of curiosity had been filled, the throne was occupied by tyrants and barbarians, the active spirits were diverted by religious disputes, and the professors of Rome, Constantinople, and Beritus, were humbly content to repeat the lessons of their more enlightened predecessors. From the slow advances and rapid decay of these legal studies, it may be inferred that they require a state of peace and refinement. From the multitude of voluminous civilians who fill the intermediate space, it is evident that such studies may be pursued, and such works may be performed, with a common share of judgment, experience, and industry. The genius of Cicero and Virgil was more sensibly felt, as each revolving age had been found incapable of producing a similar or a second, but the most eminent teachers of the law were assured of leaving disciples equal or superior to themselves in merit and reputation. The jurisprudence which had been grossly adapted to the wants of the first Romans was polished and improved in the seventh century of the city by the alliance of Grecian philosophy. The Sevillers had been taught by use and experience, but Servius Sulpicius was the first civilian who established his art on a certain and general theory. For the discernment of truth and falsehood, he applied, as an infallible rule, the logic of Aristotle and the Stoics, reduced particular cases to general principles, and diffused over the shapeless mass the light of order and eloquence. Cicero, his contemporary and friend, declined the reputation of a professed lawyer, but the jurisprudence of his country was adorned by his incomparable genius, which converts into gold every object that it touches. After the example of Plato, he composed a republic, and, for the use of his republic, a treatise of laws, in which he labors to deduce from a celestial origin the wisdom and justice of the Roman constitution. The whole universe, according to his sublime hypothesis, forms one immense commonwealth, gods and men, who participate of the same essence, are members of the same community, reason prescribes the law of nature and nations, and all positive institutions, however modified by accident or custom, are drawn from the rule of right, which the deity has inscribed on every virtuous mind. From these philosophical mysteries, he mildly excludes the skeptics who refuse to believe and the Epicureans who are unwilling to act. The latter disdain the care of the Republic, he advises them to slumber in their shady gardens. But he humbly entreats that the new academy would be silent, since her bold objections would too soon destroy the fair and well-ordered structure of his lofty system. Plato, Aristotle, and Zeno he represents as the only teachers who arm and instruct a citizen for the duties of social life. Of these, the armor of the Stoics 35 was found to be of the finest temper, and it was chiefly worn, both for use and ornament, in the schools of jurisprudence. From the portico, the Roman civilians learned to live, to reason, and to die, but they imbibed in some degree the prejudices of the sect, the love of paradox, the pertinacious habits of dispute, 
and a minute attachment to words and verbal distinctions. The superiority of form to matter was introduced to ascertain the right of property, and the equality of crimes is countenanced by an opinion of Tribitius, that he who touches the ear touches the whole body, and that he who steals from an heap of corn or an hogshead of wine is guilty of the entire theft. Arms, eloquence, and the study of the civil law promoted a citizen to the honours of the Roman state and the three professions were sometimes more conspicuous by their union in the same character. In the composition of the edict, a learned praetor gave a sanction and preference to his private sentiments, the opinion of a censor or a consul was entertained with respect, and a doubtful interpretation of the laws might be supported by the virtues or triumphs of the civilian. The patrician arts were long protected by the veil of mystery, and in more enlightened times, the freedom of inquiry established the general principles of jurisprudence. Subtle and intricate cases were elucidated by the disputes of the forum, rules, axioms, and definitions 36 were admitted as the genuine dictates of reason, and the consent of the legal professors was interwoven into the practice of the tribunals. But these interpreters could neither enact nor execute the laws of the republic, and the judges might disregard the authority of the severers themselves, which was often overthrown by the eloquence or sophistry of an ingenious pleader. Augustus and Tiberius were the first to adopt, as an useful engine, the science of the civilians, and their servile labours accommodated the old system to the spirit and views of despotism. Under the fair pretense of securing the dignity of the art, the privilege of subscribing legal and valid opinions was confined to the sages of senatorian or equestrian rank, who had been previously approved by the judgment of the prince, and this monopoly prevailed, till Hadrian restored the freedom of the profession to every citizen conscious of his abilities and knowledge. The discretion of the praetor was now governed by the lessons of his teachers, the judges were enjoined to obey the comment as well as the text of the law, and the use of codicils was a memorable innovation, which Augustus ratified by the advice of the civilians. The most absolute mandate could only require that the judges should agree with the civilians, if the civilians agreed among themselves. But positive institutions are often the result of custom and prejudice, laws and language are ambiguous and arbitrary, where reason is incapable of pronouncing. The love of argument is inflamed by the envy of rivals, the vanity of masters, the blind attachment of their disciples, and the Roman jurisprudence was divided by the once famous sects of the Procalians and Sabinians. Two sages of the law, Aetius Capito and Antistius Labio, adorned the peace of the Augustan age, the former distinguished by the favour of his sovereign, the latter more illustrious by his contempt of that favour and his stern though harmless opposition to the tyrant of Rome. Their legal studies were influenced by the various colours of their temper and principles. Labia was attached to the form of the old republic, his rival embraced the more profitable substance of the rising monarchy. But the disposition of a courtier is tame and submissive, and Capito seldom presumed to deviate from the sentiments, or at least from the words, of his predecessors while the bold republican pursued his independent ideas without fear of paradox or innovations. The freedom of Labia was enslaved, however, by the rigour of his own conclusions, and he decided according to the letter of the law the same questions which his indulgent competitor resolved with a latitude of equity more suitable to the common sense and feelings of mankind. If a fair exchange had been substituted to the payment of money, Capito still considered the transaction as a legal sale semicolon 37 and he consulted nature for the age of puberty, without confining his definition to the precise period of twelve or fourteen years. This opposition of sentiments was propagated in the writings and lessons of the two founders, the schools of Capito and Labio maintained their inveterate conflict from the age of Augustus to that of Hadrian semicolon 39 and the two sects derived their appellations from Sabinus and Priculus, their most celebrated teachers. The names of Cassans and Pegasians were likewise applied to the same parties, but, by a strange reverse. The popular cause was in the hands of Pegasus, comma forty, a timid slave of Domitian, while the favourite of the Caesars was represented by Cassius, 
who gloried in his descent from the patriot assassin. By the perpetual edict, the controversies of the sects were in a great measure determined. For that important work, the Emperor Hadrian preferred the chief of the Sabinians, the friends of monarchy prevailed, but the moderation of Salvius Julian insensibly reconciled the victors and the vanquished. Like the contemporary philosophers, the lawyers of the age of the Antonians disclaimed the authority of a master, and adopted from every system the most probable doctrines. But their writings would have been less voluminous, had their choice been more unanimous. The conscience of the judge was perplexed by the number and weight of discordant testimonies, and every sentence that his passion or interest might pronounce was justified by the sanction of some venerable name. An indulgent edict of the younger Theodosius excused him from the labor of comparing and weighing their arguments. Five civilians, Keys, Papinian, Paul, Alpian, and Modestinus, were established as the oracles of jurisprudence, a majority was decisive, but, if their opinions were equally divided, a casting vote was ascribed to the superior wisdom of Papinian. When Justinian ascended the throne, the reformation of the Roman jurisprudence was an arduous but indispensable task. In the space of ten centuries, the infinite variety of laws and legal opinions had filled many thousand volumes, which no fortune could purchase and no capacity could digest. Books could not easily be found, and the judges, poor in the midst of riches, were reduced to the exercise of their illiterate discretion. The subjects of the Greek provinces were ignorant of the language that disposed of their lives and properties, and the barbarous dialect of the Latins was imperfectly studied in the academies of Beritus and Constantinople. As an Illyrian soldier, the Tidium was familiar to the infancy of Justinian, his youth had been instructed by the lessons of jurisprudence, and his imperial choice selected the most learned civilians of the East, to labor with their sovereign in the work of reformation. The theory of professors was assisted by the practice of advocates and the experience of magistrates, and the whole undertaking was animated by the spirit of Tribonian. This extraordinary man, the object of so much praise and censure, was a native of Sidon Pamphylia, and his genius, like that of Bacon, embraced, as his own, all the business and knowledge of the age. Tribonian composed, both in prose and verse, on a strange diversity of curious and abstruse subjects colon 43 a double panegyric of Justinian and the life of the philosopher Theodotus, the nature of happiness and the duties of government, Homer's catalogue and the four and twenty sorts of meter, the astronomical canon of Ptolemy, the changes of the months, the houses of the planets, and the harmonic system of the world. To the literature of Greece he added the use of the Latin tongue. The Roman civilians were deposited in his library and in his mind, and he most assiduously cultivated those arts which opened the road of wealth and preferment. From the bar of the Praetorian prefects, he raised himself to the honours of quaestor, of consul, and of master of the offices. The council of Justinian listened to his eloquence and wisdom, and envy was mitigated by the gentleness and affability of his manners. The reproaches of impiety and avarice have stained the virtues or the reputation of Tribonian. In a bigoted and persecuting court, the principal minister was accused of a secret aversion to the Christian faith, and was supposed to entertain the sentiments of an atheist and a pagan, which have been imputed, inconsistently enough, to the last philosophers of Greece. His avarice was more clearly proved and more sensibly felt. If he were swayed by gifts in the administration of justice, the example of Bacon will again occur, nor can the merit of Tribonian atone for his baseness, if he degraded the sanctity of his profession, and if laws were every day enacted, modified, or repealed, for the base consideration of his private emolument. In the sedition of Constantinople, his removal was granted to the clamours, perhaps to the just indignation, of the people, but the quester was speedily restored, and till the hour of his death he possessed, above twenty years, the favour and confidence of the emperor. His passive and dutiful submission has been honoured with the praise of Justinian himself, whose vanity was incapable of discerning how often that submission degenerated into the grossest adulation. Tribonian adored the virtues of his gracious master, 
the earth was unworthy of such a prince, and he affected a pious fear that Justinian, like Elijah or Omulus, would be snatched into the air and translated alive to the mansions of celestial glory. If Caesar had achieved the reformation of the Roman law, his creative genius, enlightened by reflection and study, would have given to the world a pure and original system of jurisprudence. Whatever flattery might suggest, the Emperor of the East was afraid to establish his private judgment as the standard of equity, in the possession of legislative power, he borrowed the aid of time and opinion, and his laborious compilations are guarded by the sages and legislators of past times. Instead of a statue cast in a simple mould by the hand of an artist, the works of Justinian represent a tessellated pavement of antique and costly, but too often of incoherent, fragments. In the first year of his reign, he directed the faithful Tribonian and nine learned associates to revise the ordinances of his predecessors, as they were contained, since the time of Hadrian, in the Gregorian, Hermogenian, and Theodosian codes, to purge the errors and contradictions, to retrench whatever was obsolete or superfluous, and to select the wise and salutary laws best adapted to the practice of the tribunals and the use of his subjects. The work was accomplished in fourteen months, and the twelve books or tables, which the new Decemvers produced, might be designed to imitate the labours of their Roman predecessors. The new code of Justinian was honoured with his name, and confirmed by his royal signature, authentic transcripts were multiplied by the pens of notaries and scribes, they were transmitted to the magistrates of the European, the Asiatic, and afterwards the African provinces, and the law of the empire was proclaimed on solemn festivals at the doors of churches. A more arduous operation was still behind, to extract the spirit of jurisprudence from the decisions and conjectures, the questions and disputes, of the Roman civilians. Seventeen lawyers, with Tribonian at their head, were appointed by the emperor to exercise an absolute jurisdiction over the works of their predecessors. If they had obeyed his commands in ten years, Justinian would have been satisfied with their diligence, and the rapid composition of the Digest or Pandects, 45 in three years, will deserve praise or censure according to the merit of the execution. From the library of Tribonian they chose forty, the most eminent civilians of former times, 46 2000 treatises were comprised in an abridgment of fifty books and it has been carefully recorded that three millions of lines or sentences 47 were reduced, in this abstract, to the moderate number of 150,000. The edition of this great work was delayed a month after that of the Institutes, and it seemed reasonable that the elements should precede the digest of the Roman law. As soon as the Emperor had approved their labours, he ratified, by his legislative power, the speculations of these private citizens, their commentaries on the twelve tables, the perpetual edict, the laws of the people, and the decrees of the senate, succeeded to the authority of the text, and the text was abandoned, as an useless, though venerable, relic of antiquity. The code, the pandects, and the institutes were declared to be the legitimate system of civil jurisprudence, they alone were admitted in the tribunals, and they alone were taught in the academies of Rome, Constantinople, and Beritis. Justinian addressed to the senate and provinces his eternal oracles, and his pride, under the mask of piety, ascribed the consummation of this great design to the support and inspiration of the deity. Since the emperor declined the fame and envy of original composition, we can only require at his hands method, choice, and fidelity, the humble though indispensable virtues of a compiler. Among the various combinations of ideas, it is difficult to assign any reasonable preference, but, as the order of Justinian is different in his three works, it is possible that all may be wrong, and it is certain that two cannot be right. In the selection of ancient laws, he seems to have viewed his predecessors without jealousy and with equal regard, the series could not ascend above the reign of Hadrian, and the narrow distinction of paganism and Christianity introduced by the superstition of Theodosius, had been abolished by the consent of mankind. But the jurisprudence of the Pandects is circumscribed within a period of an hundred years, 
from the perpetual edict to the death of Severus Alexander, the civilians who lived under the first Caesars are seldom permitted to speak, and only three names can be attributed to the age of the Republic. The favorite of Justinian, it has been fiercely urged, was fearful of encountering the light of freedom, and the gravity of Roman sages. Tribonian condemned to oblivion the genuine and native wisdom of Cato, the Sevillas, and Sulpicius, while he invoked spirits more congenial to his own, the Syrians, Greeks, and Africans, who flocked to the imperial court to study Latin as a foreign tongue, and jurisprudence as a lucrative profession. But the ministers of Justinian 48 were instructed to labor, not for the curiosity of antiquarians, but for the immediate benefit of his subjects. It was their duty to select the useful and practical parts of the Roman law, and the writings of the old republicans, however curious or excellent, were no longer suited to the new system of manners, religion, and government. Perhaps, if the preceptors and friends of Cicero were still alive, our candor would acknowledge that, except in purity of language, 49 their intrinsic merit was excelled by the school of Papinian and Ulpian. The science of the laws is the slow growth of time and experience, and the advantage both of method and materials is naturally assumed by the most recent authors. The civilians of the reign of the Antonines had studied the works of their predecessors, their philosophic spirit had mitigated the rigor of antiquity, simplified the forms of proceeding, and emerged from the jealousy and prejudice of the rival sects. The choice of the authorities that compose the Pandects depended on the judgment of Tribonian, but the power of his sovereign could not absolve him from the sacred obligations of truth and fidelity. As a legislator of the empire, Justinian might repeal the acts of the Antonines, or condemn, as seditious, the free principles which were maintained by the last of the Roman lawyers. But the existence of past facts is placed beyond the reach of despotism, and the emperor was guilty of fraud and forgery, when he corrupted the integrity of their text, inscribed with their venerable names the words and ideas of his servile reign, 50 and suppressed, by the hand of power, the pure and authentic copies of their sentiments. The changes and interpolations of Tribonian and his colleagues are excused by the pretense of uniformity, but their cares have been insufficient and the antinomies or contradictions of the Code and Pandects still exercise the patience and subtlety of modern civilians. A rumor devoid of evidence has been propagated by the enemies of Justinian, that the jurisprudence of ancient Rome was reduced to ashes by the author of the Pandects, from the vain persuasion that it was now either false or superfluous. Without usurping an office so invidious, the emperor might safely commit to ignorance and time the accomplishment of this destructive wish. Before the invention of printing and paper, the labor and the materials of writing could be purchased only by the rich, and it may reasonably be computed that the price of books was an hundredfold their present value. Copies were slowly multiplied and cautiously renewed, the hopes of profit tempted the sacrilegious scribes to erase the characters of antiquity and Sophocles or Tacitus were obliged to resign the parchment to missiles, homilies, and the golden legend. If such was the fate of the most beautiful compositions of genius, what stability could be expected for the dull and barren works of an obsolete science? The books of jurisprudence were interesting to few and entertaining to none, their value was connected with present use, and they sunk forever as soon as that use was superseded by the innovations of fashion superior merit, or public authority. In the age of peace and learning, between Cicero and the last of the Antonines, many losses had been already sustained, and some luminaries of the school, or forum, were known only to the curious by tradition and report. Three hundred and sixty years of disorder and decay accelerated the progress of oblivion, and it may fairly be presumed that of the writings which Justinian is accused of neglecting many were no longer to be found in the libraries of the East. The copies of Papinian or Alpian, which the reformer had prescribed, were deemed unworthy of future notice, the twelve tables and Praetorian edict insensibly vanished, and the monuments of ancient Rome were neglected or destroyed by the envy and ignorance of the Greeks. 
even the Pandects themselves have escaped with difficulty and danger from the common shipwreck, and criticism has pronounced that all the editions and manuscripts of the West are derived from one original. It was transcribed at Constantinople in the beginning of the 7th century, 56 was successively transported by the accidents of war and commerce to Amalfi, 57 Pisa, 58 and Florence, 59 and is now deposited as a sacred relic 60 in the ancient palace of the Republic. It is the first care of a reformer to prevent any future reformation. To maintain the text of the band acts, the institutes, and the code the use of ciphers and abbreviations was rigorously prescribed, and, as Justinian recollected that the perpetual edict had been buried under the weight of commentators, he denounced the punishment of forgery against the rash civilians who should presume to interpret or pervert the will of their sovereign. The scholars of Acursius, of Bartelus, of Cujasius, should blush for their accumulated guilt unless they dare to dispute his right of binding the authority of his successors and the native freedom of the mind. But the emperor was unable to fix his own inconstancy, and, while he boasted of renewing the exchange of Diomede, of transmuting brass into gold, 62 he discovered the necessity of purifying his gold from the mixture of baser alloy. Six years had not elapsed from the publication of the code before he condemned the imperfect attempt by a new and more accurate edition of the same work, which he enriched with two hundred of his own laws and fifty decisions of the darkest and most intricate points of jurisprudence. Every year, or, according to Procopius, each day, of his long reign was marked by some legal innovation. Many of his acts were rescinded by himself, many were rejected by his successors, many have been obliterated by time but the number of 16 edicts, and 168 novels, 63 has been admitted into the authentic body of the civil jurisprudence. In the opinion of a philosopher superior to the prejudices of his profession, these incessant, and for the most part trifling, alterations can be only explained by the venal spirit of a prince who sold without shame his judgments and his laws. The charge of the secret historian is indeed explicit and vehement, but the sole instance which he produces may be ascribed to the devotion as well as to the avarice of Justinian. A wealthy bigot had bequeathed his inheritance to the church of Emissa, and its value was enhanced by the dexterity of an artist, who subscribed confessions of debt and promises of payment with the names of the richest Syrians. They pleaded the established prescription of thirty or forty years, but their defense was overruled by a retrospective edict which extended the claims of the church to the term of a century, an edict so pregnant with injustice and disorder that, after serving this occasional purpose, it was prudently abolished in the same reign. If can the will acquit the emperor himself and transfer the corruption to his wife and favorites, the suspicion of so foul a vice must still degrade the majesty of his laws, and the advocates of Justinian may acknowledge that such levity, whatsoever be the motive, is unworthy of a legislator and a man. Monarchs seldom condescend to become the preceptors of their subjects, and some praise is due to Justinian, by whose command an ample system was reduced to a short and elementary treatise. Among the various institutes of the Roman law, 65, those of Keys 66 were the most popular in the East and West, and their use may be considered as an evidence of their merit. They were selected by the imperial delegates. Tribonian, Theophilus, and Dorotheus, and the freedom and purity of the Antonines was encrusted with the coarser materials of a degenerate age. The same volume which introduced the youth of Rome, Constantinople, and Beritus, to the gradual study of the Code and Pandects is still precious to the historian, the philosopher, and the magistrate. The institutes of Justinian are divided into four books, they proceed with no contemptible method, from I. Persons to two. Things, and from things to three. Actions, and the article four. Of private wrongs is terminated by the principles of criminal law. I. The distinction of ranks and persons, is the firmest basis of a mixed and limited government. In France, the remains of liberty are kept alive by the spirit, the honors, and even the prejudices, of fifty thousand nobles. 
200 families supply, in lineal descent, the second branch of the English legislature, which maintains, between the king and commons, the balance of the constitution. A gradation of patricians and plebans, of strangers and subjects, has supported the aristocracy of Genoa, Venice, and ancient Rome. The perfect equality of men is the point in which the extremes of democracy and despotism are confounded, since the majesty of the prince or people would be offended, if any heads were exalted above the level of their fellow slaves or fellow citizens. In the decline of the Roman Empire, the proud distinctions of the Republic were gradually abolished, and the reason or instinct of Justinian completed the simple form of an absolute monarchy. The Emperor could not eradicate the popular reverence which always waits on the possession of hereditary wealth or the memory of famous ancestors. He delighted to honor with titles and emoluments his generals, magistrates, and senators and his precarious indulgence communicated some rays of their glory to the persons of their wives and children. But, in the eye of the law, all Roman citizens were equal, and all subjects of the empire were citizens of Rome. That inestimable character was degraded to an obsolete and empty name. The voice of a Roman could no longer enact his laws or create the annual ministers of his power, his constitutional rights might have checked the arbitrary will of a master and the bold adventurer from Germany or Arabia was admitted, with equal favor, to the civil and military command, which the citizen alone had been once entitled to assume over the conquests of his fathers. The first Caesars had scrupulously guarded the distinction of ingenuous and servile birth, which was decided by the condition of the mother, and the candor of the laws was satisfied, if her freedom could be ascertained during a single moment between the conception and the delivery. The slaves, who were liberated by a generous master, immediately entered into the middle class of libertines or freedmen, but they could never be enfranchised from the duties of obedience and gratitude, whatever were the fruits of their industry. Their patron and his family inherited the third part, or even the whole of their fortune, if they died without children and without a testament. Justinian respected the rights of patrons, but his indulgence removed the badge of disgrace from the two inferior orders of freedmen, whoever ceased to be a slave obtained, without reserve or delay, the station of a citizen, and at length the dignity of an ingenuous birth, which nature had refused, was created, or supposed, by the omnipotence of the emperor. Whatever restraints of age, or forms, or numbers, had been formally introduced to check the abuse of manumissions and the too rapid increase of violent indigent Romans, he finally abolished, and the spirit of his laws promoted the extinction of domestic servitude. Yet the eastern provinces were filled, in the time of Justinian, with multitudes of slaves, either born or purchased for the use of their masters, and the price, from ten to seventy pieces of gold, was determined by their age, their strength, and their education. But the hardships of this dependent state were continually diminished by the influence of government and religion, and the pride of a subject was no longer related by his absolute dominion over the life and happiness of his bondsmen. The law of nature instructs most animals to cherish and educate their infant progeny. The law of reason inculcates to the human species the returns of filial piety. But the exclusive, absolute, and perpetual dominion of the father over his children is peculiar to the Roman jurisprudence, and seems to be coeval with the foundation of the city. The paternal power was instituted or confirmed by Romulus himself, and after the practice of three centuries it was inscribed on the fourth table of the Decemvirs. In the Forum, the Senate, or the Camp, the adult son of a Roman citizen enjoyed the public and private rights of a person, in his father's house. He was a mything, confounded by the laws with the movables, the cattle, and the slaves, whom the capricious master might alienate or destroy without being responsible to any earthly tribunal. The hand which bestowed the daily sustenance might resume the voluntary gift, and whatever was acquired by the labor or fortune of the son was immediately lost in the property of the father. His stolen goods, his oxen or his children might be recovered by the same action of theft, and, if either had been guilty of a trespass, 
it was in his own option to compensate the damage or resign to the injured party the obnoxious animal. At the call of indigence or avarice, the master of a family could dispose of his children or his slaves. But the condition of the slave was far more advantageous, since he regained by the first manumission his alienated freedom, the son was again restored to his unnatural father, he might be condemned to servitude a second and a third time, and it was not till after the third sale and deliverance that he was enfranchised from the domestic power which had been so repeatedly abused. According to his discretion, a father might chastise the real or imaginary faults of his children, by stripes, by imprisonment, by exile, by sending them to the country to work in chains among the meanest of his servants. The majesty of a parent was armed with the power of life and death, and the examples of such bloody executions, which were sometimes praised and never punished, may be traced in the annals of Rome, beyond the times of Pompey and Augustus. Neither age, nor rank, nor the consular office, nor the honours of a triumph, could exempt the most illustrious citizen from the bonds of filial subjection, his own descendants were included in the family of their common ancestor, and the claims of adoption were not less sacred or less rigorous than those of nature. Without fear, though not without danger of abuse, the Roman legislators had reposed an unbounded confidence in the sentiments of paternal love, and the oppression was tempered by the assurance that each generation must succeed in its turn to the awful dignity of parent and master. The first limitation of paternal power is ascribed to the justice and humanity of Numa, and the maid who, with his father's consent, had espoused a freeman was protected from the disgrace of becoming the wife of a slave. In the first ages, when the city was pressed and often furnished by her Latin and Tuscan neighbours, the sale of children might be a frequent practice, but, as a Roman could not legally purchase the liberty of his fellow citizen, the market must gradually fail, and the trade would be destroyed by the conquests of the Republic. An imperfect right of property was at length communicated to sons, and the threefold distinction of prefectitious, adventitious, and professional was ascertained by the jurisprudence of the Code and Pandects. Of all that proceeded from the father, he imparted only the use, and reserved the absolute dominion, yet, if his goods were sold, the filial portion was accepted, by a favourable interpretation, from the demands of the creditors. In whatever accrued by marriage, gift, or collateral succession, the property was secured to the son, but the father, unless he had been specially excluded, enjoyed the usufruct during his life. As a just and prudent reward of military virtue, the spoils of the enemy were acquired, possessed, and bequeathed by the soldier alone, and the fair analogy was extended to the emoluments of any liberal profession, the salary of public service, and the sacred liberality of the emperor or the empress. The life of a citizen was less exposed than his fortune to the abuse of paternal power. Yet his life might be adverse to the interest or passions of an unworthy father, the same crimes that flowed from the corruption, were more sensibly felt by the humanity, of the Augustan age, and the cruel Erixo, who whipped his son till he expired, was saved by the emperor from the just fury of the multitude. The Roman father, from the license of servile dominion, was reduced to the gravity and moderation of a judge. The presence and opinion of Augustus confirmed the sentence of exile pronounced against an intentional parricide by the domestic tribunal of Arius. Hadrian transported to an island the jealous parent who, like a robber, had seized the opportunity of hunting, to assassinate a youth, the incestuous lover of his stepmother. A private jurisprudence is repugnant to the spirit of monarchy, the parent was again reduced from a judge to an accuser and the magistrates were enjoined by Severus Alexander to hear his complaints and execute his sentence. He could no longer take the life of a son without incurring the guilt and punishment of murder, and the pains of parricide, from which he had been accepted by the Pompeian law, were finally inflicted by the justice of Constantine. The same protection was due to every period of existence and reason must applaud the humanity of Paulus for imputing the crime of murder to the father who strangles or starves or abandons his newborn infant, 
or exposes him in a public place to find the mercy which he himself had denied. But the exposition of children was the prevailing and stubborn vice of antiquity, it was sometimes prescribed, often permitted, almost always practiced with impunity, by the nations who never entertained the Roman ideas of paternal power, and the dramatic poets, who appealed to the human heart, represent with indifference a popular custom which was palliated by the motives of economy and compassion. If the father could subdue his own feelings, he might escape though not the censure, at least the chastisement, of the laws, and the Roman Empire was stained with the blood of infants, till such murders were included, by Valentinian and his colleagues, in the letter and spirit of the Cornelian law. The lessons of jurisprudence 71 and Christianity had been insufficient to eradicate this inhuman practice, till their gentle influence was fortified by the terrors of capital punishment. Experience has proved that savages are the tyrants of the female sex, and that the condition of women is usually softened by the refinements of social life. In the hope of a robust progeny, Lycurgus had delayed the season of marriage, it was fixed by Numa at the tender age of twelve years, that the Roman husband might educate to his will a pure and obedient virgin. According to the custom of antiquity, he bought his bride of her parents, and she fulfilled the coemption by purchasing, with three pieces of copper, a just introduction to his house and household deities. A sacrifice of fruits was offered by the pontiffs in the presence of ten witnesses, the contracting parties were seated on the same sheepskin, they tasted a salt cake of far or rice, and this confariation seventy-two which denoted the ancient food of Italy, served as an emblem of their mystic union of mind and body. But this union on the side of the woman was rigorous and unequal, and she renounced the name and worship of her father's house to embrace a new servitude decorated only by the title of adoption. A fiction of the law, neither rational nor elegant, bestowed on the mother of a family, her proper appellation, the strange characters of sister to her own children, and of daughter to her husband or master who was invested with the plenitude of paternal power. By his judgment or caprice her behavior was approved, or censured, or chastised, he exercised the jurisdiction of life and death, and it was allowed that, in the cases of adultery or drunkenness, 73 the sentence might be properly inflicted. She acquired and inherited for the sole profit of her lord, and so clearly was woman defined, not as a person, but as a thing, that, if the original title were deficient, she might be claimed, like other movables, by the use and possession of an entire year. The inclination of the Roman husband discharged or withheld the conjugal debt, so scrupulously exacted by the Athenian and Jewish laws semicolon 74 but, as polygamy was unknown, he could never admit to his bed a fairer or more favoured partner. After the Punic triumphs, the matrons of Rome aspired to the common benefits of a free and opulent republic, their wishes were gratified by the indulgence of fathers and lovers, and their ambition was unsuccessfully resisted by the gravity of Cato the censor. They declined the solemnities of the old nuptials, defeated the annual prescription by an absence of three days, and, without losing their name or independence, subscribed the liberal and definite terms of a marriage contract. Of their private fortunes they communicated the use, and secured the property, the estates of a wife could neither be alienated nor mortgaged by a prodigal husband. Their mutual gifts were prohibited by the jealousy of the laws, and the misconduct of either party might afford, under another name, a future subject for an action of theft. To this loose and voluntary compact, religious and civil rights were no longer essential, and, between persons of a similar rank, the apparent community of life was allowed as sufficient evidence of their nuptials. The dignity of marriage was restored by the Christians, who derived all spiritual grace from the prayers of the faithful and the benediction of the priest or bishop. The origin, validity, and duties of the holy institution were regulated by the tradition of the synagogue, the precepts of the gospel, and the canons of general or provincial synods and the conscience of the Christians was awed by the decrees and censures of their ecclesiastical rulers. Yet the magistrates of Justinian were not subject to the authority of the church, 
The emperor consulted the unbelieving civilians of antiquity, and the choice of matrimonial laws in the Code and Pandects is directed by the earthly motives of justice, policy, and the natural freedom of both sexes. Besides the agreement of the parties, the essence of every rational contract, the Roman marriage required the previous approbation of the parents. A father might be forced by some recent laws to supply the wants of a mature daughter, but even his insanity was not generally allowed to supersede the necessity of his consent. The causes of the dissolution of matrimony have varied among the Romans semicolon 76 but the most solemn sacrament, the confariation itself, might always be done away by rights of a contrary tendency. In the first ages, the father of a family might sell his children, and his wife was reckoned in the number of his children, the domestic judge might pronounce the death of the offender, or his mercy might expel her from his bed and house but the slavery of the wretched female was hopeless and perpetual, unless he asserted for his own convenience the manly prerogative of divorce. The warmest applause has been lavished on the virtue of the Romans, who abstained from the exercise of this tempting privilege above five hundred years semicolon seventy-seven but the same fact evinces the unequal terms of a connection in which the slave was unable to renounce her tyrant and the tyrant was unwilling to relinquish his slave. When the Roman matrons became the equal and voluntary companions of their lords, a new jurisprudence was introduced, that marriage, like other partnerships, might be dissolved by the abdication of one of the associates. In three centuries of prosperity and corruption, this principle was enlarged to frequent practice and pernicious abuse. Passion, interest, or caprice suggested daily motives for the dissolution of marriage, a word, a message, a letter, the mandate of a freedman, declared the separation, the most tender of human connections was degraded to a transient society of profit or pleasure. According to the various conditions of life, both sexes alternately felt the disgrace and injury, an inconstant spouse transferred her wealth to a new family, abandoning a numerous, perhaps a spurious, progeny to the paternal authority and care of her late husband, a beautiful virgin might be dismissed to the world, old, indigent, and friendless, but the reluctance of the Romans, when they were pressed to marriage by Augustus, sufficiently marks that the prevailing institutions were least favorable to the males. A specious theory is confuted by this free and perfect experiment, which demonstrates that the liberty of divorce does not contribute to happiness and virtue. The facility of separation would destroy all mutual confidence and inflame every trifling dispute. The minute difference between an husband and a stranger, which might so easily be removed, might still more easily be forgotten, and the matron, who in five years can submit to the embraces of eight husbands must cease to reverence the chastity of her own person. Insufficient remedies followed with distant and tardy steps the rapid progress of the evil. The ancient worship of the Romans afforded a peculiar goddess to hear and reconcile the complaints of a married life, but her epithet of Viriplica, the appeaser of husbands, too clearly indicates on which side submission and repentance were always expected. Every act of a citizen was subject to the judgment of the censors. The first who used the privilege of divorce assigned, at their command, the motives of his conduct, and a senator was expelled for dismissing his virgin spouse without the knowledge or advice of his friends. Whenever an action was instituted for the recovery of a marriage portion, the praetor, as the guardian of equity, examined the cause and the characters, and gently inclined the scale in favor of the guiltless and injured party. Augustus who united the powers of both magistrates, adopted their different modes of repressing or chastising the license of divorce. The presence of seven Roman witnesses was required for the validity of this solemn and deliberate act, if any adequate provocation had been given by the husband, instead of the delay of two years, he was compelled to refund immediately, or in the space of six months, but, if he could arraign the manners of his wife, her guilt or levity was expiated by the loss of the sixth or eighth part of her marriage portion. The Christian princes were the first who specified the just causes of a private divorce, their institutions, from Constantine to Justinian, appear to fluctuate between the custom of the empire and the wishes of the church, 
and the author of the novels too frequently reforms the jurisprudence of the Code and Pandects. In the most rigorous laws, a wife was condemned to support a gamester, a drunkard, or a libertine, unless he were guilty of homicide, poison, or sacrilege, in which cases the marriage, as it should seem, might have been dissolved by the hand of the executioner. But the sacred right of the husband was invariably maintained to deliver his name and family from the disgrace of adultery, the list of mortal sins, either male or female, was curtailed and enlarged by successive regulations. And the obstacles of incurable impotence, long absence, and monastic profession, were allowed to rescind the matrimonial obligation. Whoever transgressed the permission of the law was subject to various and heavy penalties. The woman was stripped of her wealth and ornaments, without accepting the bodkin of her hair, if the man introduced a new bride into his bed, her fortune might be lawfully seized by the vengeance of his exiled wife. Forfeiture was sometimes commuted to a fine, the fine was sometimes aggravated by transportation to an island or imprisonment in a monastery, the injured party was released from the bonds of marriage, but the offender, during life or a term of years, was disabled from the repetition of nuptials. The successor of Justinian yielded to the prayers of his unhappy subjects, and restored the liberty of divorce by mutual consent, the civilians were unanimous, the theologians were divided, and the ambiguous word, which contains the precept of Christ, is flexible to any interpretation that the wisdom of a legislator can demand. The freedom of love and marriage was restrained among the Romans by natural and civil impediments. An instinct, almost innate and universal, appears to prohibit the incestuous commerce of parents and children in the infinite series of ascending and descending generations. Concerning the oblique and collateral branches, nature is indifferent, reason mute, and custom various and arbitrary. In Egypt, the marriage of brothers and sisters was admitted without scruple or exception, a Spartan might espouse the daughter of his father, an Athenian that of his mother, and the nuptials of an uncle with his niece were applauded at Athens as a happy union of the dearest relations. The profane lawgivers of Rome were never tempted by interest or superstition to multiply the forbidden degrees, but they inflexibly condemned the marriage of sisters and brothers, hesitated whether first cousins should be touched by the same interdict, revered the paternal character of aunts and uncles, and treated affinity and adoption as a just imitation of the ties of blood. According to the proud maxims of the Republic, a legal marriage could only be contracted by free citizens, an honorable, at least an ingenuous, birth was required for the spouse of a senator, but the blood of kings could never mingle in legitimate nuptials with the blood of a Roman, and the name of stranger degraded Cleopatra and Berenice to live the concubines of Mark Antony and Titus. This appellation, indeed, so injurious to the majesty, cannot without indulgence be applied to the manners, of these oriental queens. A concubine, in the strict sense of the civilians, was a woman of servile or plebeian extraction, the sole and faithful companion of a Roman citizen, who continued in a state of celibacy. Her modest station below the honours of a wife, above the infamy of a prostitute, was acknowledged and approved by the laws, from the age of Augustus to the tenth century. The use of this secondary marriage prevailed both in the West and East, and the humble virtues of a concubine were often preferred to the pomp and insolence of a noble matron. In this connection, the two Antonines, the best of princes and of men, enjoyed the comforts of domestic love, the example was imitated by many citizens impatient of celibacy, but regardful of their families. If at any time they desired to legitimate their natural children, the conversion was instantly performed by the celebration of their nuptials with a partner whose fruitfulness and fidelity they had already tried. By this epithet of natural, the offspring of the concubine were distinguished from the spurious brood of adultery, prostitution, and incest, to whom Justinian reluctantly grants the necessary aliments of life, and these natural children alone were capable of succeeding to a sixth part of the inheritance of their reputed father. According to the rigor of law, bastards were entitled only to the name and condition of their mother, from whom they might derive the character of a slave, 
a stranger, or a citizen. The outcasts of every family were adopted without reproach as the children of the state. The relation of guardian and ward, or in Roman words, of tutor and pupil, which covers so many titles of the institutes and band acts, is of a very simple and uniform nature. The person and property of an orphan must always be trusted to the custody of some discreet friend. If the deceased father had not signified his choice, the agnat, or paternal kindred of the nearest degree, were compelled to act as the natural guardians, the Athenians were apprehensive of exposing the infant to the power of those most interested in his death, but an axiom of Roman jurisprudence has pronounced that the charge of tutelage should constantly attend the emolument of succession. If the choice of the father and the line of consanguinity afforded no efficient guardian, the failure was supplied by the nomination of the praetor of the city or the president of the province. But the person whom they named to this public office might be legally excused by insanity or blindness, by ignorance or inability, by previous enmity or adverse interest, by the number of children or guardianships with which he was already burthened, and by the immunities which were granted to the useful labors of magistrates, lawyers, physicians, and professors. Till the infant could speak and think, he was represented by the tutor, whose authority was finally determined by the age of puberty. Without his consent, no act of the pupil could bind himself to his own prejudice, though it might oblige others for his personal benefit. It is needless to observe that the tutor often gave security and always rendered an account, and that the want of diligence or integrity exposed him to a civil and almost criminal action for the violation of his sacred trust. The age of puberty had been rashly fixed by the civilians at fourteen, but, as the faculties of the mind ripen more slowly than those of the body, a curator was interposed to guard the fortunes of a Roman youth from his own inexperience and headstrong passions. Such a trustee had been first instituted by the praetor, to save a family from the blind havoc of a prodigal or madman, and the minor was compelled by the laws to solicit the same protection to give validity to his acts till he accomplished the full period of twenty-five years. Women were condemned to the perpetual tutelage of parents, husbands, or guardians, a sex created to please and to obey was never supposed to have attained the age of reason and experience. Such at least was the stern and haughty spirit of the ancient law, which had been insensibly mollified before the time of Justinian II. The original right of property can only be justified by the accident or merit of prior occupancy, and on this foundation it is wisely established by the philosophy of the civilians. The savage who hollows a tree, inserts a sharp stone into a wooden handle, or applies a string to an elastic branch, becomes in a state of nature the just proprietor of the canoe, the bow, or the hatchet. The materials were common to all, the new form, the produce of his time and simple industry, belongs solely to himself. His hungry brethren cannot, without a sense of their own injustice, extort from the hunter the game of the forest overtaken or slain by his personal strength and dexterity. If his provident care preserves and multiplies the tame animals, whose nature is tractable to the arts of education, he acquires a perpetual title to the use and service of their numerous progeny, which derives its existence from him alone. If he encloses and cultivates a field for their sustenance and his own, a barren waste is converted into a fertile soil, the seed, the manure, the labor, create a new value, and the rewards of harvest are painfully earned by the fatigues of the revolving year. In the successive states of society, the hunter, the shepherd, the husbandman, may defend their possessions by two reasons which forcibly appeal to the feelings of the human mind, that whatever they enjoy is the fruit of their own industry, and, that every man who envies their felicity may purchase similar acquisitions by the exercise of similar diligence. Such, in truth, may be the freedom and plenty of a small colony cast on a fruitful island. But the colony multiplies, while the space still continues the same, the common rights, the equal inheritance of mankind, are engrossed by the bold and crafty. Each field and forest is circumscribed by the landmarks of a jealous master, 
and it is the peculiar praise of the Roman jurisprudence that it asserts the claim of the first occupant to the wild animals of the earth, the air, and the waters. In the progress from primitive equity to final injustice, the steps are silent, the shades are almost imperceptible, and the absolute monopoly is guarded by positive laws and artificial reason. The active insatiate principle of self-love can alone supply the arts of life and the wages of industry, and, as soon as civil government and exclusive property have been introduced, they become necessary to the existence of the human race. Except in the singular institutions of Sparta, the wisest legislators have disapproved an agrarian law as a false and dangerous innovation. Among the Romans, the enormous disproportion of wealth surmounted the ideal restraints of a doubtful tradition and an obsolete statute, a tradition that the poorest follower of Romulus had been endowed with the perpetual inheritance of two jugera, a statute which confined the richest citizen to the measure of five hundred jugera, or three hundred and twelve acres of land. The original territory of Rome consisted only of some miles of wood and meadow along the banks of the Tiber and domestic exchange could add nothing to the national stock. But the goods of an alien or enemy were lawfully exposed to the first hostile occupier, the city was enriched by the profitable trade of war, and the blood of her sons was the only price that was paid for the Volscian sheep, the slaves of Britain, or the gems and gold of Asiatic kingdoms. In the language of ancient jurisprudence, which was corrupted and forgotten before the age of Justinian, these spoils were distinguished by the name of manceps or mancipium, taken with the hand, and, whenever they were sold or emancipated, the purchaser required some assurance that they had been the property of an enemy, and not of a fellow citizen. A citizen could only forfeit his rights by apparent dereliction, and such dereliction of a valuable interest could not easily be presumed. Yet, According to the Twelve Tables, a prescription of one year for movables, and of two years for immovables, abolished the claim of the ancient master, if the actual possessor had acquired them by a fair transaction from the person whom he believed to be the lawful proprietor. Such conscientious injustice, without any mixture of fraud or force, could seldom injure the members of a small republic, but the various periods of three, of ten, or of twenty years, determined by Justinian, are more suitable to the latitude of a great empire. It is only in the term of prescription that the distinction of real and personal fortune has been remarked by the civilians, and their general idea of property is that of simple, uniform, and absolute dominion. The subordinate exceptions of use, of usufruct, of servitudes, imposed for the benefit of a neighbor on lands and houses are abundantly explained by the professors of jurisprudence. The claims of property, as far as they are altered by the mixture, the division, or the transformation of substances, are investigated with metaphysical subtlety by the same civilians. The personal title of the first proprietor must be determined by his death, but the possession, without any appearance of change, is peaceably continued in his children, the associates of his toil and the partners of his wealth. This natural inheritance has been protected by the legislators of every climate and age, and the father is encouraged to persevere in slow and distant improvements, by the tender hope that a long posterity will enjoy the fruits of his labor. The principle of hereditary succession is universal, but the order has been variously established by convenience or caprice, by the spirit of national institutions, or by some partial example which was originally decided by fraud or violence. The jurisprudence of the Romans appears to have deviated from the equality of nature much less than the Jewish, 80, the Athenian, 81 or the English institutions. On the death of a citizen, all his descendants, unless they were already freed from his paternal power, were called to the inheritance of his possessions. The insolent prerogative of primogeniture was unknown, the two sexes were placed on a just level, all the sons and daughters were entitled to an equal portion of the patrimonial estate, and, if any of the sons had been intercepted by a premature death, his person was represented, and his share was divided, by his surviving children. On the failure of the direct line, the right of succession must diverge to the collateral branches.
the degrees of kindred 83 are numbered by the civilians, ascending from the last possessor to a common parent, and descending from the common parent to the next heir, my father stands in the first degree, my brother in the second, his children in the third, and the remainder of the series may be conceived by fancy, or pictured in a genealogical table. In this computation, a distinction was made, essential to the laws and even the constitution of Rome. The agnat, or persons connected by a line of males, were called, as they stood in the nearest degree, to an equal partition, but a female was incapable of transmitting any legal claims, and the cognats of every rank, without accepting the dear relation of a mother and a son, were disinherited by the twelve tables, as strangers and aliens. Among the Romans, again or lineage was united by a common name and domestic rites, the various cognomens or surnames of Scipio or Marcellus distinguished from each other the subordinate branches or families of the Cornelian or Claudian race. The default of the agnats of the same surname was supplied by the larger denomination of Gentiles, and the vigilance of the laws maintained, in the same name, the perpetual descent of religion and property. A similar principle dictated the Voconian Law, 84, which abolished the right of female inheritance. As long as virgins were given or sold in marriage, the adoption of the wife extinguished the hopes of the daughter. But the equal succession of independent matrons supported their pride and luxury, and might transport into a foreign house the riches of their fathers. While the maxims of Cato were revered, they tended to perpetuate in each family a just and virtuous mediocrity, till female blandishments insensibly triumphed, and every salutary restraint was lost in the dissolute greatness of the Republic. The rigor of the Decemvirs was tempered by the equity of the Praetors. Their edicts restored emancipated and posthumous children to the rights of nature, and, upon the failure of the Agnat, they preferred the blood of the Cognats to the name of the Gentiles whose title and character were insensibly covered with oblivion. The reciprocal inheritance of mothers and sons was established in the Tertullian and Orphician decrees by the humanity of the Senate. A new and more impartial order was introduced by the novels of Justinian, who affected to revive the jurisprudence of the Twelve Tables. The lines of masculine and female kindred were confounded, the descending, ascending, and collateral series, was accurately defined, and each degree, according to the proximity of blood and affection, succeeded to the vacant possessions of a Roman citizen. The order of succession is regulated by nature, or at least by the general and permanent reason of the lawgiver, but this order is frequently violated by the arbitrary and partial wills which prolong the dominion of the tester to beyond the grave. In the simple state of society, this last use or abuse of the right of property is seldom indulged, it was introduced at Athens by the laws of Solon, and the private testaments of the father of a family are authorized by the twelve tables. Before the time of the December's comma 86 a Roman citizen exposed his wishes and motives to the assembly of the thirty curie or parishes, and the general law of inheritance was suspended by an occasional act of the legislature. After the permission of the Decemvirs each private lawgiver promulgated his verbal or written testament in the presence of five citizens, who represented the five classes of the Roman people, a sixth witness attested their concurrence, a seventh weighed the copper money which was paid by an imaginary purchaser, and the estate was emancipated by a fictitious sale and immediate release. This singular ceremony, which excited the wonder of the Greeks, was still practiced in the age of Severus but the praetors had already approved a more simple testament, for which they required the seals and signatures of seven witnesses, free from all legal exception, and purposely summoned for the execution of that important act. A domestic monarch, who reigned over the lives and fortunes of his children, might distribute their respective cares according to the degrees of their merit or his affection, his arbitrary displeasure chastised an unworthy son by the loss of his inheritance and the mortifying preference of a stranger. But the experience of unnatural parents recommended some limitations of their testamentary powers. A son, or, by the laws of Justinian, even a daughter, could no longer be disinherited by their silence, they were compelled to name the criminal, and to specify the offence, 
and the justice of the emperor enumerated the sole causes that could justify such a violation of the first principles of nature and society. Unless a legitimate portion, a fourth part, had been reserved for the children, they were entitled to institute an action or complaint of inefficious testament, to suppose that their father's understanding was impaired by sickness or age, and respectfully to appeal from his rigorous sentence to the deliberate wisdom of the magistrate. In the Roman jurisprudence, an essential distinction was admitted between the inheritance and the legacies. The heirs who succeeded to the entire unity, or to any of the twelve fractions, of the substance of the testator represented his civil and religious character, asserted his rights, fulfilled his obligations, and discharged the gifts of friendship or liberality which his last will had bequeathed under the name of legacies. But, as the imprudence or prodigality of a dying man might exhaust the inheritance and leave only risk and labor to his successor, he was empowered to retain the Falcidian portion, to deduct, before the payment of the legacies, a clear fourth for his own emolument. A reasonable time was allowed to examine the proportion between the debts and the estate, to decide whether he should accept or refuse the testament, and, if he used the benefit of an inventory, the demands of the creditors could not exceed the valuation of the effects. The last will of a citizen might be altered during his life or rescinded after his death, the persons whom he named might die before him, or reject the inheritance, or be exposed to some legal disqualification. In the contemplation of these events, he was permitted to substitute second and third heirs, to replace each other according to the order of the testament, and the incapacity of a madman or an infant to bequeath his property might be supplied by a similar substitution. But the power of the testator expired with the acceptance of the testament, each Roman of mature age and discretion acquired the absolute dominion of his inheritance, and the simplicity of the civil law was never clouded by the long and intricate entails which confine the happiness and freedom of unborn generations. Conquest and the formalities of law established the use of codicils. If a Roman was surprised by death in a remote province of the empire, he addressed a short epistle to his legitimate or testamentary heir, who fulfilled with honor, or neglected with impunity, this last request, which the judges before the age of Augustus were not authorized to enforce. A codicil might be expressed in any mode, or in any language, but the subscription of five witnesses must declare that it was the genuine composition of the author. His intention, however laudable, was sometimes illegal, and the invention of fide commissa, or trusts, arose from the struggle between natural justice and positive jurisprudence. A stranger of Greece or Africa might be the friend or benefactor of a childless Roman, but none, except a fellow citizen, could act as his heir. The Voconian law, which abolished female succession, restrained the legacy or inheritance of a woman to the sum of 100,000 sesterces semicolon 89 and an only daughter was condemned almost as an alien in her father's house. The zeal of friendship and parental affection suggested a liberal artifice, a qualified citizen was named in the testament, with a prayer or injunction that he would restore the inheritance to the person for whom it was truly intended. Various was the conduct of the trustees in this painful situation, they had sworn to observe the laws of their country, but honor prompted them to violate their oath, and, if they preferred their interest under the mask of patriotism, they forfeited the esteem of every virtuous mind. The declaration of Augustus relieved their doubts, gave a legal sanction to confidential testaments and codicils and gently unraveled the forms and restraints of the republican jurisprudence. But, as the new practice of trusts degenerated into some abuse, the trustee was enabled, by the Trebellian and Pegasian decrees, to reserve one-fourth of the estate, or to transfer on the head of the real heir all the debts and actions of the succession. The interpretation of testaments was strict and literal but the language of trusts and codicils was delivered from the minute and technical accuracy of the civilians three. The general duties of mankind are imposed by their public and private relations, but their specific obligations to each other can only be the effect of one. A promise, two. A benefit, or three. An injury, and, when these obligations are ratified by law, 
the interested party may compel the performance by a judicial action. On this principle the civilians of every country have erected a similar jurisprudence, the fair conclusion of universal reason and justice. One, The goddess of faith, of human and social faith, was worshipped, not only in her temples, but in the lives of the Romans, and, if that nation was deficient in the more amiable qualities of benevolence and generosity, they astonished the Greeks by their sincere and simple performance of the most burthensome engagements. Yet among the same people, according to the rigid maxims of the Patricans and Decemvers, a naked pact, a promise, or even an oath, did not create any civil obligation, unless it was confirmed by the legal form of a stipulation. Whatever might be the etymology of the Latin word, it conveyed the idea of a firm and irrevocable contract, which was always expressed in the mode of a question and answer. Do you promise to pay me one hundred pieces of gold? was the solemn interrogation of Seus. I do promise was the reply of Sempronius. The friends of Sempronius, who answered for his ability and inclination, might be separately sued at the option of Seus, and the benefit of partition, or order of reciprocal actions, insensibly deviated from the strict theory of stipulation. The most cautious and deliberate consent was justly required to sustain the validity of a gratuitous promise and the citizen who might have obtained a legal security incurred the suspicion of fraud, and paid the forfeit of his neglect. But the ingenuity of the civilians successfully labored to convert simple engagements into the form of solemn stipulations. The praetors, as the guardians of social faith, admitted every rational evidence of a voluntary and deliberate act which in their tribunal produced an equitable obligation, and for which they gave an action under Emory.2. The obligations of the second class, as they were contracted by the delivery of a thing, are marked by the civilians with the epithet of real. A grateful return is due to the author of a benefit, and whoever is entrusted with the property of another has bound himself to the sacred duty of restitution. In the case of a friendly loan the merit of generosity is on the side of the lender only, in a deposit on the side of the receiver, but in a pledge, and the rest of the selfish commerce of ordinary life, the benefit is compensated by an equivalent, and the obligation to restore is variously modified by the nature of the transaction. The Latin language very happily expresses the fundamental difference between the comodatum and the mutuum which our poverty is reduced to confound under the vague and common appellation of a loan. In the former, the borrower was obliged to restore the same individual thing with which he had been accommodated for the temporary supply of his wants, in the latter, it was destined for his use and consumption, and he discharged this mutual engagement by substituting the same specific value, according to a just estimation of number, of weight, and of measure. In the contract of sale, the absolute dominion is transferred to the purchaser, and he repays the benefit with an adequate sum of gold or silver, the price and universal standard of all earthly possessions. The obligation of another contract, that of location, is of a more complicated kind. Lands or houses, labor or talents, may be hired for a definite term, at the expiration of the time, the thing itself must be restored to the owner with an additional reward for the beneficial occupation and employment. In these lucrative contracts, to which may be added those of partnership and commissions, the civilians sometimes imagine the delivery of the object, and sometimes presume the consent of the parties. The substantial pledge has been refined into the invisible rights of a mortgage or hypotheca, and the agreement of sale, for a certain price, imputes, from that moment the chances of gain or loss to the account of the purchaser. It may be fairly supposed that every man will obey the dictates of his interest, and, if he accepts the benefit, he is obliged to sustain the expense, of the transaction. In this boundless subject, the historian will observe the location of land and money, the rent of the one and the interest of the other, as they materially affect the prosperity of agriculture and commerce, the landlord was often obliged to advance the stock and instruments of husbandry, and to content himself with a partition of the fruits. If the feeble tenant was oppressed by accident, contagion, 
or hostile violence. He claimed a proportionable relief from the equity of the laws, five years were the customary term, and no solid or costly improvements could be expected from a farmer who, at each moment, might be ejected by the sale of the estate. Usury, the inveterate grievance of the city, had been discouraged by the Twelve Tables, 97 and abolished by the clamours of the people. It was revived by their wants and idleness, tolerated by the discretion of the praetors, and finally determined by the Code of Justinian. Persons of illustrious rank were confined to the moderate profit of 4%, 6 was pronounced to be the ordinary and legal standard of interest, 8 was allowed for the convenience of manufacturers and merchants, 12 was granted to nautical insurance, which the wiser ancients had not attempted to define, but, except in this perilous adventure, the practice of exorbitant usury was severely restrained. The most simple interest was condemned by the clergy of the East and West semicolon 99 but the sense of mutual benefit, which has triumphed over the laws of the Republic, has resisted with equal firmness the decrees of the Church and even the prejudices of mankind. Three. Nature and society impose the strict obligation of repairing an injury, and the sufferer by private injustice acquires a personal right and a legitimate action. If the property of another be entrusted to our care, the requisite degree of care may rise and fall according to the benefit which we derive from such temporary possession, we are seldom made responsible for inevitable accident, but the consequences of a voluntary fault must always be imputed to the author. A Roman pursued and recovered his stolen goods by a civil action of theft they might pass through a succession of pure and innocent hands, but nothing less than a prescription of thirty years could extinguish his original claim. They were restored by the sentence of the praetor, and the injury was compensated by double, or threefold, or even quadruple damages, as the dead had been perpetrated by secret fraud or open rapine, as the robber had been surprised in the fact or detected by a subsequent research. The Aquilian law defended the living property of a citizen, his slaves and cattle, from the stroke of malice or negligence. The highest price was allowed that could be ascribed to the domestic animal at any moment of the year preceding his death, a similar latitude of thirty days was granted on the destruction of any other valuable effects. A personal injury is blunted or sharpened by the manners of the times and the sensibility of the individual, the pain or the disgrace of a word or blow cannot easily be appreciated by a pecuniary equivalent. The rude jurisprudence of the Decemvers had confounded all hasty insults, which did not amount to the fracture of a limb, by condemning the aggressor to the common penalty of twenty-five asses. But the same denomination of money was reduced, in three centuries, from a pound to the weight of half an ounce, and the insolence of a wealthy Roman indulged himself in the cheap amusement of breaking and satisfying the law of the twelve tables. Veracious ran through the streets striking on the face the inoffensive passengers, and his attendant purse-bearer immediately silenced their clamours by the legal tender of twenty-five pieces of copper, about the value of one shilling. The equity of the praetors examined and estimated the distinct merits of each particular complaint. In the adjudication of civil damages, the magistrate assumed a right to consider the various circumstances of time and place, of age and dignity, which may aggravate the shame and sufferings of the injured person, but, if he admitted the idea of a fine, a punishment, an example, he invaded the province, though, perhaps, he supplied the defects of the criminal law. The execution of the Alban dictator, who was dismembered by eight horses, is represented by Livy as the first and the last instance of Roman cruelty in the punishment of the most atrocious crimes. But this act of justice, or revenge, was inflicted on a foreign enemy in the heat of victory, and at the command of a single man. The twelve tables afford a more decisive proof of the national spirit, since they were framed by the wisest of the Senate, and accepted by the free voices of the people, yet these laws, like the statutes of Draco, 104 are written in characters of blood. They approve the inhuman and unequal principle of retaliation, and the forfeit of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a limb for a limb, is rigorously exacted, unless the offender can redeem his pardon by a fine of three hundred pounds of copper. 
the Decemvirs distributed with much liberality the slighter chastisements of flagellation and servitude, and nine crimes of a very different complexion are adjudged worthy of death. 1. Any act of treason against the state, or of correspondence with the public enemy. The mode of execution was painful and ignominious. The head of the degenerate Roman was shrouded in a veil. His hands were tied behind his back, and, after he had been scourged by the lictor, he was suspended in the midst of the forum on a cross, or in auspicious tree. 2. Nocturnal meetings in the city, whatever might be the pretense of pleasure, or religion, or the public good. 3. The murder of a citizen, for which the common feelings of mankind demand the blood of the murderer. Poison is still more odious than the sword or dagger, and we are surprised to discover, in two flagitious events, how early such subtle wickedness had infected the simplicity of the republic and the chaste virtue of the Roman matrons. The parricide who violated the duties of nature and gratitude was cast into the river or the sea, enclosed in a sack, and a cock, a viper, a dog, and a monkey, were successively added as the most suitable companions. Italy produces no monkeys, but the want could never be felt, till the middle of the sixth century first revealed the guilt of a parricide. 4. The malice of an incendiary. After the previous ceremony of whipping, he himself was delivered to the flames, and in this example alone our reason is tempted to applaud the justice of retaliation. 5. Judicial perjury. The corrupt or malicious witness was thrown headlong from the Tarpeian rock to expiate his falsehood, which was rendered still more fatal by the severity of the penal laws and the deficiency of written evidence. 6. The corruption of a judge who accepted bribes to pronounce an iniquitous sentence. 7. Libels and satires, whose rude strains sometimes disturbed the peace of an illiterate city. The author was beaten with clubs, a worthy chastisement, but it is not certain that he was left to expire under the blows of the executioner. 8. The nocturnal mischief of damaging or destroying a neighbor's corn. The criminal was suspended as a grateful victim to Sears. But the sylvan deities were less implacable and the extirpation of a more valuable tree was compensated by the moderate fine of twenty-five pounds of copper. 9. Magical incantations, which had power, in the opinion of the Latin shepherds, to exhaust the strength of an enemy, to extinguish his life, and to remove from their seats his deep-rooted plantations. The cruelty of the twelve tables against insolvent debtors still remains to be told and I shall dare to prefer the literal sense of antiquity to the specious refinements of modern criticism. After the judicial proof or confession of the debt, thirty days of grace were allowed before a Roman was delivered into the power of his fellow citizen. In this private prison, twelve ounces of rice were his daily food, he might be bound with a chain of fifteen pounds weight, and his misery was thrice exposed in the marketplace to solicit the compassion of his friends and countrymen. At the expiration of thirty days, the debt was discharged by the loss of liberty or life, the insolvent debtor was either put to death or sold in foreign slavery beyond the Tiber, but, if several creditors were alike obstinate and unrelenting, they might legally dismember his body, and satiate their revenge by this horrid partition. The advocates for this savage law have insisted that it must strongly operate in deterring idleness and fraud from contracting debts which they were unable to discharge, but experience would dissipate this salutary terror, by proving that no creditor could be found to exact this unprofitable penalty of life or limb. As the manners of Rome were insensibly polished, the criminal code of the Decemvirs was abolished by the humanity of accusers, witnesses, and judges and impunity became the consequence of immoderate rigor. The Porcine and Valerian laws prohibited the magistrates from inflicting on a free citizen any capital, or even corporal punishment, and the obsolete statutes of blood were artfully, and perhaps truly, ascribed to the spirit, not of patrician, but of regal, tyranny. In the absence of penal laws and the insufficiency of civil actions, the peace and justice of the city were imperfectly maintained by the private jurisdiction of the citizens. The malefactors who replenish our jail are the outcasts of society, 
and the crimes for which they suffer may be commonly ascribed to ignorance, poverty, and brutal appetite. For the perpetration of similar enormities, a vile plebeian might claim and abuse the sacred character of a member of the Republic, but, on the proof or suspicion of guilt, the slave or the stranger was nailed to a cross, and this strict and summary justice might be exercised without restraint over the greatest part of the populace of Rome. Each family contained a domestic tribunal, which was not confined, like that of the praetor, to the cognizance of external actions, virtuous principles and habits were inculcated by the discipline of education, and the Roman father was accountable to the state for the manners of his children, since he disposed, without appeal, of their life, their liberty, and their inheritance. In some pressing emergencies, the citizen was authorized to avenge his private or public wrongs. The consent of the Jewish, the Athenian, and the Roman laws, approved the slaughter of the nocturnal thief, though in open daylight a robber could not be slain without some previous evidence of danger and complaint. Whoever surprised an adulterer in his nuptial bed might freely exercise his revenge semicolon 109 the most bloody or wanton outrage was excused by the provocation, nor was it before the reign of Augustus that the husband was reduced to weigh the rank of the offender, or that the parent was condemned to sacrifice his daughter with her guilty seducer. After the expulsion of the kings, the ambitious Roman who should dare to assume their title or imitate their tyranny was devoted to the infernal gods, each of his fellow citizens was armed with a sword of justice, and the act of Brutus, however repugnant to gratitude or prudence, had been already sanctified by the judgment of his country. The barbarous practice of wearing arms in the midst of peace, 111 and the bloody maxims of honor, were unknown to the Romans, and, during the two purest ages, from the establishment of equal freedom to the end of the Punic Wars, the city was never disturbed by sedition, and rarely polluted with atrocious crimes. The failure of penal laws was more sensibly felt when every vice was inflamed by faction at home and dominion abroad. In the time of Cicero, each private citizen enjoyed the privilege of anarchy, each minister of the Republic was exalted to the temptations of regal power, and their virtues are entitled to the warmest praise as the spontaneous fruits of nature or philosophy. After a triennial indulgence of lust, rapine, and cruelty, the heirs, the tyrant of Sicily, could only be sued for the pecuniary restitution of three hundred thousand pounds sterling, and such was the temper of the laws, the judges, and perhaps the accuser himself, comma one hundred and twelve that on refunding a thirteenth part of his plunder, the heirs could retire to an easy and luxurious exile. The first imperfect attempt to restore the proportion of crimes and punishments was made by the dictator Scylla, who, in the midst of his sanguinary triumph, aspired to restrain the license, rather than to oppress the liberty, of the Romans. He gloried in the arbitrary prescription of four thousand seven hundred citizens. But in the character of a legislator he respected the prejudices of the times, and, instead of pronouncing a sentence of death against the robber or assassin, the general who betrayed an army, or the magistrate who ruined a province, Scylla was content to aggravate the pecuniary damages by the penalty of exile, or, in more constitutional language, by the interdiction of fire and water. The Cornelian, and afterwards the Pompeian and Julian laws introduced a new system of criminal jurisprudence, and the emperors, from Augustus to Justinian, disguised their increasing rigor under the names of the original authors. But the invention and frequent use of extraordinary pains proceeded from the desire to extend and conceal the progress of despotism. In the condemnation of illustrious Romans the Senate was always prepared to confound, at the will of their masters, the judicial and legislative powers. It was the duty of the governors to maintain the peace of their province by the arbitrary and rigid administration of justice, the freedom of the city evaporated in the extent of empire, and the Spanish malefactor who claimed the privilege of a Roman was elevated by the command of Galba on a fairer and more lofty cross. Occasional rescripts issued from the throne to decide the questions which, by their novelty or importance, appeared to surpass the authority and discernment of a proconsul. 
transportation and beheading were reserved for honorable persons, meaner criminals were either hanged or burned, or buried in the mines, or exposed to the wild beasts of the amphitheater. Armed robbers were pursued and extirpated as the enemies of society. The driving away horses or cattle was made a capital offense semicolon 116 but simple theft was uniformly considered as a mere civil and private injury. The degrees of guilt and the modes of punishment were too often determined by the discretion of the rulers, and the subject was left in ignorance of the legal danger which he might incur by every action of his life. A sin, a vice, a crime, are the objects of theology, ethics and jurisprudence. Whenever their judgments agree, they corroborate each other, but, as often as they differ, a prudent legislator appreciates the guilt and punishment according to the measure of social injury. On this principle, the most daring attack on the life and property of a private citizen is judged less atrocious than the crime of treason or rebellion, which invades the majesty of the republic. The obsequious civilians unanimously pronounced that the republic is contained in the person of its chief, and the edge of the Julian law was sharpened by the incessant diligence of the emperors. The licentious commerce of the sexes may be tolerated as an impulse of nature, or forbidden as a source of disorder and corruption, but the fame, the fortunes, the family of the husband are seriously injured by the adultery of the wife. The wisdom of Augustus after curbing the freedom of revenge, applied to this domestic offence the animadversion of the laws, and the guilty parties, after the payment of heavy forfeitures and fines, were condemned to long or perpetual exile in two separate islands. Religion pronounces an equal censure against the infidelity of the husband, but, as it is not accompanied by the same civil effects, the wife was never permitted to vindicate her wrongs semicolon 118 in the distinction of simple or double adultery, so familiar and so important in the canon law, is unknown to the jurisprudence of the code and pandects. I touch with reluctance, and dispatch with impatience, a more odious vice, of which modesty rejects the name, and nature abominates the idea. The primitive Romans were infected by the example of the Etruscans and Greeks semicolon 119 in the mad abuse of prosperity and power, every pleasure that is innocent was deemed insipid, and the Scantinian law comma 120 which had been extorted by an act of violence, was insensibly abolished by the lapse of time and the multitude of criminals. By this law, the rape, perhaps the seduction, of an ingenuous youth was compensated as a personal injury, by the poor damages of ten thousand cestuses, or four score pounds, the ravisher might be slain by the resistance or revenge of chastity, and I wish to believe that at Rome, as in Athens, the voluntary and effeminate deserter of his sex was degraded from the honours and the rights of a citizen. But the practice of vice was not discouraged by the severity of opinion. The indelible stain of manhood was confounded with the more venial transgressions of fornication and adultery, nor was the licentious lover exposed to the same dishonor which he impressed on the male or female partner of his guilt. From Catullus to Juvenal, the poets accuse and celebrate the degeneracy of the times, and the reformation of manners was feebly attempted by the reason and authority of the civilians till the most virtuous of the Cheskars prescribed the sin against nature as a crime against society. A new spirit of legislation, respectable even in its error, arose in the empire with the religion of Constantine. The laws of Moses were received as the divine original of justice, and the Christian princes adapted their penal statutes to the degrees of moral and religious turpitude. Adultery was first declared to be a capital offence, the frailty of the sexes was assimilated to poison or assassination, to sorcery or parricide, the same penalties were inflicted on the passive and active guilt of pederasty, and all criminals of free and servile condition were either drowned or beheaded, or cast alive into the avenging flames. The adulterers were spared by the common sympathy of mankind, but the lovers of their own sex were pursued by general and pious indignation. The impure manners of Greece still prevailed in the cities of Asia, and every vice was fermented by the celibacy of the monks and clergy. Justinian relaxed the punishment at least of female infidelity, 
the guilty spouse was only condemned to solitude and penance, and at the end of two years she might be recalled to the arms of a forgiving husband. But the same emperor declared himself the implacable enemy of unmanly lust, and the cruelty of his persecution can scarcely be excused by the purity of his motives. In defiance of every principle of justice, he stretched to past as well as future offences the operations of his edicts, with the previous allowance of a short respite for confession and pardon. A painful death was inflicted by the amputation of the sinful instrument, or the insertion of sharp reeds into the pores and tubes of most exquisite sensibility, and Justinian defended the propriety of the execution, since the criminals would have lost their hands, had they been convicted of sacrilege. In this state of disgrace and agony, two bishops, Isaiah of Rhodes and Alexander of Diospolis, were dragged through the streets of Constantinople, while their brethren were admonished, by the voice of a crier, to observe this awful lesson, and not to pollute the sanctity of their character. Perhaps these prelates were innocent. A sentence of death and infamy was often founded on the slight and suspicious evidence of a child or a servant, the guilt of the green faction, of the rich, and of the enemies of Theodora, was presumed by the judges, and pederasty became the crime of those to whom no crime could be imputed. A French philosopher has dared to remark that whatever is secret must be doubtful, and that our natural horror of vice may be abused as an engine of tyranny. But the favourable persuasion of the same writer, that a legislator may confide in the taste and reason of mankind, is impeached by the unwelcome discovery of the antiquity and extent of the disease. The free citizens of Athens and Rome enjoyed, in all criminal cases, the invaluable privilege of being tried by their country. 1. The administration of justice is the most ancient office of a prince, it was exercised by the Roman kings, and abused by Tarquin, who alone, without law or counsel, pronounced his arbitrary judgments. The first consul succeeded to this regal prerogative, but the sacred right of appeal soon abolished the jurisdiction of the magistrates, and all public causes were decided by the supreme tribunal of the people. But a wild democracy, superior to the forms, too often disdains the essential principles, of justice, the pride of despotism was envenomed by plebeian envy. And the heroes of Athens might sometimes applaud the happiness of the Persian, whose fate depended on the caprice of a single tyrant. Some salutary restraints, imposed by the people on their own passions, were at once the cause and effect of the gravity and temperance of the Romans. The right of accusation was confined to the magistrates. A vote of the thirty-five tribes could inflict a fine, but the cognizance of all capital crimes was reserved by a fundamental law to the assembly of the centuries, in which the weight of influence and property was sure to preponderate. Repeated proclamations and adjournments were interposed to allow time for prejudice and resentment to subside. The whole proceeding might be annulled by a seasonable omen, or the opposition of a tribune, and such popular trials were commonly less formidable to innocence than they were favorable to guilt. But this union of the judicial and legislative powers, left it doubtful whether the accused party was pardoned or acquitted, and, in the defense of an illustrious client, the orators of Rome and Athens address their arguments to the policy and benevolence, as well as to the justice, of their sovereign. 2. The task of convening the citizens for the trial of each offender became more difficult, as the citizens and the offenders continually multiplied, and the ready expedient was adopted of delegating the jurisdiction of the people to the ordinary magistrates, or to extraordinary inquisitors. In the first ages these questions were rare and occasional. In the beginning of the seventh century of Rome they were made perpetual, four praetors were annually empowered to sit in judgment on the state offences of treason, extortion, peculation, and bribery, and Silu added new praetors and new questions for those crimes which more directly injure the safety of individuals. By these inquisitors the trial was prepared and directed but they could only pronounce the sentence of the majority of judges, who, with some truth and more prejudice, have been compared to the English juries. To discharge this important though burthensome office, 
An annual list of ancient and respectable citizens was formed by the praetor. After many constitutional struggles, they were chosen in equal numbers from the Senate, the Equestrian Order, and the people, 450 were appointed for single questions, and the various roles or decuries of judges must have contained the names of some thousand Romans, who represented the judicial authority of the state. In each particular cause, a sufficient number was drawn from the urn, their integrity was guarded by an oath, the mode of ballot secured their independence, the suspicion of partiality was removed by the mutual challenges of the accuser and defendant, and the judges of Milo, by the retrenchment of fifteen on each side, were reduced to fifty-one voices or tablets, of acquittal, of condemnation, or of favorable doubt. 3. In his civil jurisdiction, the praetor of the city was truly a judge, and almost a legislator, but, as soon as he had prescribed the action of law, he often referred to a delegate the determination of the fact. With the increase of legal proceedings, the tribunal of the centumvirs, in which he presided, acquired more weight and reputation. But, whether he acted alone or with the advice of his counsel, the most absolute powers might be trusted to a magistrate who was annually chosen by the votes of the people. The rules and precautions of freedom have required some explanation, the order of despotism is simple and inanimate. Before the age of Justinian, or perhaps of Diocletian, the decuries of Roman judges had sunk to an empty title, the humble advice of the assessors might be accepted or despised and in each tribunal the civil and criminal jurisdiction was administered by a single magistrate, who was raised and disgraced by the will of the emperor. A Roman accused of any capital crime might prevent the sentence of the law by voluntary exile, or death. Till his guilt had been legally proved, his innocence was presumed, and his person was free, till the votes of the last century had been counted and declared, he might peaceably secede to any of the allied cities of Italy or Greece, or Asia. His fame and fortunes were preserved, at least to his children, by this civil death, and he might still be happy in every rational and sensual enjoyment, if a mind accustomed to the ambitious tumult of Rome could support the uniformity and silence of Rhodes or Athens. A bolder effort was required to escape from the tyranny of the Caesars, but this effort was rendered familiar by the maxims of the Stoic, the example of the bravest Romans, and the legal encouragements of suicide. The bodies of condemned criminals were exposed to public ignominy, and their children, a more serious evil, were reduced to poverty by the confiscation of their fortunes. But, if the victims of Tiberius and Nero anticipated the decree of the prince or senate, their courage and dispatch were recompensed by the applause of the public, the decent honours of burial, and the validity of their testaments. The exquisite avarice and cruelty of Domitian appears to have deprived the unfortunate of this last consolation, and it was still denied even by the clemency of the Antonines. A voluntary death, which, in the case of a capital offence, intervened between the accusation and the sentence, was admitted as a confession of guilt, and the spoils of the deceased were seized by the inhuman claims of the treasury. Yet the civilians have always respected the natural right of a citizen to dispose of his life, and the posthumous disgrace invented by Tarquin 126 to check the despair of his subjects was never revived or imitated by succeeding tyrants. The powers of this world have indeed lost their dominion over him who is resolved on death, and his arm can only be restrained by the religious apprehension of a future state. Suicides are enumerated by Virgil among the unfortunate rather than the guilty semicolon 127 and the poetical fables of the infernal shades could not seriously influence the faith or practice of mankind. But the precepts of the gospel, or the church, have at length imposed a pious servitude on the minds of Christians, and condemn them to expect, without a murmur, the last stroke of disease or the execution adopt the penal statutes form a very small proportion of the sixty-two books of the code and band acts, and, in all judicial proceeding, the life or death of a citizen is determined with less caution and delay than the most ordinary question of covenant or inheritance. This singular distinction, 
though something may be allowed for the urgent necessity of defending the peace of society, is derived from the nature of criminal and civil jurisprudence. Our duties to the state are simple and uniform, the law by which he is condemned is inscribed not only on brass and marble but on the conscience of the offender, and his guilt is commonly proved by the testimony of a single fact. But our relations to each other are various and infinite, our obligations are created, annulled, and modified, by injuries, benefits, and promises, and the interpretation of voluntary contracts and testaments, which are often dictated by fraud or ignorance, affords a long and laborious exercise to the sagacity of the judge. The business of life is multiplied by the extent of commerce and dominion, and the residence of the parties in the distant provinces of an empire is productive of doubt, delay, and inevitable appeals from the local to the supreme magistrate. Justinian, the Greek emperor of Constantinople and the East, was the legal successor of the Latian shepherd who had planted a colony on the banks of the Tiber. In a period of thirteen hundred years, the laws had reluctantly followed the changes of government and manners, and the laudable desire of conciliating ancient names with recent institutions destroyed the harmony, and swelled the magnitude, of the obscure and irregular system. The laws which excuse on any occasion the ignorance of their subjects confess their own imperfections, the civil jurisprudence, as it was abridged by Justinian, still continued a mysterious science and a profitable trade, and the innate perplexity of the study was involved in tenfold darkness by the private industry of the practitioners. The expense of the pursuit sometimes exceeded the value of the prize, and the fairer stripes were abandoned by the poverty or prudence of the claimants. Such costly justice might tend to abate the spirit of litigation, but the unequal pressure serves only to increase the influence of the rich and to aggravate the misery of the poor. By these dilatory and expensive proceedings, the wealthy pleader obtains a more certain advantage than he could hope from the accidental corruption of his judge. The experience of an abuse from which our own age and country are not perfectly exempt may sometimes provoke a generous indignation and extort the hasty wish of exchanging our elaborate jurisprudence for the simple and summary decrees of a Turkish Kadi. Our calmer reflection will suggest that such forms and delays are necessary to guard the person and property of the citizen, that the discretion of the judge is the first engine of tyranny, and that the laws of a free people should foresee and determine every question that may probably arise in the exercise of power and the transactions of industry but the government of Justinian united the evils of liberty and servitude, and the Romans were oppressed at the same time by the multiplicity of their laws and the arbitrary will of their master. Train of the younger Justin Middle. Embassy of the Avars Middle. Their settlement on the Danube Middle. Conquest of Italy by the Lombards Middle. Adoption and reign of Tiberius Middle. Of Morris Middle. State of Italy under the Lombards and the Exarchs of Ravenna Middle. Distress of Rome Middle. Character and pontificate of Gregory I Middle. The saviour of Rome during Justinian's last year years, his infirm mind was devoted to heavenly contemplation, and he neglected the business of the lower world. His subjects were impatient of the long continuance of his life and reign, yet all who were capable of reflection apprehended the moment of his death, which might involve the capital in tumult and the empire in civil war. Seven nephews of the childless monarch, the sons or grandsons of his brother and sister, had been educated in the splendor of a princely fortune, they had been shown in high commands to the provinces and armies, their characters were known, their followers were zealous, and, as the jealousy of age postponed the declaration of a successor, they might expect with equal hopes the inheritance of their uncle. He expired in his palace, after a reign of thirty-eight years, and the decisive opportunity was embraced by the friends of Justin the son of Vigilantia. At the hour of midnight his domestics were awakened by an importunate crowd, who thundered at his door, and obtained admittance by revealing themselves to be the principal members of the senate. These welcome deputies announced the recent and momentous secret of the emperor's decease, reported, or perhaps invented, his dying choice of the best beloved and most deserving of his nephews, and conjured Justin to prevent the disorders of the multitude, if they should perceive, 
with the return of light, that they were left without a master. After composing his countenance to surprise, sorrow, and decent modesty, Justin, by the advice of his wife Sophia, submitted to the authority of the Senate. He was conducted with speed and silence to the palace, the guards saluted their new sovereign, and the martial and religious rites of his coronation were diligently accomplished. By the hands of the proper officers he was invested with the imperial garments, the red buskins, white tunic, and purple robe. A fortunate soldier, whom he instantly promoted to the rank of tribune, encircled his neck with a military collar, four robust youths exalted him on a shield, he stood firm and erect to receive the adoration of his subjects, and their choice was sanctified by the benediction of the patriarch, who imposed the diadem on the head of an orthodox prince. The hippodrome was already filled with innumerable multitudes, and no sooner did the emperor appear on his throne than the voices of the blue and the green factions were confounded in the same loyal acclamations. In the speeches which Justin addressed to the senate and people, he promised to correct the abuses which had disgraced the age of his predecessor, displayed the maxims of a just and beneficent government, and declared that, on the approaching calends of January, two, he would revive in his own person the name and liberality of a Roman consul. The immediate discharge of his uncle's debts exhibited a solid pledge of his faith and generosity, a train of porters laden with bags of gold advanced into the midst of the Hippodrome, and the hopeless creditors of Justinian accepted this equitable payment as a voluntary gift. Before the end of three years his example was imitated and surpassed by the Empress Sophia, who delivered many indigent citizens from the weight of debt and usury, an act of benevolence the best entitled to gratitude, since it relieves the most intolerable distress, but in which the bounty of a prince is the most liable to be abused by the claims of prodigality and fraud. On the seventh day of his reign, Justin gave audience to the ambassadors of the Avars, and the scene was decorated to impress the barbarians with astonishment, veneration, and terror. From the palace gate, the spacious courts and long porticos were lined with the lofty crests and gilt bucklers of the guards, who presented their spears and axes with more confidence than they would have shown in a field of battle. The officers who exercised the power, or attended the person, of the prince were attired in their richest habits and arranged according to the military and civil order of the hierarchy. When the veil of the sanctuary was withdrawn, the ambassadors beheld the emperor of the east on his throne, beneath a canopy or dome, which was supported by four columns and crowned with a winged figure of victory. In the first emotions of surprise, they submitted to the servile adoration of the Byzantine court, but, as soon as they rose from the ground, Targetius, the chief of the embassy, expressed the freedom and pride of a barbarian. He extolled, by the tongue of his interpreter, the greatness of the Shagan, by whose clemency the kingdoms of the south were permitted to exist, whose victorious subjects had traversed the frozen rivers of Scythia, and who now covered the banks of the Danube with innumerable tents. The late emperor had cultivated, with annual and costly gifts, the friendship of a grateful monarch, and the enemies of Rome had respected the allies of the Avars. The same prudence would instruct the nephew of Justinian to imitate the liberality of his uncle, and to purchase the blessings of peace from an invincible people, who delighted and excelled in the exercise of war. The reply of the emperor was delivered in the same strain of haughty defiance, and he derived his confidence from the God of the Christians, the ancient glory of Rome, and the recent triumphs of Justinian. The empire, said he, abounds with men and horses, and arms sufficient to defend our frontiers and to chastise the barbarians. You offer aid, you threaten hostilities, we despise your enmity and your aid. The conquerors of the Avars solicit our alliance, shall we dread their fugitives and exiles? Question mark for the bounty of our uncle was granted to your misery, to your humble prayers. From us you shall receive a more important obligation, the knowledge of your own weakness. Retire from our presence, the lives of ambassadors are safe, and, if you return to implore our pardon, perhaps you will taste of our benevolence. 5 On the report of his ambassadors, the Shagan was awed by the apparent firmness of a Roman emperor, 
of whose character and resources he was ignorant. Instead of executing his threats against the Eastern Empire, he marched into the poor and savage countries of Germany, which were subject to the dominion of the Franks. After two doubtful battles he consented to retire, and the Austrasian king relieved the distress of his camp with an immediate supply of corn and cattle. Such repeated disappointments had chilled the spirit of the Avars, and their power would have dissolved away in the Sarmatian desert, if the alliance of Alboin, king of the Lombards, had not given a new object to their arms, and a lasting settlement to their wearied fortunes. While Alboin served under his father's standard, he encountered in battle, and transpierced with his lance, the rival prince of the Jepide. The Lombards, who applauded such early prowess, requested his father with unanimous acclamations that the heroic youth, who had shared the dangers of the field, might be admitted to the feast of victory. You are not unmindful, replied the inflexible Ordoin, of the wise customs of our ancestors. Whatever may be his merit, a prince is incapable of sitting at table with his father till he has received his arms from a foreign and royal hand. Alboin bowed with reverence to the institutions of his country, selected forty companions, and boldly visited the court of Trajond king of the Jepide, who embraced and entertained, according to the laws of hospitality, the murderer of his son. At the banquet, whilst Alboin occupied the seat of the youth whom he had slain, a tender remembrance arose in the mind of Trajond. How dear is that place how hateful is that person! were the words that escaped, with a sigh, from the indignant father. His grief exasperated the national resentment of the Jepide, and Cunimund, his surviving son, was provoked by wine, or fraternal affection, to the desire of vengeance. The Lombards, said the rude barbarian, resemble, in figure and in smell, the mares of our Sarmatian plains. And this insult was a coarse allusion to the white bands which enveloped their legs. Add another resemblance, replied an audacious Lombard, you have felt how strongly they kick. Visit the plain of Asfeld, and seek for the bones of thy brother, they are mingled with those of the vilest animals. The Jepide, a nation of warriors, started from their seats, and the fearless Alboin, with his forty companions, laid their hands on their swords. The tumult was appeased by the venerable interposition of Trijund. He saved his own honour, and the life of his guest, and, after the solemn rites of investiture, dismissed the stranger in the bloody arms of his son, the gift of a weeping parent. Alboin returned in triumph, and the Lombards, who celebrated his matchless intrepidity, were compelled to praise the virtues of an enemy. In this extraordinary visit he had probably seen the daughter of Cunimund, who soon after ascended the throne of the Jepide. Her name was Rosamond, an appellation expressive of female beauty, and which our own history or romance has consecrated to amorous tales. The king of the Lombards, the father of all boy no longer lived, was contracted to the granddaughter of Clovis, but the restraints of faith and policy soon yielded to the hope of possessing the fair Rosamond, and of insulting her family and nation. The arts of persuasion were tried without success and the impatient lover, by force and stratagem, obtained the object of his desires. War was the conquest which he foresaw and solicited, but the Lombards could not long withstand the furious assault of the Jepide, who were sustained by a Roman army. And, as the offer of marriage was rejected with contempt, Alboin was compelled to relinquish his prey, and to partake of the disgrace which he had inflicted on the house of Cunimund. When a public quarrel is envenomed by private injuries, a blow that is not mortal or decisive can be productive only of a short truce, which allows the unsuccessful combatant to sharpen his arms for a new encounter. The strength of Alboin had been found unequal to the gratification of his love, ambition, and revenge, he condescended to implore the formidable aid of the Shagan, and the arguments that he employed are expressive of the art and policy of the barbarians. In the attack of the Jepide he had been prompted by the just desire of extirpating a people whom their alliance with the Roman Empire had rendered the common enemies of the nations and the personal adversaries of the Shagan. If the forces of the Avars and the Lombards should unite in this glorious quarrel, the victory was secure.
and the reward inestimable, the Danube, the Hebrus, Italy, and Constantinople would be exposed, without a barrier, to their invincible arms. But, if they hesitated or delayed to prevent the malice of the Romans, the same spirit which had insulted, would pursue the Avars to the extremity of the earth. These specious reasons were heard by the Shagan with coldness and disdain, he detained the Lombard ambassadors in his camp, protracted the negotiation, and by turns alleged his want of inclination, or his want of ability, to undertake this important enterprise. At length he signified the ultimate price of his alliance, that the Lombards should immediately present him with the tithe of their cattle, that the spoils and captives should be equally divided, but that the lands of the Jepide should become the sole patrimony of the Avars. Such hard conditions were eagerly accepted by the passions of all Boyne, and, as the Romans were dissatisfied with the ingratitude and perfidy of the Jepide, Justin abandoned that incorrigible people to their fate, and remained the tranquil spectator of this unequal conflict. The despair of Cunimon was active and dangerous. He was informed that the Avars had entered his confines, but on the strong assurance that, after the defeat of the Lombards, these foreign invaders would easily be repelled, he rushed forwards to encounter the implacable enemy of his name and family. But the courage of the Jepide could secure him no more than an honourable death. The bravest of the nation fell in the field of battle, the king of the Lombards contemplated with delight the head of Cunimund, and his skull was fashioned into a cup to satiate the hatred of the conqueror, or, perhaps, to comply with the savage custom of his country. After this victory no farther obstacle could impede the progress of the confederates, and they faithfully executed the terms of their agreement. The fair countries of Wallachia, Moldavia, Transylvania, and the parts of Hungary beyond the Danube, were occupied, without resistance, by a new colony of Scythians, and the Dacian Empire of the Shugans subsisted with splendor above 230 years. The nation of the Jepide was dissolved, but, in the distribution of the captives, the slaves of the Avars were less fortunate than the companions of the Lombards, whose generosity adopted a valiant foe, and whose freedom was incompatible with cool and deliberate tyranny. One moiety of the spoil introduced into the camp of Alboin more wealth than a barbarian could readily compute. The fair Rosamond was persuaded or compelled to acknowledge the rights of her victorious lover and the daughter of Cunimund appeared to forgive those crimes which might be imputed to her own irresistible charms. The destruction of a mighty kingdom established the fame of all Boyne. In the days of Charlemagne, the Bavarians, the Saxons, and the other tribes of the Teutonic language, still repeated the songs which described the heroic virtues, the valour, liberality, and fortune of the king of the Lombards. But his ambition was yet unsatisfied and the conqueror of the Jepide turned his eyes from the Danube to the richer banks of the Po and the Tiber. Fifteen years had not elapsed since his subjects, the confederates of Narses, had visited the pleasant climate of Italy, the mountains, the rivers, the highways, were familiar to their memory, the report of their success. Perhaps the view of their spoils, had kindled in the rising generation the flame of emulation and enterprise. Their hopes were encouraged by the spirit and eloquence of all Boyne, and it is affirmed that he spoke to their senses by producing, at the royal feast, the fairest and most exquisite fruits that grew spontaneously in the garden of the world. No sooner had he erected his standard than the native strength of the Lombards was multiplied by the adventurous youth of Germany and Scythia. The robust peasantry of Noricum and Pannonia had resumed the manners of barbarians, and the names of the Jepide, Bulgarians, Sarmatians, and Bavarians, may be distinctly traced in the provinces of Italy. Of the Saxons, the old allies of the Lombards, twenty thousand warriors, with their wives and children, accepted the invitation of Alboin. Their bravery contributed to his success but the accession or the absence of their numbers was not sensibly felt in the magnitude of his host. Every mode of religion was freely practised by its respective votaries. The king of the Lombards had been educated in the Arian heresy, but the Catholics, in their public worship, were allowed to pray for his conversion, 
while the more stubborn barbarians sacrificed a she-goat, or perhaps a captive, to the gods of their fathers. The Lombards and their confederates were united by their common attachment to a chief, who excelled in all the virtues and vices of a savage hero, and the vigilance of all Boyne provided an ample magazine of offensive and defensive arms for the use of the expedition. The portable wealth of the Lombards attended the march, their lands they cheerfully relinquished to the Avars, on the solemn promise, which was made and accepted without a smile, that, if they failed in the conquest of Italy, these voluntary exiles should be reinstated in their former possessions. They might have failed, if Narses had been the antagonist of the Lombards, and the veteran warriors, the associates of his Gothic victory would have encountered with reluctance an enemy whom they dreaded and esteemed. But the weakness of the Byzantine court was subservient to the barbarian cause, and it was for the ruin of Italy that the emperor once listened to the complaints of his subjects. The virtues of Narses were stained with avarice, and in his provincial reign of fifteen years he accumulated a treasure of gold and silver which surpassed the modesty of a private fortune. His government was oppressive or unpopular, and the general discontent was expressed with freedom by the deputies of Rome. Before the throne of Justin they boldly declared that their Gothic servitude had been more tolerable than the despotism of a Greek eunuch, and that, unless their tyrant were instantly removed, they would consult their own happiness in the choice of a master. The apprehension of a revolt was urged by the voice of envy and detraction, which had so recently triumphed over the merit of Belisarius. A new exarch, Longinus, was appointed to supersede the conqueror of Italy, and the base motives of his recall were revealed in the insulting mandate of the Empress Sophia, that he should leave to men the exercise of arms, and return to his proper station among the maidens of the palace, where a distaff should be again placed in the hand of the eunuch. I will spin her such a thread, as she shall not easily unravel is said to have been the reply which indignation and conscious virtue extorted from the hero. Instead of attending, a slave and a victim, at the gate of the Byzantine palace, he retired to Naples, from whence, if any credit is due to the belief of the times, Narses invited the Lombards to chastise the ingratitude of the prince and people. But the passions of the people are furious and changeable, and the Romans soon recollected the merits or dreaded the resentment, of their victorious general. By the mediation of the Pope, who undertook a special pilgrimage to Naples, their repentance was accepted, and Narses, assuming a milder aspect and a more dutiful language, consented to fix his residence in the capital. His death, comma 12 though in the extreme period of old age, was unseasonable and premature, since his genius alone could have repaired the last and fatal error of his life. The reality, or the suspicion, of a conspiracy disarmed and disunited the Italians. The soldiers resented the disgrace, and bewailed the loss, of their general. They were ignorant of their new exarch, and Longinus was himself ignorant of the state of the army and the province. In the preceding years, Italy had been desolated by pestilence and famine, and a disaffected people ascribed the calamities of nature to the guilt or folly of their rulers. Whatever might be the grounds of his security, all boy neither expected nor encountered a Roman army in the field. He ascended the Julian Alps, and looked down with contempt and desire on the fruitful plains to which his victory communicated the perpetual appellation of Lombardy. A faithful chieftain and a select band were stationed at Forum Julii, the modern Friuli to guard the passes of the mountains. The Lombards respected the strength of Pavia, and listened to the prayers of the Trevisants, their slow and heavy multitudes proceeded to occupy the palace and city of Verona, and Milan, now rising from her ashes, was invested by the powers of Alboin five months after his departure from Pannonia. Terror preceded his march, he found everywhere, or he left, a dreary solitude, and the pusillanimous Italians presumed, without a trial, that the stranger was invincible. Escaping to lakes, or rocks, or morasses, the affrighted crowds concealed some fragments of their wealth, and delayed the moment of their servitude. Paulinus, the patriarch of Aquileia, removed his treasures, sacred and profane, 
to the Isle of Grado, 14 and his successors were adopted by the Infant Republic of Venice, which was continually enriched by the public calamities. Honoratus, who filled the chair of St. Ambrose, had credulously accepted the faithless offers of a capitulation, and the Archbishop, with the clergy and nobles of Milan, were driven by the perfidy of all born to seek a refuge in the less accessible ramparts of Genoa. Along the maritime coast, the courage of the inhabitants was supported by the facility of supply, the hopes of relief, and the power of escape, but, from the Trentine hills to the gates of Ravenna and Rome, the inland regions of Italy became, without a battle or a siege, the lasting patrimony of the Lombards. The submission of the people invited the barbarian to assume the character of a lawful sovereign, and the helpless exarch was confined to the office of announcing to the emperor just in the rapid and irretrievable loss of his provinces and cities. One city, which had been diligently fortified by the Goths, resisted the arms of a new invader, and, while Italy was subdued by the flying detachments of the Lombards, the royal camp was fixed above three years before the western gate of Ticinum, or Pavia. The same courage which obtains the esteem of a civilized enemy provokes the fury of a savage, and the impatient besieger had bound himself by a tremendous oath that age, and sex, and dignity should be confounded in a general massacre. The aid of famine at length enabled him to execute his bloody vow, but, as Allborn entered the gate, his horse stumbled, fell, and could not be raised from the ground. One of his attendants was prompted by compassion, or piety, to interpret this miraculous sign of the wrath of heaven, the conqueror paused and relented. He sheathed his sword, and, peacefully reposing himself in the palace of Theodoric, proclaimed to the trembling multitude that they should live and obey. Delighted with the situation of a city which was endeared to his pride by the difficulty of the purchase, the Prince of the Lombards disdained the ancient glories of Milan, and Pavia, during some ages, was respected as the capital of the Kingdom of Italy. The reign of the founder was splendid and transient, and, before he could regulate his new conquests, Allborn fell a sacrifice to domestic treason and female revenge. In a palace near Verona, which had not been erected for the barbarians, he feasted the companions of his arms. Intoxication was the reward of valor, and the king himself was tempted by appetite, or vanity, to exceed the ordinary measure of his intemperance. After draining many capacious bowls of Rhetian or Falernian wine, he called for the skull of Cunimund, the noblest and most precious ornament of his sideboard. The cup of victory was accepted with horrid applause by the circle of the Lombard chiefs. Fill it again with wine, exclaimed the inhuman conqueror fill it to the brim, carry this goblet to the queen, and request, in my name, that she would rejoice with her father. In an agony of grief and rage, Rosamond had strength to utter let the will of my lord be obeyed. And, touching it with her lips, pronounced a silent imprecation, that the insult should be washed away in the blood of all boyne. Some indulgence might be due to the resentment of a daughter, if she had not already violated the duties of a wife. Implacable in her enmity, or inconstant in her love, the Queen of Italy had stooped from the throne to the arms of a subject, and Helmichis, the king's armor-bearer, was the secret minister of her pleasure and revenge. Against the proposal of the murder, he could no longer urge the scruples of fidelity or gratitude, but Helmichis trembled, when he revolved the danger as well as the guilt when he recollected the matchless strength and interrapidity of a warrior whom he had so often attended in the field of battle. He pressed, and obtained, that one of the bravest champions of the Lombards should be associated to the enterprise, but no more than a promise of secrecy could be drawn from the gallant Peridus, and the mode of seduction employed by Rosamond betrays her shameless insensibility both to honor and love. She supplied the place of one of her female attendants who was beloved by Peridus, and contrived some excuse for darkness and silence, till she could inform her companion that he had enjoyed the Queen of the Lombards, and that his own death, or the death of all Boyne, must be the consequence of such treasonable adultery. In this alternative, 
he chose rather to be the accomplice than the victim of Rosamond, 16 whose undaunted spirit was incapable of fear or remorse. She expected and soon found a favorable moment, when the king oppressed with wine had retired from the table to his afternoon slumbers. His faithless spouse was anxious for his health and repose, the gates of the palace were shut, the arms removed, the attendants dismissed, and Rosamond, after lulling him to rest by her tender caresses, unbolted the chamber door, and urged the reluctant conspirators to the instant execution of the deed. On the first alarm, the warrior started from his couch. His sword, which he attempted to draw, had been fastened to the scabbard by the hand of Rosamond, and a small stool, his only weapon, could not long protect him from the spears of the assassins. The daughter of Cunimund smiled in his fall, his body was buried under the staircase of the palace, and the grateful posterity of the Lombards revered the tomb and the memory of their victorious leader. The ambitious Rosamond aspired to reign in the name of her lover, the city and palace of Verona were awed by her power, and a faithful band of her native Jepide was prepared to applaud the revenge, and to second the wishes, of their sovereign. But the Lombard chiefs, who fled in the first moments of consternation and disorder, had resumed their courage and collected their powers, and the nation, instead of submitting to her reign, demanded, with unanimous cries, that justice should be executed on the guilty spouse and the murderers of their king. She sought a refuge among the enemies of her country, and a criminal who deserved the abhorrence of mankind was protected by the selfish policy of the exarch. With her daughter, the heiress of the Lombard throne, her two lovers, her trusty Jepide, and the spoils of the palace of Verona, Rosamond descended the Odige and the Po, and was transported by a Greek vessel to the safe harbor of Ravenna. Longinus beheld with delight the charms and the treasures of the widow of Alboin, her situation and her past conduct might justify the most licentious proposals, and she readily listened to the passion of a minister, who, even in the decline of the empire, was respected as the equal of kings. The death of a jealous lover was an easy and grateful sacrifice, and, as Helmic is issued from the bath, he received the deadly potion from the hand of his mistress. The taste of the liquor, its speedy operation, and his experience of the character of Rosamond, convinced him that he was poisoned. He pointed his dagger to her breast, compelled her to drain the remainder of the cup, and expired in a few minutes, with the consolation that she could not survive to enjoy the fruits of her wickedness. The daughter of Alboin and Rosamond, with the richest spoils of the Lombards, was embarked for Constantinople, the surprising strength of Paradis amused and terrified the imperial court, his blindness and revenge exhibited an imperfect copy of the adventures of Samson. By the free suffrage of the nation, in the assembly of Pavia, Clefo, one of their noblest chiefs, was elected as the successor of Alboin. Before the end of eighteen months, the throne was polluted by a second murder, Clefo was stabbed by the hand of a domestic, the regal office was suspended above ten years, during the minority of his son Autoris, and Italy was divided and oppressed by a ducal aristocracy of thirty tyrants. When the nephew of Justinian ascended the throne, he proclaimed a new era of happiness and glory. The annals of the second Justin are marked with disgrace abroad and misery at home. In the West, the Roman Empire was afflicted by the loss of Italy, the desolation of Africa, and the conquests of the Persians. Injustice prevailed both in the capital and the provinces, the rich trembled for their property, the poor for their safety, the ordinary magistrates were ignorant or venal, the occasional remedies appear to have been arbitrary and violent, and the complaints of the people could no longer be silenced by the splendid names of a legislator and a conqueror. The opinion which imputes to the prince all the calamities of his times may be countenanced by the historian as a serious truth or a salutary prejudice. Yet a candid suspicion will arise that the sentiments of Justin were pure and benevolent, and that he might have filled his station without reproach, if the faculties of his mind had not been impaired by disease, which deprived the emperor of the use of his feet and confined him to the palace a stranger to the complaints of the people and the vices of the government. The tardy knowledge of his own impotence determined him to lay down the weight of the diadem, 
and in the choice of a worthy substitute he showed some symptoms of a discerning and even magnanimous spirit. The only son of Justin and Sophia died in his infancy, their daughter Arabia was the wife of Baduarius, superintendent of the palace, and afterwards commander of the Italian armies, who vainly aspired to confirm the rights of marriage by those of adoption. While the empire appeared an object of desire, Justin was accustomed to behold with jealousy and hatred his brothers and cousins, the rivals of his hopes, nor could he depend on the gratitude of those who would accept the purple as a restitution rather than a gift. Of these competitors, one had been removed by exile, and afterwards by death, and the emperor himself had inflicted such cruel insults on another, that he must either dread his resentment or despise his patience. This domestic animosity was refined into a generous resolution of seeking a successor, not in his family, but in the Republic, and the artful Sophia recommended Tiberius, 17 his faithful captain of the guards, whose virtues and fortune the emperor might cherish as the fruit of his judicious choice. The ceremony of his elevation to the rank of Caesar, or Augustus, was performed in the portico of the palace, in the presence of the patriarch and the senate. Justin collected the remaining strength of his mind and body, but the popular belief that his speech was inspired by the deity betrays a very humble opinion both of the man and of the times. You behold, said the emperor, the ensigns of supreme power. You are about to receive them not from my hand, but from the hand of God. Honor them, and from them you will derive honor. Respect the empress your mother, you are now her son, before, you were her servant. Delight not in blood, abstain from revenge, avoid those actions by which I have incurred the public hatred, and consult the experience rather than the example of your predecessor. As a man, I have sinned, as a sinner, even in this life, I have been severely punished, but these servants, and he pointed to his ministers, who have abused my confidence and inflamed my passions, will appear with me before the tribunal of Christ. I have been dazzled by the splendor of the diadem, be thou wise and modest, remember what you have been, remember what you are. You see around us your slaves and your children, with the authority, assume the tenderness of a parent. Love your people like yourself, cultivate the affections, maintain the discipline, of the army, protect the fortunes of the rich, relieve the necessities of the poor. 19 The Assembly in silence and in tears, applauded the councils, and sympathized with the repentance, of their prince. The patriarch rehearsed the prayers of the church, Tiberius received the diadem on his knees, and Justin, who in his abdication appeared most worthy to reign, addressed the new monarch in the following words, If you consent, I live, if you command, I die, may the God of heaven and earth infuse into your heart whatever I have neglected or forgotten. The four last years of the Emperor Justin were passed in tranquil obscurity, his conscience was no longer tormented by the remembrance of those duties which he was incapable of discharging, and his choice was justified by the filial reverence and gratitude of Tiberius. Among the virtues of Tiberius, his beauty, he was one of the tallest and most comely of the Romans, might introduce him to the favor of Sophia and the widow of Justin was persuaded that she should preserve her station and influence under the reign of a second and more youthful husband. But, if the ambitious candidate had been tempted to flatter and dissemble, it was no longer in his power to fulfill her expectations or his own promise. The factions of the Hippodrome demanded, with some impatience, the name of their new empress, both the people and Sophia were astonished by the proclamation of Anastasia the secret though lawful wife of the Emperor Tiberius. Whatever could alleviate the disappointment of Sophia, imperial honors, a stately palace, a numerous household, was liberally bestowed by the piety of her adopted son, on solemn occasions he attended and consulted the widow of his benefactor, but her ambition disdained the vain semblance of royalty, and the respectful appellation of mother served to exasperate, rather than appease the rage of an injured woman. While she accepted, and repaid with a courtly smile, the fair expressions of regard and confidence, a secret alliance was concluded between the Diger Empress and her ancient enemies, and Justinian, 
the son of Germanus, was employed as the instrument of her revenge. The pride of the reigning house supported, with reluctance, the dominion of a stranger, the youth was deservedly popular, his name, after the death of Justin, had been mentioned by a tumultuous faction, and his own submissive offer of his head, with a treasure of sixty thousand pounds, might be interpreted as an evidence of guilt, or at least of fear. Justinian received a free pardon, and the command of the eastern army. The Persian monarch fled before his arms, and the acclamations which accompanied his triumph declared him worthy of the purple. His artful patroness had chosen the month of the vintage, while the emperor, in a rural solitude, was permitted to enjoy the pleasures of a subject. On the first intelligence of her designs he returned to Constantinople, and the conspiracy was suppressed by his presence and firmness. From the pomp and honours which she had abused, Sophia was reduced to a modest allowance, Tiberius dismissed her train, intercepted her correspondence, and committed to a faithful guard the custody of her person. But the services of Justinian were not considered by that excellent prince as an aggravation of his offences, after a mild reproof. His treason and ingratitude were forgiven, and it was commonly believed that the emperor entertained some thoughts of contracting a double alliance with the rival of his throne the voice of an angel, such a fable was propagated, might reveal to the emperor that he should always triumph over his domestic foes, but Tiberius derived a firmer assurance from the innocence and generosity of his own minds. With the odious name of Tiberius, he assumed the more popular appellation of Constantine and imitated the pure virtues of the Antonines. After recording the vice or folly of so many Roman princes, it is pleasing to repose, for a moment, on a character conspicuous by the qualities of humanity, justice, temperance, and fortitude, to contemplate a sovereign affable in his palace, pious in the church, impartial on the seat of judgment, and victorious, at least by his generals, in the Persian war. The most glorious trophy of his victory consisted in a multitude of captives whom Tiberius entertained, redeemed, and dismissed to their native homes with the charitable spirit of a Christian hero. The meritorious fortunes of his own subjects had a dearer claim to his beneficence, and he measured his bounty not so much by their expectations as by his own dignity. This maxim, however dangerous in a trustee of the public wealth, was balanced by a principle of humanity and justice, which taught him to abhor, as of the basest alloy, the gold that was extracted from the tears of the people. For their relief, as often as they had suffered by natural or hostile calamities, he was impatient to remit the arrears of the past, or the demands of future taxes, he sternly rejected the servile offerings of his ministers, which were compensated by tenfold oppression and the wise and equitable laws of Tiberius excited the praise and regret of succeeding times. Constantinople believed that the emperor had discovered a treasure, but his genuine treasure consisted in the practice of liberal economy and the contempt of all vain and superfluous expense. The Romans of the East would have been happy, if the best gift of heaven, a patriot king, had been confirmed as a proper and permanent blessing. But in less than four years after the death of Justin, his worthy successor sunk into a mortal disease, which left him only sufficient time to restore the diadem, according to the tenure by which he held it, to the most deserving of his fellow citizens. He selected Morris from the crowd, a judgment more precious than the purple itself. The patriarch and senate were summoned to the bed of the dying prince, he bestowed his daughter and the empire, and his last advice was solemnly delivered by the voice of the quester. Tiberius expressed his hope that the virtues of his son and successor would erect the noblest mausoleum to his memory. His memory was embalmed by the public affliction, but the most sincere grief evaporates in the tumult of an urine, and the eyes and acclamations of mankind were speedily directed to the rising sun. The Emperor Morris derived his origin from ancient Rome, semicolon 20, but his immediate parents were settled at Arabissus in Cappadocia.